Chapter 241 The Example of the Nobles Two days later, the village of Fadin. The Lord only spent three hours repairing after Sarandil killed the Python Knights, and basically arrived at fighting as quickly as possible. Governor Justice and Alina are no longer in the team, nor are the Free Corps. Justice went to Dillonport, and he planned to meet the Surf General Ivalo. The infantry of the Free Corps could not keep up with the cavalry of one man and two horses. In order to set up an ambush before the Snake Cult army, Leon asked Jocelyn and Sigismund to follow up with the Free Corps, while he himself took all the cavalry rushed to Fadin. The village of Fighting is located at the bottom of an unknown group of mountains. It was originally a halfway house built at the pass of the mountains, and then gradually developed into a village over the course of hundreds of years. This is the main transportation road connecting Dalingang and Buji City. And it is also the only way to go if you don't plan to go over mountains and ridges and take a detour. Normally, villages that form traffic arteries are relatively prosperous. And this was also the case in Fighting Village in the past few years. But that was a few years ago. Today, the village of Fadin looks very desolate. The fields are barren. There are bones on the road. Everything is messy. And 9 out of 10 houses are empty. There are not many mosquitoes or flies in winter. But the vultures and rats everywhere seem to be quite fat. 10 houses and 9 empty houses. Here is not an adjective, but a literal meaning. Most of the houses were empty. Many houses were set on fire. And the entire village was burned to black. Obviously, it is not certain whether the Red Death visited here. But there must have been marauders. Sir, there are still people in the village. And the army of the snake cult has not arrived yet. But dot it seems that the village is full of old people. Not a single young person is seen. When we reach the entrance of the village, Lisa Dillon, who was scouting the road at the front, came back to report the situation. This village must have encountered some looters. But only the old people were seen. The group with the least ability to protect themselves survived? This is a bit strange. The Lord looked around and walked towards the village. There are several high-walled courtyards in the center of the village, which look like the residences of nobles. There seem to be people in the houses looking around. However, after seeing the Lord's army, these people hurriedly closed their doors, and the sound of wooden bolts being pushed against the door could be heard from a distance. No snake worshippers have been seen in Fighting Village, but there are residents or survivors here, which obviously means that the snake worshippers' army has not arrived here yet. Obviously, although Leon led his troops to Serendil for a battle first and then turned to Finn, making a circle, he still arrived earlier than the army of the snake cult. The huge number of followers of the snake cult probably seriously slowed down the progress of the snake cult army. But the reaction of these people in the village was a bit strange. It stands to reason that when encountering the Red Death or marauders, villagers would usually run away. What's the point of closing the door and hiding in your home after encountering the army? Leong asked the troops to stop at the entrance of the valley outside the village and asked Lisa Dillon to take people to find out. After all, it was not sure whether the Red Death was raging in this place. So let the Nolder go and find out first to prevent other troops from being infected by the Red Death. Not long after, Risa Dillon returned quickly and brought an old man back with him. In other words, he kidnapped an old man because Rasadalin caught the old man on horseback. The old man was well dressed with the typical Bacchus aristocratic ribbons on his body and looked like a tribune. But he was in extremely low spirits and was knocked sideways on the horse by Lisa Dillon for a while and he was already out of breath. Sir, this is the family that closed the door just now. As soon as I got close, he attacked me with a spear. So I had to force the door open and arrest him. But there were no servants or slaves in his family. And there were no young men. After Rasadalin brought the man back, he threw him directly to the ground, causing the old man to scream miserably. A tribute of the Bacchus Empire. With no servants or young men at home? This is quite rare. Judging from the style of the house, this old man should be quite wealthy so he wouldn't be in such a miserable state. Hero! Spare your life, Dot Hero! Spare your life! After being thrown to the ground by Rasadalin, the old man collapsed on the ground and just begged for mercy. Hero? The meaning of this title at this time is generally similar to words such as Hero. Right? Does this old man think Risa Dillon is a member of the Green Forest? However, Lisa Dillon's style of forcibly arresting people probably did look like a bandit. Understanding the reason for people's fear, Leon took off his homemade mask, squatted down and asked the old man lying on the ground softly. We are not bandits. What happened here? Why didn't you leave here? Seeing that the Lord was gentle and kind, the old man stuttered twice and asked tremblingly. 
Dot, aren't you bandits? Dot, when have you ever seen a bandit under the banner of a noble? Leong felt that most of the grassroots officials in the Bacchus Empire were either bad or stupid. Well, other countries are probably similar. But these Nolder elves, they are all my subordinates. Don't worry. They won't bite. The old man seemed to have regained his composure. He slowly got up and looked at Lisa Dillon in fear. Lisa Dillon spread his hands. I'm sorry. I was just ordered to find out the situation. And I had to break your door. Your Excellency will compensate you. Leon glared at Rosatilin, took out a few dinars and handed them over. As you can see, the Nolder Elves are all very sensible and good people. What is going on in this village now? It's the Red Death. Already? Who is the Lord here? The old man did not accept the money. Instead, he looked at the dinar inside. Forget about the money. It is useless to have money now. This village did not have the Red Death. But it was worse than the Red Death. The old man was indeed the local tribune. Perhaps it was fate that the Lord of Fighting Village turned out to be Fabius, an acquaintance of Leon, that is, the son of Governor Levius. In fact, most of Fighting Village is the family property of Levius. Fabius can become the Lord here because no other Lord dares to serve on the territory of the Levius family. After Levius and his son were caught by Leon last year, Leon packaged and resold them wholesale to his good brother Ramon, who asked Ramon, a professional ransom broker, to handle the business. Speaking of which, the father and son were lucky. Since it was a resale business, they made a trip to Sinjar. The journey was long and took a lot of time. As a result, Lidius and his son received a great benefit. After they returned home, they happened to encounter the Bacchus Empire that was in internal and external troubles. And no one bothered to trouble the defeated general. He was defeated and captured with superior force at the White Deer Fort. And the Shield Wind Fortress was lost. Not only did he lose his troops, but he also lost thousands of people to Leon. If this were normal times, Emperor Marius would definitely take the opportunity to beat Levius to the end and replace him with one of his confidants as governor, like Creon or Agathon. But in the current situation, he naturally couldn't care about these things. In fact, due to so many recent events, the Levius father and son have been basically forgotten. Even if they are not forgotten, no one in the entire Bacchus Empire has the intention to consider them for the time being. So, after Levius and his son returned to Fidin, they found that no one cared about them. Then, they discovered that there seemed to be wars everywhere in the Bacchus Empire. The father and son took advantage of the turmoil in the country to make some careful plans. Levius actually knew very well why he sat in the position of governor. People who can hold high positions usually understand the simplest truth. Only when you have soldiers in your hands, you will have a strong back. However, the father and son combined now only have 300 slaves and about 200 soldiers, which they feel is not enough. These are actually the private property of the Levius family. Most of his original subordinates, those captured shadow infantry soldiers, were redeemed by their own families after being transferred to Ramon by Leon. After the people were captured, they were not redeemed by Levius. So those soldiers naturally did not return to Levius's hands. Therefore, when the country was in crisis, Levius planned to start from scratch and build a large army. He wanted to save the Bacchus Empire from water and fire. That's what he said anyway. And it seems that this is really the case. The so-called building an army from scratch means raping young people into the army, which is simply called capturing strong men. He has done this job often and has rich experience. As for saving the Bacchus Empire from fire and water, if Emperor Marius killed Shiryuzas in Siyuan City, it would be Emperor Marius Bacchus Empire that would be saved. But if Sheila uses as rebels win, then Lord Levius will naturally save Sheila uses as new Bacchus. Anyway, Levius is also a member of the Shadow Legion. And he has some friendship with General Sheila. This is not because Levius is born rebellious or loves to be a wallflower. In fact, this is the consistent behavioral habit of any wealthy family for thousands of years. And this has been the case in all dynasties. This is true even if a foreign race subverts the regime. There is a saying in the East called Family, Country and World. Obviously, family is at the front and the world is at the back. Therefore, what the wealthy nobles of any country have done for thousands of years basically revolves around the same logic, investing based on family industry, or called betting. When the country is in a unified state, powerful and famous families will use family power as capital, invest in court power, and ultimately control the country by controlling aristocrats and bureaucrats. Therefore, 
The most troubled place in a unified country is around the prince. Nobles would bet on the princes they supported, which was investing their own resources in the future king, instead of a unified period, when faced with a divided continent in a state of war. Wealthy nobles will shift their investment methods to local areas, from controlling resources such as knowledge and official promotion to controlling land, population, and private soldiers. Of course, the essence remains the same. After all, it is all about controlling more combat power. No one is a fool. In fact, everyone knows that political power comes from the barrel of a gun. It's just that when the authority of the Central Committee was relatively strong, people didn't dare to become warlords for fear of being targeted and killed by the king. So they all had a tacit understanding. And once the world is in chaos, the slightly smarter nobles will hold on to their soldiers and make investments. In fact, for nobles, the so-called loyalty is actually investing in shares. Join a force that knows how to fight and is stronger. And everyone works together to achieve a monopoly. That is, to control the country. Only the common people at the bottom pay attention to loyalty. While the high-ranking nobles only pay attention to the return on investment. Moreover, the logic of most aristocrats is the same as the mentality of many venture capital institutions. To put it simply, it means that you are optimistic about a certain project and believe that it is possible to achieve a monopoly. So you invest resources to become a shareholder. If the project succeeds, you can obtain greater benefits. During this period, many venture capital institutions will invest in two competitors in the same industry at the same time. If either one defeats the other, it will become a unicorn. And then the venture capital will be hedging its bets. Because any company that successfully monopolizes, the market will reap benefits tenfold or a hundredfold as an investor. Governor Levius, at this time, planned to hedge his bets. But betting always requires capital. And the more capital you invest, the higher the status and benefits you will get in the future. Levius and his son did not intend to help anyone fight the war. They just wanted to invest in the winner. In other words, after Emperor Marius and Shira Yuzis finished fighting in Siyuan City, they would take their soldiers and horses to attach themselves to the victor. Therefore, in order to make their soldiers and horses look more powerful, that is, to gain a higher status when they stick to the victor. The father and son once again went around to capture the people and build up an army. Anyway, the purpose is to rely on the victor, to lead troops to join and gain status, not to fight. So combat training level does not matter, as long as there are more people. But if they are forced to do so by force, the young people will definitely be disobedient. They might mutiny at some point. What should we do? Levius naturally has means. To be precise, this method came from his son Fabius. He probably learned what Leong did when he hooked up with those civilian men in White Deer Castle. This time he didn't only recruit young men. He moved with his whole family, taking Ching Zhuang's family members with him. The family members were placed in designated settlements and isolated from Ching Zhuang. In this way, with the hostages, these young and strong people can only obey obediently. Moreover, Fabius did a very thorough job. The entire fighting village and surrounding areas had a total population of about 8,000 people. Except for the elderly, he had all of them violently expropriated. Yes, regardless of whether those people were civilians or slaves, they were forcibly recruited together with women and children. This is indeed done quite well. After all, whether they are civilians or slaves, they all belong to various noble lords. In this era, the people can be regarded as the property of the local lord and the entire population is forcibly taken. This is undoubtedly robbery. And the people robbed are still under their own rule. This will of course offend everyone in the area. However, Fabius, who had lost the support of the people, immediately encountered a massive rebellion by the snake cult just after completing the conquest. Because he is competing with the snake worship cult for population resources. This is going to be troublesome now. The news from Siyuan City has not been transmitted yet. Lidius and his son don't know who loses and who wins. So they can't help but lick it but they forced nearly 8,000 people under their rule, offending everyone in the territory. At the same time, many of these 8,000 people are people who have joined or planned to join the snake worship cult, and these people are working together to cause trouble. Therefore, Levius and his son felt very uneasy. They couldn't sleep at night because they thought it was dangerous. Otherwise, they might not know when the locusts would be stabbed. Sorry. Stupid. As a result, they gradually killed nearly 3,000 people in batches within half a month. In fact, they were not sure whether those people were snake worshippers. But as long as they thought they looked like them, they would kill them. 
It is true that I would rather kill 3,000 people by mistake than let one person go. Of course, there are rare cases where Lidius falls in love with someone else's wife. But this approach did make it possible for the snake worshippers, who did not appear in this village, to have the Red Death to be killed in batches. However, after solving the snake cult's chaos, the father and son still felt very uneasy because they had not been able to see the situation of the war become clear, and the remaining 5,000 people in their hands have no real combat capabilities. Forced recruitment of these people means that no one can engage in production, and the daily food consumption is terrifying. Their food reserves are obviously not enough, but neither Levius nor Fabius dared to let go of these forcibly conscripted troops. On the one hand, they need these manpower, which can give them a sense of security. On the other hand, since these people had already formed conflicts with all the nobles and civilians when they were forced to recruit them, if they were released, they might form a team to kill themselves. So the father and son simply broke the pot and broke the pot. Instead of releasing the conscripted people, they forced all the young men among them into slave soldiers and sent out his trusted soldiers to conscript the surrounding food again. Everyone knows that food is life in troubled times and no one is willing to hand over food. So there were some skirmishes here and there. And if you can do such a thing as a forced conquest, you can only imagine the quality of the subordinates sent to collect food. He definitely can't be a kind person who serves the public with a smile. When there was a conflict during the food collection, the first reaction of Lidius's men was to suppress them. This suppression turned into looting and massacre. The bones all over the ground were actually not caused by the looters, but by Fabius himself. The Lord here. Every house was robbed and every household was slaughtered. Like locusts passing through the border. More bandits than bandits. Only some local nobles or officials survived. Such as this old tribune. But there is no doubt that everyone's food has been robbed. That's why the tribune said the money was useless. There are only a few elderly people left in the whole village. They have neither the ability to work nor enough food rations to live on. Nor can they travel thousands of miles to other places. What's the use of taking money? There is no food to buy around. Where are those people who were forcibly recruited now? 5,000 people. This is not a small number. The Lord felt that Levius and his son had once again refreshed his three views. And they were definitely representatives of the unscrupulous nobles. However, he did not want to meddle in this business now. After all, the snake cult army was about to arrive. And Leon only wanted the father and son to don't ruin his business. In the mountains. That bastard father and son took them and hid in the mountains to the east. I don't know where they are. Chapter 242, Becoming a Priestess Again The old tribune obviously didn't like Levius and his son. And he directly called them bastards. Hiding in the mountains? Did Levius not even want his own manor? Wendy expressed her incomprehension. She and Lisa Dillon looked at each other. And they both shook their heads. There are a lot of minerals in the mountains. All of which are owned by the Levius family. The bastard father and son probably think those minerals are more important than the manor. The tribune didn't seem to be an old fool. But that was all he knew. After all, he was too old to go out and investigate. But the Lord can understand that Levius and his son have offended everyone around them. They obviously feel that they are not very safe in their own manner. Since Levius gave up his own manner, the Lord led his team to settle indirectly, so as not to waste time by setting up camp. The governor's family estate was very large, with dozens of houses connected on the mountainside. This is a typical high wall compound of the old Bacchus people. It is a courtyard in nature, with many tall arches and huge stone pillars. But it does not build towering castles like the high-ranking nobles of the Pender continent. In fact, if a castle was built here, then Fiden village should probably be called Feidenberg. This place is actually far larger than an ordinary village in terms of scale. The location and view of the manor are very good. At the foot of the mountain is the valley road leading to the entrance of the village. From within the manor, you can basically see the entire village directly across the valley of a hundred meters. Probably the only bad thing is that this manor is isolated on a mountain. Once the foot of the mountain is surrounded, there is nowhere to run. Is this the narrowest place around? The Lord stood on the highest terrace of the manor, looked around, pointed at the entrance of the village and asked, Yes, this was originally a road opened in the canyon to transport ore. After that, as there were more people, it continued to widen, and it is as wide as it is now. Seeing that Leon occupied the Levius family's manor and began to survey the terrain, the old tribune's eyes lit up. This. Sir, are you going to deal with that bastard father and son? To be honest, I came here mainly to deal with the snake cult. 
and I have to fight an ambush near here. But I don't have enough manpower. And it's not easy to seal off the enemy in this hundreds meter wide valley. The Lord did not deceive the Tribune. When fighting abroad, he must find help from locals who are familiar with the terrain. Snake cult? Now I really want the snake cult to come and kill these two bastards Levius and Fabius. They killed many people in the past few days in order to deal with the snake cult. In fact, we all know that most of them are innocent people. The Tribune gritted his teeth and said, while the wrinkled skin on his face was trembling. If you need help, maybe you should rescue the people in the village. How many people are left in the village now? Does anyone know the specific location of the Levius family's properties in the mountains? The Lord took a few glances into the village and could see some people hiding and looking this way. There were probably a few old people who survived. Of course people in the village know that many old people in the village have worked in those mines. Every year there are always some people who cannot afford to pay taxes who go to work in the mines. The Tribune sighed. But I don't know where the father and son are hiding. There are a lot of minerals in the mountains. The so-called mining labor is actually the same thing as the prayer tax and urination tax imposed by some noble territories in the Lion Realm. This tribute is obviously a minor nobleman, and the mining service cannot be arranged for him. So he may not be familiar with the mines. But it was obvious that he must be familiar with the people in the village. It seems that we really need to get the villagers back. Go and gather everyone who is still alive in the village, and I will get you some food. After sending the tribune back to gather the villagers, the Lord began to move around to wait. After hearing that the Lord was willing to distribute food to them, within an hour, all the survivors in the village gathered outside the manor. When there is no food to eat, the elderly, no matter how inconvenient their legs and feet are, become quite efficient. In fact, there are only about 200 surviving elderly people left, and they can't consume much food. The purpose of distributing food to these people is not to attract people's hearts. The people's hearts in this place have long been defeated by Fabius so there is no need to deliberately invite people to buy them. The main reason is to put these people to use. It will take at least a day for the infantrymen walking behind to get here. Whether they can arrive in time for the snake cult army is unknown. With only a cavalry force of 800 people, no matter how successful the ambush was, it would be impossible to completely annihilate the snake cult army. When facing the snake cult, the Lord was not thinking about how to defeat the enemy, but how to annihilate the enemy. In order to annihilate the enemy, all available resources and manpower should be used. Therefore, even if there are 200 old people in ragged clothes in front of him, the Lord feels that they can be used. Originally, Leon considered using the locust-like habits of the snake worshippers army to set up an ambush. And after the infantry arrived, he would try to encircle them from both sides, blocking the snake worshippers army in the valley. But the valley is a hundred meters wide, and Leon has too few people, making it difficult to arrange. Moreover, Snake worshippers are different from ordinary rabble. They are not afraid of death. This means that even if the ambush is successful, in order to block the enemy in the valley, the losses will definitely be considerable. Those Nolder elves and Amy's female warriors are all precious little things, and it would be uneconomical to lose too much. Now that he knows what troubles Levius and his son have done, of course Leon will consider bringing back those forcibly recruited villagers to solve his current problem of insufficient manpower. After looking at the old people queuing up to receive food at the gate of the manor, the Lord got up and went to a room outside the manor and knocked on the door. Alyssa, are you ready to be a priestess again? His. I never thought that after leaving the cult, I would still have to do these jobs. His. Alyssa inside the house opened the door. She had changed back to her priestess outfit, and her low-cut snake pattern armor exposed her white neck and shoulders, and her deep ravines looked quite alluring. In the afternoon, priestess of the snake cult, led 200 followers in ragged clothes to a large mining area in the mountains. This is actually an open pit mine. The entire mountain looks like it has been cut out of section. The mountain is divided into several layers, and many people are busy on each layer. The soil layer in the mountain section is very new. It is obvious that this mine has just been excavated on a large scale. Most of the people in the mine were chained and looked like slaves. There are a lot of people, no less than 2,000 people can be seen directly from the mine. No matter how powerful the Levius family was, it would be impossible for them to have so many slaves. It was obvious that the people here were civilians, who were forcibly recruited and were just forced to be treated like slaves. Levius and his son were not very active in training troops. But they were quite active in mining. What are they? People who worship the snake cult? The people who worship the snake cult are here. There were obviously people watching around the mine. 
as soon as Alyssa appeared nearby with the old people. Someone started shouting. Then there was a dang 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 bell, and it was obvious that the sentinel in the mine had sounded the alarm. His dot is this such a big reaction? Alyssa curled her lips. The people in the mine had begun to make a noise and commotion. And soon afterwards, a troop of about 200 people appeared on the top of the mine. At this time, Alyssa had led this group of followers back down the mountain and directly returned to the Lidius family's manor. It only took the Lord a few hours to find the whereabouts of Lidius and his son. Or rather, it was not that they found it, but they were able to expose their whereabouts themselves. In fact, the method Leon used was very simple. As long as Alyssa, the real priestess of the snake worship cult, appears in the largest mining areas with followers, then Lidius and his son will definitely panic, and they will definitely organize their own real troops or move, or fight. They killed 3,000 people in the name of dealing with the snake cult. Now that they see the priestess of the snake cult appearing here, of course they will think that the snake cult is coming to take revenge on them. Even if they are not here for revenge, they are definitely here to rob someone. Naturally, Lidius and his son will find a way to solve the problem. If they didn't come forward, Alyssa might actually recruit those villagers as a priestess of the snake cult. The number of followers Alyssa brought, that is, the old people who were familiar with the geographical environment and were responsible for leading the way, was just about 200. This is a number that makes Lidius and his son very embarrassed. They can kill 3,000 people in batches within a month without resistance. They must be ruthless and courageous enough. But they didn't dare to directly attack the snake worshippers with more than 200 people. After all, the snake cult has a reputation for not fearing death. If it is not necessary, no one wants to fight with a large number of desperados. If they lose, they will die. And if they win, there will be no benefit. If the losses were too great and they couldn't hold back the villagers who came by force, a civil uprising might kill them because they only have 200 soldiers with real combat effectiveness in their hands. In addition, there are only more than 300 slaves raised by the family who are still obedient. But those domestic slaves could only stare at the villagers in the mine. These domestic slaves who used to mine every day have now become foremen and are quite motivated to wield whips. However, it is okay for them to beat people. But it is definitely unreliable to fight. In other words, only the 200 private soldiers can be used for fighting. Therefore, Fabius carefully tracked the location of the priestess of the snake cult, neither getting closer nor farther away. But after seeing this, snake cult force, entering his family's manor, Fabius became a little uneasy. Although the father and son do not live in the manor, but hide in the mining area in the mountains, this does not mean that they intend to give up their property. Moreover, these 200 soldiers are also private soldiers of the family. They have always looked after the family and the courtyard in the manor. It can be said that they know the environment of the entire manor very well. People naturally gain a lot of confidence in a familiar environment, coupled with the mentality of protecting the family industry. Babius decided to take a little risk. He led the team into the manor through an unknown secret passage. To be honest, the Lord really didn't realize that there was such a secret passage exit in this manor. It was under the bed in the inner room. The Lord hadn't had time to check the bed yet. This secret passage probably hollowed out the mountain and led directly to the other side of the mountain. This is also a risk protection measure commonly used in the estates of the great nobles in this era, so that they can escape in case of emergency. However, although Leon did not know that there was this secret passage in the manor, Fabius obviously did not know that there were so many people in the manor. After he led his soldiers out of the secret passage, he gathered 20 or 30 soldiers in the bedroom, preparing to launch a surprise attack on the priestess of the snake cult. As a result, as soon as he went out, he found himself surrounded by a large group of people holding bows and crossbows. This scene seemed familiar to him. Half a year ago at White Deer Castle, he also faced such a scene. And then, he was surrounded by a large group of crossbows and fired at him. Fortunately, this time he had enough experience. So he reacted quickly. He fell to his knees with a plop, raised the sword in his hand above his head, and surrendered incredibly quickly. Oh! There is actually a road here? The Lord hurried to the manor house and was a little surprised when he saw Fabius on the ground and the soldiers kneeling in a row beside him. Fabius, lead the way quickly and bring back the villagers you captured. Sir, we have news. The scouts discovered some snake cultists in the valley 30 miles to the southeast. They are probably the leaders of the snake cult army. In the evening, Windive came to report back. 
It seems that at noon tomorrow at the latest, the Snake Cult's army will pass through here. I wonder if the Silver Hand will be able to arrive by then. Leon looked at the map in front of him and stood up. Has the layout in the valley been completed? The guards are ready. But sir, this matter cannot be defended for long. Although the villagers have been rescued, they can only help us build fortifications. They have not received any training and cannot fight. We still don't have not enough men. But not enough arrows. Wendy reminded with some hesitation. The Nolder have been fighting all over the place during this period. From Juran village to Serendil. The arrows fired from every place are basically unrecoverable. At present, each Nolder only has about seven or eight arrows on average. The Bacchus Empire is no better than the Land of Lions or Crows. It is difficult to replenish the arrows for bows and arrows. Even if you want to use human arrows, you can't find a place to get them. It's okay. At least now, even if we are surrounded, we still have a way to leave. Leon shook his head. Wendy! Although those villagers have not been trained. In fact, most of the snake worshippers have not been trained either. It is the best choice to let them block the entrance of the village. If the resistance of this village seems to be too much, it's so powerful that the main force of the snake worship cult might not be fooled. In fact, the safety of the villagers is quite guaranteed because wood piles have already started to be driven at the entrance of the village. The entrance to Fighting Village is actually the most dangerous place in the entire valley. Since it is continuously widened, both sides of the village entrance have been dug into steep vertical cliffs. Although this place is now about a hundred meters wide, it is still the most suitable terrain for an ambush. Wooden piles more than three meters high are being nailed to the entrance of the village in a dense manner. They have been nailed several layers. There is basically no room for people or horses to pass between the wooden piles. With the help of thousands of villagers who are familiar with the environment, it is not that difficult to control the 100 meter wide valley. Chapter 243 Bearing the Army at noon the next day, a large group of snake worshippers came to the valley noisily. This was probably the vanguard force of the snake cult. A few snake cult followers led the way, followed by at least 3,000 people. There were not many cobra warriors in this vanguard force. And there was no priestess in sight. There were no more than 20 people on horseback in the entire team. There were hundreds of snake cult warriors wearing green robes. It seems that in the eyes of the snake cult troops, being a pioneer is a hard job a job for the grassroots warriors and followers. In other words, this is the practice of the snake cult army. Those at the forefront are cannon fodder priestesses who have strong beliefs but low status. Of course, they cherish their lives. Leon lay on the wall of the manor and watched from a distance. He now knew why the snake worshippers were marching so slowly. In fact, their speed was not slowed down by those farmers looking followers, but by those snake worshipping warriors. Those snake-worshipping warriors wore full equipment when marching. The warriors of the snake cult are all soldiers fighting on foot. Or in other words, they are not soldiers at all. Because their training is quite poor, but their equipment is very good. Probably those with more pious beliefs and strong bodies would be armed as such warriors. These warriors who had not received much training did not have horses to travel. And they did not bring any carriages in their team. They could only march in their equipment. And naturally they could not go very fast. Why don't they let their followers help them carry their equipment? When marching in this outfit, you won't be afraid of dying from exhaustion. Amy lay beside the Lord and complained. Maybe they value their status as warriors. Just like the days when the female warriors who had just joined the Griffin Claws were issued with equipment. Everyone would show off in full gear all day long. Sarah whispered from behind, wearing full equipment at all times. This is in line with the snake cult's consistent style of charging at any time when it encounters an enemy. And in this way, Ordinary ambushes and raids may not have much effect on them. In fact, the main idea of an ambush is to take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness. Launch an attack at a time and place that the enemy did not expect. And catch the enemy by surprise. Such as a sudden attack when the enemy is marching without any equipment. But if the enemy is in a combat state anytime and anywhere, it will not be easy to achieve the desired effect. Moreover, although the snake cult's army looks like a mob, and although they behave like a group of brainless locusts when encountering a battle. In the valley terrain with cliffs on both sides, they actually walk very cautious. The kind of marching method of rushing all the way without looking at the environment did not happen. Basically, all the snake worshippers watched the movements on the cliffs vigilantly and moved forward slowly. It seemed that the followers of the snake cult who were leading the way were familiar with the terrain here. And the cobra warriors, who were the officers of the leading force, were obviously well trained and they knew that such terrain was easy to ambush. Fortunately, 
The Lord did not plan to directly use the terrain to launch a surprise attack at this time. The leading force of the snake worship cult was very cautious. If they launched a direct attack, it would not be called an ambush, but should be called a frontal blockade. But after the leading force of the snake cult walked carefully and slowly into the valley, they were surprised to find that there was actually another snake cult troop who had arrived earlier than them. It looked like a group of about 200 snake worshiping warriors with nearly 2,000 farmer-like followers blocking the entrance to the village. Those warriors basically carried heavy crossbows, carried moonblade axes or short-handled scythes, wore black hoods, and wore green smocks and chainmail, the standard attire of serpent worshiping warriors. On top of that, a snake cult priestess is commanding them. This group of snake worshippers seemed to be trying to climb onto the manor on the mountainside, but someone in the manor seemed to be resisting. The armies of the snake worship cult are actually teams drawn from various places by various priestesses. They are so large that it is normal for them not to know each other. At the moment, the leading troops of the snake worship cult do not know this team at the entrance of the village at all. However, it does seem a bit surprising that this team can reach the front of the pioneers. But since they had their own large troops fighting in front, of course they didn't need to be so cautious. The leading troops quickly passed through the valley and reached the entrance of the village. They did not encounter any ambushes or obstacles in the valley. After arriving at the village entrance, they also understood why the unknown group of friendly troops in front did not enter the village but wanted to attack the manor on the mountainside. Many dark wooden stakes were nailed densely at the entrance of the village, and various random wooden boards and other things were also nailed to the wooden stakes, blocking the road like several rows of large fences. This was a big project, nearly a hundred meters wide. The entrance to the village was tightly blocked. Those wooden piles were only about three meters high and seemed to be just ordinary would used to build houses in a village. However, without the tools for attacking, it was quite laborious to dismantle them with bare hands. They could only be chopped with an axe. However, there seems to be a lot of messy debris placed between the rows of wooden piles. It is estimated that it will not be that easy to clear a passage. Moreover, if you want to cut a passage, you must withstand the attack from the manor on the mountainside. In this case, it was natural to conquer the manor first. Otherwise, he would have to be beaten in vain. His. You have just arrived now. His. Where is your divine envoy? The priestess seemed to be in a bad mood when she saw the leading troops of the snake worship cult approaching. Several cobra warriors looked at each other and faced the priestess. Honorable envoy of God. We are the vanguard this time. The priests are leading a large force behind. How did you come in front of us? There is only one priestess here but she brings 200 warriors and 2,000 followers. This obviously means that this priestess is very powerful. So several cobra warriors behave very humbly. His. I also want to ask why you are so slow. His. I already told you to get to Bashi City quickly. Are you on vacation when you are just dragging your feet? The priestess had a very bad attitude, and she seemed to dislike the fact that this leading force was moving too slowly. Several cobra warriors lowered their heads not daring to ask the priestess about her gender. The hierarchy within the snake worship cult was very strict, especially in the cobra sect in Pindor, where the priestess was at the top of the pyramid. They didn't dare to talk back to a priestess who led more than 2,000 people. His. Hurry up and capture that manor. My people will tear down these obstructing logs. His. The priestess obviously had the arrogance of a high-ranking person, and she started giving orders without being polite at all. This sect was indeed a real priestess of the snake cult. Several cobra warriors nodded and bowed hurriedly, and then began to send messages to the troops, dispatching men to start attacking the manor. But the cliff is quite steep, and there is no way to go. The manor is located on the mountainside dozens of meters high, so you have to climb up and attack from the top. Although the number of crossbow bolts fired from the manor were not particularly large, it was indeed quite difficult given the skills of these snake cult warriors and followers. The cobra warriors did not take the lead, but directed their warriors and followers to climb up the mountain in a swarm. The priestess's men had indeed begun to tear down the tattered wooden boards nailed to the wooden piles. With this leading force in the siege, the crossbow bolts fired from the manor on the mountainside were all aimed at the people who were climbing the mountain wall. It is indeed a good opportunity for the snake worshippers to open up a path. Several cobra warriors looked at each other and seemed to sigh in unison, but said nothing. They just arranged a few more warriors around them to hold up shields to protect themselves probably in their eyes. The priestess planned to use their vanguard force to attract firepower so that the priestess's followers would die less. 
This is also the normal thinking of priestesses. In other words, any friendly force with a high position in any force would do this. But this priestess did it more obviously. But the leading force was originally responsible for opening the way for the army. If the priestess's team was not here, then, the leading force of the snake worship cult would have had to conquer this manor alone. There is currently a friendly force responsible for clearing the way, which actually helps these cobra warriors. In fact, it is normal for the army to encounter road blockages during its march. This situation seems normal to several cobra warriors. The only problem is that the followers under the priestess seem to be a little timid and uneasy. They may have just joined the cult, and such followers are really not suitable to be sent to attack the manor on the mountainside. The arrangement of the priestess in fact. It is understandable. Although the manor on the mountainside was continuously firing crossbow bolts. There didn't seem to be too many people there. And they could probably be conquered by force. After all. The manor didn't seem to have any defensive facilities. It's just that the burning rolling logs dropped from the manor from time to time are more terrifying. After accelerating dozens of meters on the steep cliff. This thing is simply unstoppable. It will kill you if it comes into contact. Obviously. If this manner cannot be solved, it is indeed not easy to clear the road due to the threat. So several cobra warriors urged the troops to intensify their attack. Groups of snake cult warriors climbed up the mountain wall and crawled upwards, looking like green aphids crawling on some dark low walls at the turn of spring and summer. This all-out attack seems to be effective, although some snake worshippers are shot off the cliff from time to time. On the whole, it seems to be continuing to advance. As long as they can achieve their goals, the snake cult team doesn't care much about casualties. More than an hour later, the manor on the mountainside still had not been conquered. There were obviously people guarding the manor's walls. As long as snake worshippers climbed over the wall and entered the manor, they would be hacked to death and their bodies thrown out as weapons. But it seems that there are no other means of defense in the manor. But the resistance is relatively fierce. At this time, the priestess men gradually used axes to carve out a two to three meter wide passage among the rows of wooden piles. His. I will attack the manor from the mountain road inside the village. And you will continue the attack from outside. His. When will the main force come? The priestess let her own troops enter the village. And then arranged for a few cobra warriors to attack from two directions. That manor must definitely be conquered. Most of the people brought by the cobra warriors are currently climbing the mountain. Even if they retreat, they will be shot by crossbows and have to continue climbing. As you wish. Noble envoy of the gods. The main force will arrive before evening. We should be able to turn the village into a safe camp before the main force arrives. Several cobra warriors nodded in obedience to the priestess's arrangements. As a result, the valley that was originally hundreds of meters wide has now become a three meter wide passage. When those wooden piles have been cut out to create a passage, naturally no one will try to destroy all the wooden piles. Not long after, the sound of a large number of weapons clashing was also heard in the manor on the mountainside and no more stones or logs were thrown down the mountain. It seems that the resisting people in the manor have faced a close quarter situation. Although the manor has not been completely conquered, the valley passage is obviously safe. A cobra warrior rode on horseback and ran towards the direction he came from. Not long after, a thick plume of yellow smoke rose from the mouth of the valley. Two hours later, the sun set, and the snake cult's army finally appeared in the valley. Perhaps because they learned that there was a female priest here or perhaps because they knew that the manor on the mountainside was still resisting. The snake cult army seemed to be moving faster in the valley, and it looked like it was charging for reinforcements. Just as the front group of snake cult warriors rushed into the village through the narrow passage at the entrance of the village, the last troops of the army had already entered the valley. At this moment, a huge sound rang out from the besieged manor on the mountainside. In the valley, a female priestess of the snake cult, who was protected by a large army rolled over and fell from her horse. A huge blood hole appeared in her chest. And she didn't even have time to say her last words. The surrounding snake worshippers looked up and saw only a puff of white smoke appearing on the manor wall on the mountainside. And a few seconds later, continuous roars sounded from the mountain walls on both sides. Boom. 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 Buzz. Ka dot ka dot ka. This continuous explosion sound simply earth-shattering in the valley. The continuous explosions lasted for a long time and were accompanied by the terrifying sounds of cracking rock walls and falling boulders, echoing in the valley. At the same time, countless rocks and soil collapsed and were thrown everywhere in the valley. Almost the entire valley was shaking. Huge rocks kept rolling down, plowing bloody ravines in the valley, and then collided with each other. 
the flying debris once again brought death to pieces. Following a series of explosions, a part of the steep mountain wall collapsed on a large scale, and a large amount of soil and stones collapsed to the bottom of the valley, almost completely sealing the entrance to the valley. This is why some places are artificially widened. Landslides and mudslides are common natural disasters in mountainous areas in this era. Without widening valley roads to a width of hundreds of meters, there is no way to ensure road safety. But now, even the valley hundreds of meters wide is turned into a desert. Leon concentrated all the grenades in the valley and detonated them continuously with fuses. The scene of the earth shaking and the mountains lasted for at least 10 minutes before slowly becoming quieter. But by this time, the entire valley bottom was already a h. Lish seen. Brown mud has completely covered the entire valley bottom. The original road is completely invisible. But countless injured people can be seen struggling in the mud. Countless mutilated corpses were dumped together with massive amounts of rubble. And bright red blood slowly seeped out of the huge ravines created by the boulders. Stones were still falling from the rock walls on both sides, making loud cracking and falling sounds from time to time, amidst the huge noise caused by the falling rocks. The screams in the valley seemed extremely weak. Not many of the snake cult army can still fight. In fact, except for the vanguard troops who are besieging the manor, there are probably not many snake worshippers left who can successfully crawl out of this mire of H. L. The bossy priestess before was of course Alyssa. And the snake cult warriors she brought with her were actually the 200 soldiers under Fabius. And those 2,000 followers were the young and strong among the 5,000 people captured by Fabius and his son. Of course Fabius was very aware of current affairs. He led 200 soldiers and seemed very honest when surrounded by 2,000 young men who had enemies with him. After being rescued, the villagers also behaved very cooperatively. This is their home. Now these villagers are not snake worshippers. And none of them want to be harmed by the snake worshippers. The reason why Alyssa, a true priestess, performed the scene at the entrance of the village was mainly to ensure that all the snake cult's army would enter the valley unprepared. Alyssa knew that the female priests of the snake cult were usually more cautious about their lives. After forming an army, they would probably separate a vanguard unit to both explore and open the way. Therefore, the leading troops of the snake worship cult must be convinced that the road in the valley is safe, and deliberately let them attack the manor just to confirm this. Since they have blocked the road at the entrance of the village and arranged defenses at the manor, it is obvious that there will be no other of ambush. On the other hand, first sealing the road with wooden stakes, and then cutting a narrow passage yourself is actually a psychological trap to make the snake cult army have nowhere to escape. In the eyes of most people, since a three meter wide passage has been opened, the troops can pass through. No problem. But for an army of tens of thousands of people, in an emergency, the only escape route is only three meters wide, which is worse than no road at all. The collapse of the mountain and falling rocks caused by the explosion on the ridge were indeed terrifying. But if they responded in time, Many snake worshippers could have escaped, but the passage, which was only three meters wide, prevented them from turning around and running back. Instead, they swarmed at the only intersection that could enter the village. At present, the area around the wooden pile has been buried by soil and gravel. Countless snake worshippers have died here, but only a few can successfully enter the village. In fact, when he entered the village, he could only be beaten to death by the villagers. Although the villagers are not brave and good at fighting, it is relatively easy for 2,000 people to block a 3 meter wide opening. After all, there are not many snake worshippers who can rush into the village. And they have nothing to praise except that they are not afraid of death. Combat Effectiveness Just after the explosion and rockfall, more troops appeared in the manor on the mountainside. The female soldiers fought out with the Noldor. And the remaining Noldor arrows were also used. Leon led his troops and began to harvest lives. The snake worshippers who besieged the manor were already at a loss when the earth was shaking and the mountains were shaking. After just over half an hour, there were no more snake worshippers standing in the valley. Chapter 244 Take Them Away More snake worshippers should have been shallowly buried by the sprayed mud. In fact, it is certainly impossible for the tens of thousands of troops in the valley to be completely destroyed by just one man-made violent landslide. Although most of the snake worshippers were buried in the soil, there were still many lucky ones who were still alive. And many snake worshippers were even uninjured. But at this time, none of them dared to stand up or even raise their heads. Although these snake worshippers are not afraid of death, they are very afraid of the power of heaven and earth. Even more afraid than ordinary people. After all, 
superstitious and ignorant people are more likely to blame all disasters on divine punishment. The previous movements looked like they had offended the gods in the eyes of the snake worshippers. Even now, rocks are still falling from the cliff. But basically none of the snake worshippers in the valley dare to move. At this time, Liang didn't know how many people in the snake worship cult army were still alive. But he didn't plan to lead the troops to investigate directly. It was too dangerous. Who knew when the bomb places on the cliffs on both sides would collapse again? And according to common sense, mountain collapse and falling earth and rocks can cause at most only half of the direct casualties to the snake cult army. Those living snake worshippers are currently afraid of Tianwei lying on the ground and dare not move. But if they lead the troops down the valley to face them directly, they may have to fight another uneconomical and bad battle. In fact, in order to ensure that all hidden dangers could be completely resolved, Leong had already asked the guards to make preparations. Wendy had already appeared at the entrance of the valley with the Nolder guards. In the previous explosion, the valley she led her people to create was very large. And the fuse was not that long. To create such a large-scale explosion, someone had to be arranged to light the fuse every short section. This meant climbing to the top of the cliff to ambush and having to run away immediately after lighting the fuse. Only the Nolder rangers had such efficiency and skill to escape the landslide after the explosion in time. At this time, Wendy had reorganized the guards together and blocked the entrance to the valley. That is, behind the army of snake worshippers. The entrance to the valley has also become extremely narrow due to landslides. A large amount of mud and gravel mixed with trees are blocking it, leaving only a gap of less than 10 meters. Wendy's mission was not to guard the gap. In fact, no one could have predicted what this place would look like before the explosion. It was also difficult to predict whether the Nolder would be able to reach this location in time after a large-scale landslide. Liang's arrangement for her was to try his best to light a fire at the entrance of the valley. A fire that can last all night and seal the entire valley entrance. As a Nolder elf, Windulf had never touched fire before she met Leon. But she didn't expect that after meeting the Lord, she would always commit murder, set fires, and create explosions. With only about 10 meters of gap left at the entrance of the valley, the task of lighting a fire to seal the entrance was indeed quite easy for the 200 Nolder. All kinds of messy trees were dragged over and piled together, blocking the entire entrance of the valley with their branches and leaves. Then, fierce smoke filled the pile of trees with branches and leaves mixed with some soil. The fire didn't look too big. The open flame was only 3 to 5 meters high, but the thick smoke made it impossible to get close. But no matter what, no one can get out of here. At the entrance of Fighting Village, Liang himself was also preparing to light a fire at this end of the valley. Lord Fabius, please light the fire. As a lord, you must do one good thing for your own territory. Although this may be the only one. Leon handed a torch to Fabius and motioned him to light a few rows of wooden stakes. The messy things stuffed between the wooden piles were actually fire starters. The villagers in the village were dragging a lot of trees apparently waiting to add firewood to the fire. Well, lighting a fire here won't burn the snake worshippers in the valley. Right. Fabius obviously didn't understand what this meant. But he didn't dare to be disobedient. Took the torch and started to light it. Fire never easily burns people who can run and jump. The vast majority of people who die in fires die from thick smoke. Leon said calmly. Just like the good deeds you and your son did. Although you didn't say you wanted to kill people when you forcibly requisitioned food. Your men killed most of the old people like smoke in a fire. Fabius' hand holding the torch trembled violently. Your Excellency Leon, you said you would let me go. Otherwise, my father would definitely kill all the women and children. The fire was finally lit, but Fabius's heart probably cooled down. The wooden piles at the entrance of the village had all ignited, forming a wall of fire, and the villagers continued to throw trees and corpses into it. The violent thick smoke accompanied by the stench began to sweep across the entire valley gradually covering the entire valley bottom. This is what will inevitably happen after a fire is lit at the mouth of the valley. The valley is a wind outlet, and the wind will continue to fill the valley with smoke. Coupled with the fact that both ends were lit, the smoke could not escape, and the thick smoke continued to accumulate in the valley, forming a rolling gray carpet within a few minutes. Coughs and heart-rending wails sounded one after another, along with the dull sound of falling stones from time to time. Adding another layer of torture to the valley, that was already a purgatory. The coughing in the valley only lasted for less than half an hour, and then completely fell silent. Fires were ignited at both ends of the valley, completely blocking all exits. The snake worshippers who were afraid of the power of the landslide 
and did not climb out of the mud and rocks in time were now completely unable to climb out. The sky gradually darkened, but the firelight illuminated the entire valley, and the thick gray smoke gradually accumulated in the valley and formed a rolling cloud of smoke, burying everything at the bottom of the valley. The tens of thousands of snake worshippers' troops were buried in this valley, without having much direct contact with Liang's troops. In the village of Fidan at night. Fabius, to be honest, it is stupid for you father and son to threaten me with the women and children in your own territory. Do you think I will accept such a threat? Liang is now basically certain that the snake cult army is definitely doomed. Although they can't go to the valley to check now, as long as they are not the walking corpses of the Terror Legion, they will definitely suffocate to death in the valley. He looked at the sullen Fabius and began to think about how to deal with the father and son. Levius was not actually here. The governor was still hiding in the mountains, in the same place as the women and children of the village. He had not released the women and children. After knowing that Fabius was captured and forced to return the young men in the mine, Levius probably wanted to use those women and children to ensure the safety of their father and son. In order to deal with the snake cult army first, Liang had no time to deal with them before. And letting women and children hide in the mountains was the way to go when facing enemies. But now, this matter has to be solved. This is not a threat. I just want to save my own life. You asked me to put Qingzhuang back. And I put them all back. I don't want to go against you. Now that the snake worshippers have been killed, you should keep your promise and let them go. I, Fabius explained weakly. Fabius, I said that I will only let you go after killing all the snake worshippers. Do you understand? And now, there are still so many snake worshippers standing in front of you. Leon pointed at the 200 soldiers dressed in snake worship warrior uniforms surrounded by villagers. They were the private soldiers of the Levius family, wearing green robes, but now they were all unarmed. This, but they are not snake worshippers. They are. Fabius sat down on the ground slumped midway through his words, then turned his head and closed his mouth, no longer looking at the soldiers. Aren't they the snake cultists? They're the ones who kidnapped the villagers. Right? The ones who confiscated food. Right? The ones who killed people and set fires. Right? Isn't this what the snake cultists do? It seems you already understand. Already? Leong turned to look at the panicked soldiers. Then, do you understand? Sir, we are just following orders. We, please don't kill us. This is unfair. One of the wiser soldiers fell to his knees and began to cry. Obviously, he already understood that Fabius wanted them to die. I am following orders. Whose orders are you following? When did I give you the order to kill the old people in the village? When did I let you burn down the houses in the village? I only asked you to recruit troops and food not to kill people or set fire to them. Fabius turned around and retorted, obviously unwilling to take the blame. It seems that you want fairness. Let's do this. I will give you fairness. You lead the villagers to find all the properties that the Levius family has looted over the years. Capture Levius and rescue all the women and children. I will let you go after all this. Otherwise, you will all be snake worshippers. The Lord smiled sarcastically and used the trick that the Bacchus nobles used to harm the common people. Early the next morning, the villagers returned. They brought back most of the women and children, as well as the food that originally belonged to them. Levius was also brought back. But sideways, he died, and died miserably. The bald governor had many small scars on his face, and a huge gap on his neck that looked like he had been bitten, with more than half of his entire neck being bitten off. In addition, most parts of his body seemed to have been smashed, and his body was almost turned into mud, looking like this is worse than the snake worshippers who died under the collapse of the mountain. If Liang hadn't said that he would capture the people, it is estimated that the governor would not even have a complete head left. In the distance, many villagers still did not rest, surrounding the group of soldiers, and did not leave. Fabius sat among all the soldiers, trembling. What's going on? Did he meet an ogre? Liang seemed quite calm. He didn't care about Levius's life or death. But he died so tragically that he had to ask about it. It was bitten by a villager. Lisa Dillon explained. Many women died in the house where Levius was hiding. All naked and with signs of abuse. And some young girls too. At that time the situation cannot stop the villagers. In order to avoid accidents, Rasadalin brought some troops and followed the villagers there. Witnessing the whole process. Originally, the villagers were only rescuing their wives and children. But then, they found out from the cries of the women who were still alive that many women had been abused. And then, 
They saw corpses everywhere behind the house in the mountains. A villager went crazy after seeing the body of a young girl. He rushed into the yard and bit Li Yu's throat like a wild beast and never let go. That was his daughter, said to be only seven years old. The other villagers also swarmed forward. And it was hard to say whether Li Yu's was bitten to death or beaten to death. He doesn't even let the young children go? Liang frowned and looked at Li Yu's rag like corpse. Lisa Dillon shook his head. Sir, it's not just a few female corpses, but hundreds. I saw hundreds of female corpses myself, and the youngest girl among them looked only five or six years old. And the villagers came back from now on. There will be at least three to four hundred families who have not found their wives. Three to four hundred? In two months, Dot, he certainly can't harm so many women by himself. Liang turned to look at the two hundred soldiers who were tied up at the other end of the village. I'm afraid none of them are innocent. Rasadalin nodded. Yes, sir, I think so too. But you said last night that you would let them go. So I tied them up first and waited for you to deal with them. Those private soldiers really wanted to capture Levius in order to survive. And they seemed to work very hard when leading the way. And even brought back several carts of property. But they had never mentioned that so many women had died before. Go and throw that body into the fire. It's an eyesore. Leon walked to the group of soldiers and gave instructions. The soldiers' eyes lit up. They probably thought that Leon was going to keep his promise and give them a way to survive. Several soldiers worked together to lift Leviusa's body and planned to throw it into the still burning fire. Dot, no! What are you doing? Fabius rushed over, pushed several soldiers aside, and tried to snatch his father's body. But several soldiers worked together to subdue Fabius even though their hands were tied with ropes. Leviusa's body was then thrown into the fire. Levius was burned to death by these snake worshippers. Are you just watching? Why don't you kill these snake worshippers quickly? Leon said calmly, and took a few steps back to make room. The villagers didn't understand, but the old tribune understood. He stood up and shouted, Burn them! The villagers already hated these soldiers, but now that they had received clear guidance, they all swarmed forward and drowned the two hundred soldiers together with Fabius in the crowd. Since we have to kill them! Of course we should kill them! But why do we have to let these villagers do it themselves? After returning to the manor on the mountainside, Amy looked at the villagers who kept throwing bodies into the fire and asked Leon strangely. Because I want to take all these villagers away. Leon replied. Let them kill the local lord and the lord soldiers with their own hands. And they can only follow me. Speaking of which, my behavior is not noble. But at least I can let them live. Chapter 245 Difficult Decision Two days later. The accumulated smoke has been blown away by the wind that poured into the valley. Alyssa burned off her priest robe and snake-patterned leather armor, and tied her hair into the look of a lady from the lion realm. Except for her, hissing, way of speaking. Everything else looked different. It has nothing to do with snake worship. She obviously didn't want to have anything to do with the snake cult anymore. Probably because she was a little scared. Alyssa didn't even speak much in the past two days. And she kept hiding in her room in the manor without coming out. Perhaps. She felt that Liang's attitude towards the snake worshippers was too fierce. For now, all the snake worshippers who met Liang were not spared. But for Leon, those who created and spread the Red Death must die. Since these snake worshippers have chosen to become the public enemies of mankind, they deserve this treatment. At this moment, in the valley, the corpses of thousands of snake worshippers lay scattered near the mountain walls on both sides. From a distance, they looked like earthworms crawling out of the soft mud at the bottom of the valley. Countless messy traces. The corpses of several female priests of the snake cult were also leaning against the mountain wall. It seems that before they died, they also struggled to survive. Just like thick smoke can smoke out insects from the soil. These snake worshippers who were not killed by landslides or buried alive by mud and rocks were smoked out by the smoke. And then, they all fell on both sides of the valley. The Medenheimers and the Free Corps infantry had arrived here half a day ago just in time to clean up the battlefield. They were cleaning up the bottom of the valley with the villagers. In Liang's eyes, the corpse must be buried. Otherwise, when the climate warms up, it is likely to cause a plague. It didn't take much time to clean up the corpses lying on both sides of the valley. After all, we only needed to collect the equipment of the snake cult warriors and bury them on the spot in the valley. All we had to do was dig out the soft soil on the mountain wall. Just put some down. Even many pits are ready-made. The snake worshippers, who were killed by smoke originally crawled out of the soil. As for those that have long been buried in the soil, then of course there is no need to clean it up. The valley floor was quickly cleared. 
and once everything was buried in the earth. It looked like a simple natural disaster. However, this valley will probably no longer be a major transportation thoroughfare for a long time. Thousands of people have been cleaning up the valley all afternoon. But they still cannot clear a complete passage. There are too many fallen stones. And many boulders cannot be moved at all. This valley cannot be passed by vehicles and horses in a short time. That's it. It's a bit difficult for people to pass. However, it is enough as long as his own troops can come over. Liang has no intention of building bridges and paving roads here to be a good person. How to restore transportation within the Bacchus Empire? That was a matter between the Emperor Marius and Justice. The situation in the Bacchus Empire is actually completely under control. Both Bashi City and Dillonport have returned to normal order. And the devoured people in Siyuan City have also been cleared away. However, these three major cities were severely damaged. A large number of nobles fled. Countless civilians died in the war. And basically every family was in mourning. In a short period of time, it will be difficult to restore the former prosperity. Probably because it was expected that many nobles would return one after another during this period. Several senior governors of the Bacchus Empire maintained the status quo in a tacit understanding. Karos devoted himself to maintaining order in Siyuan City. Governor Justice took over the defense in Port Royal. And General Creon presided over the prevention and treatment of the Red Death in Bochi City. None of them are currently managing their own territory. But none of them intend to return to their own territory. This may be because they don't want to mess with the nobles who return to their territories. Especially those nobles who are familiar with each other and can be said to have a two-point friendship. Perhaps, both Justice and Kairos felt that those nobles who fled when the enemy was facing them, and then came back to demand their property after everything calmed down were no longer worthy of their smiling faces. The entire Bacchus Empire is probably about to enter the post-disaster reconstruction stage. Perhaps this was the situation that Emperor Marius wanted to see most. A large number of those nobles who opposed the reform died, and they would certainly not dare to talk nonsense for a while while they were still alive. Most of the old people in the Senate, who only know how to make noises on the podium have disappeared. The powerful rebel army was completely wiped out. And the snake cult army was all buried in the village of fighting. Although Bacchus suffered huge losses at home. Most of the most elite forces were preserved. The problem of the rebel army was also solved. Although the fruit was picked by Leon. At least it did not cause too much trouble. Moreover, Leon, a deliberately declared enemy, could block the real enemy from within for Emperor Marius which lords in the entire empire are reliable, and which lords are incompetent were all exposed in this turmoil. Now, we just need to ensure a peaceful time of quiet development. In a few years, the entire country will surely be reborn and stronger and more united than before. However, just when the most difficult situation had been resolved, something happened to Emperor Marius himself. Two days ago, he met Martis in Chizaw village, and then he was led by Agathon, who reacted very quickly, to flee north. When they fled to the north of Fort Olega, they met Governor Kairos. Kairos looked like he was coming to meet him with his troops. So Emperor Marius and Agathon were naturally defenseless and protected by a large group of troops. Kairos, you came just in time. There are only 200 Horn Viper vanguards around Mounts now. We should take this opportunity to eliminate her. Quickly lead the troops to Chizaw village and send people to see you in city to pass the order so that all the Shadow Wolves can also be killed. The troops are dispatched. Emperor Marius felt that this was the best opportunity to kill Martis. And he could accept it even if he suffered huge losses. Your Majesty, you should probably take a rest. Kairos didn't move. His expression looked very hesitant. And the entanglement and conflicting emotions he showed were almost visible to the naked eye. But then, he finally said something that everyone could hardly believe. Take your Majesty to Layla Fortress. After saying these words, Kairos looked like he had aged 20 years in an instant. Perhaps, in order to say these words, he exhausted all his energy and courage. At this moment, he did not even dare to look into the eyes of Emperor Marius. Obviously, this is an extremely difficult decision. What do you mean? Kairos, what do you want to do? Emperor Marius was shocked. Are you planning to rebel? No, you are not such a person. I'm sorry. Your Majesty, I don't want to do this either. I don't want to. Don't worry. I will kill Maldus and ensure your safety. Kairos closed his eyes and sighed. Then closed his jaw tightly. You could clearly see the veins pulsing on the side of his cheek. It was obvious that he was feeling very uncomfortable and was suppressing his emotions. 
several shadow centurions stepped forward and surrounded Emperor Marius. But at this moment, Marius suddenly slapped Agathon on the butt of Agathon's horse with the spine of a sword, then turned around and ran away. Agathon! Go find Justice or Alina! Next to him, Agathon also drew his sword. It seemed that he wanted to protect Emperor Marius and break out of the encirclement. But his horse was suddenly slapped by Emperor Marius and ran in the other direction. The incident happened suddenly. Kairos men originally focused their attention on Emperor Marius, and most of them ran away after Emperor Marius. Only a few cavalrymen responded in time and began to pursue Agathon. But General Agathon's skill was not something that a few cavalrymen could master. The cavalry were cut down one after another, and Agathon even stole two more horses. Kairos's men certainly did not dare to harm Emperor Marius, and they did not seem to have any plans to kill the king. Agathon did not come back to save the people single-handedly. He did run away as Marius ordered. At this time, Emperor Marius had been taken to Layla Fortress. At the same time, the troops sent by Kairos have also searched the surroundings of Chizaw village several times. But he didn't find Maltes. Not even the Horned Viper Pioneer. Two days ago, Maltes did only bring 200 Horned Viper vanguards with her. But it only took her 10 minutes to defeat Emperor Marius and Agathon's guards. Then, she defeated another unit. A seemingly elite infantry regiment. Within 10 minutes. That was the fleet that had been fishing outside Dillonport before. Although the warships are in tatters, and although the men in this infantry regiment are all disheveled. The infantry regiment itself is not in shabby condition. The leading regiment commander even wore a luxurious royal pointed helmet with green tassels on his head. This was the helmet style of the regimental commander of the regular army of the Buckley Empire. The plate and chain composite armor on his body is engraved with a circular heraldry composed of four fan patterns. The four patterns are mountains, iron felt, big sword, and heavy crossbow. This is the symbol of Mettenheim. The number of the infantry regiment exceeds 700, including hundreds of Mettenheim great swordsmen, and even at least 50 dead swordsmen. This should be a very strong regiment. However, this army only lasted about 10 minutes in front of Maldis and her horned viper vanguard before the entire army collapsed. In fact, these Mettenheimers are indeed very brave. Their customs and beliefs determine that they will not turn around and run for their lives easily, and they are also very effective in fighting. But the problem is that the combat effectiveness gap between the leader of this infantry regiment and Maltes is indeed too big. After just one encounter, Maltes rushed into the formation and was captured. The legion commander was captured, and the legion naturally collapsed. At this time, there were not many horned viper pioneers left under Maltes. However, Martis didn't seem to feel any distress or reluctance at all. She still looked expressionless and put her sword on the neck of the infantry leader. Dot use your ship to take us back to Amara. Mainland dot bring all their bodies on board. This was the only thing the priestess said after the leader was captured. After that, there was a long silence. And Maltes did not say a word again. The remaining 20 or so Viper pioneers escorted the infantry leader onto the ship. The infantry regiment had no choice but to carry all the bodies of the horned Viper pioneers onto the ship. After Kairos' army arrived at Chizaw village, it was already empty. Only the corpses of some imperial knights and Iron Ring Centurions were left on the beach, as well as a few tattered and abandoned ships. At this time, Leon was leading a huge team of more than 6,000 people to the north, preparing to return to Karen Deer Castle. The main purpose of his trip south was to deal with a snake-worshipping sect that might threaten his territory. Now this matter has been completed. Leon took away everyone around Fighting Village. More than 4,000 villagers carried the food collected from Levius and the trophies they had just obtained from the snake-worshippers. They followed Liang's troops. It looks like a large group of followers of the snake cult. All the property of the Levius family was also taken away, which contained dozens of carriages containing various belongings, except for the mines that cannot be relocated. The area around Fadin village is completely empty. Unexpectedly, no one spoke this time among the goddesses, who had expected a few words of quarrel. This actually made Liang, who had been mentally prepared, somewhat uncomfortable. Maybe this is because I didn't solve the problem in the way God expected. The Lord sometimes feels that the gods of Pendor are rarely seen in the world. Perhaps they have not thought that heretics can be eliminated without swords. Taking the villagers on the road together, we still carry heavy loads. So the journey is naturally very slow. But this time, there was no need to abandon the villagers and travel lightly. After all, there were no battles to fight on the road. After walking for a full week, Leon arrived outside Bashi City. The large army was still marching north. 
and Liang asked others to take the villagers to Karen Deer Fort for resettlement. And he himself took the newly reorganized Silver Hand on the way to Bashi City. He was going to check in with Anson and see how the doctor's research on the Red Death was going. The Silver Hand was brought mainly because the gladiators among them were familiar with the environment near the City of Knowledge. Besides, it was not appropriate to bring the Nolder Elves in the city. It is precisely because of this that Liang did not enter the city when he lifted the siege of Bashi City before. The Silver Hand currently has about 300 people, and they can only be regarded as training knights. This knighthood is currently an illegal knighthood, and their knighthood can only be recognized within Liang's forces. At present, all members of the Silver Hand are fierce warriors. It included more than a hundred people from Mettenheim and nearly two hundred gladiators. These fighting knights were elected by the soldiers of the Free Legion themselves. They were some of the people who played the greatest role in dealing with the Python Knights of the Dread Legion on the seaside, including Sigismund. Most of the soldiers of the Free Legion climbed out of the tragic gladiatorial arena. They actually have a simple sense of honor. They are willing to join the battle to fairly win the respect they deserve. They are also willing to follow and support those who have made more contributions in the battle. Comrades. After all, that's what they did in the arena. Although Leon said that they were all qualified to become knights. They themselves did not do so. Only 300 people were elected as knights. While the others were still in the free corps. During battle, they would serve as sergeants and follow the knights they supported. This is Sigismund's suggestion and the consensus of the free corps fighters. Sigismund once personally established a group of civilian knights. He knew that when too many people obtain knighthood, the sense of honor and recognition brought by this status will fade. Therefore, the Silver Hand has only established a staff of 300 foot knights for the time being. Leong issued a big hammer to every gladiator in the City of Knowledge. I wish you good luck and good luck. If someone had a hammer at that time, the Python Knight's rotten bones would have been knocked to pieces long ago. And he would never have been beaten so hard. Since the purpose of the Silver Hand is to eradicate evil, it is very likely that they will encounter such skeletons in the future. So one person was issued a long-handled war hammer as a standard weapon. Anyway, these gladiators are all muscular men. And they are all suitable for swinging hammers. As for the Mettenheimers, they all brought their own Mettenheim two-handed swords with them when they came back this time. So there was no shortage of weapons. Of course, the status of these warrior knights as apprentices would not be recognized elsewhere. Nowhere could a group of slaves be recognized as knights. Even under Liang's command, they can only get respect and cannot get fiefdoms. They are not real knights. So naturally they cannot register fiefdoms. In fact, many people can't even write their names. And even signing their names is a problem. If they were asked to register, they would be blind. Leong did not find Anson in Bashi City. General Creon said that Anson went to Bretwin two days ago and never came back. Your Excellency Leong, it is said that there is an abandoned snake cult lair in Bretwing. Anson sent news back yesterday. He seems to have found clues related to the control of the Red Death there. General Creon said. In fact, Leon also knew about the snake worshipping Din in Bretwing. A year ago, Leon led a caravan to fight with Count Odin. After the caravan was robbed by the snake cult, Count Odin sent cavalry to chase them all the way here and burned down the snake cult's lair. Chapter 246 Evil Ritual Bretwin is a subordinate village and town in the northwest of Bashi City, only a few dozen miles away from Bashi City. This was once a famous land of fruits and vegetables. From a modern perspective, Breadwing is probably a vegetable and fruit planting base. Just like most large cities that have to rely on surrounding towns and villages to supply fruits and vegetables. Bok City has always relied on Breadwing to provide a richer and more balanced food mix. Of course, this vegetable base not only supplies Bashi City, but also supplies the army. More than a hundred miles southwest of Breadwing is the Layla Fortress, the strongest military fortress in the Bacchus Empire. This fortress originally guarded the main road leading to Siyuan City and Bashi City. So there were always a large number of soldiers stationed there. Similar to the Chicha Fortress in the Lion Kingdom. This purely military fortress has no residents. So all supplies are provided by nearby villages and towns. Brethwang is mainly responsible for providing vegetables, fruits and other food. But when the Lord led the team to Brethwang, this place didn't look like a land of fruits at all. Large areas of vegetable fields and orchards were deserted and unattended. Most of the winter fruits, such as oranges, had already matured. But no one picked them. So they just fell under the trees and rotted. Most of the vegetables in the garden have rotted in the ground. Some melon sheds still have racks. The buckets hanging on the racks are still there. 
and the farm tools leaning against the trees are still there. But no residents were seen. Anson was not found in the village either. The whole village was so lifeless that there really wasn't even a dog in sight. But the problem is that this place doesn't look like a chaotic place. There are no blood stains or bones on the ground. And there are no messy objects discarded in the village. What's going on in this place? If there's a disaster, it shouldn't be so neat. Right. The way it is now makes people feel even more panicked. Leon looked up and looked around. But he couldn't see any living creatures. Not even birds. This is obviously very abnormal. The ground is full of overripe fruits that have fallen to the ground. It is impossible for birds and animals not to come and eat them. And even if all the people here ran away, they would at least bring their daily tools with them. The farm tools leaning under the trees didn't look like they were thrown away casually, but that no one took them away at all. Sir, there seems to be a temple over there. Something doesn't look right. Close pointed to a relatively tall stone house near the lake in the village. The house was very large, with a rather crude statue of the goddess Demai on the roof. It is indeed a temple. A vegetable and fruit planting base, like Bretwing will naturally worship the goddess of harvest. Close said that this temple looked wrong, mainly because it had no doors or windows. In other words, all the doors and windows were sealed and neatly sealed. They should have been built with stones and repainted with plaster. How can a temple close its doors and windows? Leon waved his hand and asked his brothers to surround the temple. Close stepped forward and clung to the wall and listened. There is no sound. Then he sniffed. But there is a strong smell of blood. There is something wrong here. Here. Look. Look into the water. Sigismund suddenly shouted loudly. This temple was built close to the lake. The road on the side of the house extended out to the lake to a small wooden pier. The pier is very small and should only be used to park small barges that pass through the lake. Just like the inland river piers behind Changna town. It is estimated that vegetables and fruits can be transported directly to Buji city by boat from here. Sigismund was currently visiting at the dock. At this time, the lake water near the dock was reddish brown. Moreover, there were densely packed carcasses of birds, mice and other small animals floating on the water, as well as many carcasses of fish. No wonder we didn't see any birds. All of them died in the lake. The lake behind this temple is all reddish brown. Only when a large amount of plasma precipitates in the lake water will the lake surface be dyed this color. Sigismund drew out his sword and kept staring at the water to make famous gestures. Then he walked slowly along the pier to the back of the temple. He looked along the sword blade and pointed at a stone gap behind the temple. The blood dot is what flows from inside. Brothers, cover your noses. Go to the city of knowledge and tell General Creon that it is best not to drink the water of Lake Sava during this period. The blood may be poisonous. Come, break this house open and take a look. Leon took a few steps back and put on his mask. After thinking about it for a while, he felt uneasy. So he simply put on his helmet mask as well, and then signaled the men of the Silver Hand to work. Seeing that the Lord was so careful, the tough men also took precautions and started swinging hammers. Assembling them with hammers turned out to be useful, and they came in handy so quickly. This long-handled hammer is very good at knocking rocks. The biggest function of the 8-pound long-handled hammer when not fighting is to knock rocks or drive with piles. A group of tough men surrounded the temple and smashed it. But the walls of the temple seemed extremely strong. It was not until one wall was knocked deeply that it deformed inward. And finally a big hole was opened in the house. Moreover, after breaking the wall, the bricks and stones actually fell out. Then, a group of people all took a few steps back. Several broken corpses fell out of the big holes along with the masonry bringing out a pool of sticky blood. It was impossible to see into the temple through the hole, because countless corpses were piled up layer by layer to form the inner wall. The corpses covered the newly dug hole like masonry. No one knew how many were piled up. Hi. No wonder it couldn't be knocked. There were obviously piles of corpses inside supporting the surrounding walls. Even with masks on, the stench still made everyone scalp numb. Dot knocked down all the walls. Brothers, wrap yourself up. Don't let the blood from the corpses stick to it. It was not easy for Leon to hold back from spitting out. He retreated to a distance and waved to everyone to join him. Hundreds of sledgehammers were swung together. The temple is full of them. All corpses. The skin of most of the corpses had been ulcerated. And thick red pus was constantly dripping down. They looked like corpses infected with the red death. But this is by no means the doctors of the Knights of the Shining Cross or the plague hunters who sealed the corpses inside. The plague hunters would burn the corpses of all infected people. 
and they would never pile up so many corpses in the house. This looks more like an evil ritual, because all the corpses were naked. They were piled up around the walls of the temple, more than three meters high. In the middle of the temple is a square pool. It was a blood pool. Four meters square, thick black blood has filled the entire blood pool, probably due to the vibration of the sledgehammer just now. The plasma is shaking slightly at this time. There was a four-pointed star-shaped platform floating in the middle of the pool, swinging slowly in the blood pool. On the four-pointed star platform, a person was tied with an iron chain. In other words, it is tied to a broken body that barely looks like a human being. After all, no one knows whether it is still a human being. The chest and abdomen of the body were broken open, and two huge gaps, one horizontal and one vertical, penetrated the entire body in a cross shape. Large pieces of flesh on the chest and abdomen were deliberately pulled apart and rolled over, so that the gaps in the chest and abdomen also appeared. The shape of a four-pointed star. Almost all the internal organs are exposed. This is an altar. A poisonous blood altar built with the blood of countless red death patients. Leon and Sigismund looked at each other and blurted out at the same time. Castro! Yes, this is what happened to the powerful gladiator who died in Wendy's hands. Leon originally thought that most of the problems would be solved as long as he killed the snake cult army. But now it seems that the threat from the snake cult may not be over. This evil ritual probably involved thousands of corpses. Dot, but the guy who was cut open looked dead. Close frowned and said, Since the temple was full of corpses and sticky blood, no one went in and touched it to avoid contracting the Red Death. But it can be seen from the outside that the body on the four-pointed star is definitely dead. After all, the heart was exposed. There was no movement at all at the moment. And there was no sign of resuming beating. What a good eye! 999 adult male corpses. And the body of one chosen one. Exactly 1,000 people. A harsh and weird voice suddenly took over Close's words. The sound was so sharp that I couldn't even tell whether it was male or female. It just felt like it suddenly appeared in my ears. A group of people turned around and looked around. But saw no one. Leong and Close immediately drew their swords. They were familiar with the situation where a sound suddenly appeared but no one could be seen. This vocal technique they had seen from the three prophets was very similar to the sound of the three prophets reciting rituals. Ha uh ha. -huh. Maybe you are the perfect body of God's choice. What a strong warrior. The weird sound sounded again. Who is pretending? Come out! Close understood. The body of the gods chosen that the voice spoke of seemed to be himself. After all, Close is clearly the strongest of them all. He was extremely nervous now. And he completely understood Amy's panic when she faced Mrs. Bella in Long River Town. Mrs. Bella is a heretic who worships the dark goddess. At that time, the doom-inducing person once said that Amy was the perfect goddess carrier. But now, encountering the altar of the snake cult. He himself is said to be the perfect body of the chosen god. Sir, I think the snake cult may have some connection with the heretics who worship the dark goddess. Their paths seem to have many similarities. Close kept looking around and cautiously approached Leon. I think so. The Lord Lord was also moving carefully, constantly looking for the person who made the sound. Ha ha ha. Come on. Come find me. I'll tell you everything. Huh? The voice seemed to be teasing the Lord, but it stopped abruptly mid-sentence, and then became completely silent. Sir, an army from the Bacchus Empire is coming outside. They are still a few miles away. Summer, who was on guard outside the village, ran in. Before he could finish speaking, he saw a group of people around Leong standing guard with their backs to the room full of corpses. He stopped talking, looked around, drew his sword and lowered his voice. Sir, are there any enemies here? Leon rolled his eyes and shouted very suddenly. Don't run! Catch him! A large group of men hurriedly looked around. But they didn't see who Leon wanted them to catch. In fact, the Lord is bluffing. He wanted to try to see if he could trick the mysterious man into making some noise. But it has no effect. Leon looked around again and then put down his sword. If you can't cheat, that bastard should be gone. Samer, what is the banner of the army outside? It looks like the flag of Governor Kairos. Sir, Governor Kairos is not an enemy now. Right. Summer asked with some uncertainty. The ships and food sent to Menheim before came from Governor Kairos. Although this was a deal for Kairos, the people of Menheim actually had some affection for Kairos. So naturally, they were not too hope Kairos becomes an enemy. Kairos, dot, why did he appear here? Leon frowned, turned around and looked at the blood pool behind the altar. 
and then shook his head. Is he coming to this altar? We'd better hide first. Kairos, I still can't believe that you would be driven by people from the snake cult. I thought it was possible for anyone to join the snake cult. But you would never. Emperor Marius was sitting on a gorgeous prison cart, whispering to Kairos, who was riding a horse next to him. The prison car was quite exquisite. It was even a luxurious four-wheeled carriage with a pair of sofas that was rare in the entire Pinder continent. However, the windows were equipped with iron bars, and the doors were locked. If Liang saw this car, he would definitely recognize it as the carriage he sold to Governor Kairos last year. I didn't take refuge in the snake cult. I know I can't explain it. And maybe I won't be able to forgive myself until I die. But I have to do it. I'm sorry. Your Majesty. Kairos' complexion was a little withered and his eyes were dull. But a man in his fifties looked like he was seventy years old. It was obvious that he himself had been suffering in these past few days. Then tell me why you did this. Maybe I can help you. Emperor Marius still seemed not to have given up hope of solving the problem. You'll know soon that we've arrived. Kairos looked at the village in front of him. Stop talking. And silently escorted Emperor Marius to the village. What's going on? What's going on? As soon as he arrived in the village and saw the temple with most of its walls knocked down from a distance, Kairo suddenly panicked and rushed forward like flying. But he did not dare to enter the altar. It's over. It's all over. Antonius. My Antonius. He ran around the outside of the temple twice like a headless fly, then sat down on the ground and cried like an old farmer. Antonius? What happened to your son? Kairos. Tell me. What happened to you? And what is the situation with these corpses here? Emperor Marius struggled left and right, broke away from the hands of the two soldiers holding his shoulders, looked at everything in the temple, and then looked at Kairos, who was sitting on the ground, his frowning frowning into deep grooves. Chapter 247 It's easy to get into trouble if you don't go home for a long time. Kairos turned around, looked at Emperor Marius with dull eyes, and his voice was extremely low. Emperor Marius' eyes widened. You mean Dot your son has joined the snake cult? No. It is impossible for Antonius or myself to join the snake cult. Although we have indeed encountered bribery many times over the years. He was controlled by the snake cult with poison. I have to save him. Caro spoke incoherently. Let me be clear, Dot, what is going on? What does this have to do with these corpses? Emperor Marius obviously didn't understand. He looked at the terrifying scene in the altar and forced himself to speak more calmly. This is a conspiracy. I know this is a conspiracy. But I can't give up my eldest son. Kairos finally begins to talk about what he has been through. This matter still has to start a few months ago. After Kairos took over Bailin village, he put his eldest son Antonius in charge of dealing with the Red Death in Bailin village. He helped Liang arrange food and ships, and then went to see Yuan City. Following Liang's suggestion, Levi was sent to see Yuan City. The IOU of Yo's was handed over to the Emperor Marius himself. So Levius was transferred to the Shield Wind Fortress. There is nothing wrong with these things in themselves. The only problem is that Kairos has not been able to return to Dillonport since then and has almost lost contact with his family. Because Kairos has been ordered to exterminate Shira uses as rebels since then. And there are many spies in his shadow army who inform the rebels. In order to track down the spies and prevent the army's whereabouts from being exposed to the rebels. He banned the army from going out and did not send anyone out. This made it impossible for anyone to know the whereabouts of his troops. And he was unable to contact his family. At that time, even Emperor Marius could not contact him. The war was fierce and dangerous. For the sake of the country's security, Kairos acted cautiously to ensure that the army would not be ambushed. This was also due to his sense of responsibility as a marshal. However, because he has not been home for a long time and has not contacted his family, the things he encountered at home were not properly handled. Or in other words, they were handled in a series of abnormal ways. The snake cult has been infiltrating Dillonport before. Many people know about this, and Kairos certainly knows it well. In fact, if Kairos had not been under control, the snake cult might have infiltrated the army. However, although the snake worshippers in Dalinging failed to add sand to the army, they achieved many results in the homes of the nobles, especially those noble families who often stay away from home, such as Kairos' family. Kairos has not returned home for a long time, and no news has been sent back. Although this lonely woman knows that Kairos has a mission, she still can't help but think about it. And Antonius, the son of Kairos, after completing the blockade mission of Bailin village, went out to play for a while, but was poisoned when he returned home. It was not an accident. 
nor was Antonius accidentally contracting the Red Death, he was attacked. Moreover, the reason for this attack has something to do with the carriage that Leon sold to Kairos. Since Kairos was going to fight outside, this luxurious carriage was naturally used by Antonius for a period of time. It was the same for every young man. When his father bought a luxury car, of course, he wanted to have fun with it for a few days. So after taking care of the business assigned by his father, he fooled around in this luxury carriage for a while. But as soon as he returned to Dalingang, he was hit by a poisonous sting. In fact, the person who ordered the servant to shoot the sting was none other than Antonius's mother, Lady Eris. That is Keros's wife, a 50-year-old lonely middle-aged and elderly woman. Keros had brought back a special style luxury carriage before and did not tell Ms. Alas the origin of the carriage. It was something traded from the enemy Leon. And the transaction also involved food. Keros did not intend to tell Ms. Alas the origin of the carriage. Anyone. But the problem is that this carriage was previously ridden by Amy and Sarah. And it was sold in a hurry. Of course, it would inevitably leave some smell of young women. Especially Sarah. Who usually uses a lot of spices. As a result, Ms. Alas had some misunderstandings. Keros was a famous handsome boy when he was young. He was very popular among noble women in the Bacchus Empire. Even at this age, he is still quite charming. Based on Bacchus's style, it was quite normal for a nobleman to secretly have several lovers. After all, Ms. Alas is getting old, and the wrinkles on her face can no longer be smoothed out with an iron. Naturally, she has little confidence in her own charm, and some servants with ulterior motives are encouraging her. So after seeing the carriage, he decided that Kairos had a new love. Later, a loyal servant said that the possible mistress should be dealt with. So, Ms. Alas found a poisonous needle and asked the servant to find an opportunity to use the poisonous needle to attack any woman who appeared in the carriage when the luxury car returned to Dialingang. In Ms. Alas's opinion, the poisonous needle should have been nailed to Kairos's lover's neck. But the problem is that Kairos did not take this carriage to see you in city. The person who took this carriage out to fool around was her son Antonius, a young unmarried man who went out to hang out with friends in a luxury car. This is indeed true. Very normal social behavior. Since the curtains of this carriage were transformed into masks by Leon, the windows were hung with the usual tool of the Bacchus Empire by Antonius. People can be clearly seen from outside the car, but they cannot tell who is in the car. As a result, Antonius was beaten after returning to Dillonport with this luxury car. In fact, Antonius did bring the girl back. As a result, nothing happened to the girl in the car. But Antonius was hit by a dart. The servant was obviously aiming at Antonius. In fact, being hit by the poisonous needle shouldn't be a big problem. The wound was not big. And the toxin on the needle was not fatal. It will only cause the skin to swell, peel and ulcerate, producing a foul odor. But there will be no sequelae after healing. This is a characteristic of many highly infectious toxins. Even a rusty needle soaked in feces can do this. At one point, the poisonous needle that Alas could find would naturally not be a rare thing. This is just the jealousy of a confused and lonely middle-aged and elderly woman. It is not intended to kill anyone, but just to temporarily disfigure a certain mistress. But after Antonius was poisoned by the poisonous needle, he thought it was the snake cult that infected him with the Red Death. He had just dealt with the Red Death in the village of Bailin and knew that it was deliberately created by the snake cult. And as it is obviously not an incomprehensible situation for the eldest son of Kairos to be targeted by the snake cult. So he immediately returned home. After some examination, he found that he had symptoms similar to those of the Red Death. The skin at the wound began to fester and ooze pus, and emitted a foul odor. Antonius was actually a brave and resolute young man. Although he immediately believed that he might die, he did not panic too much and even locked himself in the house for self-isolation. However, his mother, Ms. Alas, did not want to lose this son who had a great future. She knew that it was not the Red Death, but she did not know how to explain to her son that it was a poisonous needle injected by someone else. The lady could only take some quick remedial measures. She asked the servant who injected the poison needle to suck the poison from her son's wound. In her opinion, this poison would definitely be sucked out. But no one knows what the loyal servant sucked for Antonius. Anyway, Antonius has been sleeping since then. And his symptoms are getting worse and worse. And the servant has also disappeared. Madame Alas panicked. Unable to contact Governor Kairos. Ms. Alas panicked and had no idea what to do. She hurriedly summoned a large number of doctors of all kinds to come to her home to treat her son, and even used the medicine of some unreliable doctors. 
bloodletting. As a result, by the time the most experienced doctors from the Knights of the Shining Cross arrived, various quack doctors had already treated Antonius, who had mild symptoms, to a critically ill condition. The doctors of the Shining Cross finally determined that this was not the Red Death, but a poison mixed with various snake venoms, which probably also contained some kind of hallucinogen. The symptoms caused by these mixed poisons looked very similar to the Red Death, but they were originally treatable, as long as the composition of the toxins could be determined. But those quack doctors used to treat the disease randomly, used all kinds of smoke and fire, and used a lot of folk remedies to fight poison with poison. They also gave Antonius a large basin of blood. If he didn't kill anyone on the spot, it would be considered Antonius. C's body is good enough to withstand the torture. If Antonius had followed his own will, and stayed in a room in self-isolation without doing anything else, based solely on the toxicity of the poisonous needle, he would probably be able to recover on his own after just a few days of sleep. But by this time Antonius had been bleeding and was in a coma, unable to be consulted. After being messed with for too long and given too many useless drugs, any clues that might have been there are no longer found. As a result, no matter how skilled the detoxification expert is, it is impossible to determine the composition of the poison. However, Ms. Alas did not want to believe that she had killed her son by looking for a quack doctor. As a result, the anxious lady expelled the Knights of the Shining Cross and turned around to find a few random priests outside her door. In other words, he is a magic stick. Superstitious activities are very popular these days. And the typical thinking of aristocratic women is this. Since doctors can't do it, let the magicians do it. In the eyes of these old women, it was the same thing whether they were sick, poisoned, possessed by evil spirits, or even had a stroke. In any case, it can be solved by jumping to the master. If it doesn't work out, it's obviously God's will. This really cannot be blamed on Kairos for marrying a wife carelessly. After all, most old noble women are like this. Of course, if you are a smart girl like Alina or Amy, you will definitely be able to figure out why there is a magician waiting at your door at this time. But Ms. Alas' heart was already in a mess. She didn't think about it so much. She only knew a proverb popular in mainland China. Sincerity leads to spiritual success. The priest who would take the initiative to show up at the door of a noble at the governor level would certainly not be an ordinary priest. He would be someone from the snake cult, just disguised as a priest from the temple of the goddess Demaya. But those people were not priestesses like Alyssa, but some men, using half threats and half deceptions. These magic sticks easily led Ms. Alas to take her family to the snake cult, and then began to treat Antonius. I don't know what kind of treatment they used. Anyway, Antonius did wake up. But after waking up, he seemed confused and couldn't even speak. He only knew how to obey orders. He even looked like one of those snake worshippers. Puppet. Moreover, green scales, like snake skin, began to appear on his neck. But for Ms. Alas, at least her son has indeed been rescued. Snake worshippers said that it would take some time for treatment to fully recover. So Ms. Alas seemed extremely cooperative with those snake worshippers and even really planned to bring her whole family to embrace the snake worship. In the first half of his life, Kairos may have had different political opinions from Emperor Marius, but he never showed mercy when he met the snake worshippers. Unexpectedly, when he was fighting to death with the snake worshippers outside, his whole family would be infected by the snake worshippers. Collected, the people who worshipped the snake cult had a bigger purpose when they came to Kairos' house to cause trouble. After taking control of Kairos' family, these snake cultists originally planned to drive Antonius to lift the defenses of Emperor Lingang and let the snake cult army outside the city into the city. But this failed, let alone Antonius. Even Kairos himself could not convey such an order in public. What's more, Antonius can't even speak now. Soon after, Kairos and his family suddenly left Yi Lingang without a trace. Because the consul's family bleed without fighting, most of the nobles in Yi Lingang fled the place. Fortunately, the pig farmer the serf general Ivalo emerged and defended the city. A few days ago, when Kairos was in Siyuan city to deal with the devoured people in the city, he met his wife, Ms. Alas, whom he had not seen for a long time. But his wife didn't come because she missed him. Ms. Alas made a special trip to Siyuan city to find him. She tried to persuade Kairos to assassinate Emperor Marius. In disbelief, Kairos spent a lot of effort to confirm that the 50-year-old woman in front of him was indeed his wife and that she was sane and not talking nonsense. The reason why Ms. Alas tried to let Kairos assassinate Emperor Marius was actually because the magic stick told her 
that only the blood of Emperor Marius could restore Antonius to a normal person. Otherwise, Antonius' soul will be devoured. This is probably not a lie. Although Kairos does not know how the devoured people of the snake cult are created. He knows that the snake cult can indeed do this. After all, he was clearing out the devoured ones in Siyuan City at that time. Later, a man who looked like a priest brought Kairos to Bretwin and let him witness Antonius on the altar. At that time, Antonius's face and neck were almost covered with pale green scaly dry sh. L.S. And his face was covered with herpes. The herpes seemed to be gradually transforming into snake skin. His eyes were open. But they were basically gone. His whole face looked like a snake. The envoy of the snake cult pushed Antonius down and sank into the pool of blood. Then the scales on Antonius' face that floated up obviously faded a bit. But it didn't take long for him to regain his snake skin appearance. Later, the messenger of the snake cult told Kairos that only the blood of the king could save his son. And he would seal Antonius in this altar and wait for Kairos to bring Emperor Marius. Kairos saw the temple sealed with his own eyes. After understanding the situation, Kairos was faced with a difficult decision. The people who worship the snake cult must have done it on purpose. This was to assassinate Emperor Marius. Originally, they should have planned to control Kairos himself. Antonia suffered for Kairos. The old Bacchus Empire in the Amara continent fell apart and fell into chaos because the emperor was assassinated. This gave the snake worshippers an opportunity to establish a religious state on the ruins of the old Bacchus Empire. But this time, the people who worship the snake cult obviously want to repeat the story of the past in the continent of Pender. The so-called need for the king's blood may be a pure scam. Or it may be true. But no matter what, Kairos must let Emperor Marius stay by his side. But now, the person on the altar is not Antonius. Emperor Marius obviously did not think that his blood could bring the dead back to life. He shook his head and looked at the altar. The man with his chest and abdomen cut open was obviously not the son of Kairos. Lord Kairos, when you first saw this temple sealed, were there so many corpses here? Leon, what are you? Suddenly hearing the Lord's voice, Emperor Marius and Kairos were startled at the same time. Kairos was silent for a while, but still gave the answer. No, there were no corpses in this temple at that time. Not a single one. Only my son Antonius was alone. Chapter 248 How can the emperor be so easy to deal with? Lord Leong, how did you come here? To be honest, I'm a little doubtful. Dot, does what happened here have anything to do with you? Emperor Marius squinted at Leong, who suddenly appeared from the corner. His Majesty the Emperor obviously didn't understand the situation. He knew that Leong sent troops to deal with the snake cult. But he didn't know that the snake cult's army had been killed by Leong alone. Emperor Marius had been held hostage by Kairos recently. So, of course, he couldn't receive any intelligence. Your Majesty Marius, I really didn't expect that our first meeting would be under such circumstances. However, you shouldn't doubt a friend who has been providing selfless help. Moreover, if I were you, I would worry about myself first. Life is safe. This matter is obviously aimed at you. And Kairos is obviously just deceived. Leon waved. And a large group of strong men emerged from the abandoned houses in the village and surrounded Kairos guards. Leon, what are you going to do? Are you deliberately leading people to ambush here? What do you know? Seeing so many of Liang's men suddenly appearing. Kairos regained his composure. He got up from the ground and asked Leon with a frown. The number of personal guards he brought into the village was not large. Only a few dozen shadow centurions. Now these personal guards gradually gathered together back to back with some uneasiness. You are overthinking. I don't have the time to ambush you. I'm just not sure if any of your men are members of the snake cult. After all, according to what you said just now, your whole family has already taken refuge in the snake cult. Naturally, I you have to be careful. Your Majesty Marius, do you want to come to my side first? Leon waved to Emperor Marius, signaling the kidnapped emperor to leave the dangerous spot. Emperor Marius looked around, took a few steps back, withdrew from the control of the shadow centurions around him, and moved towards Leon. Several shadow centurions looked at each other, but no one moved. Only Kairos took out the throwing spear he carried with him. Kairos, in this situation, are you still planning to commit regicide yourself? I smashed this temple open, but I guarantee that this place will look like this after I smash it open. But I didn't see anyone with snakeskin scales on their necks. And you should be able to tell that my people don't dare to get the blood on these corpses. The things here have nothing to do with me. I was just here to find my team members. Leon said quickly, although he has more people in the village, 
he must try to avoid conflicts. The Shadow Centurion next to Kairos is not easy to deal with. Regicide? I won't do such a stupid thing. But I can't let you take his majesty away. After Kairos took out the throwing spear, he did not look at Leon, but glanced at his own men, probably assessing the combat effectiveness of both sides. Looking at this, Kairos does not intend to give up easily. Sure enough, any father is very persistent when faced with saving his son. Have you never thought that the so-called priest is just deceiving you? Your son is not here. Leon looked at Kairos and shook his head. If your son can still move, even if he can still move like a puppet, that guy will definitely ask your son to come forward to contact you. In this situation, the only option is illustrate. No. Shut up. Kairos shouted with his eyes widened. A trace of despair and madness on his face. My son must still be alive. Probably only when his own son is in trouble would a big man like Kairos change his temper and become difficult to communicate with. But he was still somewhat rational after all. Liang's troops surrounded him at this time. Of course, he did not attack anyone, but just confronted Liang. Being so frozen is obviously not an option. Anson still doesn't know where he is. And Liang still has to find a way to find his medical officer. But he doesn't have time to waste here. Just when the Lord was about to use force to solve the problem, something strange happened. Sir! It! It moved! Close suddenly pointed at the altar with straight eyes. As if he had seen a ghost. In fact, it was true that they had seen a ghost. Everyone turned around and saw that the dead man, whose chest and abdomen had been cut open, and whose heart in his chest was not beating at all, actually started to move. Leon now understood why Kairos was so insistent. The snake worship cult can actually resurrect people who have suffered such fatal injuries. So rescuing Kairos' son seems not to be empty talk. I just don't know what the resurrected people will lose. When it comes out, kill this damn thing. It's obviously become as powerful as Castro. Sigismund muttered and made several gestures with the sword in his hand. The monster in the altar has torn off the iron chains that bound its hands and feet. Several nails that nailed the iron chains to the four-pointed star platform were pulled out casually, seemingly effortlessly, as if the nails were just just like embedded in tofu. But the nail was half a foot long, and the four-pointed star platform was obviously not a rotten object, but a solid wood platform that looked very solid at first glance. This naturally means in human power. However, no one dared to go inside the temple at this time. The pus and blood there definitely meant the red death. And no one wanted to be infected. The monster that had sat up in the altar turned its head. And its eyes had completely turned into orange vertical pupils. Then, the monster's attempt to step out of the pool of blood seemed too big. And its intestines slipped out along the dissected abdominal cavity. The monster seemed to be a little violent. It ripped out its own intestines and seemed to tear out some other internal organs. Then it stepped straight out of the blood pool with black pus and blood dripping from all over its body. In just a few steps, its originally dissected chest and abdomen turned into a large black void. But he was still, alive, and walked steadily with bloody footsteps. Lord Leon, I beg you, don't hinder me, and let him leave here. Kairos also looked at the species that was probably no longer human beings coming down from the altar, and suddenly turned his head and said something to Leon. Kairos, are you crazy? Of course, I don't want to deal with you. But that thing is different. That thing is obviously not human. Leon looked at Kairos with a retarded look. Didn't you see that the internal organs of that thing were torn out by himself? Is it possible that you know this guy? Indeed. It would be outrageous to let it go after this situation. Of course, I know it's not a human. I just think he doesn't seem to have his own consciousness. But it will definitely go to the person who controls it. Maybe if you follow him, you can find the priest of the snake cult. You can also find me. Antonius. It seems that Kairos is sane after all. Or in other words, he will try any method to find and save his son. In fact, Leon also felt that this method might work. We really need to figure this out. Mr. Leon, or you can ignore this matter. I believe you have nothing to do with the snake cult. Let Kairos investigate this matter on his own. Emperor Marius also nodded towards Leon. Leon felt that His Majesty Emperor Marius was quite generous. Kairos had just kidnapped him before, but he actually dared not to stop Kairos and let Kairos investigate on his own. But after hesitating for a moment, he still signaled to his men to get out of the way and watch the monster walk out step by step. Kairos, I still have to find my medical officer. I really don't have the time to care about things here, but there is something I have to tell you. 
I just buried tens of thousands of the Snake Cult's army a few days ago. The Snake Cult army that besieged the Lin Gang before has been destroyed. And I guarantee that not a single one will be left. Perhaps, the person you are looking for has fled far away. And you may not be able to find him if you follow this thing. Leon reminded Kairos kindly. Kairos looked at Leon and nodded. I must thank you for what you have done. In fact, I also heard about your selfless help to Bacchus a few days ago. After speaking, he turned to look at Emperor Marius. Your Majesty, believe me, in fact, I never wanted to murder you. I just wanted to try the blood of the king that the priest said. If I can find the priest this time, I will capture him and bring him back to plead guilty to you. Moreover, your majesty, if you want to implement reforms, you should have been cruel enough to get rid of me long ago. After saying that, Kairos led his troops and slowly walked out of the village following the monster. Emperor Marius watched Kairos slowly leave and sighed sadly. Your majesty Marius, are you going to let him leave like this? Leon looked at Emperor Marius with deep doubts in his eyes. Did he really let Kairos go like this? You dot killed the snake cult's tens of thousands of troops? Where are you? Emperor Marius did not answer. He turned around and looked at Leong several times, apparently wanting to get to know the Lord again. Near the village of fighting. Oh, by the way, in order to kill the snake cult army, Governor Levius and his son used their bodies as bait. Unfortunately, they all died for the country, and their deaths were quite heroic. Leon thought carefully and changed the adjective for Levius's tragic death. I know very well what kind of person Levius is. I am afraid that words such as heroic cannot be applied to him. Count Leon, I understand that there will definitely be a price to pay for getting rid of the snake cult. If the Empire pays, the price is only Levius and his son. So I should actually thank you more. Are you interested in the northern governor of the Empire? Emperor Marius and Justice indeed wore the same pants, and even used the same rhetoric to win over. Forget it. Your Majesty, I just captured Kalandir Fort not long ago, and I will station thousands of troops at Kalandir Fort to threaten the Bacchus Empire. If you make me governor, I can't follow you. I will send you to the City of Knowledge. General Creon is there. By the way, I hope our next meeting can be more formal. Leon shook his head and called his men to leave. There's no need to send me away. In fact, there are people escorting me all the time. I'm very happy that a master like you didn't even notice them. Sura! Emperor Marius smiled and shook his head, turned his head and shouted behind him. From several dark corners, several people wearing wolf head helmets stood out at the same time. Your Majesty, the Shadow Wolves have followed. Liang's eyes widened. These guys were hiding so secretly. He brought hundreds of people with him. But no one could find them. No wonder he let Governor Kairos leave so easily. It turned out that he sent someone to follow him. Similarly, it is no wonder that his previous behavior did not look like a hostage. It turned out that Emperor Marius had such a secret army following him all the time. It is really difficult to say who is the one who was kidnapped. This is General Sulla, the Shadow Wolf from the Ember Empire. Count Leon, we are friends now, so I will let you see him. But when we are enemies, he may always hide. It's in the dark. So be careful. Emperor Marius introduced Sulla to Leon. But General Sulla obviously did not intend to show up. He nodded from a distance. And then retreated into the darkness again. Your Majesty is really good at it. By the way, I once saw some spies called Vipers under Governor Justice. Do they have anything to do with General Sulla's people? Leon shook his head and sighed with emotion. The spies of the Bacchus Empire were really full of variety and variety. And they were indeed more fancy than kingdoms like Lion and Crow. Those are some spies trained by the Shadow Wolves. They were originally intended to deal with the Snake Cult. Someone was needed to work as undercover agents for the Snake Cult. So they were called Poisonous Snakes. The Snake Cult will not be exposed. Emperor Marius answered seriously, seeming to be giving Leon sincere advice. Like the Shadow Wolves, they are warriors who walk in the darkness. Maybe you should also build such a team. If you don't want to, if you are killed by the Lion King or another king. I am a loyal and brave minister of the Lion Kingdom. How could I be killed by my own king? Huh? Your Majesty, since there is someone to protect you, I will take my leave. Leon shook his head and turned around to leave. Emperor Marius is obviously difficult to deal with. And General Sulla's shadow wolves are indeed very dangerous and head on combat. Perhaps one of his own silver hands can defeat both of them. But the shadow wolves are obviously specialized in traveling through darkness. Probably only Rissa Dilling can deal with them. 
the Lord felt that he had better find Anson quickly, and then go back to Karen Deer Castle to stay, and asked Lisa Dillon to quickly form a shadow army walking in the secret place. At this moment, Anson was actually less than 20 miles away from the Lord. There was a reason why Leong didn't find him. Anson was on a boat in Sava Lake at this time. It was an inland river boat, a wooden boat commonly used by fishermen with pure or power. It was only about 10 meters long and more than 1 meter wide. There were two people in the boat with Anson, a man and a woman. The man was unconscious. His body was swollen, and his face was covered in blue scaly spots. The woman wore a worn leather armor and held a spear in her hand. Testing the depth of the lake. Chapter 249 Murderer? Me too. The woman had short men's hair and behaved like a soldier. If you didn't look carefully, you would have thought she was a man. Doctor, are you sure this guy can really be saved? I've never seen anyone who can be saved from the Red Death. The boat gradually approached the lake. The woman took a spear and poked into the water to make sure that the water was very shallow. Then she got out of the boat and stepped into the water. She asked Anson while pulling the boat to the shore. He is different. He has been infected with a very strange poison. This poison seems to have neutralized the Red Death on him and even prevents his red death from being passed on to other people. The priest touched his blood in the temple, but he was not worried about contracting the red death. If we could determine what kind of poison he was infected with, it would be equivalent to finding a cure for the red death. Julia, do me a favor. I can't hold him back. Anson looked very tired. He tried hard to drag the unconscious man out of the boat, but the boat only shook a few times, and the man was not dragged at all. Perhaps your medical skills are indeed good but with your skills, you really shouldn't go out alone. Young doctor. The girl named Julia shook her head with contempt, stretched out her hand to drag the unconscious man, and put it on her shoulders with great strength. Then the two of them strode ashore and put the man on the shore. On the ground. I didn't go out alone. Didn't I hire you? I just overestimated the courage of your colleagues and underestimated the madness of the snake cult. They can actually turn people into snake-like monsters? Anson sighed and shook his head carried his medical kit on his back, got off the rickety boat, walked up to Julia, sat down and began to breathe. I didn't expect those bastards to be so cowardly. Doctor, with your skills, you actually dared to take people away from that weird temple. I really admire you. Julia twisted her waist, looked at Anson and sighed. I am a knight of the Radiant Cross. I am fearless wherever my radiance shines. How can I be afraid of a few snakeskin corpses that have lost their souls? Anson stood up on his knees and looked back at the lake. They don't seem to be catching up. Let's leave quickly. Aren't you afraid? Julia rolled her eyes, but did not waste any time. She carried the unconscious man and walked forward with difficulty with the spear. Obviously, this woman named Julia was the main force in their journey. As an employee, you shouldn't mock your employer. Anson saw Julia walking unsteadily and stretched out his hand to give her a hand. Hey! I just wanted to find a temporary job escorting medical personnel to make a living. I didn't expect to encounter such evil things here. Julia was obviously dissatisfied with this job. Didn't you say before you set off that you were just going out to find some medicinal materials? The little money you paid is not the price of your life. That's right. This guy is the medicine. Although it is indeed a bit dangerous to find the medicine. But have you heard of the proverb that good medicine always grows on the cliff? It seems that Anson has stayed with the Lord for too long and has learned how to squeeze employees. He probably also learned a lot of language arts from Sarah, and he can explain everything in detail. But your medicine is too heavy. You have to pay more. Julia gritted her teeth and said, It's certainly not easy to walk with an adult man on her back. She was indeed very tired. Of course, when you meet Lord Leon, you can have as much money as you want. But you have to return to Bashi City alive first. Come on. You will make a fortune when you return to Bashi City. Anson imitated what the Lord once did and wrote a blank check, while also motivating his employees. The two of them walked forward and gradually reached the edge of a swamp. There are always many swamps and wetlands on the edge of big lakes, and they are probably the kind of muddy lands where people will sink as soon as they enter. The two of them looked at the swamp in front of them and were a little dumbfounded. It was already evening and the light was not very good. Everyone knew not to enter the swamp easily at this time. Dot, wait a minute. Doctor, I think we are going in the wrong direction. Dot, why is the sunset in front of us? We seem to be walking to the west just now. Julia looked around, then suddenly turned around blankly. Bashi City seems to be in the southeast. Right. Oh? Uh -huh. 
Well, God, don't you know the way? Anson was stunned. It was obvious that this young doctor had little experience in outdoor life. He had just rowed a boat on a wide lake for a long time and walked in the wild for so long without any reference. He had long lost his sense of direction. This young man who was able to get on the wrong ship at the port of Bashi City certainly had an obvious shortcoming. He could easily get lost. I said I just came here from Siyuan City. I'm not familiar with this area. How can I know the way? Julia put the man on her shoulder down again. She was obviously not in a good mood at the moment. But her movements were still gentle. It seemed that she didn't want to do anything to the unconscious patient. It's obvious that even though Julia talks bad words and acts like a man, she is a kind-hearted girl. Anson looked around in confusion and sighed. It would be great if Rasadalin was here. He can always find the way. Why can't I have the talent of being able to find the direction just by looking at it like the Nolder Elves? Woolen cloth? The Nolder Elves? Huh. They are all old monsters that can live for thousands of years. If you live for a few hundred more years, you can easily find your way anywhere. Julia seems to be a very outspoken talker. And she rarely stops talking. But she does work diligently all the time. I'm not an old monster. Anson, I finally found you. In order to find you, my lord has dug up almost three feet of the ground near Bretwin Village. A clear voice sounded. Whoever comes. It is Lisa Dillon. Rasadalin was leading a few Nolda rangers to search along the lakeshore. The elf's ears were indeed very good. He heard Anson's voice without seeing anyone across the hills by the lake. Fortunately, Anson and Julia were along. All talking. Risa Dillon. Hey. It seems we are right to go this way. Anson waved his hands excitedly. He had already seen Risa Dillon riding a horse. Anson. Maybe you are right to go this way. Look behind you. Lisa Dillon quickly rushed behind Anson and drew his sword. Your luck is indeed very good. Risa Dillon was probably very happy to have found Anson. Normally, he would not talk so much to Anson. The sword light in the elf killer's hand fell, and a humanoid monster with a pale green body was beheaded by the Nolder elf. It was a devoured person, and it was approaching Anson silently. Their pale green snake skin-like skin was difficult to spot near the swamp. They actually kept chasing us. Fortunately, you are here. Anson glanced behind him a few times. His eyebrows suddenly drooped, and he laughed a few times. Risa Dillon, why are you here? My lord did not find you in Brevin Village. So we asked us to send out most of the cavalry. Rasadalin shook his head. We better leave here quickly. These monsters are very inconspicuous near the swamp. Are they chasing you? Julia raised her head and looked at Rasadalin. She seemed to be impressed by the handsome Nolder elf. And her tone of voice became gentler. Yes, we were chased here by that kind of monster. Where are we going now? Through the swamp? No. Follow me all the way south. Wait. It seems we have to fight our way out now. Lisa Dillon looked at Julia and then saw more shaky figures from behind Julia. Those are all devoured ones. Maybe they came from the lake. Can they dive? Julia was obviously aware of the fact that these devoured people did not need to breathe. Rasadalin immediately got off his horse and said, Get on your horse and get out of here. I'll stop them. Then he threw the reins in front of Anson and rushed behind Julia with his sword. Several Nolder rangers he brought also rushed out with him. The Nolder have always been reliable when facing enemies. Anson got on the horse obediently, but still did not forget his mission. Julia, bring that man up. Quick. Julia turned her head and looked at Risa Dillon, who had already started to kill. She used her strength to lift the unconscious man and laid him across Anson's saddle. Then she gave the horse a hard slap on the butt. The horse galloped southward, and Anson only had time to say, Alas, before he was taken away by the horse. I hope you can cure the Red Death. Remember to give me more money. Julia muttered a few words towards Anson's back, then picked up her spear and ran behind Lisa Dillon. The fate between people is very wonderful. Two people of different races, different personalities, different identities, and even different genders often form a friendship that ordinary people may not be able to form after decades of being together in a battle of just 10 minutes. This is the case with Lisa Dillon and Julia. One is a Nolder noble, a male elf who looks like a beautiful woman. He has long shawl hair like a woman. He is usually taciturn and has been a killer for many years. The other one is a human civilian, a short-haired woman who dresses like a man. She also looks very androgynous. She is usually a chatterbox and is working part-time as a guard. These two people are opposites in every aspect, but they were unusually in tune during the battle. Enemies that Rasadalin could not reach with his sword and shield could always be stopped by Julia in advance with her spear. 
and Rosatiline could easily kill them when he returned. And Julia can always get timely help from Lisa Dillon when using a spear on her back or in front of her where it is difficult to guard against. It was their first time fighting together and even meeting each other for the first time. But they worked together like old friends who had been together for many years. In terms of martial arts, Julia's skill is obviously not comparable to any Nolda Ranger. But when it comes to cooperation with Rissa Dillon, the two are perfect. Where did you learn these skills? I have never cooperated so well with humans. In this battle, Sadilon obviously fought smoothly, and he eliminated the devoured ones in 10 minutes. This indifferent elf even took the initiative to talk to a human, and it was a human woman that he would never look at at all. Lisa Dillon was usually very indifferent to Sarah and others. He only obeyed Liang's orders. Even Amy didn't pay much attention to him. Wendy was able to have friendly exchanges with him. But that was because they were both Nolder nobles. Apart from the Lord, the only human being who could be called his friend was Eric. This was probably because Lisa Dillon had always apologized for accidentally injuring Eric. My father taught me dot, but I'm not sure if I should still call him father. Julia sat down on the ground with her spear in hand and looked at Rissa Dillon's profile. I am a murderer. And I am wanted by the Bacchus Empire. Oh. Ha dot, I am also a murderer dot, and I am also wanted by the Bacchus Empire. Lisa Dillon turned around strangely. Real? Real. The two looked at each other and laughed. The person I accidentally killed was my brother. After laughing for a while, Julia murmured. Dot this dot, I also accidentally killed my brother. My cousin. The expression on Rosatalin's face was even more strange. He was exiled by the Nolder tribe because he accidentally killed Islandil's nephew in a duel. That was indeed his cousin, Rosatalin himself. In fact, he is also the nephew of Islandil. The Nolder nobles of the same ethnic group are all relatives of each other. The two were silent for a while. And Lisa Dillon also sat down next to Julia. Julia stared at the water in the swamp under her feet, looking at the reflection of her short hair, feeling a little lost. She would dress up like a man. But she didn't naturally like this kind of neutral dressing. This kind of neutral culture is not popular in Pande continent. Julia was just using this method so that she could often see her brother in the reflection in the mirror or water. She once had a twin brother named Julius, who looked exactly like her. Julia's father was once the guard of a noble in Siyuan City. And the two siblings were trained by their father to use various weapons and coordinate fighting skills since they were young. She is so good at cooperating with others because she and her brother have long trained a method of working together to fight against the enemy. But one day, Julia unexpectedly discovered that her father and brother were not protecting any nobles, but a snake priestess. This sudden discovery overturns the beautiful family in her heart. Julia confronted her father and brother with what she had seen. But her brother Julia silenced her and threatened to kill her. The two siblings got into a fight, and Julia accidentally killed her twin brother during the fight. Later, she was wanted for murder, and her father considered her an enemy. Not long after this incident, Siyuan City was besieged by rebels. The soldiers who were chasing Julia were called back by Emperor Marius. Julia escaped the wanted arrest. But she also lost her home. She could only wander around and look for her future elsewhere. The Lord I am loyal to help me complete my redemption. Maybe you can too. Lisa Dillon said softly. Maybe. But what I want is not redemption. Julia also said softly. I just want to kill the snake cult. Then you should come with me to meet the Lord. He can even help hostile countries to deal with the snake cult. Lisa Dillon nodded towards Julia. You are a brave warrior. Anson. That doctor also look brave when facing the snake cult. I hope your lord is the same. Julia stood up with her spear in hand and looked at the bow and arrows on Risa Dillon's back. Actually, I prefer to use a crossbow. Maybe you do too? Lisa Dillon stretched out his hand towards Julia. Yes, me too. Chapter 250 Blood and Poison In fact, not only did Rasadalan himself not get lost, but his horse also couldn't get lost. It really depends on what kind of people raise what kind of horses. The Nordoma took Anson back to Bretwen a few hours later, and Anson met the Lord here again. However, Anson was stunned when he saw the corpse in the temple, because there was not a single corpse in the temple just one day ago. One day ago, Anson came to Bretwen. He came here because the people in the City of Knowledge told him that there was a snake cult's lair in Bretwen a year ago, since the Red Death was spread by the snake cult. Anson naturally wanted to visit the snake cult's lair and perhaps find clues to the cure for the Red Death. After all, things like the snake heart stone were first discovered from the snake worship cult. 
Many seemingly evil things can be used as criminal tools in the hands of people with malicious intentions. And when used in the hands of doctors, they may be able to cure diseases and save lives. And Anson has always believed that the snake worshippers may indeed be using the Red Death to select warriors. But they must also have methods to suppress the Red Death. Of course, Anson also knew that he was not suitable for going out alone because of his poor skills. It's just that Liang's troops are not in Bashi City for the time being. And before he became a real knight of the Shining Cross, Anson was unwilling to instruct the plague exterminators to do things. So he recruited some people on the spot in Bashi City. Anyway, it was just to go to nearby Bretwing to check out the former territory of the Snake Worship Cult and look for clues. It was not for combat. And there was indeed no need to take away the plague hunters who were already short of manpower. Julia, who was looking for work at the time, became Anson's temporary employee. Previously, the city of Bashi was besieged by the rebels. She was sealed in the city for several months and was eager to find a job to earn a living, coupled with the fact that Anson recruits people without checking their identity. Julia, a hidden and wanted criminal, only dares to find this kind of job. Anson was lucky. As soon as he arrived at Bretwing, he met a priest from the snake cult. In fact, Anson was not sure whether the priest was from the snake cult, because the priest was a male and only wore a green hooded cloak with a face still wearing a mask. The mask on his face does indeed look like something from the snake cult. The mask looks like a snake with wings, which is roughly what Aziz Dahaka looks like as depicted in the seminary. At that time, the priest was opening a sealed temple and brought out an unconscious patient from the temple who looked obviously infected with the Red Death. The patient looked rather terrifying. His whole body was soaked in blood. He looked like he was in the advanced stage of the Red Death. He even had snakeskin-like scales on his face. In this situation, everyone was afraid of being infected with the Red Death. As a result, most of the guards Anson recruited temporarily ran away. Except Julia. In fact, the reason why Julia did not run away was only because she had an abnormal hatred for the snake cult, and she planned to kill the snake cult priest. The priest was not very skilled. But Julia's level of fighting alone was not much higher either. During the fight, Julia's body was stained with the blood of the comatose patient but she struggled for a long time, but failed to kill the priest. Anson discovered that Julia wiped off the blood on her body and face, but there was no abnormality on her face. After a normal person is exposed to the pus and blood from the red death patient, erythema will appear on the skin within a minute or two. But Julia is obviously just a normal human being. But nothing happened. This means that the blood on the patient's body is not. It's contagious. A patient who clearly appears to be in the late stages of the red death is covered in pus and blood, but is not contagious. Moreover, the priest had directly touched the patient just now. For doctors like Anson, finding a way to suppress the spread of the Red Death is more important than anything else. Even if there is still no way to save the disease after being infected, if you can find a way to make it non-infectious, it is equivalent to finding the best way. Good medicine. So he took advantage of the priest to be entangled with Julia and sneakily rushed towards the patient. The snake cult priest seemed to be anxious when he saw Anson running towards the patient. Then the priest summoned a devoured person covered in snake skin, probably planning to kill Anson and then run away with the patient. But at this time, Anson rushed forward like the most heroic knight. The doctor who had no fighting ability actually kicked the priest over with one kick and also overturned the devoured person who was not walking steadily. Together with Julia, they dragged the patient and ran to the lake. The doctor was indeed very lucky. He found a small boat at the small dock behind the temple. It was obvious that this was the priest's boat. I don't know why Anson had such strong explosive power at that time. Maybe people's faith is indeed the most powerful weapon. People were robbed. And even the boat was robbed. The priest was probably angered. And he played a strange flute. Then Anson and Julia saw a large group of devoured ones coming from all directions. So they quickly ran away from the lake in a famous boat. However, in their panic, they took the wrong direction. So, this is probably Antonius, who was originally supposed to be lying in the temple? It seems that the corpse in the temple was resealed by the priest. It's really strange. Why did the priest have to do it in this temple? What about these things? Leon was keenly aware of the anomaly. If this was a ritual, wouldn't it be possible to perform it somewhere else? What exactly is this ritual for? Sir, I remember that the mysterious man said that these are 999 corpses and one divinely chosen warrior. It should be rare to see such a number of evil rituals. Miss Luciana, 
The daughter of Governor Justice, maybe you know that it is said that Miss Luciana has read all the books that can be found in the entire city of Erudition. It was Sigismund who spoke. It seemed that he had heard rumors about Luciana during the Gladiator Rebellion in Bacchus. But apparently he still didn't know that Alina was Luciana. The problem is, Luciana is not in the city of knowledge. Her name is Alina now. And she is in Dillonport with justice. How about you and Close go to bring Alina back? Close? By the way, take care of the armored ship you left in Dillonport. You can go to Dillonport and rent a dock in the name of Silver Hand. Leon really intends to find out the meaning of this ritual, which may lead to the truth about the Red Death. Anson was currently treating patients on the spot in Bretwing Village. This patient must indeed be Antonius. Anyway, he looks very similar to Governor Kairos. He is not dead nor has he become something like a devoured person. He still has breathing and heartbeat, but it is very weak. But think about what happened to him. To be able to survive until now after being tortured is considered to be a very tough life. Anson, are you sure his red death is really not contagious? Since the Nolder elves and female soldiers were sent out to search for Ansem and have not returned yet, Liang is currently surrounded by either rude gladiators or macho men who have no knowledge of medical and health knowledge. In the end, the only thing that can be done to Ansem is the person who was the assistant turned out to be Liang himself. Although the Lord never thought that one day he would work part-time as a nurse. He was willing to do some hard work in order to find a way to control the Red Death. Perhaps, this is the reason why a kind-hearted and soft-hearted person like Ansem has always been devoted to the cruel Lord. I'm sure, sir. Otherwise, I would have been infected by now. He should be anesthetized by Snake Heartstone now but I'm afraid it will be difficult to wake him up. He is too weak. I can confirm that he is infected the Red Death was poisoned at the same time. And this poison may be able to inhibit the spread of the Red Death. It can even suppress the Red Death and prevent its body from festering. I don't know what this poison is now. But now that I know I can always find out the reason. Anson had never rested. But he was still full of energy. He kept wandering around the patient using various medical tools to extract blood and broken skin fragments from the patient, and refused to stop for a moment. This place is not suitable for research. Perhaps we should take him to Knowledge City or Kalen Deer Keep, Leon said hesitantly. But he felt that this patient probably couldn't stand the torture anymore and might die at any time. Then, he will probably die on the road. Sir, we have to keep him alive until we find out what kind of poison he had. Anson raised his eyes and shook his head seriously. Okay, you are a doctor. You have the final say. However, if he can't be saved, you can't be sure what kind of poison he was poisoned. Right? We have to find a way to add some water to him and let him wake up. Come here. Otherwise, I think he may never wake up. Leon took out a long hollow needle from Anson's medicine box, looked at it carefully, and then began to clean it. This should be a long hollow needle used to balance chest pressure. It is two millimeters thick, but one and a half feet long. This is a common situation after severe trauma to the chest and abdomen. This hollow needle must be used to relieve pressure in the chest cavity when necessary. This kind of hollow silver needle is worth a lot of money. And only high-level doctors like Anson have this kind of equipment. Anson maintained these instruments very well. In this era, Anson was considered one of the most hygienic people. And the needles were kept clean. Sir, you are right. But if you want to give him water, you should insert a gastric tube which is a needle to treat pneumothorax. Anson looked up and agreed with Liang's decision. He also felt that the patient really needed to be hydrated. If he could wake the person up, he could at least determine the composition of the poison through consultation. No, I think we should try this. The way he is now, watering him may not be of any use. Leon took out two round ones from his saddlebag. Fruit. That is coconut. The most reassuring fruit in this era. Bar none. Most of the southern part of the Bacchus Empire is a low-altitude hot and humid area with plenty of sunshine. Coconut trees grow everywhere. Leon's troops previously obtained a lot of coconuts in Fighting Village. Any army will pay great attention to obtaining reliable food and water along the way. And as the supreme leader of the army, there will naturally be someone who prepares this most reliable backup material for the Lord. He had been bled before and had not been rehydrated. So he had to be given an infusion. That is... Coconut water was introduced into his blood. Leong made two gestures with the needle and then began to burn the long hollow needle repeatedly on the fire. You mean, pour coconut water into his veins? Anson looked at Liang's movements hesitantly. Can fruits also replenish blood? 
Of course other fruits can't do it. But coconut can. Of course. It can only be used in emergencies. Coconut is not plasma after all. Leon said with certainty. Although Anson's medical skills are already considered to be quite advanced in Pinder. He can understand that weak people need to quickly replenish nutrients. And he can also understand that directly inserting blood vessels is the fastest way. But he obviously does not understand coconut oil. Something like water can actually enter the blood vessels. But fresh, unopened coconut water can indeed be used as a substitute for sterile plasma and glucose solutions in emergencies. Since there was no reliable catheter, Leon directly used the long needle to complete the connection between the coconut and the patient. His hand was relatively stable and he inserted it into the vein in the crook of the patient's arm in only three attempts, and then asked Anson to take it. He made a net bag and hung the patient's arms and coconuts above his head. Although Anson didn't understand it very well, he knew that the Lord would not mess around at this time. Just like when he first treated Eric. Eric was exhausted, but the Lord told him not to give up, and he was really saved. Of course, this time is different from saving Eric. This time, Neither Leong nor Anson expected to completely restore Antonius to health. They just wanted to keep Antonius awake for a period of time. Sir, do you think? Can people transfuse blood with each other like this? In the past, my teacher also tried to transfuse the blood of another death row prisoner into an injured person who had lost too much blood. But the injured person still died in the end. Anson looked at the coconut and said, Of course blood can be transfused between people. But each person's blood is different. Injecting mismatched blood is equivalent to injecting poison, which will lead to death. And we currently cannot distinguish the type of blood. If it is a sibling of the same mother, brothers, we should be able to transfuse each other's blood. Leon popularized common sense to Anson that could not be discovered in this age without microscopes. Blood transfusion. Red death. Injecting mismatched blood is equivalent to injecting poison. My lord, do you think the blood of the Nolder is poison to humans? By the way, I remember you said before. Wu King Eric once tried to find the blood of an older noble maiden. Anson muttered to himself for a while. And then suddenly mentioned what happened half a year ago. Leon was stunned for a moment. That's right. The Nolder elves will not be infected with the Red Death. He is looking for an older noble girl. Probably for stronger magic power. An older noble girl like Wendy has purple eyes. Which obviously means magic power. And Rissa Dillon also said that magic power may be life force. Anson looked at Leon, and his words became smoother and smoother. Sir, do you think the king wanted to transfuse the blood of Noodua's daughter into his own body? The madness inherited in their family, dot is it really madness? Anson dot you are a genius. Leon's eyes suddenly lit up, and he looked at Antonius, who was still unconscious. Maybe, he was not poisoned, but was injected with the blood of elves. Chapter 251 Goddess's Reward Soon after, Antonius regained his vital signs. His breathing and heartbeat were much stronger, and the coconut water finally had some effect. But he still didn't wake up, and Anson couldn't wake him up with cross worms. In fact, after Anson removed the anesthetic effect of the snake heart stone from Antonius, Antonius almost died. The reason he didn't wake up was not because of Anson's lack of medical skills, but because he was suffering from severe pain. It should be due to the body's self-protection that he remained comatose. But even in a coma, it was still clear that Antonius was enduring unimaginable torture. His teeth were clenched, and he was breathing like a wounded beast. He kept making slight hissing sounds, and his body was shaking instinctively. Just looking at it made people feel uncomfortable. Anson and Leon have both seen this situation. Patients in the late stage of the Red Death react this way. The severe pain will make people still tremble in a coma. The only difference is probably that Antonius's skin does not seem to continue to fester. Fortunately, Leon still has a snake heart stone in his hand. The one he got from Rasadalin was given to Mirgon Killik. And the snake heart stone he got from the doom inducing person in the camp of the three prophets is still with Leon. Only the snake heart stone can restore the painful Antonius to a state of minimal consumption. It seems that the person who used the snake heart stone on Antonius was actually trying to save him. Obviously, I am afraid that I will not be able to communicate normally with Antonius in a short time. At the moment, he can only be regarded as a semi-vegetative state. Anson was helpless in the face of this situation. He could only wrap up Antonius' whole body and apply some ointment to try to treat his broken and pus-filled skin. Although Antonius' condition has not deteriorated, it seems that his life can be saved. But unable to wake him up to communicate with him, we can only rely on guessing. Just in time, Lisa Dillon came back with Julia. 
in order to verify his idea. Liang took Lisa Dillon to Bashi City to find a red death patient who was about to die of illness and conducted a cruel human experiment. The main reason is to try to see if the red death can be suppressed with the blood of the Nolder. As a warrior, the Nolder did not refuse to shed a little blood, not to mention trying to save people. But this experiment failed. The patient had no reaction after being injected with Resadron's blood and died of the red death one day later. Perhaps, it is not a bad thing that this attempt failed. If it is determined that the blood of the Nolder is the life-saving medicine for mankind, then the consequences may be more serious than the Red Death itself. And it is likely to have serious consequences that are extremely twisted and perverted. However, although this human experiment was unsuccessful, an episode after the experiment led to another breakthrough in the study of the Red Death. This experiment was conducted in an isolation area blocked by the exterminators. The isolation area was full of confirmed Red Death patients. When Leon determined that the experiment had failed and left the quarantine area on horseback, he and Lisa Dillon were attacked by several guys infected with the Red Death. The attacking patients recognized Rosadalin as a Nolder, and they claimed that the Red Death was brought by the Nolder. The Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet had long maintained this. And indeed the Nolder were not they can catch diseases. So many people think that the Red Death was caused by the Nolder. Although the attack quickly ended with sword slashing the desperate patients to death, Leong and his party were all greatly affected. Leon, Lisa Dillon, Julia, and the two accompanying horses were all stained with the blood of those guys. One of the horses is Liang's horse Alice. Leon and Lisa Dillon were not affected by a little blood on their bodies. But not Julia and Alice. Although Alice is smart. She is just a horse after all. She does not know how to protect herself from viral infections. Moreover, horses cannot wear pants and shoes. There is a lot of blood on her body from the Red Death. As Lisa Dillon's newly recruited bodyguard. Julia followed the Lord and Risa Dillon to Bashi City to complete the experiment. Although she had relatively complete protection, she was unable to kill the enemy during the battle. When attacking an enemy behind Liang, her hands were still soaked in blood. There was nothing that could be done about it. No one expected that the Red Death would launch a sneak attack. Lisa Dillon almost planned to cut off Julia's hand in order to save her life. Fortunately, his sword had just cut down the enemy and was covered in blood so he did not strike. Of course, a sword covered in poisonous blood cannot be used to accomplish the feat of a strong man breaking off his wrist. But a few minutes later, Julia said that there was no problem at all. The fact was that her body showed no symptoms at all, and she was still not infected. Lisa Dillon had indeed seen people who survived after being infected with the Red Death. But Julia's situation was completely different, which was equivalent to not being infected at all. In other words, Julia is a human without elven blood but she is still completely immune to the Red Death. On the contrary, Alice showed obvious symptoms. Red spots appeared on the blood-stained horse's butt, and then she began to lose hair and develop sores. A few hours later, many abscesses appeared on Alice's buttocks. When the sores ruptured, pus and blood would flow out. Poor Alice kept whining in Liang's arms. However, Alice has always been raised to be fat and strong, so her resistance is probably very good and it seems that her condition has not deteriorated rapidly. Sir, what should I do? Alice is like this. Hearing that something happened to Alice, Windife rushed over. She was usually very nice to Alice, although Alice had always been reluctant to talk to her because she was scared by grenades. I wonder if it will recover after drinking my blood. Leon was almost in tears. He was making famous gestures on his wrist with a knife, intending to draw some blood to test whether he was immune to the Red Death. After making two gestures, he turned his head and looked into Wendy's eyes, probably thinking that Wendy's blood might be more curative. However, after a few glances, he finally gave up on this unreliable idea, and he was equally reluctant to let Wendy bleed her. So he turned around and still looked for the angle of the knife on his arm. Alice rescued him several times and followed him on his expeditions to the north and south. The storms came and went. Unexpectedly, an accident happened to such a low-class enemy. The Lord was now going crazy with anxiety. After all, Leon is also a human being. When Alice is in danger, people like him will inevitably encounter times when their IQ temporarily drops. This is impossible! Sir, blood transfusion is useless. Let alone drinking blood. Don't mess around. I don't want to treat your injuries. Anson snatched the trembling knife from Liang's hand and threw it aside. However, although Anson is a doctor, he is not a veterinarian. He cannot cure horses. Besides, 
he still hasn't found a suitable solution for the Red Death. But I can't kill it. Can I? It will be contagious. My poor Alice. Leon also knew that the idea of bloodletting was probably unreliable. But he was anxious. He had no choice but to hold Alice's huge head and stroke the horse's neck to comfort her. Sir, I don't think there's anything wrong with Alice that it seems like her, but is about to get scabbed. Wendy observed closely for a while, and suddenly said, I don't think Alice's screams are very painful now. She used to jump around when she was in pain or frightened. Now this kind of scream seems like hungry. Um, the Lord took a half step back, held Alice's head, and looked left and right, then stretched his neck to look at the horse's ass. Alice licked Leon's face twice, whimpered twice, and began to nudge his hand with her nose. Eh, yeah, Alice, are you okay? The Lord always feeds the horses with his own hands. So of course he knows what it means when Alice holds his hand. It means he is really hungry. The horses but has indeed begun to scab. And Alice also wants to eat. So it is obviously not a big problem. Horses are indeed better at resisting the Red Death than humans. And they can also withstand the Red Death. Now that Alice was fine. The Lord's IQ regained the high ground. He looked at the small scars on Alice's butt for a moment. Then kissed Alice fiercely and screamed in excitement. Anson! Anson! I may have found a way to deal with the Red Death. Leon felt that he should have thought of it a long time ago. But because he had been disturbed by ideas such as cults, magic, and witchcraft, he had not considered the scientific approach that he should have considered. Julia is a normal human being who has had no interaction with elves or other races for several lifetimes. But now she has no reaction to the Red Death. Why is this? The only difference between her and other humans is probably that her hands were once stained with Antonius' poisonous blood. Right? Anyway, that's what the Lord guessed. In order to verify this guess, Anson tried it with his own hands. This experiment can only be tried on healthy people. People who are inherently immune like the Lord are definitely not able to do the experiment. But those who have been contaminated with Antonius's blood, there are only so many people. So Anson decided to go on his own. For this reason, he tied his wrists tightly, so that the blood could not flow temporarily. He also specifically told the Lord that if there was anything wrong, he would immediately cut off his hand. If there are signs of infection, you may be able to save your life as long as you cut off the hand quickly enough so that the poisonous blood does not have time to flow to other parts of the body. But this time, the experiment was successful. Anson waited until his hands turned purple and swollen due to lack of blood circulation, but still did not show any symptoms of the Red Death. I probably understand. Antonius is the antidote. His blood is the vaccine. The Red Death virus in his body has lost its activity. But it can stimulate the body's immune system to resist the Red Death virus. The Lord spoke excitedly in words that no one could understand. But his expression was unusually exciting. Anson, I know how to control the Red Death. Sir, are you planning to use that Antonius? His. He already lost a lot of blood. If everyone is infected with his blood, isn't it a bit too cruel? Although Anson didn't know what smallpox was, and he didn't understand words like immune system, he still understood the meaning of the Lord's words. No! Anson, I haven't reached that point of complete inhumanity. Alice has also been infected with the Red Death. But a strong war horse like Alice will not die from the Red Death. The Red Death, the disease, is very similar to smallpox. A vaccine can be made from large sized cows or horses. I should have thought of it earlier, but I have been thinking about magic and magic being stained with Antonius's blood but not contagious. This situation just reminded Leon that what really prompted him to think of a solution was the acne that appeared after Alice contracted the Red Death. Leon finally found a way to deal with the Red Death by inoculating pox using the method used by humans in another world to control smallpox. However, he used horses instead of oxen. They used those larger horses to actively infect the Red Death and then extracted bodily fluids from the scabbed horses and dripped them onto people. The main reason why he didn't use oxen was because he had more horses. For reinforcements going south this time, he brought more than 2,000 horses. Although the blood on Antonius' body can also have the same vaccine effect. After all, he is a living person, and there is not much blood on his body. Jocelyn's God of War Beast was recruited to serve as the first batch of vaccination carriers. The big guy was more resistant. The only impact of the Red Death on it was a few small mosquito-like bumps on the horse's body. The first human to try horse box was also Jocelyn. The former Twilight Knight has a more adventurous spirit and is quite active in things that can benefit all mankind. According to his own words, 
He believes that this can atone for the not-so-kind things he has done in the past. After being inoculated with horse box, Jocelyn developed some minor sores on her skin and had a low fever all night. The next day, the sores on my skin scabbed. The fever went away, and I felt completely fine. Then he tried to touch the blood of the Red Death patient in Anson's way. They succeeded. Horse box does make people immune to Red Death. The Lord has probably accumulated unimaginable merit this time. And countless people will be protected from the Red Death if this method of vaccination can be quickly promoted. Speaking of quick promotions, that's where Amy and Sarah come into play. The beautiful princess knights are very popular even in Bacchus. In places such as Bashi City and Karen Deer Castle, Amy's team is even more popular than the Knights of the Shining Cross. Although they did not contribute much in controlling the Red Death. In terms of promoting horse box, all the troops under Leon's command plus Creon's plague hunters, thousands of people, may not be as good as any of Amy's troops' squad. No matter where you are, most people are determined by appearance. With an all-female army, coupled with Sarah's affinity and persuasion, Amy and her griffin claws easily convinced all the surrounding lords and tribunes to not only use horse box to create a vaccine, he quickly passed it on and helped the lord change his reputation. The name Leon quickly changed from a child-eating demon to a messenger of the goddess of Order Eunomia around the city of knowledge and Colin Deer Castle. Sarah was smart enough not to mention Demaya, the goddess of protection and harvest. After all, Leon is the lord of the fierce lion realm. Perhaps Amy and Sarah's publicity effect was better. And Leon soon heard about this merit with his own ears. Just after the effect of horse box was quickly spread, a very familiar female voice appeared in Liang's ears. Or in other words, appeared in his mind. Well done, kid. But beware. A more sinister enemy is peering into our territory. This is the voice of Eunomia, the goddess of order. The gentle female voice that originally told Liang to be careful behind him. At the same time as this voice came, there was also a reward. This reward came very obviously. Not only Leon, but almost all his partners found that they seemed to become stronger at the same time. Several other people thought that this was the physical manifestation of immunity to the Red Death. They thought that vaccination might make people stronger. So they spread the theory of the vaccine. But Leon knew that this was the encouragement given to people like him by the goddess of order. And this was also the first time he truly experienced the actual role of the goddess. Your iron bone skill has been improved. Currently level 10 inch. Your first aid skill has been improved. Currently level 5 inch. This was a long lost system reminder. If he hadn't found a way to prevent the red death this time, Leon would have almost forgotten that he even had a system. Iron Bone was directly upgraded by two levels to the highest level, while first aid was directly upgraded by four levels. This is probably because of Antonius. Your teammates' skills have been improved. You can check your teammates' skills. The names of several teammates lit up at the same time. What Anson has improved is healing, which is currently at level 9. It seems that treating diseases has also been classified as a healing skill. And finding a solution to the Red Death is obviously extremely important to the goddess. And the increase is not small. Anson's Iron Bone has also increased. But it is still only level 2. And his foundation is really poor. Jocelyn and Julia have both upgraded their Iron Bones. And are currently at levels 9 and 6 respectively. Amy and Sarah did not improve their Iron Bones. They mainly improved their persuasiveness. And Amy also improved their command. It seems that the goddess is very fair. And whatever she does will improve her. Of course, Amy's command is not high. Only level 4. But her persuasiveness is level 7. And Sarah now has level 9 persuasion. It is obvious that the way they spread Eunomia's faith probably received extra care from the goddess. Liang's own improved attributes are not many. But these improvements are unexpected gains. Which are always a big surprise. And as long as everyone involved in this matter basically improves. The goddess does seem to be fair. It's just that Rasadalin's blood was drawn, but he didn't get any benefits. Probably because the Nolder Elves were not under the control of the Goddess of Order. In fact, the Lord thinks that Alice should also receive a reward. But Liang's system is incomplete. The horse has no panel data. And no changes can be seen for the time being. Liang thinks that the Goddess may not use her divine power on the horse. In fact, the Lord is more concerned about the words of the Goddess Eunomia than improving his skills. A more evil enemy. And our territory. Chapter 252 The Bud Determines the Head The Lord still doesn't know who the more evil enemy is. But he felt that what the goddess said about our territory had something else to it. Us? The goddess of order can use this word. 
Does this mean that she plans to have a relationship with me? So, the messenger of the goddess of order, boasted by Amy and Sarah has been recognized by the goddess herself? The lord suddenly felt like he had become a magician. After all, the title, messenger of a certain goddess, usually appeared in cults. But at the same time, Yunomiya's words also meant great danger. After all, in the territory occupied by Leon, what the goddess can call our territory is actually the eastern part of the Lion Kingdom. That is, the large area from Chang'e Town to White Deer Castle. This is basically telling Leon clearly that there is a terrible heretic who plans to cause trouble in Liang's territory. The goddess's clear warning must be taken seriously. Therefore, Leon did not delay any longer in the Bacchus Empire. He directly appointed Anson as the temporary consul of Karen Deer Castle and asked Jocelyn to help Anson manage military affairs. Then he led his troops back to Chang'e Town. The reason why Anson was asked to take charge of Cullen Deer Castle was mainly because Anson also had to manage the prevention of the Red Death here. Although there is a vaccine, there is still no cure if people are infected before they are vaccinated. And it will take a long time for people in the Lion Realm to be generally vaccinated. During this period, we must pay more attention to the prevention and control of the Red Death and not relax for a moment. As the doctor who knows the most and is best at identifying infected people, Anson must stay in Karen Castle to continue preparing for the prevention and control center and establish multiple border checkpoints on the border between the two countries. Before the vaccine became widespread in Leon's territory, he had to ensure that the Red Death in Bacchus would not be spread to the north of Karen Deer Castle. There are now more than 10,000 people around Karen Deer Castle. But fortunately, these people are basically all former slave rebels. And most of them are strong men. The Lord is kind to these people not only giving them a way to survive, but also giving them food. So they are actually easy to manage. And they are also very cooperative with Anson's series of projects to build checkpoints. Amy brought most of the villagers in Fighting Village to Shield Wind Fortress, and Leon gave her a task to rebuild Shield Wind Fortress. Speaking of which, Shield Wind Fortress was originally burned down by Amy. Now that it is being rebuilt by Amy, it can be considered a kind of fate. Occupying these two sites was actually Liang's plan from the beginning and it was also a condition discussed with Alina before. At that time, Alina was holding the flag of Emperor Marius, representing the Emperor Marius himself. The conditions confirmed with Alina were naturally equivalent to the recognition of the Bacchus Empire, which was considered a transaction for the Lion Kingdom. This means that Liang captured the frontier territory of the Bacchus Empire and expanded its territory for hundreds of miles, giving the Kingdom of Lion a dominant position in the face of the Bacchus Empire. Not only that, they also deployed heavy troops at two strategic locations, always threatening the Bacchus Empire. This attitude is a must. Emperor Marius naturally did not really regard Leon as a life-and-death enemy. He also needed to recuperate and would not provoke a war during this period. The border was expected to maintain peace for a long time. As for the Lion Kingdom, everyone from the king to the lords must have nothing to say about Liang's contribution. Leon conquered these territories alone and did not let anyone reinforce them. Naturally, they had no reason to intervene in these new territories obtained by Liang. They could only praise the kingdom for having a more powerful general than Count Odin. And in order to ensure that Leon could withstand the possible counterattack of the Bacchus Empire, the kings and lords of the Lion Kingdom would not come to trouble Leon at this time. Otherwise, Ulrika himself would not be happy if the good situation was ruined. Therefore, the lord will say that he is a loyal minister and good general of the kingdom as long as the king is not stupid. He will not deal with him at this time. Moreover, maybe he will be made the marshal. If he wants to fight Bacchus, he must launch an attack from Liang's territory. In this case, it would be unreasonable not to let Liang be the marshal. However, the war between the Lord and the Snake Cult in the Bacchus territory did not actually reach the Lion territory. In these days, there are no telephones, internet, or even newspapers. Any news that appears depends on word of mouth, which is very inefficient. Moreover, people who know these things are very busy now and have no time to spread the praises of the Lord's great achievements in the Lion Realm. Most of the villagers in Fighting Village are engaged in civil engineering and real estate construction in the sterile place of Shieldwind Fortress. That place is hundreds of miles away from any village or town. And there is really no place to find anyone to brag about. Sarah has been spreading propaganda everywhere, but she is mainly spreading horse box. Popularizing the Red Death vaccine is her current main task. The fact that the Lord buried the Snake Cult army was spread near the city of Bashi. Comparatively divine. 
Some people say that Count Leon can use ancient magic power to shake the sky and earth apart with a wave of his hand. Cause landslides by simply stamping his feet. Swallow clouds and mist. And swallow tens of thousands of the snake cult's army with just one mouthful. They even speculated that Leon was a Sindarin elf because it was said that the Lord brought a force composed of Nolder elves. I don't know who made this statement. But to be honest, this statement is indeed very close to the truth. Therefore, the current Lord has become the biggest enemy of the entire Bacchus Empire, both in terms of reputation and actual territory. In other words, a large part of the opponents, the Bacchus, who hate the snake worship cult, do not regard Leong as an enemy. But they also understand that there is no friendship between countries. Leong is the lord of the Lion Kingdom, and he can only be opponent. Emperor Marius also publicly stated in Siyuan City, with a terrible opponent like Leon peeking at the border of the empire, all Bacchus must unite and rebuild the empire into the strongest country in the shortest possible time. As a result, the Lord became the source of motivation for the reconstruction of the entire Bacchus Empire, and also became the shield of Emperor Marius. Even the fact that he once gave up Siyuan City was not mentioned by anyone. Facing a terrible opponent like Leon, the Bacchus people did we are actually much more united than before. At the end of February in the 356th year of Pan Delhi's reign, Leon returned to Chang'e Town. During the Lord's absence, places such as Chang'e Town and White Deer Castle have gradually become stable and prosperous. Today's Chang'e Town not only has no voice against Leong, but even the bandits have basically disappeared. This stable and peaceful situation is of course closely related to the fact that the Lord used Father to get rid of most of the people with ulterior motives at once. When no one in the territory is holding things back behind the scenes, and everyone is focused on making money and cultivating land for construction, the local public security will naturally appear to be much better than other places. In fact, the larger the population, the better. The larger the population that obeys management, the better. It is not without reason that the goddess of order calls Liang's territory, our territory. Chungha town is now very orderly, because all the unruly people have been killed by father. And even those who failed to pay back the money, and the beggars, who were unwilling to work were expelled by Eric. Expelling those who cause trouble is naturally to obtain more available people. If a territory is in good order and the security is excellent, there will always be many people who are willing to obey the management and move there. During this winter, many people moved to Chang'e town from all over the country. Ponde Bank's lending business also gradually became popular during this period. Leslie had been worried before. She was afraid that the bank had taken in too many deposits, but could not lend them out. This might cause the bank to be overwhelmed by deposit interest, and eventually cause a run and make the Lord bankrupt. But in fact, except for 20% of the bank's savings funds, all the other money has been loaned out. In addition to the forced loans during the previous tax period, most of these loans were actually borrowed by civilians and businessmen who moved to Chang'e town. People who have just moved here are always short of money. It is better to borrow money from a bank than to borrow money from usury privately. Compared with the loan sharking rate among private individuals these days, the loan interest rate upon a bank is simply a gift from God. The monthly interest rate is 2 cents, and the monthly interest rate is simply a gift from God. The difference between 50% and 50%. Moreover, most of the time, when people seek loans from banks, they do not do so in the conventional way of borrowing money. For example, Anson issued the largest loan in Cullen Deer Castle, but it did not use currencies such as dinars at all. And it was before the Lord opened a branch of Penn Bank to Cullen Deer Castle. When the Lord returned to his territory, he left the first batch of horses used for horse pox at Karen Deer Castle. Although most horses will not die from the Red Death, they will eventually become weak for a period of time if they contract the disease. Alice was an extremely strong war horse, and she was still too weak to ride for two days. Only Jocelyn's huge war beast was alive and kicking from start to finish. After the horse box vaccine was spread in Bashi City and Cullen Deer Castle, General Creon recalled the main force of the Knights of the Shining Cross as quickly as possible, intending to quickly organize a horse box vaccine in Bashi City. Dillon Port and other places. Production of vaccines. However, there was a shortage of horses near the city of Urshi. So General Creon went to Cullen Deer Castle, intending to buy 300 horses from Anson. In other words, he originally wanted to borrow 300 horses. The horses left at Karen Deer Castle were in the recovery period after vaccination. That is, when the horse box was scabbing, which was the most suitable time to serve as vaccine carriers. And the vaccine from these horses has been confirmed. It is safe for human body. 
The Bacchus Empire has always been short of large livestock such as cattle and horses. The Bacchus Empire has no land to raise horses. The only large pasture in the country is under the high mountains in the southeast of the Bacchus Empire, which is a few hundred miles east of the village of Fighting. Deep. But that is not grassland. But wetland meadow. Suitable only for raising pigs. Most of the soldiers in Bacchus's main army are infantry. This is not because they don't like riding horses or have no tradition of knights. It's just because they really lack horses. Only elite guards such as Shadow Centurions, Iron Ring Centurions, and Imperial Knights are eligible to use horses. Because they were originally Centurion-level leaders and low-level military attaches before Emperor Marius initiated reforms. The price of horses in Bacchus is more than three times that in the Lion Kingdom. Therefore, 300 horses is actually a lot of money for the Bacchus. In dinars, it is about 400,000. General Creon was a poor man. So of course, he couldn't afford so much money to buy it. So he originally planned to borrow it. To be honest, Creon was indeed a cunning general. As soon as the lord left Cullen Deer Castle, he came to Anson for credit. It was obvious that he felt that Anson, an honest boy, was easier to deal with than the lord. But Creon probably didn't expect that the but often determines the head. If he really talked to Leong himself, he might actually be able to borrow it. And Leong probably wouldn't ask him for money. After all, the Lord does not care about interests when facing the Red Death. In Liang's eyes, the prevention and control of highly infectious diseases does not respect national boundaries. But Leong just left. And now Anson is the acting consul. And Anson is not the owner of these horses. The owner of the horses is Leong Anson also knew that once he lent it, he might not be able to get it back. As a consul, he could not let the Lord suffer losses. So General Creon had no choice but to do it in the name of buying. He knew that a kind-hearted person like Anson would definitely be willing to sell, as long as Leon would not suffer a loss. But because he had no money, General Creon proposed a credit. Emperor Marius would definitely repay the money anyway. And His Majesty the Emperor's credit was still very good. To be honest, Creon probably still had the idea of purchasing it for zero dollars. Anyway, Leon is now nominally an enemy. And taking away hundreds of horses can be regarded as dealing with the enemy. However, Creon probably did not expect that as a conscientious doctor. Anson would of course be willing to provide any support he could provide for free in controlling the Red Death. But as a consul, Anson quickly learned to change his mind and bargain. Perhaps this has something to do with the Lord's words and deeds. When he first met Anson, Anson protected Leslie with a group of tough men for a week without taking any money. So the Lord kept reminding Anson that it was not okay to not charge money. The style of the Knights of the Shining Cross. So now, as a reserve knight, who is always ready to join the Knights of the Radiant Cross, Anson has gradually learned that the necessary conditions for being a Knight of the Radiant Cross require money. And it is quite expensive. 300 horses. Each horse was priced at 1,500 dinars by Anson. Together with the corresponding labor and technical guidance. The total price was 500,000 dinars. Then Anson himself acted as the millman and approved Ponde for General Creon. The first credit loan from a bank. And the loan was required to be made on the credit of Emperor Marius. I don't know if this is considered a national debt. But General Creon readily agreed. In his opinion, this is no different from a credit account. For this reason, Creon specially brought Alina to sign the loan. Alina had just been brought back from Port Dillon by Sigismund and was investigating the weird rituals of the 999 people. At this time, Alina was still the envoy of Emperor Marius. She had not seen Emperor Marius since she left the UN city. Naturally, her status as special envoy was not taken back. Looking for a loan from the Lord of the Lion Kingdom was considered a diplomatic matter, and Alina could make decisions on these matters on behalf of Emperor Marius. In order to control the Red Death, Alina, like General Creon, naturally did not care how much money it cost. So Emperor Marius, who was far away in Siyuan City, received a large debt bill. Although His Majesty the Emperor thinks this loan is a good deal. The problem is that this kind of operation makes him very uneasy. This loan is only 500,000 yuan. The Red Death vaccine needs to be popularized by the whole people. If this continues, all bucks will how much does it cost to vaccinate people in this country? For the first time, Emperor Marius felt that his country might go bankrupt before it had time to rebuild. Of course we can't continue doing this kind of thing. Emperor Marius was very clear-headed. He felt that it was certainly necessary to obtain horses to make the Red Death vaccine. But there was no need to buy horses if there was a shortage of horses. 
Aren't there a lot of horses in the Duchy of Dexia next door? In addition, Governor Kairos chased the monster in the temple all the way to the Dexia border. Due to the previous civil unrest, many illegal armed forces were also roaming around the border. This is also a hidden danger and needs to be addressed. So the flexible-minded Emperor Marius sent someone to kill the chief culprit of heresy in the name of eliminating the heresy. It's urgent to catch the worms and save them. The Shadow Wolves under General Sulla secretly followed the group of illegal armed forces into the territory of Dexia. Following behind the illegal armed forces to capture the horses of the Dexia people. Chapter 253 Support the troops and respect themselves. To be honest, Emperor Marius was a gambler. Because what he did was actually equivalent to sending out all the trusted troops in his hands again. Currently, the only ones left in Siyuan City are a small half of the Immortal Legion that have been disabled in the continuous battles. If it were not for the purpose of clearing out the remaining rebels around Siyuan City and maintaining the security of Siyuan City, I am afraid that the Immortal Legion would have been sent out by Marius. Therefore, Emperor Marius appointed General Agathon as marshal and asked General Agathon, whose army was also disabled, to go to Layla Fortress to reorganize the manpower. Agathon had been driven away by Marius to find justice, but he was looking for him in the wrong place. He thought that justice was in the city of Bochi. General Creon had previously controlled the Red Death in the city of Knowledge. In order to give Creon more space, justice would not be constrained. So he went to Imperial Port and never came back. The reserve troops of the Immortal Legion, the Imperial Mortal Guards, also followed Governor Justice in rebuilding Imperial Port. But Agathon went to the right place when he went to Bashi City. Not long after he arrived at Bashi City, Emperor Marius was relieved by Leon at Brexwing. Therefore, General Agathon naturally did not need to go to Dillon Port to find justice, but returned to Emperor Marius again. Emperor Marius asked Agathon to go to Layla Fortress because Layla Fortress was originally the residence of General Agathon. However, the rebels had already approached Siyuan City at that time. The rebels lost control in Bashi City, and the snake worshippers besieged Yilin Gang. At this time, there was no point in holding on to Layla Fortress. The enemies all emerged from the hinterland. Therefore, Emperor Marius transferred Agathon back, abandoned Layla Fortress, and allowed Agathon to regain Malisburg, which was a more important hub at the time thus quickly reconnecting the three major cities. But now that the domestic war has subsided, Emperor Marius has set his sights on the Principality of Dexia, and Layla Fortress naturally becomes more important at this time. Besides, Layla Fortress was controlled by Kairos a few days ago. Although Kairos is now focused on pursuing the snake cult, his current state cannot reassure Emperor Marius. In order to prevent Kairos from becoming the second Shira uses, Emperor Marius replaced the Marshal with Agathon and sent him back to Layla Fortress. Unlike the Chicha Fortress in the Lion Kingdom, Layla Fortress is not a border fortress directly facing the enemy, but a connecting hub between various military and political important places. 300 miles to the east of the fortress is Buji City, the cultural center. 400 miles to the south is Siyuan City, the capital and political center. More than 200 miles to the north is the Sava River Fort, which is at war with the Lion Kingdom all the year round. And about 400 miles to the west is the city of Siyuan the capital and political center, the border of the Principality of Dexia. The Bacchus Empire had two such hubs. One was Malisburg, which Emperor Marius had asked General Agathon to recapture, and the other was Layla Fortress. Such hubs usually stock up on heavy troops. Because if there is a problem anywhere in the surrounding areas, reinforcements can be sent from Malisburg or Layla Fortress. At the same time, logistical supplies and various materials must also be transferred through it. In fact, in the entire Pender continent, only the Bacchus Empire has such a transit hub. On the one hand, this is due to the different military systems. The various legions of the Bacchus Empire are essentially dispatched by the state and are not the private troops of local lords. In order to prevent the border lords from taking advantage of the emperor to support their own troops from afar, causing the country's legions to gradually become the lord's private soldiers, it is necessary to build a midway fortress to keep a close eye on them. Usually, the person in charge of the Layla Fortress is the most senior emperor of the past dynasties. A trusted general. This is not to distrust the border lords. After all, it is related to national security. In fact, even if this is done, problems will still arise. Shira uses his rebels actually bought the country's legions into his own followers in various ways. On the other hand, it was mainly because the Bacchus Empire lacked horses. Since Siyuan City is located on the southern coast, 
It is far away from places like Saba River Fort in the north. However, the number of domestic cavalry and carriages is relatively small, and the efficiency of transportation and rescue is not high enough. Naturally, this kind of military transfer center is needed to shorten the distance of reinforcements to avoid being cut off in various important areas. Just like not long ago, due to the fall of the hub town of Malisburg, the connecting channel between Siu and City, Bashi City, and Dillonport was lost, and the Bacchus Empire was directly cut into two halves. Agathon's prestige in the army is indeed very high, and now he has the status of marshal. After he returned to Layla Fortress, there were no problems with the garrison of the fortress. Even though many of these armies belonged to the Shadow Legion and had been originally commanded by Kairos, Agathon, who was also from the Shadow Legion, still easily took over them and reorganized them in a very short time. But a serious situation occurred in the Sava Fort in the north. To be precise, a war broke out again in Sava Fort at a time when war should not be provoked at all. The Lord of Sava River Fort is General Titus. But this general was sent to the Amara continent by Emperor Marius early in the morning. And the situation at that time indeed made it impossible to send another person to manage Sava River Fort. The rebels of Shiryuzas have been persistently besieging Siyuan City, and have not gone to Sava River Fort. This resulted in the Sava Fort being left unattended for a long time. And there were not even enough troops stationed there. In this case, the Kingdom of Lysher and the Principality of Dexia would naturally pursue this place. The reason why King Ulrich did not respond to Alina's request for help was because his troops had already secretly crossed the Sava River. So he signed an armistice agreement with Alina, but did not announce the armistice agreement to the whole country. Because like the emperor of the old Bacchus Empire in the Amara continent, he sent troops to launch a sneak attack before the ink on the armistice agreement was dry. But things like history are really amazingly similar. Just like when the Barclay Empire and the Bacchus Empire tried to get the Pender continent at the same time. They ended up fighting each other first to share the cake. The Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Dexia also wanted to share the cake. The battle for the ownership of the Saba Fort and the surrounding area was fought. While Leon was fighting to the death with a snake cult in Bacchus, Duke Brennus of the Lion Kingdom and Caliph Bahman of the Principality of Desha were fighting fiercely near the Sava River Fort. Brennus's troops are relatively elite, but the Knights of the Lion are still being rebuilt, and the number of people participating in the battle is relatively small. Bahman brought a large number of Desha Ghazi raiders with more troops. But Desha's troops have never been very adaptable to overseas operations in terrains other than deserts. Their combat effectiveness may not be fully utilized. As a result, the two sides fought for nearly two months, each suffering heavy casualties, but no one gained any substantial benefits. It wasn't until the news that Leon occupied Kalen Deer Fort came that the Desha people completely evacuated the Sava River Fort. However, they encountered an ambush during their evacuation. Bahman finally escaped with only a few dozen people. The guards returned to Dexia territory. Brennus, who suffered heavy losses, also failed to get the Sava fort. And he was also ambushed when he led his troops to try to control the surrounding villages. He ended up like Bahman, and escaped with only a few dozen knights. Return to the Lion Realm. The people who ambushed Bahman were the same group of people as Brennus. General Titus came back just at this time. And he came back with the Phoenix Knights. In fact, General Titus had returned a long time ago. But he encountered the infantry of the enemy's Dread Legion on the way. There are actually a large number of infantry in the Dread Legion. After all, most of the former Imperial Third Army were infantry. The number of infantry in the Dread Legion is even greater than that of the Python Knights. These undead infantry are very powerful in combat. They were elite warriors when they were still alive. They were the Spear Regiment of the Third Army of the Cuban Empire. They were also typical hedgehog-type infantry with spears and large shields forming a dense phalanx. Core but when Maltes appeared under Siu and City with the Terror Legion, the Infantry Legion was not with Maltes. Otherwise Emperor Marius might not be able to seal the Terror Legion into Siu and City. This is because this Infantry Regiment was separated from Maltese at sea, and was separated relatively far away. The northern seas of Pender Continent will freeze in winter, and the large area of frozen ice will cause large ocean currents to appear on the sea, and the ocean currents will push all the way to the southern bay of Pender Continent. Therefore, Monsoons and waves caused by ocean currents often occur in the southern part of the Bacchus Empire in winter. Just like the wind and waves that Leon's troops encountered in Serendil. If those dilapidated ships of the Dread Legion encounter wind and waves during their voyage, it is indeed easy for them to run into various problems. In addition, General Titus was ordered to destroy the snake cult port on the Amara continent in a timely manner. 
The other large forces of the snake cult did not go to sea. But Maltus's fear army came out alone in a broken ship. After all, the undead army of the Terror Legion is different from ordinary people. They have no requirements for the safety of transportation and the suitability of the port. Anyway, the undead like the Terror Legion don't care about falling into the sea. They can climb up from the bottom of the sea. The Dread Legion driving a shabby ship encountered a winter current on the southern coast of the Pender continent. As a result, the fleet, which lacked sails and relied basically on oars for power, was washed away by the current and became two parts. Most of the Python Knights followed Maltes and landed in Chizaw, while the infantry of the Dread Legion were affected by the ocean currents and drifted into the bay northwest of Siyuan City. This huge bay is the end point of the ocean currents in the southern waters of the Bacchus Empire. Of course, by in summer. This is the starting point of the reverse ocean current. In other words, the ship carrying the Dread Legion infantry had actually passed through the waters of Siyuan City and traveled a long distance. But they have never been able to land because of the Phoenix Knights led by Titus. After General Titus was ordered by Emperor Marius to attack the Snake Cult port on the Unlaw Continent, he led the Phoenix Knights back from the Unlaw Continent. When they were about to return to the waters of Siyuan City, they encountered the Dread Legion fleet was washed away by the ocean currents. They didn't know that these were just infantry from the Dread Legion. So they followed them all the way, trying to prevent the Dread Legion from landing. Encountering the Dread Legion on the sea is actually a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This undead army is indeed very powerful after landing. But those broken ships are simply vulnerable at sea. Therefore, the fleet of the Phoenix Knights plans to take this opportunity to kill the Dread Legion at sea. After all, the Phoenix Knights did not bring horses with them, when they came from the Amara continent for support. And they did not plan to fight the Terror Legion on land without horses. Unlike the Dread Legion, normal horses are not suitable for large-scale embarkation on ocean voyages. The horses of the Dread Legion are all undead. They will neither run around nor be frightened, and can be loaded into the ship's cabin without any problem. But live mana takes up a lot of space, and it's easy to get sick and die on the ship. General Titus led the Phoenix Knights and indeed killed half of the fleet carrying the Dread Legion infantry at sea. But it was delayed for a long time. Even after the siege of Siyuan City was relieved, they did not leave from the siege near the bay, landing in Dalkin. Precisely because Siyuan City had already been relieved at that time, General Titus did not go to Siyuan City immediately. Because soon after he landed in Vita Village, he heard that there was a war in his own territory, and two groups of foreigners came to his home. Turf Wars. Naturally, General Titus couldn't bear this situation. He was a fierce general with a bad temper. In addition, the village of Vita was not far from the Sava River fortress. So he led the Phoenix Knights to the Sava River. He rushed towards the fort and happened to bump into Caliph Bahamon, who was retreating. To be honest, the reason why Bahamon was ambushed after leaving the jurisdiction of Sava River Fort was probably mainly because he brought too many horses. Seeing Bahamon's troops withdrawing from the jurisdiction of Sava River Fort, the Phoenix Knights naturally realized that these desert tribe cavalry must have attacked the territory of General Titus before. The people of the Phoenix Knights are indeed very loyal. General Titus helped them destroy the port of the Snake Cult in the Amara continent. For them, they are their own people. Plus the troops of the desert people. With so many horses, that definitely deserves a vote. So Bahamon was ambushed by the Phoenix Knights without any precautions. And suffered heavy casualties. Most of the horses became the mounts of the Phoenix Knights. Later, Titus planned to take the Phoenix Knights back to the Sava River Fort to complete supplies. But he bumped into Brennus plundering the villages under his rule. Brennus' habit of plundering wherever he went had hurt him this time. Although Titus himself sometimes scrapes the land, he obviously cannot accept his own land being scraped by others. The Phoenix Knights were a more righteous team and couldn't bear to see such marauders. So they took another shot. The Phoenix Knights with horses are indeed very powerful. And Brennus did not expect to encounter such a strong enemy in the village. After being charged by the Phoenix Knights for several rounds, Brennus had no choice but to run away. But sometimes people are really fickle. After fighting several big victories in a row, General Titus was probably a little distracted. He defeated the Dread Legion and the strongest lords of the Principality of Desha and the Kingdom of Lion. Who could be replaced? It will all be a little bit floating. During the continuous battles on the two continents, Titus has formed a deep comradeship with the Phoenix Knights. The Phoenix Knights currently only know him and will naturally follow him to fight. But when he suddenly had such a strong army in his hands and maintained a winning streak without suffering any major losses, General Titus began to have some other ideas. For example, 
support your troops and respect yourself. For another example, taking advantage of the fact that the Phoenix Knights are in his hands now. He can take the opportunity to expand his strength. It is actually quite normal for him to have such thoughts. If he went to see Emperor Marius now, the Phoenix Knights would probably no longer be commanded by him. And he would become an ordinary general again. It is estimated that both in terms of attention and specific strength, they are not as good as Agathon and Creon. And there are two or three governors with higher status above them. But what if he keeps holding the Phoenix Knights in his hands? Even, what if he could use the Phoenix Knights to carve out more territory of his own? Is it possible to become the governor of the Bacchus Empire? His Majesty the Emperor has always been the smartest man. And Governor Levius has always been full of misdeeds. He has been able to hold the high position of governor just because his family controls the Shadow Infantry. So, what if I hold the Phoenix Knights in my hands for a little longer and find a way to turn them into my own private soldiers? If you want to keep the Phoenix Knights in your hands, the best way is of course to prevent the war from ending. Chapter 254 The New Marshal In order to take control of the Phoenix Knights, Titus did not go to see you in city, but put his ideas into action, taking advantage of the fact that Sava River Fort was attacked. He once again provoked a revenge war against the Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Dexia. He led the Phoenix Knights and invaded the Lion Kingdom in the name of Revenge. He wandered around the Lion Kingdom and provoked Sir Lehman, who was stationed at Chicha Fortress. Afterwards, he went to the Turta Fortress in the Principality of Desha, killed many Desha people, and seduced several Desha lords. He wants to provoke a large-scale war between the three countries, because the three forces will involve each other, for the purpose Titus wants to achieve. This will actually be better than facing only one hostile force, regardless of the timing of causing a large-scale war. This tactical idea is actually good. It can induce the enemy to kill each other, expand the scale of the war, and then sit on a strong city like the Sava River Fort to seize the fire. This was originally to turn the Phoenix Knights, who did not originally belong to him, into his private army through constant battles, and to prompt Emperor Marius to give him a higher salary on the grounds that the scale of the war around the Sava River Fort was expanding. Authority and freedom. But Titus did intend to gain more territory for the Bacchus Empire and gain an advantage for the empire in the west because in his opinion, Leon, the lord of the Lion Empire, had captured two territories in the northeastern part of the Bacchus Empire. Since the situation on the northeastern border of the empire is worrying, he should create good conditions in the west. Titus did not intend to treason. He knew Emperor Marius. And he knew that the decisions made by Emperor Marius were always from the perspective of benefiting the Bacchus Empire. He knew that as long as he did not treason and considered the interests of the empire, then Emperor Marius would not care about his own military support. Just like Kairos. Even though Kairos had always opposed Marius' reforms. Because Kairos had always been serving the country if you think about it. You still have the highest status. Of course, Kairos is now messing up for his son. But Titus doesn't know that. Titus was not in the country during the most chaotic period of the Bacchus Empire. He did not know the current situation of the Bacchus Empire. Basically, all the major legions of the Bacchus Empire had been maimed. He also did not know that the cavalry of the Dread Legion actually having landed in advance. He thought that the entire Legion of Fear had been killed by him at sea. In the eyes of Titus, Bacchus was still the extremely powerful empire. And fighting against the Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Desha at the same time had always been a routine operation for the Bacchus Empire. At this time, when General Agasan came to Layla Fortress, Agasan was able to reorganize the troops of Layla Fortress so easily. It was also because the soldiers in Layla Fortress had heard that the Sava River Fort had returned. A large-scale war began. Agathon, who understood the current actual situation of the Empire, was of course very panicked. He knew very well that the current situation of the Bacchus Empire was definitely not suitable for triggering a war between the three countries. If the war continues, continues to expand in scale, and becomes a long-term national war between the three countries, then judging from the current state of the Bacchus Empire, it is almost certain to lose. Although the root cause of all this is indeed the betrayal of the Lion Kingdom and the plunder of the Dexia Principality, the Bacchus Empire is currently in dire straits, and the Sava River Fort incident should actually be tolerated. But now that everything has happened, and the war has begun on the Sava River Fort, there is no retreat for Agathon. The Bacchus Empire must win this battle quickly, because it cannot show its strength to other countries. The fact of Bacchus's domestic weakness. Once the Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Desha discover that the Bacchus Empire is so weak at the moment, it will really be over. If other countries see that the Bacchus Empire is weak and dare not fight for a long time, 
they will not even give them a chance to negotiate. In this case, the only way out is to launch a thunderous strike and end the war in the fastest and most brutal way. It must not be prolonged into a protracted war. But Agathan is really difficult to operate at this time. Kairos led the main force of the Shadow Army following him to track down the snake cult at the border of Dexia. Emperor Marius drove those illegal armed forces into Dexia. And the Shadow Wolves were also sent to Dexia to obtain horses. Siyuan City is currently empty. And the Immortal Legion cannot move. The Empire's first army corps was crippled by the rebels in Bashi City. And it would take at least several months to rebuild. In order to quickly roll out the Red Death vaccination. The Knights of the Shining Cross could not spare their time. Nor could General Creon's plague exorcists. On the other side of Dillonport, Justice and the Imperial Mortal Guards were negotiating with the Surf General Ivelo, trying their best to avoid the formation of a new Surf uprising. In addition, God's port is thousands of miles away from the Sava River Fort. And even if Justice properly resolves Ivelo's matter, he still won't be able to get through it for a while. The most powerful legions in the entire Bacchus Empire were unable to participate in the Battle of Sava River Fort. Currently, the Bacchus Empire can only face the armies of two countries at the same time with the more than a thousand troops newly organized by Agathon in Layla Fortress, as well as the troops in the hands of General Titus and the Phoenix Knights. Moreover, Agathon knew that he had to quickly reinforce the Sava River Fort. If Titus and the Phoenix Knights did not receive reinforcements for too long, they might think that the Empire had given up on them. What if Titus suddenly took the Phoenix with him? The Knights rebelled against the Empire. Perhaps every dazzling hero is a gambler including Emperor Marius and General Agathon. While sending people to report the situation to Emperor Marius, Agathon sent out all the troops he had just reorganized, except for a few wounded soldiers guarding the gate. Basically no one was left in Layla Fortress. His troops only have a thousand men, and since they are newly reorganized, their cooperation with each other is actually not very good. But Agathon implemented an extremely bold tactic. He personally led his troops, sneaked across the river at night, and made a surprise attack on the Chicha Fortress. Sir Lehman, the lord of Chicha Fortress, was stationed by the bridge of the Sava River at the time. In order to maintain control of the bridge, Lehman carefully arranged a large number of troops to patrol both ends of the bridge. But no one expected that Agathon's troops would land across the river from the river between Salem Village and Chicha Fortress in late winter and early spring, when the river is the coldest, and make a full circle in one night. A large circle went around the back of Chicha Fortress. You must know that this is not the southern part of the Bacchus Empire. This is the center of the entire continent. And the climate is not that hot. At this time in February and March, the ice in the upper reaches of the Sava River had just begun to thaw. And the river water was bone chilling. No one knew how Agassan managed to swim across the river with a group of newly reorganized troops at this time. The location for crossing the river chosen by Agatha was also very good. Since Kalandir Fort was already controlled by Leon at this time, Salem Village was originally considered a safe hinterland sandwich between Chicha Fortress and Kalandir Fort. Most people were engaged in construction during this period, so the precautions at night were not too great. Rigorous. Currently, Anson is still organizing border checkpoints at Karandir Castle to ensure that the Red Death does not spread. In addition, there is Chicha Fortress to the west, so the patrol team is not arranged to go to the west of Salem Village, so as not to avoid the risk of not having just settled in Salem Village. What kind of conflict will there be between the Bacchus and the Chicha Fortress? Sir Lehman of Chicha Fortress probably had the same idea. After learning that Leon had captured Karen Deer Castle, Lehman did not send a patrol to the east of Chicha Fortress. This was also to avoid misunderstandings. Lehman did not want to let Leon felt that he had some plans for his newly occupied territory. As a result, Agathon passed through the gap between the two places, and then launched a surprise attack from the north gate behind Chicha Fortress that no one expected. The Chicha Fortress was also controlling the Red Death some time ago. Corpses were being transported and burned outside the North Gate. In addition, Lehman brought the large army to the bridge. There were not enough defenders in the fortress. As a result, Agathon was killed. He sneaked in in the name of reinforcements and then controlled the entire Chicha Fortress from the inside. This surprise attack shocked the entire continent in a very short period of time. Since the Chicha Fortress was built, it has never been captured by anyone. Even when Asa, the first emperor of Bacchus and the conqueror, led tens of thousands of troops across the continent of Pindor. He stopped in front of this fortress for a whole year and finally withdrew his troops and stopped fighting. Such a result is naturally more attractive than the fight against the snake cult in Bacchus. General Agazon suddenly became the most dazzling general in the entire continent. 
but he is also the famous general in the most dangerous situation. After occupying Chicha Fortress, Agathon sent an envoy to Lion City before anyone could react. He asked King Ulrich to sign an armistice agreement and pay one million dinars for the war. Pay compensation in exchange for withdrawing from Chicha Fortress. This operation was of course intended to prevent the Lion Kingdom from seeing the true nature of the Bacchus Empire, and to end the war as a victor as soon as possible, or to attract the Lion Kingdom's war goal to recapture the Seven Chas Fortress. For the Lion Kingdom, Chicha Fortress is both a symbol of victory in the founding battle and the gateway to the capital. Everyone knows its importance. If Chicha Fortress is captured, the capital Lion City will be directly exposed to the enemy. This will cause all residents in the entire capital's economic circle to lose their sense of security. And a large number of nobles and businessmen will flee. If Chicha Fortress cannot be recaptured in a short time, the indirect losses will be immeasurable. Moreover, everyone in the fierce lion realm would probably misjudge the strength of his troops because of Agathon's strong words. In most people's opinion, those who could capture the Chicha Fortress must have at least several thousand elite troops. Right? This means that it may be difficult to recapture the Chicha Fortress through fighting for a while. After all, General OSA with tens of thousands of troops did not capture the thousands of troops guarding the Chicha Fortress by Archduke Alfred the Lion. In addition, the current state of the Lion Kingdom is not particularly good. Two powerful dukes have passed away one after another. The Lion Knights suffered heavy losses a few months ago and have not yet been able to recover. Duke Bredis has just been promoted. Tuss and the Phoenix Knights crippled him. If it were in the past, Ulrich would probably agree to Agathon's conditions. Exchange one million dinars for Agathon to withdraw from Chicha Fortress. Admit defeat and declare an armistice. But Agathon probably didn't expect that King Ulrich was now very poor. The asking price of one million dinars was really not high. And Agathon was actually asking for the lowest price. Agathon was also worried that Ulrich would fight with him. But if the asking price is any lower, it is really outrageous. Chicha Fortress is not a remote town. This is a large-scale solid fortress that has never been conquered before. The cost of building it back then was more than 100. Thousands of dinars. To be honest, even King Ulrich himself felt that Agathon's asking price was not high. Probably just to avenge himself for breaking the agreement and attacking the Sava River Fort. But the problem is that although this million dinars is not much, Ulrich really can't afford it now. It stands to reason that since it is the beginning of the year and the National Treasury has just received the taxes, and has not yet dispersed them all. The national treasury should be rich. But the problem is that King Ulrich owed a lot of loan sharks last year. He spent a lot of money to find older noble girls. And spent a lot of money to bribe the rebels of the Bacchus Empire. All of this money was borrowed from major lords. Of. Originally. Ulrich had no intention of repaying the money he borrowed. But the domestic situation was not very good in the second half of last year. If he did not repay the money, he would be afraid that the throne would be unstable. So at the beginning of the year Ulrika embezzled taxes from the treasury to repay the money. At the same time, the reconstruction of the Lion Knights, which suffered heavy losses, cost a lot of dinars. King Ulrich was very clear about the significance of this army to him. Only after rebuilding the Lion Knights ten years ago, did he truly take control of the entire country. No matter how much money he spent, he would have to restore the Royal Knights to its original state. The Royal Knights need to be dignified and the National Finance Minister did not dare to refuse the Lion Knight's reconstruction expenses. The dinar was spent like water, and part of it was secretly swallowed up by Duke Brennus. This has been the practice for ten years. Brennus is greedy for money, and Ulrich knows it well. But the reason why Brennus is so loyal to the king, and the reason why Ulrich is so relieved about Brennus, is because of this convention. So King Ulrich is really poor now. He has hundreds of thousands of dinars, but every money has its place and it is really impossible to come up with an extra million dinars. Ulrich's previous idea of attacking the Sava River Fort was actually to find some additional profits from the Bacchus Empire. Bredas scraped the land not just for himself. He wanted to hand over half of the harvest to Ulrich. He couldn't afford the money, but Chicha Fortress had to be taken back. Otherwise many wealthy households around Lysher City would flee and the economic losses would be even greater. So King Ulrich had no choice but to take it back by force. As a result, the entire Lion Kingdom was basically fully mobilized. King Ulrich issued a king's order, once again declaring war on the Bacchus Empire, and summoned all lords to the vicinity of Chicha Fortress. At this time, Leon welcomed the king's envoy in Chang'e Town. Count Leon has worked hard to open up territory for the country, and has indeed set an example for the lords of the kingdom. 
now that the country is in danger and the enemy is arrogant and domineering. The whole country is looking forward to Earl Leon leading the army to defeat the powerful enemy. In accordance with His Majesty's decree, You know me with the glory of the Asian goddess and the will of the late king. I appoint Count Leon as the marshal of the kingdom. After a lengthy speech, the minister responsible for communicating the king's order handed Leon a gorgeous scroll and held out a short-handled scepter made of silver in both hands. That is the authority of the marshal of the Lion Kingdom. Ulrich appointed Leon as marshal, and the primary combat goal was to regain the Chicha Fortress. The Lord had just casually mentioned that he would be named a marshal, but he didn't expect it to come true. Although it wasn't too surprising, he really didn't expect it to happen so quickly. Chapter 255 Where to Hit This is a problem. Although he became a marshal very quickly, the new marshal of the Lion Kingdom was extremely slow in dispatching troops. Leon didn't even start to organize the army. Instead, he started training new soldiers. From the looks of it, the Lord planned to go to war after training his troops. This was almost equivalent to being hungry. So he started by growing vegetables and raising pigs. Because the Lord actually doesn't want to fight at all now. And he hasn't had time to digest the newly acquired territory. And Leon knows very well why Ulrich appointed him as marshal at this time. That's not how much Ulrika trusted him. In fact, Leon felt that Ulrich didn't even have a single coin of trust in him. To make yourself a marshal at this time. Isn't it actually to find someone to take the blame? The Lord even thinks that all the marshals appointed by King Ulrich are scapegoats. Of course. In name, they may all be pillars of the country who shoulder heavy responsibilities when the country is in crisis. When the overall situation of the Lion Kingdom was relatively good, King Ulrich would serve as the marshal himself. Just like when Leon followed Count Odin and Godric to participate in the war against the Bacchus Empire for the first time. At that time, the Lion Kingdom with strong troops and strong horses, His Majesty the King did not give up his position as marshal to any lord. The previous marshal, Duke Brennus, was sent by Ulrich to save the Lion Lake City from the bad situation when the Kingdom of Lion was in trouble. He didn't get anything, but he fought the most dangerous battle. Therefore, Brennus was not willing to bring his own troops at all at that time. He would rather beat the king's troops to pieces. And he took the opportunity to scrape the land very brutally. And he seemed to be very smart when negotiating the deal with Leon. Now, Brennus has been defeated. Chicha Fortress has been lost. And the national treasury is out of money. So the lord has become the current scapegoat. And King Ulrich probably learned the lesson of Brennus when he was the marshal. Brennus crippled the Lion Knights and the Royal Guards at Eagle Claw Castle. Therefore, Ulrich no longer allowed the marshal to lead his troops. All the support he gave to Leon, the new marshal, was actually the silver scepter. In other words, Ulrich did not provide any soldiers or any other material assistance. He just sent a piece of official appointment letter and then asked Leon to regain the Chicha Fortress. Isn't this tantamount to free prostitution? The marshal of a country is nominally the military leader of the country. He has the power to command and dispatch the troops of various lords. However, with the power, he has reciprocal obligations. The marshal has the responsibility to provide necessary support to the lords who obey the dispatch, such as food, grass and ordnance, class military aid. But Ulrich didn't give Leon anything. Isn't this just counting on Leon to be taken advantage of by providing money, effort and food? You have to risk your life to attack a solid fortress like Chicha Fortress. Although it is true that you can collect money when providing military support to other lords, and you can also take a big share of the spoils when distributing them. The problem is that this battle is to regain the Chicha Fortress. And I am afraid that you will not get any spoils. Even if Chicha Fortress is recaptured, the Lord will not get any benefits. Is it possible that Ulrich can seal this capital gateway to Leon? To be honest, even if Ulrich really dared to seal it, Leon wouldn't want it. The Lord knows that if he becomes the Lord of Chicha Fortress, his treatment will be completely different from Sir Lehman and King Ulrich will definitely not subsidize him with a copper or a grain of grain. There are no residents near Chicha Fortress. This purely military fortress previously relied entirely on Lion City to supply military supplies. Once Lion City provides nothing, then this fortress will only be a waste of money and food for Leon, and he will have to bear the burden, the heaviest and most sensitive responsibility. Therefore, the Lord of course has no enthusiasm for this appointment. He does not want to use his own troops to evaluate General Agazon's combat effectiveness. Liang's reaction now is to slowly organize the army, delaying it for a month or two first. As a marshal, it is customary to arrive 
at the assembly point last. The boss is the last one to appear. But the businessmen in Chung'e town were very excited after hearing about this. They have not forgotten that when the Lord took them to do business in Bacchus, they first went to Chicha Fortress to gather, and then entered the jurisdiction of Sava River Fort. And then, they bought all the inventory in Bacchus. Everyone got rich. At that time, they deeply realized that. War is well. Moreover, at that time, Lord Leong could lead them to make a fortune with only a few troops. Now that Lord Leong has become the marshal of the kingdom, it is obviously more appropriate. Is this going to make a huge fortune? So the merchants rushed to the Lord's Hall of Chang'e Town to see Leong, hoping to provide supplies with the army. This is actually the trust and support the merchants have for Leong. Of course, the lords cannot dampen their enthusiasm. Besides, providing supplies by the merchants accompanying the army is a win-win situation. At least they don't have to supply food and grass to other lords themselves. So Leon agreed. But only three days later, the lord regretted that he had agreed too readily. Leon did not expect that the merchants would be extremely efficient this time. When Liang's army was still completely silent, the merchants had spontaneously formed a huge convoy of thousands of carriages and were ready to go. The scale of the trade event was several times larger than that of a year and a half ago. The reason why the merchants were so efficient this time was actually because Liang moved too quickly when he went south to deal with the snake cult a few months ago. It only took three days from the decision to the dispatch of troops. The merchants were still spending the winter at Mao's house at the time. So they were slow to respond. Didn't have time to keep up. After all, Leon was trying to deal with the snake cult and the Red Death. So it was naturally impossible for him to bring businessmen with him. But the businessmen didn't know. They felt that they were too slow to keep up with the Lord's troops last time. And they probably missed several hundred million because of this. Because Leong captured the Karandir castle of the Bacchus Empire with a single army. They thought the Lord has won a huge victory against the Bacchus Empire. So this time, the businessmen felt that they must not miss the opportunity again. Lord Leong used his troops to appear and disappear. And the speed of dispatching troops was too fast. As a result, a huge convoy appeared outside Chung'e town within a few days. There were thousands of merchants and their hired servants alone. It looked like a motley army surrounding Chung'e town and the number of people is still increasing. Of course, so many businessmen are not just from Chang'e town. There are also many people who are not afraid of death from the surrounding areas. Nowadays, business in Liang's territory is booming, and the number of merchants is indeed much greater than before. Coupled with the existence of Long River Express transportation, horse-drawn carriage transportation is also more convenient, and naturally more merchants are participating. However, today is different from the past. Li Ang's strategic goal this time is to regain the Chicha Fortress. Not to waste time running to the Sava River Fort like he did back then. Besides, the Lord only plans to take back the fortress and has no plans to attack the Bacchus Empire. Leon knows that the Bacchus Empire is now facing huge pressure and will definitely resist desperately from top to bottom and fight to the death with Emperor Marius who is forced to a dead end. But it's not worth it. And a war like recapturing the Chicha Fortress is not as suitable for business as the last time. The Chicha Fortress is different from the original Sava River Fort. There are no residents around it who can come to shop. And the Lord does not intend to lay siege to the city for a long time. This means that the caravan can only do business with the soldiers during the period when other lords of the Lion Kingdom come together. However, because many merchants had the experience of joining the army last time, the goods they brought were not actually the meat. Wine entertainment, and other supplies that the soldiers needed. They brought a large amount of furs, oils, and other northern goods that the Bacchus were relatively lacking. Specialties such as these are relatively profitable in Bacchus. But the problem is that the soldiers definitely don't need these things. And the size of the caravan is too big. If they were all going to do business with soldiers, they would all have to lose their pants. Maybe the number of customers would not be as many as businessmen. Moreover, the Lord does not plan to send troops for a while. In fact, Leon is really planning to train a wave of new soldiers before setting off. But these businessmen are too proactive. They have already installed the cars and are waiting to be driven. In order to improve efficiency, they even purchase goods at a higher price. Although the farmers in the villages and towns of Chang'e Express and Leisure Realm have made a lot of money because of the massive purchases of goods by the merchants. The Lord is quite distressed that these merchants are the backbone of tax payment in his territory. If they lose all their wealth, then I will have to suffer from poverty in the future. Moreover, in order to catch up with this business, many businessmen also went to Ponde Bank for loans. 
If this drags on for two months, it's not certain what the war will be like. But if these merchants who took out the loans don't sell the goods they received at high prices, I'm afraid they will all be forced to become deadbeats. Liang had no choice but to issue a martial summons order, asking all the lords of the Lion Realm to gather east of the Chicha Fortress, and asked Eric to command the Changha Express convoy and set off first with the merchants. The merchant's convoy must first go to the vicinity of Chicha Fortress and finish the business of summoning the lords of the Lion Realm first. Otherwise, they will probably die waiting in Chungha Town. So, just like before, a huge merchant army set off towards the Chicha Fortress. The Lord asked Eric to take the silver scepter that represented the Marshal's identity and set off under the Marshal's flag. This was actually to let Eric gather an army near Chicha Fortress to facilitate the merchants to prepare for other lords. Troops. Provide supplies. Businessmen may not make much money for a while. So someone must constantly step in to coordinate. Of course, this must be done by someone with a flexible mind and a good relationship with the businessmen. Eric is undoubtedly the most suitable candidate. And now the Lord does not dare to wait until he has finished training his troops before taking action. He is being forced to think about how to defeat Chicha Fortress and what to do after defeating Chicha Fortress. If we don't find a place to absorb the goods in the hands of merchants, the merchants' loans will cause Ponde Bank to have a large amount of bad debts that cannot be recovered. The specialty products of the Fierce Lion Realm are not easy to sell in the country. And merchants purchase them at a higher price. These guys purchase too much. And they are likely to run out of money quickly because of the inventory in their hands. When the bank's bad debt rate reaches a certain level, it will form a series of negative effects. Merchants will be unable to carry out other businesses. Commerce in the territory will quickly slump. Prices will skyrocket due to the imbalance between supply and demand. And the purchasing power of dinars will rapidly decline. This will cause depositors to panic. Banks will face runs or be unable to maintain normal operations and then further form a more serious negative cycle. Moreover, this negative effect will be reflected faster when the territory has not completely transformed from a precious metal currency structure to a credit currency system. The magic silver coins that Leon asked the Nolder to create do not have full credibility for the time being. They can only be circulated in the White Deer Castle and Nolder Forest areas and cannot be saved by minting coins. Money is money only when it circulates. Leon now particularly understands why some big countries are fighting everywhere because of businessmen. This is not a political issue, but an economic issue. It is really impossible not to fight. A business system that uses finance to drive rapid development is prone to economic crisis. Markets must be found from other countries so that domestic businessmen can survive and the domestic economy can survive. In other words, Leon must expand the scale of the war and fight it into other countries. And it must be in a place that can absorb the inventories of merchants. But now, where to fight? The area around Sava River Fort can no longer digest the merchants' goods. In fact, the entire western part of the Bacchus Empire, including the current Cuyan city, may not be able to digest those goods. Almost all of the western part of the Bacchus Empire was destroyed by the rebels. Emperor Marius also burned all the supplies in Cuyan city. The current western part of the Bacchus Empire does not have enough purchasing power. Leon had just returned from Bacchus. Although he did not go to the west of Bacchus, he still knew the current state of the empire. In fact, the current Bacchus Empire is probably not a suitable customer group. They have been affected by the domestic chaos for an entire season. In addition, they are the country that most needs to quickly popularize the Red Death vaccine. Today, Bacchus is short of horses. Food is short of daily necessities. And things like fur and grease are definitely not the first choice of the Bacchus people now. What to do? Then we can only go to the Principality of Dexia. The Desha people are probably rich now. And they also need furs and oils. But the Sava River Fort of the Bacchus Empire is blocking the road. They can't go around to the west of the kingdom and invade the Desha territory from the direction of Single. Right? It seems obvious that a certain new marshal is planning to use his power for personal gain. Besides, Although Brennus and the Desha people had a fight before to share the cake. The Lion Kingdom did not declare war on the Desha people because both sides were just trying to gain benefits from sneak attacks. And it was not considered a formal troop dispatch. Just a collision. Openly declaring war over such a thing would be tantamount to admitting that one's own country was a thief who took advantage of the situation and tore up the armistice agreement. So both countries kept silent. Moreover, the Dexia people were ambushed and maimed by General Titus in the end. They did not have a deep hatred against the Lion Kingdom. It is estimated that they had a deeper resentment towards Titus. There was no declaration of war. So it would be inappropriate to attack Desha directly. 
as a marshal, he could easily be hostile to all other countries. To send out troops on a large scale, there must be a name. It seems like there really is nowhere to go. Liang was very hesitant. But maybe Eric does have the best luck attributes. Anyway, as soon as he brought the merchants to the east of Chicha Fortress, the situation changed dramatically. In other words, a huge turnaround. The Saba River Fort was captured by the Desha Principality at this time. Not only that, the Dexia army actually appeared near the kingdom's capital, Lion City. The name Leong wanted to send troops was actually placed directly in front of him. Chapter 256 It's all a misunderstanding. In fact, the current situation is probably really caused by Eric's luck. After Eric, under the banner of Leon's marshal, led a mighty team to the vicinity of Chicha Fortress. Everyone had a little misunderstanding because this huge caravan seemed to be the fierce lion, the kingdom's army. After all, the flags of all the great lords appeared in that huge team, including Leon, Godric, Leofric, Father, Grandron, and the Royal Knight Iris. The Royal Iris is Amy's flag, which is exactly the same as the flag of the Royal Guards. Amy's brother, Lord Andrew, also used this flag when he served as the commander of the Royal Guards. This is mainly because most merchants will find a backer, especially when participating in such large-scale, long-distance trade activities. It will be safer to fly under the banner of a big lord. There was a caravan that did not fly the flag of the big lord. And as a result, it was worshipped by snakes. Teach robbed. So all the merchants are well prepared this time. The merchants who come from Ermin will naturally join Father. Those who come from Payne Village will bear the banner of Gronlin. And those who come from White Deer Castle will also ask Amy to help. Give them a sense of security. In addition, there are already three big flags on the carriages of the Long River Express. And the small lords along the way will also join this group army. So the team led by Eric looked at it from a distance as the overwhelming army of the Lion Kingdom. And it seemed to be led by the king himself. After all, the flags of the Royal City Guards were also inside. Of course, you can definitely see it if you look closely. But facing a large-scale army with more than a thousand carriages alone. Except for the Lord of the Lion Kingdom. Which desperate scout would dare to get close to investigate. At the same time, after the caravan stopped near the Chicha Fortress. It did not attack the Chicha Fortress. Instead, it continued to gather other lords of the Lion Realm who came together. And gradually began to move closer to the bridgehead in the south. This does not seem to be about recapturing the Chicha Fortress. But it looks like they are about to attack the Sava River Fort. This is a caravan, and of course, it will not attack the fortress. And Eric has been following Li Ang's instructions to ask other lords of the Lion Kingdom to gather to facilitate the merchants to do business. But during the gathering, Eric was somewhat unable to control the noisy businessmen. Most of the goods brought by the merchants were northern specialties that could not be sold in the army. They originally wanted to sell them in the south. But the merchants didn't know much about strategy and tactics. They only knew that troops from the lords of the Lion Kingdom were constantly joining this huge team along the way. The number was unknown. But it seemed to be boundless. In the eyes of the businessmen, the group army is probably already very strong. And it is estimated that it will march towards the Sava River Fort at any time. Therefore, the merchants all plan to move closer to the south first. So as to take advantage of the opportunity. So as not to be squeezed behind and unable to keep up when the army officially went out for battle. In fact, those who have come to join us are all small lords and their combined real military strength is less than a thousand. But the merchants don't know that. As a result, various caravans rushed to the south, which caused the big army to keep moving slowly south. The small lords of the Lion Realm, who had just joined the commander's banner, did not understand the situation very well, seeing that most of them were moving. Naturally, he followed suit. Although Eric holds the martial scepter, the scepter is only useful to the lords of the Lion Realm, and has no effect on merchants. After all, he is not Leon, and he does not have the same prestige and influence as a lord in the eyes of merchants. So Eric really can't drag back the merchants who have made any changes. As a result, the caravan and army group that originally planned to gather east of Chicha Fortress gradually moved to the Sava River, and were about to join Lehman's troops, who were guarding the bridge. The main reason why Lehman has been holding fast at the end of the bridge is because Titus has been making preparations to attack on the other side of the bridge. Titus wants to lure the Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Desha into fighting. Of course, he has to drag Lehman's troops away. At the bridge, now that Chicha Fortress has been captured, Raymond knows that if he leaves the bridge defense area, it means that Lion City may be driven into by the Bacchus Empire. 
and Titus seems to want to do just that. So Raymond naturally. Man could only guard the bridge and dare not leave. But the army of the Lion Realm appeared on the other side of the river. General Titus, who was originally dragging Lehman at the bridge on the other side of the Sava River, was frightened. He really wanted the battle between the three countries to continue. But he didn't expect that there would be so much movement in the Lion Kingdom and that such a large army would be dispatched so quickly. Moreover, the army of the Lion Kingdom did not care about Chicha Fortress at all. Instead, it seemed that the entire army had mobilized to find trouble for him at Sava River Fort. In this situation, there is no point in watching the fire from the other side or taking chestnuts from the fire. Shouldn't you run away quickly? So Titus quickly withdrew to Layla Fortress, running very fast. Agathon left almost no one behind when he left Layla Fortress. Layla Fortress was an empty city, which was just right for Titus to be stationed. As soon as Titus withdrew, Sir Lehman naturally felt that a great opportunity had appeared. Because the Sava River Fort was empty, why not seize the opportunity and capture it quickly? Lehman became a world-famous mad lion knight at a young age, and he naturally had a proud and arrogant character. The Chicha Fortress was lost from his hands, so he wanted to make up for his mistakes. He has been guarding the Chicha Fortress for more than a year. He knows very well that as long as there are 1,800 defenders in the Chicha Fortress, it will be difficult to defeat them. Therefore, he also understands that the Kingdom's group army will not attack easily. And now, if we take advantage of the emptiness of Sava River Fort to quickly capture it, and then exchange Sava River Fort for Chicha Fortress, wouldn't this be equivalent to making up for the previous sin of losing Chicha Fortress? In addition, there was the Kingdom's army group behind them and the current marshal was Leong. With Lehman's understanding of Leong, he felt that Leong would think so. So he asked the army group to move closer to the river. So Lehman did not say H, low to the group army, but directly abandoned the bridgehead, dispatched the entire army, and quickly attacked the Sava River Fort. He wanted to take the credit. To capture the Sava Fort alone before the arrival of the army group was to make up for Lehman's deeds. There is actually nothing wrong with this idea. And Lehman implemented it well. He did capture the Sava fort for a time, but he only occupied a day and a half, because Titus took away all the manpower and supplies when he evacuated, and also destroyed the city gate and suspension bridge of the Sava river fort. All the city defense facilities were also destroyed. Destroying the city defense when evacuating actively was a routine operation. The gate of Sava river fort could not be closed at all, and there was no one to defend it. Of course, Lehman succeeded easily. However, as soon as Lehman entered Sava River Fort, a large force from the Dexia Principality rushed over. The Dexia people also saw the gate of Sava River Fort open. So naturally they wanted to fight. Because they had been in the south before, and due to their location, the Dexia people did not immediately notice the army group on the other side of the river. They thought it was because their own army came over and scared Titus away. Like Lehman, the lords of the Dexia Principality naturally had to grab the credit when faced with this situation and they all rushed very quickly. And Lehman's lone army had just entered the Sava River Fort, with the city gate open and no time to block it. It was of course unable to defend against the German and Sia army. It only lasted for a day and a half before being forced to evacuate, suffering heavy casualties. Lehman himself was almost hacked to death inside. But the Dexia people were actually not feeling well either. Lehman's team was quite strong in combat. The Dexia people had more casualties than Lehman. Lehman always thought that the group army would come for reinforcements. So he fought extremely tenaciously. But it wasn't until Lehman withdrew to the marshal's banner with all his injuries ready to curse that he discovered that the so-called group army was actually just a large group of noisy businessmen. In order to restrain the merchants from making any changes, Eric was almost going crazy. The only thousand troops from various small lords were used by Eric. And it was not easy to calm the merchants. Of course, it was impossible to come for reinforcements in this state. There were no negative incidents such as gathering in crowds to cause trouble. So Eric was considered to be quite capable. So Lehman could only cry without tears and scold himself for being too impulsive. He really shouldn't take any credit. After learning about the current situation, both Eric and Lehman were a little worried. The Dexia army was just across the river. If the Dexia people discovered that this was a huge caravan, what would happen to the Dexia people? For the Xiao people, it was just a luxurious meal. If they had eaten this meal, they might be able to last for several years. So Lehman and Eric worked together, coaxed and deceived and finally brought the caravan back to the east of Chicha Fortress, intending to hide further east and away from the danger zone. 
after capturing the Sava River Fort. The Dexia people found that this place was extremely poor and had basically no harvest. The Sava River Fort was stripped of its land by Brennus before. There was not much left. And Titus while the army took the initiative to evacuate. So of course, they would take away everything they could. A large-scale troop dispatch resulted in nearly a thousand casualties. But only an empty city was obtained. Even the surrounding villages and towns had nothing. Most of the Dexia lords felt that this battle was too costly. Bahadur Khan Kadin, the leader of Desha, felt that it was such a loss. Bahadur Khan Kadin was the ruler of the Desha Principality. If it was the time when the Pandey Kingdom ruled, he should be called the Duke of Kadin. In fact, Bahad Khan is not Kadin's first name or surname. His name is Kadin, and his tribe is also called Kadin Tribe. Bahad Khan is actually a title, which is roughly equivalent to God, the designated Khan. Nowadays, Desha is an independent country. The title of Duke in the Kingdom of Pindor has not been used for many years. In fact, the people of Desha do not consider themselves a principality. They are no longer attached to any kingdom. It is called a principality only because Desha was once a vassal of the Kingdom of Pind. Hundreds of years ago, the ruler of Desha was made a duke by King Pind. Historical reasons made other countries call Desha a principality. After Kadin was elected as the current leader by all the Desha tribe, he reused the title. Bahad Khan, which represented the god. Of course, this does not refer to the gods themselves. The Desha people's god is called Wada, and his image is a black male horse. This is the common belief of all herdsmen living in the Savanir Desert. No one dares to claim to be the god himself. The title of Bahad Khan represents the common head of all aspects of politics, military, justice, religion, etc. in Desha, a country that combines politics and religion. It also refers to the messenger of God Veda in the world. This is different from the meaning represented by Twet. There are many people in Desha who are qualified to be called Khan. In fact, all Desha lords are Khans. They are an alliance composed of multiple tribes. The leader of each tribe is called Khan. The title, Khan, only refers to the tribe. Leader, Bahad Khan Kadan, actually means that he is the leader of all Khans appointed by the gods. Name Kadan. As for Kadin's tribe, the core sphere of influence is in the capital, Toba, in the center of Dexia. That place is actually quite far from the Sava River Fort, and it has to pass through most of the Savir Desert. In other words, Kardin's cost of sending troops this time is actually quite high, but he didn't get any benefits from Sava Fort. Only an empty city, and Kardin didn't really want to occupy Sava Fort for a long time. Whoever occupies Sava Fort will face two people at the same time. Nation. Cardan is a smart man. And he will naturally not waste his strength guarding a useless territory. So he planned to find a more prosperous place to rob a ticket to make up for the losses of sending troops. And planned to leave after making a fortune. This is also the Dexia people's consistent combat thinking. Although they have never admitted that they have any relationship with the Jata people. Their behavioral logic is indeed very similar to the Jata people. And they are basically plunderers. It's just that Dexia has transformed into a semi-nomadic and semi-settled state more than a hundred years ago. And now it can be regarded as a country with a complete political system. The closest to the north and south of the Sava River Fort are the military fortresses of the two countries. To the north is the Chicha Fortress occupied by Agathon. And to the south is the Layla Fortress of the Bacchus Empire. A large-scale bastion like the Chicha Fortress is difficult to fight at first glance. And there is still no gain in fighting it. It doesn't look like Agathon will come out anyway. So you can completely bypass it, and Layla Fortress is not easy to fight. And there will be no gains either. In addition, the Dexia people discovered the Marshal's flag of the Lion Kingdom and a large army group, dozens of miles east of the Chicha Fortress. It seems that King Ulrich's troops are also inside. City group plays a lot. And this army group is slowly moving to the east at this time. It seems that it is going to enter the Bacchus Empire from the east. In fact, at this time Eric, with the help of Lehman, was leading the caravan away from the danger zone. Earl Leon had just occupied Karen Deer Castle and subsequently became the marshal. As a king, of course he knew about this important matter. In Carden's view, since the Lion King appointed Leon as the marshal, it is normal for the army of the Lion Kingdom to invade Bacchus from Liang's territory. So after Carden discussed with his men for a long time, they planned to take advantage of the opportunity when the Chicha Fortress was occupied by the Bacchus Empire and the army of the Lysher Kingdom were all moving to the east. 
The Lion City Precinct went to rob a vote. Anyway, the bridge over the Sava River is now unguarded. Carden believes that since the main army group of the Lion Kingdom and Ulrich's troops are all east of the Chicha Fortress, the Lion City is probably relatively empty at the moment. And Lion City is the center of the entire continent. The most prosperous place in the entire continent. If you seize the time, grab it and run away. You will definitely make a lot of money. The Dexia people are actually self-aware. They have no intention of conquering Lion City. They just want to seize the prosperous villages and towns around Lion City before the group army of the Lion Kingdom can react. The Dexia people are desert nomads. The cavalry is very mobile. But like the Jada people, they are not very good at attacking fortified cities. But the problem is that Lion City is not empty at all now. It can even be said to have many soldiers and generals. Chapter 257 Both Sides Suffer Losses Ulrich did not hand over his troops to Leon. Since Chicha Fortress is occupied by Agathon. In order to prepare for possible raids by the Bacchus Empire on Lion City. All members of the newly replenished Lion Knights are now in Lion City. Today, the Lion Knights have returned to a full strength of 600 Lion Knights and more than 2,000 Lion followers. Ulrich has been conducting Knight Selection in the Lion City in the past few months. When a royal knighthood such as the Lion Knights recruits large-scale members, naturally a large number of noble children will come to Lion City to participate in this election. These young people are already made combatants who have been trained for a long time. And they all bring their own horses. Dry food. At the same time, the super-staffed Royal City Guards, who had re-recruited more people, also increased the size of their retinue team in the Lion City. Ulrich took advantage of the time when the noble children came to the Lion City. The current number of Royal Guards is 2,800, which is equivalent to the full strength of the Lion Knights. If he were not worried that the number would be too large to support, Ulrich, who has always been insecure, would probably recruit more people. Different from the Lion Knights, the Royal City Guards are a private armed force that belongs entirely to Ulrich. The National Finance will only subsidize weapons and equipment for them. But the daily consumption of people, horses and shoes has to be supported by the king's private money. Moreover, the treatment of the king's retinue will naturally be much higher than that of the general knight's retinue. Not only will they receive death and disability benefits, but their wages will also be high. Which is why Ulrich is so tight now. In addition to the Lion Knights and the Royal City Guards, Duke Brennus is now also in the Lion City. He had just suffered a defeat. So he took advantage of the fact that all the nobles were in Lion City to reorganize his troops. Many noble children failed in this election and failed to join the Knights of the Lion. Of course they are willing to join the Grand Master of the Lion Knights at this time. And maybe they will have the opportunity to become a member of the Royal Knights in the future. Therefore, Brennus quickly reorganized an army of more than a thousand men. Not only that, other lords in the northwest of the kingdom are also coming to Lysher City in waves. They want to gather at Chicha Fortress. And they will inevitably pass through Lysher City. After arriving at Lysher City, these lords will naturally stay in the jurisdiction of Lysher City for a few days to observe. And then join other lords before going there together to avoid being ambushed by the enemies in Chicha Fortress. Anyway, the distance between Lysher City and Chicha Fortress is not far. Even if there is only one or two days left before the meeting deadline, they can still catch up by setting off from Lysher City. Right now, the Lion City has its most abundant troops. So much so that the streets are full of horse manure, and there is no time to clean it up. As a result, as soon as Carden led the Dexia army into the village of Yerevil, east of the Lion City, they ran into the real main force of the Lion Kingdom, and it was Ulrich who personally led the army. This was due to the severe overstaffing of the Royal City Guards. And the newly reorganized troops of Brennus temporarily occupied the city defense garrison camp, resulting in insufficient accommodation in the barracks in the Lion City. Moreover, there were so many noble children who came to participate in this election of royal knights. They all had horses. Not to mention, they occupied all the taverns and hotels in the city. They also made the entire Lion City look like a big cesspit. Completely useless. Place to set foot. Even the prices of horse feeds such as hay and beans in Lysher City have increased several times. People under Leon Myshyong International do not have to pay business tax in Lysher City. Naturally, they can do all kinds of business. They seized the opportunity and ruthlessly made a lot of money. So at this time, Ulrich was making personal arrangements to use Yaladil Village as a temporary military camp for the cavalry troops. To rescue Lion City from the cesspit. And at the same time rescue his own wallet from high-priced horse feed. 
When Cadden brought the Desha people here, he had no intention of attacking Lion City. Instead, he planned to quickly attack the surrounding villages and towns, grab them and run away. Naturally, when leading an army to rob a village, they would not waste time doing any intelligence gathering. Adhering to Cadden Khan's eight-character policy of Move quickly and leave as soon as the robbery is over. The Desha army rushed into Yaladar village at full speed. But Cadden never expected that there would be so many troops in this village. Ulrich really didn't expect that the troops from the Bacchus Empire didn't come. But the Desha people came instead? Is this Cadden Khan too courageous to actually dare to take advantage of Lion City? You really mistook the lion for a sick cat. Right? If the Dexia people were not killed here, all the wealthy households in the Lion City area would definitely feel unsafe. And they would run away with their families. So the angry Ulrich blew the charge himself. When the capital area is attacked, this is different from ordinary battles. The troops of the Lion Kingdom were all very active. Basically all of them, including the nobles, were mobilized. And Bahadur Khan Kadden was not even given a chance to turn around and run away. Especially those young nobles who have just been promoted to Lion Knights. All of them are yearning to make contributions and make great achievements. And they scream fiercely. Just one day later, there were many dead and injured outside the village of Yaligul, with corpses scattered everywhere. There were large cavalry units on both sides, and there was no way to plan any tactics in the sudden encounter. This kind of battle was fought very quickly, and people died very quickly. As a result, both Bahadur Khan and King Ulrich were on the verge of tears at the same time. The newly rebuilt Lion Knights charged too hard and lost a third of them. Most of the dead were the new Royal Knights, and their new retinues, who were not skilled in cooperating. This result is normal. And the new recruits of the Royal City Guards died more. And the overstaffing state was suddenly restored to the original strength of 1,500 people. Now the barracks in Lysher City were enough. Ulrich felt at that time that he might go bankrupt. How much pension will this cost? The Desha army of Bahad Khan Kadden suffered even more heavy casualties. And they did not gain any benefit at all. So Kadden quickly withdrew the remaining soldiers to the territory of Dexia even giving up the wounded. The Dexia people with full cavalry were capable of running away, and could even take away most of the horses that had lost their owners. Therefore, although the Lion Kingdom seemed to have won the battle, it basically did not get any valuable spoils and suffered considerable losses. As for Desha, Cadden sent troops this time to lead his diehard cronies who supported him. Now the loss of strength is too heavy. God knows whether his position as Bahad Khan will be stable after returning to Desha. You must know that the Principality of Desha was actually a semi-hereditary and semi-electoral country before Cadden's rule. Bahad Khan, the messenger of God in the world, was originally elected by various tribes. Just like the title, Caliph. In Desha it means the successor of the divine messenger. It was originally elected by various tribes. The Caliph is one of the candidates for the next Bahad Khan. There are usually three to four. By originally refers to the person who assists the envoys to lead the way for the people. It is a local governor who combines military, politics and religion, similar to a general or a city lord, and is also the local religious leader. It can also be seen from the meaning of this title that this person was originally elected as a leader by the local people. Only the conships of various tribes are mostly hereditary. But in fact, more than 200 years ago, even the position of Khan was held by the most prestigious person elected within each tribe. To this day, there are still some small tribes that use the method of recommendation to elect their Khan. But after Kardang came to power, he completely changed the system. In other words, he became Bahad because he changed the system. He used the hereditary system to make promises to powerful tribal leaders, promising that the tribal leaders who supported him would become hereditary, caliphs, or by. Children and grandchildren can control greater power. So in the election of various tribes, Kadan, who was young at the time, was successfully elected as Bahad. Subsequently, Kadan fulfilled his promise. He took the new powers that be who became caliphs and bays because they supported him, and used force and violence to forcibly change the election system of the principality of Desha to a hereditary system, and adopted feudal autonomy similar to that of various kingdoms. In other words, Cardin directly and fully corresponded to the religious-related titles such as Bahad, Caliph, and by to the titles of King, Duke, Baron, and so on in the Kingdom of Lion. Each title can be passed on to its own heir, and unless one family dies, it will no longer be recommended. After a great purge filled with blood and violence, 
Cadden created a permanent group of high-ranking aristocrats in Desha. This comprehensive transformation from the electoral system to the hereditary system has indeed quickly stabilized Cardin's rule in a very short period of time. Those who have gained power certainly want to maintain it permanently. So they must support Cardin's approach. This has nothing to do with the country's religious beliefs and culture. Who doesn't want future generations to always be a higher ruling class? Moreover, after Cadden used force to purge the disobedient tribal leaders, he indeed unified the entire Dexia. Dexia is no longer a loose tribal alliance. And the tribes rarely have civil wars with each other. The national strength has indeed been thus improved a lot. As a result, Dexia has never implemented an election system in the past 20 years. Now it is more like a dynasty. Except for the difference in religion and culture. It is essentially the same as other kingdoms. But just like the reforms of Emperor Marius, changes in the political system of any country will always cause conflicts. In the past 20 years, those who have benefited from the hereditary system have been the tribal leaders who once supported Cadden, which naturally allowed Cadden to secure his position as Bahadur. But now, many tribal leaders who originally supported Cadden are old and dead, and their descendants have inherited their status. But these young new Khans are not very familiar with Cadden. Besides, most people in high positions have more than one child, and there is only one high-level title. Children who fail to inherit the title will naturally have other ideas. For example, Cardin himself can use force to force the hereditary system and create a group of high-level aristocrats to support him in becoming Bahadur. This actually points out a clear path for these young people. As long as there are enough people and troops to support him, who can anyone can become a Bahadur in this way? Even if they are not strong enough, they can at least become Caliph or Bai by supporting another Bahadur, just like their father supported Cadden. So today's Desha is not stable. And Cadden is already facing the threat of another challenger his brother Emil Xerxes. In fact, Amir Xerxes used the hereditary system created by Cardin to challenge Bahad's position. Because Cadden created the Bahadur hereditary system, he also gave his father the title of Bahadur Khan. Anyone who ascends to the throne or the throne will do this. The Dexia tradition is that after the death of the father, the property owned by the father should be divided equally among all the children. Therefore, Amir Xerxes claimed that since his father was the former Bahad Khan, the entire principality of Desha should be divided into two halves, so that both children could become Bahadur Khan. If it is in a tribe, after the tribe's Khan dies, the two children can indeed divide the tribe equally. For example, the brothers Kadden and Amir Xerxes were divided into two tribes, the Kadden tribe and the Amir tribe, from their father's tribe, both of which were Khans. Since Kadden himself promoted the hereditary system, it was not easy for him to object to this reason, so his younger brother has been claiming to divide Desha equally. And he has indeed received support from some young tribal leaders, mostly those who failed to inherit the caliphate or the young man with the title of Bai. If Desha is still under the recommendation system, then even if Kadin cripples all the troops, his status will not be affected. After all, Bahad is recommended by the tribal leaders themselves, and everyone will generally not slap him in the face. But now, Cardin has used force to force the formation of a hereditary system. He understands better than anyone else that the strength in his hands is everything. He also knew that his case was ahead of him. And every Khan in Dexia probably understood this truth. At the same time, every leader will probably try to copy his rise to power when given the chance. Nowadays, when his troops suffer huge losses, people like Emil Xerxes may not be content with it. And many others will not be content with it. Therefore, Cardin did not dare to continue fighting. He could only withdraw back to the country with the remaining troops filled with sadness, preparing to face another difficult challenge from within. The Desha people retreated, and Ulrich and Cardin fought a lose-lose situation. In fact, this situation of losing both sides was just the beginning. After all, this was a blatant attack by the Principality of Dexia on the capital of the Kingdom of Lysher. In this case, the Kingdom of Lysher could only make the only response. Ulrich, who was also filled with sadness, declared a full-scale war on the Principality of Desha, and sent Desha to the Principality regards it as the highest priority enemy, the kind that will not stop until death. In the king's order issued, Ulrich directly called the Dexia Principality, the cult bandit in the desert, and Bahadur was also called the brutal cult leader. After all, Lion City is the capital of the Lion Kingdom. If the capital of any country is attacked, this can only be the reaction, and Ulrich is extremely angry now much more angry than when Chicha Fortress was captured. This bad battle has driven him to the verge of bankruptcy. To be honest, 
Eric has been busy coordinating the mood of the caravan during this period. This huge caravan only moves slowly from a location dozens of miles east of Chicha Fortress to the Saba River. Then Eric and Lehman teamed up to take him back to the original place and just moved back and forth without doing anything. The result was like this. After learning about the situation, Leong suddenly became energetic. Now, a new strategic goal appears in front of the Lord. Command the kingdom's army. Invade the principality of Dexia in the name of revenge. And fight a long war in Dexia territory. In other words, use force to open up a new market. This time, Leong did not hesitate at all. He quickly mobilized his army and once again set out within three days. The efficiency of dispatching troops was as ridiculously fast as ever. Moreover, he issued a martial order to the lords across the country, summoning the troops of each lord to gather directly at the Sava River Fort to prepare for an all-out attack on the Principality of Desha. Of course, the problem of Chicha Fortress also needs to be solved. After all, King Ulrich's request is here, and the king did not let Leon change his strategic goals. But the lord has no intention of storming the Chicha Fortress, and such a giant bastion is not easy to capture. Leon knows that the Bacchus Empire is in a bad situation. So he plans to have a friendly consultation with General Agathon to see if this matter can be a cannot be resolved peacefully. Chapter 258 I Can't Believe You Agathon has been squatting in Chicha Fortress for almost a month. To be honest, he was really panicking during this time. After the negotiation with King Ulrich broke down, Agathon knew that the Lion Kingdom would probably send a large army to attack. He also knew that he had to repulse at least one attack by the Lion Kingdom army before he could start negotiations again so he placed some scouts around and kept an eye on the recent situation. However, he didn't understand the situation at all during this period. First, a large army from the Lion Kingdom quickly arrived dozens of miles east of Chicha Fortress. The size of the army was quite terrifying. With more than a thousand baggage carriages, alone, Agathon felt that this was probably the Lion Kingdom preparing for a long siege. So he was prepared to be besieged. Not only did he ask his troops to save rations and prepare for a protracted war, they also divided the troops into two shifts and kept nervously adopting a defensive posture. But who knew that the army was slowly moving back and forth from north to south? And then from south to north near Chicha Fortress. But it never came to fight. Agazon is not afraid of fighting. But this situation of always going back and forth, but not attacking is too weird. This made Agathon feel panicked. And if he came? He would leave. I keep lingering at the door, and don't come in. Isn't this tempting? Moreover. Agasun knew that the handsome flag leading the army was Liang's flag. Leon was a very powerful strategist in Agasun's eyes. And Agasun did not dare to relax at all. As a result, this army wandered back and forth near the Chicha Fortress, causing Agasun to lose sleep every day. He kept thinking about what strange means Leon would use. And he really couldn't sleep. And then, Leon's army went east. Eric took the caravan a little further east, leaving Agathon's reconnaissance range. This made Agathon even more worried, fearing that Leon would launch an attack on the Empire from Kalandir Castle. The eastern part of the Empire would be completely unable to free up its hands. I am afraid that it would be impossible to stop Leon. But just when Agathon was panicking and planning to withdraw from the Chicha Fortress to try to block or delay, Liang's army, the large Dexia army passed by the west of the Chicha Fortress. Agathon was even more panicked now, since the Desha people dared to cross the Sava River. It meant that the Sava River fort had fallen. But General Titus and the Phoenix Knights couldn't be killed so easily. Right? Could it be said that General Titus surrendered to the enemy? Agathon was almost in despair. He knew that no matter whether Titus surrendered to the enemy or not, at least the Sava River Fort would definitely be gone. Without the Sava River Fort, he would be trapped alone in the Lion Realm. There is Liang's army in the east. The Sava River Fort in the south was captured by the Dexia people. And the Dexia army also went to the west. Even if he wanted to retreat, he had no way to go. Shortly afterwards, he discovered that the Dexia army had returned the same way it had come. It seemed that they had suffered a defeat at the foot of Lysher City. Originally, Agathon was ready to abandon Chicha Fortress at this time. After all, the Dexia army of thousands of people was defeated at the foot of Lysher City, which showed that the current strength of Lysher Kingdom far exceeded his imagination. Agathon felt that it was no wonder that Ulrich refused to negotiate in the first place. After the Lion Kingdom formed such a large-scale army in the east, the remaining troops of the Lion City could actually defeat the Dexia army? Of course, with such strength, there is no need to negotiate with oneself. 
Maybe the Lion Kingdom will divide its troops into two groups to attack the Bacchus Empire from the direction of Saba River Fort and Kalandir Castle at the same time. After all, King Ulrich always likes to use two-headed snakes. Tactical. So Augustan asked his men to get ready and plan to implement a dangerous plan again to abandon the Chicha Fortress. Set fire to the fortress. Use the fire to attract the attention of all the Lion Kingdom troops. And then try to take a detour from the north to attack the hinterland of the Lion Kingdom. Such a Shurhu city. This judgment is indeed very accurate. The current Shurhu city is indeed very empty. If Agathon really goes to attack Shurhu city by surprise, he will probably be able to succeed with one blow. Agathon felt that if a place like Lion Lake City was captured, the Lion Kingdom would definitely not send out troops for a while. And the Bacchus Empire would definitely get time to recover. Even if he was fighting in the Lion Kingdom. Death. At least Emperor Marius could seize this time to organize an army to block the enemy. But before he implemented this plan, Liang's team appeared again in Agathon's eyes. It was actually the caravan. And it came slowly from the east again. And stationed directly near Chicha Fortress. The walls can be seen with the naked eye. This is when Eric heard that the Dexia army had escaped. So he was going to take the caravan back to the gathering point designated by Liang. In fact, Liang had not received any news in Chengha town at this time. And naturally no new orders were sent. Come! After being taken back and forth a few times, the merchants probably realized that the battle situation might be a bit complicated. Now they are more obedient than at the beginning. And the order seems much better. From a distance, they look more like a regular group army. As a result, Agathon thought that Liang had seen his plan. In Agatha's mind, Liang was a strategist on the same level as Emperor Marius. After all, Emperor Marius also treated Liang as an equal in his words. So Agathon did not dare to move. He felt that Liang's army was stationed so close, but was not moving. He was probably waiting for him to leave the Chicha Fortress and intercept it outside the city. Agathon felt that Liang had trapped him in Chicha Fortress on purpose. So he had to give up the plan and lamented that Liang was really a terrible enemy who knew people's hearts. So he once again asked his troops to work in two shifts to prepare for defense with all their strength. And was fully prepared for a deadly battle. So in the past month, Agathon has basically not been able to sleep well. Can't eat well. Has lost weight several times. And is in a trance all day long. When he saw the Lord appearing at the gate of Chicha Fortress, Agathon felt that he must be hallucinating. He sighed on the spot. The time has come! And felt that he was probably not going to die soon. It was under this circumstance that Liang met General Agazon. To be honest, Liang didn't recognize at first glance that the emaciated and shaky sick man in front of him was actually Agathon. His face was pale. His beard and hair were messy. And his eyes were dull. He was so thin that he could barely hold up his armor. The dark circles under his eyes looked sunken. And he kept talking to himself. Leon once thought that this guy was an addict. And he was obviously in a state of unconsciousness after taking drugs. Because the first words Agathon said when he saw Leon were, Count Leon, you are finally here. I will dream about you whenever I close my eyes recently. The Lord almost kicked her away at that time. With such a resentful expression and a resentful tone, it looked like she had been abandoned by Leon. By the time Leon finally recognized that this was indeed Agathon himself, Agathon had already begun to express his stance in a way of saying his last words. Your Excellency Leong, I know that with the current situation, I am no longer qualified to ask for anything more. But I can't watch the Bacchus Empire being invaded. Especially, I can't watch you leading an army to invade the Empire. Agathon was a little weak when he spoke, and his eyes when looking at Leong became more and more like a resentful woman. Me? Invading the Empire? Wait. Agathon, do you have some misunderstanding? Leong is now even more confused than Agatha. When did I say that I would attack the Bacchus Empire? Don't hide it from me. You will appear here. You must be here to persuade me to surrender. Right. Don't think about it. I will definitely defend Chicha Fortress. Even if you die here, I will hold you back. Agathon is probably a little nervous now. Gritting his teeth and being resolute. The Lord was even more confused. Hey! Agathon. Can you just listen to me? I will not surrender. Give up your unrealistic thoughts. Agathon's red eyes stared at the Lord. As if he was afraid of what Leon might say to persuade him to surrender. And was probably worried about what methods Leon might use. Surport like H. L. I want you to surrender for no reason. I came to you to ask if you are willing to form an alliance with me and attack the Principality of Dexia together. Leon finally couldn't help but raise his voice. And said what he wanted to say first. 
regardless of whether Agasun was continuing to speak. Humph. Only Agathon died in the battle. Not. Agathon had been making a heroic statement. But when he suddenly heard the word, alliance, his words stopped abruptly. After a while, he hesitated and spoke again. Well, you just said that you want to form an alliance with me. Yes. You can first sign a truce with me on behalf of the Bacchus Empire. And then you go to Emperor Marius. I will form an alliance with His Majesty Marius at the Sava River Fort. And then invade the Dexia territory with the Bacchus Empire. Seeing that Agatha was finally able to speak properly, the Lord Lord breathed a sigh of relief. This dot do you have some conspiracy? Do you really plan to form an alliance with the Empire like this? Agasun obviously didn't expect that Liang's conditions were so easy. And it felt a bit unreal. This was a development direction that he didn't even dare to think about. Agathon, are you on drugs? Given the situation you are facing now, do I need to lie to you? To be honest, judging from the current situation, being stuck in the fortress will have no effect at all. I can even burn Chicha Fortress on fire and suffocate you inside, since it won't cost me any money to rebuild the fortress. Leong really didn't intend to deceive people this time. Seeing Agatha's suspicion, the Lord naturally became less polite when he spoke. But to be honest, it is actually difficult for Leong to set fire to the Chicha Fortress. He was just casually expressing his emotions. Unless the insiders set the fire themselves. Otherwise this kind of bastion would be easy to defend and it would be difficult to get close. The shooting angle of the crossbow on the bastion is very wide. And there is basically no blind spot. If you really dare to set fire, you must be prepared to kill and injure thousands of people. But when Leong mentioned a fire burned Chicha Fortress, Agathon's heart sank. Agathon thought that the Lord had indeed guessed his plan to burn the fortress and run for thousands of miles. And when he guessed his plan, he came to the door in person and offered such easy conditions. This was probably some kind of conspiracy. It was probably to lie to him. With such a terrifying enemy, Agathon felt that if he also commanded the army, he might not be able to fight against Liang. And he did not want to try Liang's conspiracy. But now, this terrible enemy is right in front of him. He is standing at the entrance of Chicha Fortress. Only three steps away from him. The guards on both sides were far away. Agathon closed his eyes that were red and dry due to lack of sleep. And slowly touched his hand to the hilt of the sword at his waist. Count Leon. You are the most powerful enemy I have ever encountered in my life. I can't believe you. Agathon was probably making some determination. And there was a hint of determination in his words. Just as the words. I can't believe you. Came out of his mouth. Agasun gathered all his strength and stepped forward, swinging a sword that condensed what he had learned throughout his life. There is always distrust between people. Of course, in this world, everything will never go smoothly, and it is common for others not to trust you. But the Lord felt that he was very miserable. Why did no one believe him when he always told the truth? In the past, when I really tried to deceive people, others believed me. Why is it so difficult to be an honest gentleman? Originally, Leon sincerely wanted to form an alliance with the Bacchus Empire and invade Dexia. This would be very beneficial to both the Lion Kingdom and Bacchus, as well as to Leon himself and the caravan. Originally, it was a win-win situation. According to the Lord's own prediction, General Agathon should be happy to accept this situation. And then not only can he peacefully take back the Chicha Fortress, but he can also invade Dexia with the troops of the Bacchus Empire, reducing the pressure of the war anyway. Leon wanted to open up the market. And with the profits from the caravan, his troops would not compete with the Bacchus Empire for the spoils of war. But Agasun had been suffering in the Chicha Fortress in the past month. And his mind was full of thoughts of a decisive battle. His state was indeed a bit dazed. And he had been thinking about what conspiracy this terrible enemy Leon might be planning. So the result of this meeting was that Leon was injured by the sword. And Agathon was kicked by Leon who made a temporary counterattack and broke his ribs. Agathon wanted to kill this enemy who, in his opinion, might lead to the collapse of the empire. In Agathon's heart, everything said by Leon, the strategist master, must be carefully considered. Does Leon want to form an alliance with Emperor Marius in the Sava River Fort? Is it really about forming an alliance? What if he wanted to lure His Majesty the Emperor to the Sava River Fort? and then launch a large army to fight to completely destroy the Bacchus Empire? Based on Leon's reputation for eradicating the snake cult and controlling the Red Death in Bacchus. If Emperor Marius was gone, the Bacchus people would probably not be too opposed to Leon becoming the new ruler of the South. Right? 
Could it be that Liang worked so hard to eliminate the snake cult just for this moment? His Majesty the Emperor said that Liang was thinking about the entire continent just like him. So would Liang be like His Majesty the Emperor and have the desire to rule the entire continent? It should be possible. Otherwise, why would he send troops to deal with the snake cult for the sake of the people of Bacchus? Since I cannot deal with this formidable enemy, and His Majesty the Emperor finds it difficult to deal with it, it is best to let this formidable enemy disappear. He is standing in front of me now. He is the Marshal of the Lion Kingdom. If he dies, the Bacchus Empire can also resolve the crisis. This was Agatha's thought when he swung that sword. This thought was actually reasonable. Agathan's swordsmanship is actually very good. When he swung the sword, he gathered all his energy and energy. He knew that Leon was extraordinary. And he knew that he only had one chance to strike with the sword. Leon didn't expect that Odysseus would suddenly take action at this time. And what Odysseus used was actually a genuine sword drawing technique. The sword was so sudden that he couldn't even see the light of the sword. The Lord was indeed stabbed. And the sword was so powerful that even the enchanted armor made by Noldo on Leon could not block it. However, this sword did not stab Leon to death after all. A small object that the Lord had been carrying in his arms blocked the tip of the sword. Then the sword tip slipped. And a half foot long wound was drawn diagonally on Liang's chest. What blocked the tip of the sword was the dragon tear. The dragon tear obtained from Alric. The noisy one of the drunkard group. This dragon tear was shattered by Agassin's sword with all his strength. But it saved Liang's life. Chapter 259 Windy Seal Liang's reaction after being hit by the sword scared all his men. After being struck by a sword in the chest. Leon only had time to kick out a kick in a hurry knocking Agathon over. Then he covered his chest and prepared to run back. He was at the gate of Chicha Fortress, within the shooting range of the Bastion, but he only staggered a few steps before falling to the ground unconscious. It looked like it was dead. Agathon was also kicked hard by Leon and was knocked out of breath. He didn't regain his strength for a long time. The guards on both sides were all stunned. Wendy! Close and others reacted very quickly. They rushed forward to protect the Lord and quickly took him away from the Chicha Fortress. However, Agathon's men did not use crossbows to deal with clothes and others. After all, General Agathon also fell at the gate of the fortress and could not get up. They had to drag their general back to the fortress and close the gate. So the two sides just took their boss and broke away from each other. Afterwards, the men protected the unconscious Lord and rushed to Karen Deer Castle in the east. Leon was still alive, but he was unconscious. Anson was at Karen Deer Castle. Liang's men felt that the Lord seemed to be injured. Seriously? Anson is probably the only one who can save his life at the moment. Karen Deer Castle was not far away. In order to save time, Rasatalan took the two fastest Nordoma horses to Karen Deer Castle first, intending to take Anson to the closer Salem village. It's important to save some time when rescuing people. Leon was unconscious and couldn't ride a horse. And his chest was injured and he couldn't be bumpy. He could only use a relatively stable carriage, which would definitely be slower. Fortunately, Leon came up with a box carriage. Otherwise using a truck would have been too bumpy and would have aggravated the injury. The subordinates are all quite reliable. And no one intends to cause trouble with Agathon at this time. Everyone just wants to save the Lord first. Windife was very panicked now because she could hear the Lord's heartbeat with her ears. Although everyone's heartbeat sounded similar to Wendy, Leon's heartbeat was completely different. Just like people can always see their lover among thousands of people at a glance. Wendy can also distinguish the voice from Leon among thousands of troops. Any sound. And Liang's heartbeat was particularly chaotic now. And the frequency kept slowing down. Wendy felt that she did not protect the Lord well. She was Liang's personal guard. But Leon was seriously injured in front of her eyes. At this moment, Wendy felt as if a sword had been stabbed in her chest. And her heart was in pain. Perhaps Wendy hoped that it was herself who was hit by the sword at this time. Because she felt that if she was hit by the sword, the Lord would definitely have a way to save her. Now Leon was injured. But Wendy didn't know what to do. The Lord did not take Amy's female soldiers with him when he went out this time. Before meeting Anson, Wendy, as the only woman in the team, was naturally responsible for taking care of the Lord along the way. There are many girls who are clever and can take better care of themselves than rough guys like clothes. But Wendy was standing guard in a four-wheeled carriage at this time, looking at Leon lying in the carriage, with tears in her eyes. But she was at a loss what to do. She had removed the enchanted armor from the Lord's body, and her underwear had been cut open, exposing the wound on her chest. The wound looked very deep, half a foot long, 
diagonally cut from the center of the chest to the left, where the heart was. In fact, as a soldier, Wendy would naturally do a simple bandage to stop the bleeding. But the problem is that Liang's wound looks very wrong. The wound does not bleed a lot, but there are some scattered purple crystals embedded in the wound, and it is even emitting light. Wendy had never seen this situation before. The long wounds were still open, but they did not continue to bleed. This in itself was very abnormal. As for the purple crystals at the wound, Wendy had never seen it before. In fact, Wendy has seen dragon tears. The Noldor people have been using the magic contained in dragon tears to maintain the illusion around the city of Alakla. This is a kind of magic circle that generally refracts nearby light. Making a Lakli last city has never been discovered by humans. This is probably the only large-scale magic that the Noldor elves can activate. The reason why I say activation is because this is not a concrete magic. It is just the use of magic items. The magic circle in the city of Arrakal is just a magic item set up in the Tower of Arrakal, which was brought by Avidane, the first generation of Noldor elf king who first came to the continent of Pender. Although Avidane is a Noldor, he is a child of the Sidaran elves, and he brought his family's magic items from home. Because of this, only the descendants of the Noldor elf king can activate Arakli's circle. As one of the inheritors of the elf king's bloodline, Wendy naturally has to learn how to activate the magic circle in Alakal City. So she has seen dragon tears. And she has seen a lot of them. The brilliance emitted by these scattered crystals in Liang's wounds looks very much like the dragon's tears taking effect in the magic circle. But the problem is, dragon tears are not this color. Dragon tears are royal blue. The crystals in Liang's wound were rich purple. And the purple light seemed to have stars flowing through it. Just like Windulf's purple eyes. Winnie didn't know what was going on. But she felt that if this continued, Master Liang's heartbeat might disappear. Because Liang's current heartbeat was only about 10 times per minute. Windife knew that once the human heartbeat dropped to such a frequency, it would basically be on the verge of death. Liang's breathing has also slowed down to an extremely slow level. Only taking about 3 breaths a minute. But Winnie didn't dare to take out the crystal fragments. The fragments were deeply embedded in Liang's wound. In this case, it was best not to touch it unless you were a professional doctor. Wendy still knew this common sense. Wendy's eyes gradually filled with tears. She didn't know what to do at this time. She thought that Liang's current condition was either because his heart was injured, or because he had lost all his blood when he escaped from the Chicha Fortress. Is it because of excessive blood loss? Or is it because Liang's heart is about to fail? Wendy wasn't sure. She didn't have any medical skills. But she remembered what Leon said when he was anxious after Alice was infected with the Red Death. I wonder if it will get better after drinking my blood. Wendy didn't know that Leon had told Anson that blood transfusions between people of different blood types were poison. And she wasn't around at that time. The tearful girl decided to give it a try. Try her blood. Because Wendy does know that her blood is different. She has known it since she was a child. To activate the Erical City Magic Circle, you need the blood of a purple-eyed Nolder like her. Or in other words, you need the bloodline passed down from the first elf king Ava Dane. That is, the bloodline of the Sindarin elves. The way to activate the magic circle is to use blood. Use the blood of the purple-eyed Noldor elves to redraw the runes on the sigils in the Erekli Tower. Precisely because blood is needed to open the magic circle. The three Noldor elf kings will not close the magic circle, except when the magic power of dragon tears is exhausted every few years. After all, it is not easy to have the blood of purple eyes. If there are too many, it will be more troublesome to start. In fact, in earlier times, only the Noldor who could activate the magic circle could become the Elf King, which meant that the purple-eyed Noldor must succeed the Elf King. Of course, that was a rule long ago. Now that the Noldor are facing the crisis of genocide, they will naturally no longer stick to this rule. However, Islandel has been, His Highness, for 300 years and has not become king. In fact, it is somewhat due to this reason. Islandel's bloodline may be relatively weak, and he cannot activate the Alakal method alone. Array. In addition, the Aino family inherits the knowledge and culture of the Noldor. So Islandel abides by the ancient rules, and has always refused to be crowned. But Wendy is different. She has known since she was a child that her blood does contain magic. Because as soon as she could remember, she was taken to the Alakal Tower by three elf kings, who taught her how to use magic circles and some runes. Almost everything a person learns when he or she is young becomes an instinct that he or she will never forget throughout his life. And the same goes for Nolder. Even though Wendy has never used those runes personally for decades, Wendy clearly remembers what each rune looks like. In fact, 
there are still many runes inherited by the Noldor. The elves have not stopped the transmission of this ancient knowledge. But there are really not many that can be used nowadays. Some represent sharpness and will be used on arrows. Some represent toughness and will be used on armor. There are also ones that represent vitality and are used on newborn Noldor babies. Childbirth is difficult in the Noldor. And the cycle of adulthood is long. Perhaps there are runes that can guarantee the survival rate of babies. Anyway, this rune has continued to exist to this day. These runes are actually the secrets of Noldor enchanted equipment. The Noldor don't just rely on the technology of refining alloys to make excellent equipment. Those sigils made of runes can actually work. It's just that the role of these runes in the hands of the Noldor elves is not as obvious as that of the Sidarin elves. Nor is it as convenient. If the Sidarin elves want to enchant equipment, they don't need to use foreign objects at all, while the Noldor elves only inherit technology, but cannot use magic so they must use carriers. This carrier is called Mithril, which is the Ebony of Pender Continent. Ebony probably contains a little magic power, and also has the ability to conduct magic power. What Leon said at the time was actually not accurate. Ebony itself cannot actually be called Mithril. It should be called the raw material of Mithril. The way to transform Ebony into Mithril is to use it to carve runes and form sigils. When the rune takes effect, the originally pure black Ebony will turn into silver white Mithril. This is why Noldor, who does not have magic power, can still enchant various equipment. Mithril is what makes up the sigil and has its effect. The equipment itself is actually only used to inlay Mithril. Naturally, many materials can be used. Therefore, Noldor's sigil armor is even cloth armor and is lighter. The runes used on babies are probably because Noldor babies themselves are lives containing magical power. But it is difficult to say whether such life runes have any effect. Anyway, Every pair of Noldor parents will use their own blood to draw the runes of life on the child immediately after giving birth to a child. This has been done for thousands of years. And now it has become a birth ritual. The exhausted mother will not rest until she is sure that the child is healthy and alive. And the father will go to the celebration. It is difficult for the Noldor to give birth. Every time a Noldor is born, a celebration will be held in the ethnic settlement where the child lives. Right now, what Wendy plans to try is the rune that represents vitality the kind that Noldor parents use on babies. Originally, Wendy planned to try to let Leon drink her own blood. But Leon was now unconscious and naturally couldn't drink anything. So Wendy decided to use this method. Naturally, she, an underage girl, had never used this method before. But Liang's heartbeat was getting slower and slower. And she was already seriously ill and sought medical treatment. She cut her wrist open and began to use her own blood to draw a series of runes representing vitality on Liang's chest and connected the runes to form a talisman covering the entire chest. In fact, Winnie didn't know whether the rune used on the Noldor baby could have any effect on Leon. After all, Leon was not the Noldor, and the Noldor tribe would not treat injuries like this. But she knew it wouldn't hurt at least. There was certainly no harm in smearing blood on her body. If this kind of rune is useful for babies, then it might also be useful for lords. Plus his own blood. Although Lord Leon was not allowed to drink it, the runes drawn with his own blood should have some effect. Right? Wendy thought anxiously. She had been concentrating on drawing the runes. And the carriage was always a little bumpy. She had to do her best to maintain the integrity of the runes. And she drew slowly and carefully. Therefore, Wendy, who was too serious, did not notice that the purple light in Liang's wound seemed to be directed towards the runes drawn with blood. Move? It's like wanting to take the initiative to come into contact with Wendy's blood but it was out of reach. And the runes drawn by Wendy did not touch the injured area. I don't know how long it took. But Wendy was only halfway through the painting. Her wrist was not cut deep enough. And it gradually became scabbed and stopped bleeding. So she gave herself another knife and reopened the wound. This time, the cut was more severe. And the carriage shook. So a large stream of blood spattered and fell on the wound on Liang's chest. No! Wendy finally cried out, tears welling up in her eyes. But this was not because of the pain and blood loss in her wrist. But because the string of blood covered up part of the runes she had just drawn. The entire talisman on Liang's body. So it was ruined. But then, Wendy covered her mouth and looked at the changes in Liang's wound with tears. The purple crystal fragments in the wound suddenly glowed with brilliance as Wendy's blood splashed into them. And the dazzling light filled the entire carriage at this moment. But this kind of light does not make people feel dazzling. Instead, it makes people feel extremely gentle. Just like a mother's embrace. But it makes people feel a little bit sad. It's like a faint sadness 
that suddenly emerges from the depths of the soul. After a moment, the light dissipated, and the wounds on Liang's body were revealed. Gone. Gone were the purple crystals and the runes drawn by Wendy. Liang's body was clean, as if nothing had happened, not even a scar. Wendy Dot, why are you crying? Dot, wait a minute. Where are my clothes? The Lord opened his eyes, but then he realized that he was naked, and he quickly touched his lower body. Fortunately, the pants are still on. Chapter 260 Definitely a Real Man. Sir, are you awake? Wendy laughed while shedding tears. It turns out this really works. I didn't expect it to work the first time. Ha uh ha. -huh. This underage girl is genuinely happy. What? Wendy Dot, you. You? You dot what did you do to me? What's the first time? Leon looked at Wendy who was crying and laughing. And his mouth started to wet. He quickly covered the two points on his chest and started to pull off his underwear. But the underwear had been cut to pieces by Wendy. And now there was only a bloody rag left. So the Lord grabbed the rag with both hands and covered his chest. Looking as if he had just been ruined. Leon had just woken up from a coma. And he was actually not quite awake yet. He didn't realize that his wounds were gone. Ha ah, dot it's nothing. You seem to be fine dot wait a minute. Wendy laughed out loud. But then her expression changed. She frowned and grabbed the Lord's hand. And forcibly opened Liang's hands covering his chest. Then she leaned down and put her face close to Liang's chest. Hey. 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 Wendy. Don't. 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 You're still underage. The Lord struggled in panic for a while. But he had just woken up from a coma. So naturally he had no strength. He really couldn't defeat Wendy. So he could only watch as Wendy pressed her face against his chest. The two arms were still firmly pressed behind Wendy's back. It looked like Wendy had hugged Leon around her waist. And she had twisted Liang's arms to hug him forcefully. Stop talking. Dot this dot this is wrong. Why is it so slow? Wendy used a little more force to suppress Leon who was resisting. Her brows frowning more and more. What dot what's so slow? Wendy, what are you talking about? The Lord stopped struggling. It was useless to struggle anyway. Besides, which man could bear to push away the beautiful girl who was clinging to his chest? Moreover, this beautiful girl's eyes were filled with tears. Your heartbeat. Why is it still so slow? Don't you feel anything? Wendy finally let go of her arms, raised her head, and looked at Leong. Her face was extremely worried, and there seemed to be some tears in her eyes. She was still worried that Lord Lord's situation was too abnormal. His heartbeat was still only a dozen times a minute. Huh? Heartbeat? Feeling? This? What should I feel? The Lord didn't know what Wendy was talking about. Just now Wendy rushed up to her and hugged her. Which made him panic and even started to think wildly. Does Wendy mean that I don't care about her? Didn't my heart beat faster when she pressed against my chest? Is that what you mean? Has this underage girl read another romance novel? You are not yet a minor. Say it again. I'm still wearing my pants. So of course my heart won't race. The Lord looked around. Confused about Wendy's condition. And then, he saw the scars on Wendy's wrist. It was a wound made by Wendy herself. The cut was a bit deep and bleeding all the time. Cut your wrists. Still crying? Leon was shocked at the time. This couldn't be some bloody situation like committing suicide for love. Right? But? Why? Isn't it? Wendy dot what's going on? Did you cut it yourself? The Lord Lord was really panicking now. What happened during the time when I was unconscious? Why did Wendy commit suicide by cutting her wrists? He turned over and sat up. Took Wendy's arm. And started to bandage her with the rag that was originally underwear. Wendy looked at Liang's nervous face in a daze. She wanted to pull out her arm to explain. But suddenly discovered something. She lowered her head in confusion again. And put her face against Liang's chest again. Sir! Your heartbeat has finally gotten a little faster dot but dot but. The Lord bandaged Wendy's wrist. And Wendy raised her head again. She no longer shed tears. But her face was still full of worry. Liang's face was full of confusion. Wendy! You? Ugh! The Lord really didn't know what to say. He even saw Wendy slit her wrists. Wouldn't that make his heart beat faster? This is all scary. This situation is much scarier than being stabbed by Agathon in a sneak attack. I feel more distressed too. It really didn't hurt as much as it does now when the sword hit my chest. Wait a moment. Chest. Leon lowered his head and looked in disbelief. Then touched his chest with both hands. And then touched his left shoulder along the left chest. All the injuries on my body are healed? 
How long have I been unconscious? The Lord Lord exclaimed. He clearly remembered that he was stabbed by Agathon. At that time, he did not know how deep the wound was. But at least, he was sure that the injury was serious. In any case, it would not be possible in a short time. Heal. Moreover, he knew that Anson was assigned to Karen Deer Castle at this time. And the doctor was not in the team. So he could not provide him with a healing speed bonus. Not only that, he also discovered a surprising fact. There was an arrow wound on his left shoulder. It was a penetrating wound left during the bloody battle with the Gatu people in Fletcher Village. Although it healed, there was still a scar. But now, even the scar on the left shoulder is gone. And the skin all over the body is as smooth as a child. No matter how awesome your medical skills are, you can't still provide full body beauty services. Right? There is no such high technology in this era. Probably dot a little more than half a day. Sir, do you really feel nothing unusual? Your heartbeat is still very slow now. Much slower than the average person. I am very worried. Wendy wiped the tears from her face. She had really been worried. She originally thought that Leong had just come back to his senses. The Lord raised his head, looked at Wendy blankly, then looked down at his bare chest, stretched out his right hand and clenched it into a fist, and then released it. No problem. I'm pretty strong now. Then he took his pulse and felt his pulse quietly. The pulse at this time was steady and strong, even much stronger than before. But it was indeed abnormally slow. It only happens once every five seconds. It stands to reason that this frequency would only appear in creatures such as giant turtles or blue whales. The former sleeps all year round and does not exercise much, while the latter needs to maintain lower oxygen consumption when diving into the sea. So the heartbeat frequency is very low. But when it occurs in humans, this frequency is not considered too slow, but is close to death and requires immediate admission to the ICU. So why was Wendy so nervous just now? But I really didn't feel anything was wrong with my body. Do you even feel stronger? He knew his body well. And Leon was sure that he was fine. So he breathed a sigh of relief. But then he became nervous again. Even if she thought she was about to die. Wendy wouldn't commit suicide. I have never issued any cruel order that if I die, my bodyguard must die together. Wendy! What happened to your wrist? First tell me what happened after I fainted. Seeing that Wendy's face was pale, Leon held up her cut wrist, left hand, gently patted the back of her cold hand, and asked her to sit down and talk. Wendy's face suddenly turned red, and the hand held by Leon shook subconsciously, but she did not withdraw it. Instead, slowly, slowly, he held Leang's paw. Hold it tight. After all, this was his own problem. So Leong asked carefully. Wendy also spoke very carefully. She talked about the abnormality of Liang's wound. The purple starry sky-like fragments. The unfinished talisman she drew with her own blood. And the last purple brilliance with a touch of sadness in the warmth. The only thing she didn't say was her heartache after Leon was injured. Nor did she say how happy she was when she saw Leon wake up. Of course, Leon had already felt what she didn't say. She looked nervous and tired. Although the blush on her face had not faded. She looked a little haggard after crying. She even forgot to take care of the injury on her wrist. Blood was scattered everywhere on the soft couch in the carriage. It turned out that it was her blood. Leon was indeed distressed. Thank you for your hard work, Dot Wendy. Please take a good rest here, Dot. You have shed so much blood for me. I will get you something delicious to make up for it. The Lord gently patted Wendy's hand and asked her to lean on the soft couch and rest for a while. Wendy did not reject Liang's kindness. She had never been polite to Leon. In addition, she had been losing blood before. She had been concentrating on drawing runes for most of the day, which was indeed very tiring. Seeing Wendy lying on the temporary hospital bed, Leon opened the partition window between the carriage compartment and the driver's seat in front, and knocked on the compartment wall. Stop! Hey! Hey! Sir! Are you awake? Close was driving the car. Hearing the Lord's instructions, Close turned his head and glanced. But he couldn't see inside the carriage from the driver's seat so he started to brake and stop the horse. This is a four-wheeled carriage that has been improved again by the Lord in recent months and is intended to be specially provided to wealthy families. It is much more advanced than the one sold to Kairos. The front wheels can be turned and it also uses a booster lever. In addition to the handbrake, a footbrake is also used and even the wheels are made of a combination of cast iron hubs and leather. The interior facilities are also very luxurious. The interior of the carriage is painted white and the Nordos designed exquisite texture decorations. 
The sofa that Leon was lying on is also made of white fur, similar to the configuration of a plush sofa bed. It makes people feel quite luxurious when they look up. Of course, such a carriage is quite luxurious. But as the Lord, now as a marshal, he naturally has to show off his performance. Of course, Liang's main purpose was not to show off. He wanted to take advantage of this opportunity where the army and caravans were dispatched in large numbers to sell this luxurious carriage to the entire continent. So he brought several of them with the army, intending to open the eyes of the wealthy people in the principality of Dexia. And at the same time, he could corrupt a sofa. The sofa in the carriage was naturally much more comfortable than marching on horseback. And it was also able to consider strategies and tactics while marching. As for cast iron wheels and leather tires. This is mainly because there is no rubber. So leather has to be used. In fact, the cost of such a carriage is not high for Leon. The Noldos have countless furs in their hands that have no place to use. They are too willing to take the trouble to skin animals. This is naturally cheaper for the Lord, and leather is leather. A specialty of the eastern part of the Lion Kingdom is not very valuable in Shanghai town. But it's different elsewhere. Hum hum. If the Lord doesn't sell this kind of luxury carriage for more than ten times the price, then it will be considered a liquidation. This kind of carriage with good maneuverability is indeed much more flexible than the ordinary carriages on Pinder. The front wheels can turn, which means the turning radius is small. The existence of cast iron wheels and foot brakes allows the carriage to face the situation more calmly. For emergency situations and steep slopes, the requirements on the road will be lower and the ride comfort will be higher. Of course, the most important thing is that the privacy is higher. This kind of car is equivalent to an independent space. And the driver sits outside the car. The driver must control the steering from the driving position in front. There are two partition walls between the driving position and the car. If the people in the car do not open the partition window, the driver can basically not hear the sound in the car at all. Close had not heard the sound of Leon and Wendy talking at all before. His driving skills were not very proficient, and he needed to concentrate. Of course, this kind of front-wheel steering carriage was just built by the Lord not long ago. And no one is skilled at it. People like Close, who is cautious and conscientious and will not be distracted, are already the best coachman at present. However, Close, a warrior who was never distracted, looked a little dull at this time. He really couldn't help but be distracted. The first order the Lord gave him after he woke up was to stop the car and find some underwear first. After all, Leon was shirtless now and his underwear was already tied around Wendy's wrists. Of course, he had to ask his men to get him a new fig leaf. Clothes actually didn't think much at the time. He stopped the car and brought out a piece of clean clothes. But the Lord did not even open the compartment door. Only opened it a crack. Then stretched out his hand and grabbed the underwear inside. In fact, this is also a normal operation for normal people. Leon can't just appear naked in front of his subordinates and wear underwear in public. Right? That's so shameless. After all, he is now a marshal. But that's normal operation under normal circumstances. Now the Lord should be a seriously injured person in Close's eyes. Even if he wakes up, he should be lying down to recuperate. Close, who realized something was wrong, felt very uneasy at the time and opened the car door and took a look inside. Then he covered his eyes and retreated and began to keep mumbling. I didn't see. I didn't see anything. I'm already blind. There's sand in my eyes. Wendy was lying on the couch with her eyes closed. Her face was red. And she seemed to have cried just now. And there were tears on her face. A lot of blood spilled on the soft mattress. Staining the original Snow White cushion with spots. Close knew that it was definitely not the Lord's blood. Because he was the one who carried Liang into the carriage. At that time, Liang's wound had stopped bleeding at all. In addition, the Lord was shirtless and was putting on underwear in a hurry. After all, Close was an experienced person. He understood immediately and felt that he might have seen something he shouldn't have seen. He felt that he was too reckless. However, Wendy looked like she had cried loudly. Could it be that the Lord used force? Hiss. Wendy is the best among the Nolder Rangers. Even though the Lord was seriously injured, he was still able to forcefully capture Wendy. Still on the carriage. This is amazing. But looking at the way Wendy is sleeping now, and the fact that she didn't hear any big noise while driving just now, it seems that although she was raped, overall it seems that the two of them are in love. Close felt that Lord Lord was really powerful. Definitely a true man among men. Chapter 261 The Dragon in the Dream When he finished dressing and opened the car door, a group of brothers had gathered outside. 
including the ten Menenheimers, who followed him in the first place. It's just that none of these big guys are concerned about the Lord's injury. But they are winking and trying to peek into the carriage. Ahem. Sir, is your injury? Okay. Summer, who had just whispered secretly with clothes for a while, greeted the Lord. I'm fine now. Samer, let the brothers stay where they are and have a meal. Then turn around and go back to Chicha Fortress. Agathon stabbed me. I have to give him something in return. Leong didn't know that his image in the eyes of his brothers had become a super scumbag. Seeing these group of subordinates talking to each other, he thought they were worried about his injury. He was quite moved and felt that Medenheim as expected. People are all good brothers who value feelings. Summer turned around to pass the order, but turned around and winked at close. In the past, Wendy had been doing the job of passing the order. It seemed that it was no longer convenient for Wendy. Obviously, Close has already had some gossip with his fellow countrymen. But Close was still measured. He only talked to the old brothers who followed Leong through life and death. After all, these old brothers know a lot. When they were in Fletcher Village, they always saw Leon and Sarah sneaking around alone with the mercenaries behind their backs. When they were in Mixiangling, they saw Leslie and Sarah coming out of Leon's tent at the same time. Then he met Miss Amy from White Deer Castle. Amy actually took the initiative to come to the Lord to study, and then stayed with him all day long. So far, the Lord has even captured Nolder elves like Windulf, still fighting with injuries. Close felt that Lord Lord's technical level was simply unbelievable. It was probably even better than Nirgon. The prodigal son among the flowers that Eric had mentioned. No matter how many women there were, they were still human beings. But sir, even not even the elves were spared. Close and the others now admire the Lord in all aspects. Then he immediately thought of the book he had planned to use as toilet paper. But Anson desperately grabbed it from his hand. Anson said it was some kind of officer's memoir. It could improve a certain skill level. And then he gave the book to the Lord. It seems that everything started after the Lord got that book. It seems that the book is really famous. And it has obviously greatly improved some of Mr. Liang's personal skills. But the officer's memoir seemed to have been sold by the adults at a high price. No wonder those knights were willing to spend so much money on that crumpled codex. Close now somewhat regrets that his educational level is limited. And he has never liked reading. He dozed off when he saw dense texts. But if he had known that the book had such a powerful effect, he would have studied hard. It seems that the book was sold to Chicha Fortress? Um, gotta get that book back. Close has a good memory. The person who bought the book was indeed the garrison knight of Chicha Fortress. But now it is really not easy to get it back. In fact, Winnie didn't fall asleep at all. She was still recalling the nervous and caring look on her face by the Lord. And the warmth that came from his hand when he held her left hand. She felt that Leong had always deceived her in the past. Always letting herself. Experience the process when teaching strategies and the like, and even deceiving herself into being a villain when training Alice to adapt to grenades. But now it seems that it was Leon who was deliberately bullying him. Right? Snort. It's true what is written in those night novels. Men will always bully girls to attract girls' attention. Did he really think of herself as a little girl? Hum hum. I am 50 years old. Not 15. Winnie felt that the Lord's technical level was too poor. But now that I think about it, it seems that I do too. Very happy? Most of the Nolder elves are relatively indifferent. And naturally, they will not have the idea of an underage girl like Wendy. Of course, Wendy has never had this experience in the tribe. Now Wendy is filled with another kind of dilemma. According to the age of the Nolder elves, she will not be considered an adult for 20 years. According to the rules of the Nolder tribe, she must reach adulthood. Well, 20 years is not a long time. But how many 20 years can he have? No one could make him live to be a thousand years old like the Nolder. But maybe, I can change the rules of the Nolder? Become, king of the Nolder. Then there is no need to wait twenty years. Lord Leon has been teaching himself to be Machiavellian. And he also said that he wants me to become the queen of the Nolder. Is this what he thinks too? No wonder this guy kept saying that I was an unraged girl. By the time the Lord returned to the carriage, with a plate of hand-prepared mare's milk and fried eggs, Wendy's thoughts had already turned to decades in the future. Perhaps Wendadier is right. Underage girls really shouldn't read too many chivalric novels. When Wendy opened her eyes again, she looked like a different person. Her eyes filled with purple light that almost overflowed. Leon, did you make this yourself? This was the first time that Wendy directly called the Lord by his name, without using any honorifics that would create a sense of alienation. The Lord did not notice it at all. 
after all, Leon was not very sensitive to identity and titles. Ah, uh, yes, I can only do this. I fried these too, and I will eat them myself. You eat these too. Leon looked at Wendy uneasily while holding the plate. He never knew how to cook, and he didn't even use panel seasonings. He felt that the food he cooked might not be very delicious. But Wendy thought that the Lord's uneasiness was something else. She brought her face forward with a bright smile. Her eyes turned into crescent moons. You only brought one plate. How can the two of us eat? This is in the army. And of course, there are not so many plates. Being able to carry such a plate is considered a special treatment given to the marshal by the brothers. After all, these days when the army goes on an expedition, they usually use the iron lunch boxes they carry with them to distribute food, which are large metal cups with handles. They are used to ladle out water and put soup in them. But omelets must only be served on a plate. So of course, the Lord used the only silver plate. In fact, not only is there only one plate, but also only one fork. They are all personal items of the Lord. So naturally there is only one set. Ahem. There's nothing we can do about the troops' march. Let's just make do. Leon directly picked up a piece of fried egg and planned to feed it. Wendy's face turned red all of a sudden thinking that after all, humans still have more colorful intestines. This one only holds a plate and a fork. It must be Liang's trick. Right? To be honest, the Lord really has no tricks at the moment. He just wants to be nice to the little girl who cut her wrists and used blood to save herself. After all, Wendy is indeed an underage girl in his eyes, which makes him feel quite distressed. But no matter what, the two people did slowly get together, eating from the same plate. And of course, they got closer and closer. Leon, it would be great if you could live to be a thousand years old. Wendy was still thinking about what she had just thought. And it was estimated that this time, she had already thought about hundreds of years from now. Huh? What are you doing living so long? But then again, if I keep this heart rate, maybe I can live to be a thousand years old. The Lord feels that only turtles have such a slow heartbeat among land creatures. A slow heartbeat means a slow metabolism. Maybe he can really live a long life? Now that Wendy mentioned her lifespan, Leon also began to re-examine his situation. Leon knew that the purple spar fragments Wendy saw were probably the dragon tears that she had been carrying in her chest. When he was hit by the sword, he knew something was blocking his chest. It turns purple, probably because the dragon tears were crushed and embedded in the wound, staining it with the blood of its own wound. The sapphire blue dragon tears will naturally turn purple after being stained with red blood. As for his sudden coma at that time, Leon believed that this might also have something to do with dragon tears. Otherwise the trauma on his chest would not have caused him to faint so quickly. He could clearly remember that he was planning to run away. But he suddenly lost consciousness. As if his soul had been pulled out. Then, he seemed to have a very clear dream. In the dream, he saw a dragon that he wasn't quite sure about. It was a white creature with wings. But it didn't look like the ferocious looking giant lizard in the legend. But a very gentle creature that looked soft but his intuition told him that it was a dragon. It was lying in a small lake, with only the upper part of its body exposed. It should be a small white dragon. Its body does not look too big, but the part above the water is about three meters high. Compared with people, it is indeed a giant. The reason why Leon felt that such a big creature was just a small dragon was because compared to its head, the sapphire blue eyes seemed quite large. They also looked friendly and warm, not hostile at all and gave people the impression of a child. Feeling. However, there seemed to be a hint of sadness in his eyes. This place looks like an island. Probably in a valley on the island. The lake where the little white dragon is located appears crystal clear. And the bottom of the water seems to be emitting a sparkling light. Just like a mirror that is constantly emitting blue-violet light. Countless light points are moving like stars. And the dragon seemed to be lying among the stars. Because the lake was always glowing. Leon couldn't see clearly what was in the lake but he couldn't get close. In fact, he couldn't move at all at the time and couldn't even turn his eyes. After all, it is a dream. So it is not surprising to have such a state. Almost everyone has had this kind of dream where they can't move and can only see something. But the dragon seemed a little surprised after seeing Leon. It looked at Liang's eyes seriously and looked at Leon. The big blue eyes were full of confusion. Then, it twisted its long neck back and shouted, Althea, you seem to have made a mistake. Yes. The little dragon was speaking human language. But his speech was not very clear. And he probably didn't speak very often. It's unmistakable. That is indeed the bloodline of Avidane. 
A gentle female voice came from the other side of the valley. But Leon couldn't shift his gaze at this time. He could hear it, but couldn't see whose voice it was. Leon could only keep looking at the lake and the age dragon. Then the dragon seemed to shake its head slightly. But this guy obviously doesn't look like an elf. Wait! That's not right. The little white dragon seemed very surprised. It raised its head high and stood up from the lake. Its body was about five meters tall. After it stood up, Leong saw a huge crystal ball from under it. Not sure if it was an illusion. Leong saw the modern city he was familiar with from the crystal ball. And even saw his bedroom and the large monitor in the bedroom. He even saw a knight with a flying flag on the monitor. Staying on the big green map. This was the big map interface he was familiar with in Mountain Blade. That flag is very conspicuous. It is a golden griffin flag on a black background. What are the things in his memory? It's too complicated. I can't erase his memory. Fortunately, he probably doesn't know anything. This was probably the last thing Leon heard the dragon say. Listening to this meaning. This dragon obviously cannot understand the modern items in his memory. Leon was a human being in two lifetimes. And his memories are complicated and intertwined. It is normal for him not to understand them. After these words, Leon felt like he was falling and falling. It's like I'm falling into an endless abyss until my feet finally hit the ground. Generally speaking, it is a feeling of falling from an unknown height, but standing firm. As he fell, he vaguely heard the gentle voice speaking again, but he only heard half of the sentence. He looks a lot like that guy. I don't know who the woman named Althea was talking about. Because at this moment, Leon woke up. The Lord could guess that it was the dragon tears that restored his injuries and brought his consciousness to the dragon. So he fell unconscious on the spot. It's a pity that at that time, his consciousness in the dream could neither speak nor move. So he couldn't ask clearly. But no matter what, the dragon and the female voice called, Althea, definitely have no ill intentions towards me. After all, Leon knew who Althea was. There was obviously a slight error in the dragon's judgment. Leon was not a person who knew nothing. On the contrary, perhaps only Leon knew the name Althea in the entire Pender continent. No matter how vague the memory is, it will eventually be awakened by some scenes. Leon originally had no feeling for the name, Althea. But after seeing the little dragon, he recalled the background story that had long been faded after a quick glance when playing the game. Althea should be the younger sister and twin sister of Ava Dane. The First Nolder Elf King. Chapter 262 The Meaning of Dragon Tears the storm violently beat against the stone walls of the temple. The rocks on the seaside were hit by big waves. And there were waves of disturbing winds. Thunder echoed dully in the dark corridor. And swaying shadows danced on the rough stone walls. Providing silent accompaniment to the flickering torches. Althea sat alone by the pool. Wrapped in a delicate rabbit fur scarf to avoid the cold and wet. I heard you coming. Qualies. She said calmly. Turning her head to the depths of the high rafters where the light could not reach. Shadows rose, dragon wings whirred, and a small dragon flew over her head, circled half a circle in the wide hall of the temple, and landed next to her. The dragon wings were retracted. The sharp curved claws scraped the floor, and he shook his head to shake off the water droplets all over his body. Then, Sialon's plump and soft body lay beside the pool. Why don't you rest? Quarry's harsh voice came, and his big blue eyes looked friendly at Althea, who was hugging her knees. The storm kept me awake. It reminded me of the night I lost my father, my brother, and myself. As Althea said, she turned her gaze from Xiaolong to the calm water. Xiaolong stared at her silently, but her thoughts had drifted to past memories. The pain of the sacrifice was still clear, and a tear ran down her cheek as she thought back to all she had given up. She voluntarily stayed here to serve the gods in order to let her brother Avidane go back to save the tribe. She watched from the crystal ball the destruction of the Sindarin elves, watched the Nolder suffer for thousands of years, and watched her brother's descendants grow old, sick and die from generation to generation. But no one remembers her. The gods erased her memories in other people's hearts. And she silently endured thousands of years of loneliness and being forgotten. No one remembered her. No one knew her. And no one could come here. The gods made her immortal and kept her appearance as a young adult. But even gods could not alleviate the pain in her heart. Being forgotten is the greatest sadness. Qualies was confused by her sadness. Although it had lived with this elf girl for many years, the tears she shed from time to time were still a mystery to this little dragon. It cannot understand the bond between Althea and her people, especially the mysterious connection with her twin brother, who cannot be separated. 
the Dragonet was able to understand its own species' loose solitary relationships, penchant for hunting, and 20-year cycle of courtship behavior. But it couldn't understand the logic of Althea's behavior. More than once, it wondered whether she had a mental defect or suffered from some kind of mental illness. Then, Xiaolong felt some familiar touch in his consciousness. Some kind of gentle transformation of perception. As if a certain will came to live in his mind. It knew that this was the oracle once again lodged in its consciousness. It long ago resisted this invasion and domination of the mind. And for centuries, it has tried to fight this occupation of its consciousness. But ultimately in vain. The failed struggle ultimately only increases its own burden. On the contrary, good cooperation seems to be beneficial to both parties. This will that always likes to temporarily occupy its body gives qualies an extremely powerful magic power. So now, out of habit, it has learned to simply relax and fade out of consciousness, leaving its body to this obviously more powerful will. God's will. Althea, you look in pain. The oracle made the same harsh sound through Quali's body. The oracle's process of taking over the dragon's body was without warning and silent. But Althea was aware of it all. Yes, the storm brings back sad memories. She started replying as usual. I know this is still a difficult decision for you. But this choice is yours. And I can't erase the memory given to you by my own will. So I can only keep you here. The oracle's attitude is actually very gentle. This being who has never shown his face and has only come as a possessed host can obviously understand Althea's pain. And there is even a sense of empathy in his words. Yes, this choice is of my own free will. But I will still be sad. No one will know. No one will remember. No one will come here. And I won't even grow old or die. I even forgot how long I have lived here. Tears fell again in Althea's purple eyes. Althea, I have always been in such loneliness. Dot, I am immortal, but can never appear in front of anyone. The oracle seems to understand Althea's mood. Maybe I should let Qualys understand your emotions. But poor Qualys still can't understand this. And it has always been at a loss for your sadness. A warm and familiar feeling also appeared in Althea's mind. And the oracle entered her consciousness. The surrounding stone walls began to fade away and her eyes gradually fell into darkness. When she opened her eyes again, it was already morning. The storm has gone away. The torch in the hall has been extinguished, and the bright sunshine has dispersed all the shadows and the pain in Althea's heart. The air smelled fresh and clean, which meant it was still drizzling outside. Qualys folded his wings and put his forearms on his knees, sleeping among the dazzling sapphires on the ground. I am going to release Qualys' consciousness now. Please treat it gently. It is in deep distress now, said the oracle. Why is it distressed? What are these things? Althea looked at the little dragon possessed by the oracle. Feeling a little confused, she pointed to the sparkling blue gems scattered across the hall like stars. Ordinary dragons, even the smarter water dragons, cannot feel the emotions of elves. Their needs are very simple, and they lack the same emotional expression as your people. But I made quarries feel your grief. Althea, these are the tears Quali shed when he felt your pain. The oracle seemed very patient. A being who had been facing almost endless loneliness was naturally very patient. But dragons cannot feel sadness. Nor can they shed tears. Althea was still confused. There is a huge difference between not being able and being unable. Althea, at least last night, this little dragon did it. Just like you. The Nolder elves don't know magic. But that doesn't mean they can't use magic. The oracle seemed to be hinting at something. However, Qualys will undoubtedly be sulky when he wakes up. So quickly collect these scattered dragon tears. I believe these things will come in handy one day. This was what Liang thought of when he saw the game screen on the monitor in the crystal ball. For some reason, Liang's memory became very good at this time. And he could even recall the concept of the game that he had only briefly read once. Of course, this is the reason why Dragon Tears was born. And most players will always take a look. But to remember it so clearly as if it were happening before your eyes again, is incredible. Perhaps, this is because my memory has been searched by that little dragon? So all the things that stuck deep in his memory were dug out? Of course Leon could realize the meaning of the picture on the crystal ball. It was obviously the picture deep in his memory. But now, Leon felt that the role of dragon tears should not be to exchange for medicine such as the elixir, nor to obtain the support of Nolder's troops. Dragon tears are probably used to save lives and make contact because Althea's sadness should come from the suffering, loneliness, and forgotten. Since the dragon tears were caused by the little dragon named Qualys feeling Althea's sadness under the influence of the oracle, 
then the dragon tear should naturally be related to these attributes. So he would be seen by Althea at that time. Xiaolong's tears themselves are to bring Althea a connection with her tribe and to relieve Althea's pain, not for other people. At the same time, when she saw the little dragon in her consciousness, Althea said, That is indeed Avidane's bloodline. The little dragon also said, This guy obviously doesn't look like an elf. Of course, the tears shed by a dragon possessed by a god must have powerful divine power, which can probably allow people to quickly recover from any injuries and even gain some special abilities. But the use of this divine power must also be conditional. This is an item produced by Althea's sorrow. It must be a nolder elf of the same bloodline as Althea to activate it. If it has nothing to do with Althea's bloodline, I am afraid that dragon tears will bring suffering, loneliness, and forgetfulness. Just like Alaric, he fell into endless memories, causing pain and madness, and could only use alcohol to anesthetize himself. The elixir Alaric drank may indeed be made from dragon tears, but Alaric is just an ordinary human being. He does not have the bloodline of Althea. Dragon tears can only induce memories and sadness for him. If he does not die from this, he is already determined and strong. After King Ulrich fell ill, he searched everywhere for the blood of Nolder noble girls. It seems that the information Miss Felina got was completely correct. The three prophets did not deceive Ulrich. He really needed the Nolder nobles. The girl's blood is used to make life-saving medicine. Maybe. The king also got the dragon tears. And most likely it came from the three prophets. He originally sent Lehman to take away the three prophets. And then release the three prophets. Obviously. The deal the three prophets reached with the king was to exchange dragon tears for freedom. And they did give the king a real method of treatment. If the same bloodline as Althea were used to activate dragon tears, dragon tears might be able to heal everything and even give people some elven attributes, such as longevity. The reason why the blood of an older noble girl is emphasized is probably because Althea is also a girl herself. And her attributes will be closer to Althea's own attributes. Althea was on an island and there was only a little dragon with her. No matter how old she is, she will only be a girl for the rest of her life. Therefore, the only one who has the same bloodline as her is probably Avidane, the first Nolder elf king. Althea is obviously Avidane's twin sister, and has exactly the same bloodline as Avidane. So Avidane's descendants can activate dragon tears. However, the current Nolder don't seem to realize this. They feel that dragon tears are very kind, and will always actively collect dragon tears but they have always only used dragon tears as a source of magic power. The biggest role is to maintain the operation of the invisible magic circle in a local city. They did not remember Arhi. And even in the history of the Nolder, there was no record of Arhi at all. But Althea still protects the Nolder in her own way. Leong felt that the reason why the invisible magic circle in a local city requires the blood of the Elf King to be activated is probably not because blood is required to draw the runes, but because dragon tears requires Avidane's blood. Therefore, a human like him would probably not be able to use dragon tears to heal his wounds. And he might even die suddenly. When Leon was injured, the fragments of dragon tears embedded in the wound quickly caused him to fall into a coma. And he almost died. Leon does not have Avidane's bloodline. His Nolder bloodline only comes from Madigan. Several generations apart, Madigan is only the adopted son of Felgesiner. Not his biological son. Like Aldarian, he does not have the blood of the Elf King. But the blood splattered from Wendy's wrist fell into Liang's wound. Wendy has pure purple eyes. And she is the direct descendant of Ava Dane. It is her blood that allows Leon to obtain benefits that were impossible to obtain originally. Leon can now feel the vigorous strength coming from his body. This is definitely not the strength he had before the injury. It's just that I don't know what King Ulrich used to prepare the medicine. Leon rescued Wendy in time. So the king should not have been able to obtain the blood of the Nolder with the blood of the Elf King. It's a pity that I can't see my own attributes. And I don't know how much they have been enhanced. Now, not only has the injury recovered, but the heart rate has also become very slow. Perhaps this is a characteristic of the immortal race? Leon decided to give it a try. Wendy! Can I feel your heartbeat? The Lord stretched out his paw towards Wendy. You? You? You dot Leon dot how are you going to feel? Wendy's face turned red again. The underage girl obviously did not expect that the Lord's request would be so direct. The Nolder elves have very good ears. And they all listen directly to the heartbeat. But Leon definitely doesn't have that kind of hearing. And he stretched out his claws. This. What is this for? Wendy said she was nervous. Want to run. But his feet didn't move. And he was still biting his lip to make up his mind. 
Then she took a deep breath and closed her eyes. But Liang just grabbed Wendy's hand and started to feel her pulse. Wendy didn't know this kind of traditional Chinese medicine technology. She closed her eyes and kept biting her lips. Her heart pounding. Will he follow it and touch it to his heart? If he touches it, should I beat him? But Leon obviously didn't intend to do any other bad things. He just felt Wendy's pulse quietly. About 40 times a minute. It seems that the Nolder's heartbeat is indeed slower than that of humans. But not too much slower. The heartbeat of this immortal race seems to be several times faster than mine? It seems that I made a wrong judgment? So you are indeed abnormal now? What to do about this? It seemed like he had to lie down and recuperate. Otherwise he might fall into a coma due to lack of oxygen. In fact, this was mainly because Wendy was extremely nervous. And the underage girl's heartbeat was constantly accelerating. Normally, it would probably be about a dozen times a minute. But the Lord obviously had some misunderstanding. He sighed. Wendy! I seem to be sick. I think I need to lie down for a while. Wendy opened her eyes all of a sudden and looked at the frowning Leong, who was a little confused. He was still thinking of teasing her just now. But now he is sick? Could this guy want to squeeze into the soft couch and lie down with him? Are there so many tricks? This is too bad. I'm not yet a minor. Well, at this moment, Wendy remembered that she was underage. Humph! So this is your true face! Then just lie down! Originally, Wendy thought she could make up her mind. But Leong pushed even further. And she suddenly felt that she was no longer innocent. This was completely the behavior of a perverted pervert. Ouch! What are you doing? Dot don't hit dot Wendy! I'm really sick. Dot ah! The Lord finally lay down on the soft couch in the carriage. But he laid down because he was beaten. Wendy's tactics were quite dark. Chapter 263 I came here specifically to stab you. Chicha Fortress. General Agathon covered his chest and coughed from time to time. One day ago, he was kicked by Leon. And the military medical officer said that one of his ribs was broken as a general who has been fighting for many years. He is already used to injuries. But this time is slightly different. Agathon felt a little guilty. This time, he used his sword to attack Leong temporarily. He did not communicate with any of his subordinates in advance that this was an impromptu assassination. Agathon did not regret this impromptu decision. But he felt very sad at this time. He knew that Leon had just helped the Bacchus Empire resolve its crisis not long ago. This was the only external assistance when the Empire fell into full-scale war. It was Leong who solved the siege of Bashi City at the most dangerous time, destroyed the Python Knights of the Terror Legion, and killed the army of the Snake Worshippers. And Leon even found a way to protect against the Red Death. Perhaps it won't be long before the entire empire and even the entire continent will no longer be threatened by the Red Death, and the Snake Cult will lose their most feared method. For the Bacchus, Leon was the hero who saved the empire. No matter what Liang's ultimate goal is, the entire Bacchus Empire owes Leon a huge debt of gratitude. As a member of the Bacchus Empire, Agathon felt that he should also be grateful to Leon. But he did something that a Bacchus should not do at this time. And he also carried out a sneak attack and assassination in a killer way. For the sake of national security, it is unreasonable to assassinate a benefactor who has provided great help when the country is in crisis. But it had to be this way. After all, he is an enemy. And a terrible enemy that he cannot defeat. As an imperial general, you have such a responsibility that you cannot show mercy to your enemies. Count Leon must understand this. Right? Leon also once went into danger among thousands of troops with one man and one sword, and used kidnapping to save the White Deer Castle of the Lion Kingdom. Maybe he could understand himself. But at that time, the two armies were facing each other, and they should have used all possible means. Leon was able to kidnap people in the army because of his ability, and he almost did not hurt anyone but he made a sneak attack during formal negotiations. No reputation whatsoever. This is a lifelong stain. Agathon was indeed in pain. This method of attacking through negotiation is not in line with the honor of a general. The principles between nobles and Agathon's own values. It's a pity that it's too late to think about this now. He should only be in bed to recuperate now. Right? Agathon felt that the sword might not have killed Leon. He could feel that the tip of the sword was blocked by a hard object and did not penetrate too deeply. But serious injury should be inevitable. I hope you are not dead. I'm sorry. This is not what a hero would do. I will let you return my sword in the future. But I cannot let you send out an army to the Empire at this time. Agasun muttered towards the east gate of Chicha Fortress. There were still traces of Liang's blood on the ground outside the east gate. General! 
There's something going on in the east. Dot, it's the Griffin flag. They're back again. At this moment, the soldiers on the fortress observation deck exclaimed. Agathon sighed deeply, stood up silently, and walked towards the city wall. Come back at this time. Could it be? Leon is dead? Is this Liang's army coming back to take revenge on me? Agathon was not excited about killing a formidable enemy. On the contrary, his heart was filled with thoughts, as if there were several walls sealing his heart. And he was panicking. You really shouldn't die alone like this. Wait for me on the way. Maybe I will go with you. But I have my responsibility. I cannot watch your troops cross the Sava River. For the sake of my motherland, I must take more people. You can understand that. Right? We will have many brothers accompanying us along the way. So we will not be lonely. Maybe. I can follow you to kill Hades and rule the underworld. A hero like you must have similar wishes. Get ready for war. Get your torches ready. Standing on the city wall, Agatha no longer showed any weakness. He shouted various military orders, and the troops in Chicha Fortress immediately became nervous and busy. Leong had been lying in the carriage for another long time. He didn't feel there was anything wrong with his body. But instead, he was getting better and better mentally. There were only slight contusions on the eye sockets and under the ribs, which were now bruised and bruised. Even after applying the bruised medicine, there was still a slight pain. This was from Wendy, and she was very cruel. However, Wendy did not leave the carriage after the beating. In fact, it was Wendy who helped Leon apply the drinking wine. The girl felt distressed immediately after doing it. Leon neither fought back nor got angry. He already realized why Wendy beat him. But Wendy felt a little guilty after knowing that she had misunderstood and was taking the initiative to help the Lord with massage to activate blood circulation and remove blood stasis. This massage technique was learned from my Xiongling. It is said to be a byproduct of what the people learned after Liang's first military training. Only Close, who was driving, once again had the idea of getting that book back. Lord Lord and Wendy didn't know what they were doing in the carriage. Anyway, the carriage was shaking constantly along the way. Close felt that if he hadn't been able to hold the car down due to his heavy weight, the carriage might have been knocked over by the two of them. The Lord's ability is really strong. The carriage was shaking along the way and almost never stopped. Of course, the massage on the carriage will shake and the wooden carriage will even squeak occasionally. The ten or so old brothers are also surrounding the carriage now. As Liang's original team, these strong men from Mettenheim feel it is necessary to help the Lord cover it. They can't let the large army see this carriage that is shaking all the way. Right? Maybe it will affect the morale of the army. Of course, they were walking around the carriage with winks. Obviously not just to cover up. Unfortunately, the windows of the carriage were closed with curtains, and the sound of horse hooves kept coming on the road. They were unable to peek or hear any specific movement. Leon was now sure that there was nothing wrong with his body. He had already asked Wendy again. The heart rate of the older elves when they were calm and not moving was actually similar to his current situation. This means that he probably received some kind of divine power through that meeting with the little dragon. Perhaps he also gained abilities that most people dream of but cannot ask for, as long as the Nolder. But Leon also knew that this kind of thing might not happen again. After all, Quali said that Althea made a mistake and saw that he was not an elf, and his memory was different from ordinary people. In other words, except for this coincidence, I still cannot use dragon tears as a life-saving straw in the future, and good things like resurrection with full health should not be provided to myself as a human being now that he knew that he might live a long life, and that dragon tears could no longer save his life. The Lord decided to be cowardly, try to avoid accidents, and try to live for a few more years. But even if you are timid, those who deserve revenge must still take revenge, such as Agathon's sword. This is not because the Lord is being cautious, but mainly because he was stabbed by a sneak attack during the negotiation. And Leon was originally really well-intentioned and seeking a win-win situation for all parties. This kind of thing is always very irritating. Besides, as a leading marshal, if he doesn't take revenge if he is stabbed, those lords of the lion realm with little education will probably think that Count Leong is weak and incompetent. After all, there are many small lords in the kingdom group army, and they are not as obedient as their own subjects. If people lose their support, it will be difficult to lead the team. So the lord led his troops to Chicha Fortress again. And this time, he had no intention of negotiating on an equal footing. He intended to intimidate. Aren't you? Agathon. Worried that I would lead troops into the Bacchus Empire? Then if you don't obediently come out of the city 
and come to my military camp. I will lead my troops to attack Bacchus. Let's see if you can get out. In his own camp, surrounded by a group of strong men from Medenheim and Wendy's guards, Leon didn't believe that Agathon could still assassinate him. As a result, the troops stopped one mile east of Chicha Fortress. Close took the Lord's instructions and went to Chicha Fortress to find trouble with Agathon. You mean, Count Leon wants to invite me to dinner? In his military camp? Why did Agathon look so surprised when he saw Close? Shouldn't Leon be seriously injured? It's only been a day. He stabbed it with his own hands and knew that even if he didn't die from that kind of injury, he would have to lie down for at least a month or two. Can you treat yourself to a meal? You must be deceiving yourself. From the looks of it, Leon was indeed dead. Otherwise, he wouldn't have resorted to such a clumsy trick with his ability. And if he was really fine, he would have shown up in person. My master said that if you don't go to our military camp to eat, he will directly attack the Bacchus Empire. I will leave the Chicha Fortress to you for your retirement. And you don't dare to come out anyway. Close, wearing a helmet, finished what the Lord had said angrily, then turned around and planned to go back. Agatha knew Close. This rough and arrogant voice was the strong man who asked Leon which governor he wanted to kill at the gate of White Deer Castle. So at this moment Agathon strengthened his thoughts. This kind of subordinate, who can go through life and death together into the enemy camp must be loyal to Leon. It seems that because Leon died, this strong man came here to avenge his lord. Wait! Don't leave yet! Agathon stopped close, took out the sword from his waist, and struck the wall beside him with the sword. Sparks flew and the blade snapped in the middle, breaking into two pieces. General! The soldiers on the city wall shouted in horror. But Agathon just waved silently to tell them to retreat. Then he put the two broken swords back into their scabbards and ordered the soldiers to hand them to close. This is my sword! It's the sword I shot at Count Leon yesterday. It should be with Count Leon now. As a courtesy and apology from me. Agathon spoke very calmly. And now, he was no longer entangled in his heart. If a respectable opponent was killed in a dishonorable way, then both the murder weapon and the murderer should be buried with him. This is the practice in Pender. Agathon turned back and glanced south from a distance on the city wall. That was his beloved motherland. And today, he is saying goodbye. If Leo had died, Agathon would not worry about the invasion of the Lion Kingdom's troops at all. He believed that Emperor Marius would be able to defeat any enemy except Leon. Moreover, except for Leon, even if others achieved temporary victory, they could not make the people of Bacchus surrender. Only Leon. Both His Majesty the Emperor and the people of Bacchus were favored by Leon. His Majesty also regarded Leon as an equal opponent. But others were never in His Majesty's eyes. I will go to the banquet. Tonight. Agazon said to Close. Close didn't think much. Took the broken sword. Nodded and left. Since the Lord is safe and can still stagger on the carriage all the way, Close will certainly not have much hostility towards Agathon. After all, for the people of Medenheim, injuries in battle were commonplace. The Lord had suffered many injuries in life and death before, so he was not a hypocritical person. Mr. Leong invited guests to dinner, and the guests greeted him as a courtesy. This was also a normal interaction. Close felt that the errand was settled, and there was probably no problem. So he returned to the military camp to report. But Leon was in a daze holding Agathon's broken sword. He is not a rough guy like Close. He knows what it means for a general to break his sword and give it to the enemy. It's normal to cut it off during a fight. But breaking it off when you're not fighting has an extraordinary meaning. It represents a fight to the death. And it's a fight to the death. Giving the sword broken into two parts to the enemy is to pay homage to the enemy while also paying homage to oneself. The sword is with the man is not a slogan in many cases. Especially for a general who leads the battle. Unless you knew you were going to die. You would never do this. Agathon. Want to fight me to the death? And we made an appointment tonight? He probably doesn't have many troops. Is he deliberately seeking death? Leon didn't think that Agathon could defeat his own army. Even a night attack was impossible. His personal guards were the Nolder Rangers led by Rissa Dillon and Wendy. It would be good if he didn't take the initiative to conduct a night attack. The entire continent. The troops that could sneak attack the Nolder at night must not be ordinary humans. Although Lisa Dillon has not returned yet. Wendy is very reliable as the captain of the guard. She is more sensitive than cats. And no matter how subtle the movement is, she cannot escape her ears. But why did Agathon do so brilliantly? If he didn't want to pay attention to the threat of marching on Bacchus, he didn't have to respond at all. No one would be willing to attack him if he stayed in the Chicha Fortress. 
This would instead contain more troops from the Lion Kingdom. Why did he have to try his best to challenge? And he also used this ritual of admitting that he would die? To stop yourself from crossing the Sava? But he definitely knew he couldn't stop it. Besides, he might as well go to the other side of the Sava to hold the bridge. Agathon is an outstanding general. He is not so stupid that he insists on fighting to the death to impress himself. Right? Even if you die, you won't have any real effect. Leon, who didn't understand, decided to go to the door in person to find out. Although he planned to take revenge on Agathon, he did not intend to kill him. Agathon was the most trusted general of Emperor Marius. If he died in his own hands, it would be difficult for him to form an alliance with the Bacchus Empire. Therefore, Agathon, who was determined to die and had a determined look on his face, saw Leon riding his horse towards Chicha Fortress on the top of the city, and then dismounted nearly 200 meters outside the east gate of the fortress. Agathon, come out and speak! Liang's voice is quite loud. General Agathon's head was buzzing. His resolute expression suddenly collapsed, and he began to be in a trance again. Because just yesterday, Liang rode towards Chicha Fortress, holding a flag in the same way. He also dismounted outside the east gate in the same way. Even the words he shouted were the same. Agatha, come out and speak. And the voice was the same. So big, General Agathon has now begun to wonder involuntarily. Has he returned to yesterday? Otherwise, who else can seriously injured people shout so confidently? It can be heard clearly from 200 meters away. Agathon, who was full of confusion, also walked down the city wall like yesterday, stood outside the city gate like yesterday, and watched Leon walking towards him in a daze like yesterday. But the bloodstains were still there outside the east gate, and there was no sword on him. This is not yesterday. Agathon sighed and looked at Leon. Your Excellency Leon, your injury dot is okay? Are you not going to persuade me to surrender again? What the age, L? I'm just here to stab you. Leon probably felt a little bit like yesterday. But this time, he didn't want Agasun to say anything. He stepped forward and spoke while stabbing him with a sword quickly. Just like Agasun stabbed him at that time. Chapter 264 debts must be repaid. Moreover, he was involuntarily carried by clothes and other tough men. And went to the Lord's military camp to eat an extremely unpleasant meal which was said to have been cooked by Leong himself. The quality of the ingredients is quite good, and it is veal that is difficult to enjoy for the Bacchus who lack cattle and horses. But it tasted salty and astringent. One side of the steak was fried to a crisp, but the other side was bloody and undercooked. The appearance looked like poison, and it was packed in a military lunchbox, with only a knife and no fork. It's really not elegant at all. It's not what a dinner party should be like. However, Agathon ate it happily with an attitude of taking poison. When he took a bite of the steak, his mouth was filled with bloodshot eyes. It comes from the unfamiliar side. How come you don't want to believe me? I've always been honest and reliable. I'll treat you to a meal when I say I'll treat you to a meal. What's wrong with your chest? I won't be hurt by being stabbed by a broken sword. Right. Leon looked at the steak in front of him that was half burnt and half bloody. He didn't dare to speak and kept scolding Agathon. Agathon was rubbing the side of his chest. He couldn't chew the steak. He had just swallowed it with great effort. And the injury on his ribs was painful from the action of swallowing. Liang's steak is really poisonous. More poisonous than the red death of the snake cult. Your Excellency Leon, if you want to retaliate with my sword, I will admit it. But can't you use your own sword? Why are you stabbing me with a broken sword? My ribs are broken. Agathon took a few big gulps of water and finally managed to calm down. There was not a drop of wine in Liang's military camp. And only boiled water could be used to entertain guests. When the Lord goes out to fight, he never lets the people of Menheim see anything related to wine bottles. What? Broken ribs? You're not trying to blackmail me. Are you? You're wearing armor. How can a broken sword be so powerful? The Lord expressed his disbelief. He didn't use much force. Could it be that he had unknowingly mastered the skill of stabbing someone to death without the sword head in just one day? Is the effect of dragon tear so strong? It seemed like Agatha would have to shed more blood. Leon stabbed Agatha with a broken sword. This was mainly to return the broken sword to the general, indicating that the marshal did not accept the decisive battle. You should take back the broken sword yourself. This is really a formal etiquette between samurai or generals. The enemy sends a broken sword to express his intention to fight to the death. If he does not accept the war and plans to negotiate for peace, or if the two countries happen to stop fighting at this time, then he really should send the broken sword back. 
This means that I will not die. And neither will you. I do not regard you as my enemy. And you do not need to pay tribute to us. Moreover, you have gained my respect and will not lose your honor because of this. However, Leong didn't stab him for revenge. And stabbing him with a piece of stubble naturally didn't count as revenge. Leong just wanted to let the troops on both sides see this scene and regain his own face. Of course, Leong regained his face with his own money. After he stabbed Agasun, Close and others swarmed up, held up their shields, and captured Agasun before his men could react. In his own military camp, this can probably be regarded as capturing the enemy general. But after Agasun realized that he was not injured, he loudly ordered the troops to be on standby at Chicha Fortress. And he went to eat Liang's meal honestly. In fact, the Lord must make General Agasun owe him a favor. Finally, he found some opportunity. Of course, Liang would take the opportunity to become a creditor. This is much more cost-effective than retribution and death. Anyway, he is a blessing in disguise. There is no need to make an enemy. Now that the two countries are hostile, Agatha's sneak attack on him was just to be loyal to the country. Indeed, he should not be treated as an enemy. Leon could still understand the difference between an enemy and an enemy. But since Wendy shed so much blood to save herself, the Bacchus must also shed some blood. Leon looked at Agatha, thinking about how to blackmail Emperor Marius. Yes, the logic in the Lord's heart has always been very fair. Agasun stabbed himself with a sword with the intention of killing himself. So now he owes himself a life. The Lord never collects debts overnight. He must collect them on the spot. Since he did not die and the actual loss he suffered was a dragon tear. Of course Agatha's son did not have to pay for his life. But he had to double the compensation and at least be several times higher than the value of the dragon tear. Such as mental damages, medical expenses, and lost work expenses, army time delay expenses, horse and vehicle transportation expenses. Anyway, everything has to be accounted for by him. Since Wendy lost so much blood, people who care about Agatha need to shed some blood too. But it is said that Agatha's parents are dead. That would only cause Marius, the great master, to bleed. Fair enough. Count Leon. Cough. Forget it. My minor injury is not worth mentioning. It's your injury, daughter. You okay? Agathon still couldn't believe that Leon was still alive and kicking. And he was much more energetic than himself. How could it be okay after being stabbed with a sword? I almost died. The Lord made his famous heart gesture. But my doctor's skills are good. It cost a huge price and a lot of dragon tears to save me. So, you owe me a big debt now. I acknowledge the dead dot, but dot do you promise that you will not attack the Empire? Agasun looked at the half piece of poison-like food left in the military lunchbox put down his knife, and looked at Leong. The food at Leong is terrible. Just now I struggled to swallow a piece and almost died. He usually eats bloody stuff like this. Could he really eat children? Agathon couldn't help but shudder. Why am I trying to take advantage of the Bacchus Empire now? Your country is so poor now. If you conquer it, you will have to spend money on disaster relief. The Lord beckoned close to remove the lunchbox and took out the map. Then where are your armies going? Agathon now believes it. He knew that if Leon really wanted to attack Bacchus, the sword he was stabbed an hour ago should be the griffin sword on Liang's body. Even after being seriously injured by him, Leon still didn't kill him in revenge. So he really didn't want to be an enemy of Bacchus. Unaffected by any personal grudges, he wholeheartedly pursues the world. Such magnanimity and magnanimity. Indeed, only Emperor Marius could compare with him. Not himself. This is indeed a debt owed to him. And he should indeed repay the debt. Look, I plan to go to Ashkaman. You should know that place. Right. The largest port city in Dexia is only separated from Siyuan City by a bay. Leon asked, pointing to the map. Of course Agatha knew Ashkaman. In fact, that place had been occupied by the Bacchus Empire for a short period of time. That was more than 20 years ago, before Emperor Marius came to the throne. And Agatha was still a child at that time. For the Bacchus Empire. Ashkaman is indeed a very important port city. This allows the capital Siyuan city to have a big city across the sea. It can not only act as a horn to each other and ensure the safety of the capital, but also pass through short distance sea trade quickly created a lot of wealth. Ashkaman and Siyuan city are only separated by a bay several hundred miles wide. Even offshore boats can sail across. However, the culture and output of the two sides are completely different. This short and medium distance ocean trade is the lowest cost and most profitable. Moreover, 
Ashkaman can provide a large number of war horses to the Bacchus Empire. The former emperor of Bacchus once captured Ashkaman. But that emperor also caused heavy losses to the Shadow Army because of his capture of Ashkaman. Agathon's father died in the battle at that time. However, the result of the strong attack on Ashkaman that year was not good. The hasty deployment of troops and the tragic victory with huge casualties not only caused the empire to be faced with enemies on both sides, but also almost exhausted its national strength. And Ashikaman only held it for more than half a year before it was taken back by the Dexia Principality again. It wasn't until Emperor Marius, who was the consul of Siyuan City at the time, negotiated peace with the Dexia, threatened the Senate with the Dexia army, and obtained the throne in a nearly coercive way that everything improved. Under the leadership of Marius, the empire regained its vitality, and Agathan also grew from an orphan to a general under Marius in more than 20 years. That's not an easy place to fight, Sir Leong, and I doubt you can hold it after you defeat it. Besides, it's too far away from your territory. Agasun shook his head. Since he owed Leong a sword, he naturally wanted to help Leong think about it now. But he clearly remembers that when the Bacchus Empire showed up with all its elites, it still only suffered a miserable victory. If it weren't for the powerful naval fleet of the Bacchus Empire, none of the warriors stationed in Ashkaman would have been able to return home. Yes, I also feel that it is too far away from my territory. So, I plan to give Ashkaman to the Bacchus Empire. Of course, the Empire has to give up the place in exchange. Leon smiled at Agathon. I said that I would form an alliance with the Bacchus Empire and I would be responsible for taking down Ashkaman and you only need to send troops to guard it and provide fleet support to protect my retreat. After that, Ashkaman Komen belongs to the Bacchus Empire. I know you have always wanted to get this port. Agathon looked at the map and then at Leong. The expression on his face gradually turned into disbelief and then gradually turned into a sigh of admiration. Huh? I don't understand. This kind of cooperation is certainly a great thing for Bacchus. But what do you want to get? General Agathon was just a general after all. If Emperor Marius were here, he would definitely not say that. I am a businessman. Agathon. For a businessman, everything has a price. Including the sword you stabbed me with. There is a clear price tag. I spent at least 3.5 dot to treat the injury. Eight dragon tears. You now owe me a huge debt of eight dragon tears. Agathon. I am a businessman. And I plan to give you a chance to repay your debt. Ashkaman is very rich. You know... Leong stared into Agathon's eyes and raised the standard for asking for Dragon Tears from 3 to 8 with his fingers. Dragon Tears? Is there really such a thing in the world? Agathon began to feel confused. You said I owed a debt. And I admit that. But I haven't seen the Dragon Tears you mentioned. How can I pay it back? Oh, everything has a price. But I really have no money. Agathon spread his hands. Like an old man who owed money and refused to pay it back. No way dot you have been in the Shadow Army for so many years. Haven't you learned anything from Governor Levius? Leon also spread his hands. Levius is a capable man. Even when he was so depressed that he hid in the mines. He still provided me with several carloads of gold and silver treasures. Ahem dot, but you don't want me to go to Ashkaman to scrape the land. Right. The way Agathon looked at Leon was indeed like looking at a devil who eats children. Otherwise, the Empire is so poor now that it asks me for a loan. If you don't scrape the land, how will you get the money to pay off the debt? To be honest, except for the land, you are short of everything now. Leon shook his head and said the word, land, in a particularly loud voice. Okay, I understand. You want the territory. Right. You've even figured out how to operate it. You're planning to let me exchange the territory for Ashkaman. Right. But my territory is Layla Fortress. So it's a military fortress. I can't make the decision. Agathon was actually very smart. And he understood Liang's intention. But he still spread his hands and shook his head. Like an old man who owed money and refused to pay it back. Agathon, don't pretend to be stupid. I'm talking about you. Not you. I am a fair person. At least half of the debt you owe me must be paid by Emperor Marius. You go to Emperor Marius well. Tell him my request. He will definitely make the decision. And he also owes me 500,000 dinars. All of which are debts to me. You must have a lot in common. And Emperor Marius must know what I want. Where? Leon twisted his neck and turned to look at the Chicha fortress opposite the camp. By the way, I can also make you a hero of the Empire. Before you return home, 
You can burn the Chicha Fortress. What? Are you not serious? Agathon stood up in surprise, almost overturning the table. Don't be so excited. Isn't it just burning an empty castle? Chicha Fortress is no longer a myth of invincibility after you captured it. Burning it is the best commemoration of it. Moreover, only burning it. Emperor Marius could send troops with confidence. Leon looked at the cold and heavy bastion and sent Agathan back. In fact, there were many reasons for burning the Chicha Fortress, but Leon didn't mention it, and Agathon didn't ask. The next day, Chicha Fortress was besieged by Count Liang's army and burned down by the famous Imperial General Agathon. The fire did not go out for several days. This huge bastion, which had never been captured in 150 years, was destroyed after the first fall. The city of Lyon was filled with mourners, and many middle-class people with money, but no power planned to move to other places after hearing the news. The Marshal of the Lion Kingdom, Count Leon, sent a peace order to the Lion City, saying that he had recaptured the Sava River Fort and was about to invade the territory of Dexia. The Kingdom of Lyon will be as stable as a mountain with this marshal here, so citizens should rest assured. Subsequently, the army made a large-scale advance. Under the blazing fire of Chicha Fortress, it took only three days to advance to the south of Sava River Fortress and to the east of Turda Fortress. Chapter 265 The Newcomer of the Phoenix Knights See you in city. Today, see you in city is in dire straits, with construction sites for rebuilding homes and busy people everywhere. When Emperor Marius burned the materials in the city, and the fearful legions and rebels fought in the city, the bustling place in the capital became a mess, but it also left CU and city with only one voice from now on. The nobles who could run had already run away. Those noble-born members of the Senate would neither participate in barbaric battles, nor coolie like construction, nor would they scrimp on food and clothing under the call of Emperor Marius. The materials hidden at home are donated for centralized supply. In fact, the original Senate probably no longer exists, and Emperor Marius has reorganized a new Senate council. The members are all elected from citizens of all walks of life. And unlike before, the members of the Senate now hold important positions and are all people who have made outstanding contributions to the country. Among them are the old nobles, Marius's think tank, the initiator and promoter of reform, and the new imperial treasurer Governor Justice, General Creon, a rising aristocrat who has a commoner background and has been fighting against the snake cult and the Red Death. There is the newly appointed garrison officer of Siyuan City, General Valius. He was once the lord of the burned Olega Castle and is now the garrison officer leading the construction in Siyuan City. He has been leading the residents of Siyuan City to respond to Marius' call. Whether it is withdrawing from Siyuan City to organize fortifications or returning to Siyuan City to rebuild their homes, Valius is the leader of the residents and craftsmen. There is also General Ivelo, who was born a serf but successfully defended Imperial Port. Emperor Marius gave this. Big General. The official title of General and originally planned to appoint him as the administrator of Lin Gang. But the serf general refused the appointment because he believed that he had no experience in governing. And ability. I don't want to cause the people to suffer because of my incompetence. But I can be a general and lead troops to fight. These four new senators each represent the old nobles of Bacchus the emerging nobles of Pendor, residents and craftsmen, as well as farmers and serfs. This was also the vision Marius had always had in mind. The Senate should not only be the hand of the emperor assisting the emperor in governing the country, but also a hanging bell that supervises the emperor's behavior on behalf of all classes. But it should never be a battlefield for power and profit and factional struggle. There is no faction in the Senate at this moment. Or rather, they are all Marianists who support reform. So naturally there will be no serious internal strife. And in the new five-seat Senate, the last seat is empty. This seat should be reserved for the spokesman of the armed forces. That is, the representative of the army. This was of course reserved for Agathon. Only Agathon will not be opposed by anyone. He was born in the Shadow Legion. But at the same time, he supports reform. He has made outstanding achievements and is always undertaking arduous tasks. He is the best person to balance the power of the military. In addition, Brutus was appointed as an intelligence officer by Emperor Marius, an important position in the Bacchus Empire responsible for intelligence, espionage, and surveillance investigations. But in fact, the real controller of this position is Alina, and Brutus can only be regarded as her deputy at best, because those professionally trained spies were originally Justice's men. They only listened to Alina's arrangements. At the same time, 
Only Alina could get General Sulla from the Shadow Wolves to help her. General Sulla would only respond to the requests of two people in Bacchus. One was Emperor Marius. And the other was the one who had been in the most dangerous situation. Alina was entrusted by Emperor Marius to contact him. But Alina currently does not hold any position. It was Justice's request not to give Alina a position. He did not want his daughter to engage in intelligence work. Because this job would always involve contact with the dark side. He was worried that if this position was made public, his daughter would not be able to marry in the future. In fact, this child has refused to talk about anything related to blind dates. He keeps saying that he will only marry the child of prophecy. But there is no such thing as the child of prophecy. But after Alina lost her position, the secrecy of the intelligence department was greatly strengthened. Alina now often disappears wearing a mask. And even Justice doesn't know where she is. Sometimes she would hide behind the screen in the council chamber, holding a small notebook to provide intelligence to Marius. But more often than not, it's not Alina behind the screen, but Brutus' sister Elena. She and Alina look very similar. Now they wear exactly the same clothes. No one can tell the difference without looking carefully. Come out. Emperor Marius knew that Alina had such a substitute. But only Marius knew. At this time, the new members of the Senate Council were holding a small meeting in the chamber. The huge black stone conference table is hollow. And a fire basin is placed under the table. The firelight reflects the hollow part of the table. Making the tabletop show obvious patterns and lines. Those hollow lines and patterns represent fortresses and roads. This huge conference table is engraved with a map of the Pender continent. A black metal chess piece carved into the shape of a sword was placed at Chicha Fortress on the map. While another blue-gray chess piece carved into the shape of a giant crown helmet was placed at Layla Fortress. This was the situation three days ago. Dot have the people sent to Layla Fortress returned. Emperor Marius was placing a red chess piece in his hand next to the Chicha Fortress and placed another red chess piece with a crown logo on the Lion City. Your Majesty, we have contacted the Phoenix Knights. But according to the Phoenix Knights, it was General Titus who told them to stand still at Layla Fortress. General Titus claimed that he would defend Layla Fortress, and General Agathon worked together to buy time for the Empire. To this end, he asked Your Majesty to allocate troops, money and food to him, and asked him to establish a new legion. The person reporting was the intelligence officer Brutus. He conveyed the situation with an expressionless face and no emotion at all in his words. If he really cared about the Empire, he should have defended the Sava River Fort instead of illegally occupying Agathon's territory. General Creon shook his head, thinking that Titus's statement was unreliable. That's not to say. Layla Fortress is indeed easier to defend than Sava Fortress. It is understandable that Titus retreated. He can be stationed in Layla Fortress to protect the capital which means that he does not intend to treason. He is just greedy and wants a higher status. By controlling the Phoenix Knights to blackmail the Empire into supplying money and food for soldiers is very dangerous. The Empire can't give him money and food now. Governor Justice shook his head, turning over the book he used to keep accounts in front of him. The Empire needs money everywhere. And there is not enough money and food to rebuild Siyuan City. As finance minister, he is probably the poorest person in the history of the Empire and the treasury really has no money. Ivalo, do you have any objections? Maria saw that the serf general had been silent and encouraged him. Your Majesty, I am just a pig farmer. I don't know how to govern a country. My only opinion is that the land is sacred, even if you face a formidable and powerful enemy. As a general, you should not abandon any inch of land. Ivalo said softly with some hesitation. That's right. Titus gave up the Sava River Fort when he could hold it, and he gave up after Agathon successfully attacked the Chicha Fortress. Not only did he abandon the country, but he also asked Agathon to help him. Song is in despair. Maybe this bastard did not treason. But he betrayed the people under his rule. Countless civilians will die in Sava Fort because of his evacuation. And more people will be homeless as a result. General Valius' attitude was more intense. Obviously, he cared more about the life and livelihood of every Bacchus. It was no wonder that Emperor Marius made him consul. Now is not the time to talk about charges. The key is how to get the Phoenix Knights out of Titus' control and quickly assist Agathon. Since the Lion King appointed Liang as marshal, it is obviously to invade the empire. So Agatha only Jia Song would venture into Chicha Fortress alone to buy time for the empire. But he probably wouldn't be able to hold on for long. Justice was obviously thinking more pragmatically. Sura, do you have any friendship with the Phoenix Knights? Emperor Marius turned his head towards the shadow in the corner and asked. 
The place was dark and looked like there was no one there. But General Sulla's voice came out. No. Although Phoenix and Shadow both exist to fight against the snake cult, I also admire their character. But they are noble knights who shine like flaming flames in the light. While we are just ghost wolves hiding in the dark not wanting to attract attention. This is true. The Shadow Wolves are all civilians. And they probably don't have much in common with the noble knights of the Phoenix Knights but they all have the mission of dealing with the snake cult. Your Majesty, gentlemen, I have just received a new piece of information. Chicha Fortress was burned down by General Agathon, and Titus is trying to take Agathon's troops as his own. A pleasant female voice came from behind the screen. That was Alina's voice. And everyone at the conference table turned their heads. Alina hurried out, covered in dust, and handed a letter to Emperor Marius. Agathon died, is he still alive? Emperor Marius frowned. He did not ask what Titus had done, but was more concerned about Agathon's life and death. Still alive. I saw him. But General Agathon is now wounded. And he is being held in Layla Fortress by General Titus. Titus is currently forcing General Agathon's troops to be loyal to he. Fortunately, I brought this letter back. General Agathon said this was written by Count Leon to you. Alina pointed to the parchment sealed with fire paint in Maria's hand. Sigh. The enemies of the Empire always come from within but the enemies from outside are actually thinking about the empire. It's really ridiculous. After reading the letter, Emperor Marius looked down at the map on the table and sighed deeply. Everyone, bring your troops to prepare for war. Gather all the empire's troops between Siyuan City and Layla Fortress. I will personally go and provide soldiers, horses, money and food to Titus. After just squinting his eyes and thinking for a few seconds, Emperor Marius made a decision. Your Majesty, if all the troops are mobilized now, will the Eastern Region be ignored? The Lion King asked Leon to serve as Marshal. This is obviously to let Leon lead the army to enter from Kalandir Fort. General Creon didn't understand. What Agathon brought back is a covenant. Leon plans to do a business with me. He will not have any ideas about the Eastern Region. Of course, this business must be negotiated, and I have to talk to him face to face. Arlene Na. Send a reply to Leong. I will meet him at Layla Fortress. The matter of Titus is just a matter of course. Emperor Marius shook his head, with a hint of sarcasm in his eyes. However, Titus is an Ashborn after all. I have to give some face to his majesty manias of the Ashborn Empire. I plan to make him a glorious phoenix knight. Layla Fortress. General Titus was in a manic rage, and was forcibly taken away from the fortress eastward by a group of phoenix knights. He felt betrayed betrayed by Emperor Marius, betrayed by the Imperial Senate, and betrayed by the Knights of the Phoenix, because the Phoenix Knights actually ignored his order and prepared to go to Karen Deer Castle with all members, and even forced him to go with them. The reason why the Phoenix Knights went to Karen Deer Castle is because the current lord of Karen Deer Castle, Earl Leon, destroyed the army of the Snake Cult and created a vaccine to suppress the Red Death. This was confirmed by all the leading figures of Bacchus, including Emperor Marius, and Count Leon even told them on the spot how to make and inoculate the vaccine. The Phoenix Knights came here to deal with the snake cult. No matter which country's lord they were, whoever could deal with the snake cult would be their allies. They came from the Ashborn Empire of the Amara continent, and they didn't want to participate in Pan. In the struggle between the countries and the German continent, they especially do not want to participate in the struggle for power. Therefore, the Phoenix Knights plan to build separate auditoriums at Karen Deer Castle and Malisburg to ensure that the snake cult will not resurgence. Not only that, Emperor Marius also personally made the decision to let Titus join the Phoenix Knights and become a new Phoenix Knight. This is the first time that the Phoenix Knights, inherited from father to son, have recruited outsiders for the sake of Emperor Marius. This is of course an honor, and it seems like Emperor Marius is praising Titus. But the problem is that Emperor Marius took back Titus's position as the liaison to the Ashborn Empire, and he was no longer a messenger on behalf of the Emperor. Titus's mission was over. And of course, he would take back his status as an envoy. Emperor Marius even gave Titus a larger territory as a reward for successfully completing the mission. All the land around the Sava River Fort, including Emmeline and Labulin and other villages and towns, all considered Titus territory. But here's the thing. These territories currently do not belong to the Bacchus Empire. Liang's army has marched to the south of the Sava River Fort. And these territories are all under Liang's control. Moreover, judging from Liang's appearance, he probably would not return it to Titus. In this way, 
Titus himself is just an empty-headed general. After losing his status as an envoy, he can no longer control the Phoenix Knights. He is now a newcomer who has just joined the Phoenix Knights. The Knights have their own organization and levels. A newcomer like Titus will naturally not have any authority. The guys in the Ember Empire are all brainless. They only think about muscles, blood and fire. Except me. All the Bacchus are not good people. They are all xenophobic. Emperor Marius was even more of a treacherous person. They say they treat everyone equally. But in fact they never trust me. And that Leon. A young man who has just been lucky and won a few battles. What does he know? Sooner or later, I will get the Saba fort back. And we have to at Cullen Deer Castle. Titus thought angrily. Chapter 266 The Bargaining Chip of the Transaction Perhaps Emperor Marius was not a fair emperor. His treatment of Titus was much harsher than that of Kairos. You know, Kairos once threatened Marius. If you really talk about sin, this is treason. However, Emperor Marius did not deal with Kairos directly. Instead, he allowed Kairos to find trouble with the snake cult and only sent the shadow wolf to follow him secretly. Titus, on the other hand, only revealed his intention to become the second Levius. He did not rebel or treason. Nor did he even break the law. But as soon as the signs of becoming a warlord appeared, Emperor Marius suppressed him with explicit praise and covert derogation, and even sent Titus to the frontier. In fact, there is a reason for this differential treatment. Kairos was able to hold Marius hostage because the Shadow Army only listened to his command and they dared to deal with even the Emperor. This means that once Kairos is killed, the Shadow Army will inevitably rebel. But the current Bacchus Empire cannot afford such a rebellion. Although Titus brought the Phoenix Knights from the continent of Amara, and they seemed powerful, he did not have the same control as Kairos. The Phoenix Knights would not obey his orders, but were only based on Titus. He was just helping him as C's previous ambassador. The Phoenix Knights are the protectorate knights of the Ashborn Empire. The only person who can make them obey absolutely is the Emperor Manius III of the Ashborn Empire. In fact, the history of the Phoenix Knights is not long, but it is full of glory and indeed powerful. This order was founded in conjunction with the Ashenborn Empire. At that time, the Snake Cult had almost occupied the entire continent of Amara. The armed forces resisting the Snake Cult in the old Bacchus Empire once only had the last castle left, the Fawn Castle. But they still fight hard. The Snake Cult mobilized an unprecedented force to deal with the last bastion that dared to resist its rule. The Lord of Fawn Castle died on the front line and his young son, Manius Calgar, put on his father's armor and stood at the front like his father, bravely leading a few comrades to continue to persevere. This was a hard and protracted battle, and most of Manius's comrades died on this day. But they successfully repelled the snake cult army and won the final victory. After losing his father and so many friends, the sad Manius held a mass cremation and prepared to cremate all the corpses. The flames that night were so hot that all the survivors felt as if their armor was melting. No one knows what happened that night. But the next morning Manius and his soldiers found themselves fully clothed, but missing their armor. When they went to investigate the remains of the firewood that was giving off a faint green smoke, everyone saw a dazzling red light shining in the embers. But there was no trace of heat coming out. The confused Manius pushed aside the ashes and found that their armor was all hidden under the embers. Each piece of armor looked like it was forged by flowing flames but the metal was cold to the touch. After this miraculous event, Manius and his surviving comrades began to call themselves Emberborn and spread the news of their victory at Fawn Keep. As a result, the people of Umla Continent realized that the snake cult was not invincible, so most areas gradually armed themselves to resist. Soon after, Manius Karaga announced the establishment of a new empire, the Ashborn Empire, and he became the first emperor of the Ashborn Empire, Manius I and those warriors who fought with him at Fong keep formed the original Phoenix Knights. Today, when members of the Phoenix Order die or retire, they pass their armor and swords to their sons, just as Manius put on his father's armor and continued to fight. The name Phoenix Knights also means that the Ashborn Empire will continue to be reborn like the Phoenix. They believe that the Phoenix will become stronger every time it is reborn from the ashes. Therefore, their flaming armor always shines at the forefront and their shining swords that never retreat can always bring firm determination to their allies. Even if they are face to face with the Dread Legion, they can still bravely stand at the front even after most of them are killed. Moreover, no matter how great the loss is, as long as their Phoenix battle flag returns to the Fong Fort, the Knights will immediately be re-established. Just like the rebirth of the Phoenix, 
The sons of the Phoenix Knights will train martial arts and armor repair skills from an early age. They are always ready to put on their father's armor and inherit their father's glory and mission. It is this kind of spiritual inheritance that allows the Ashborn Empire to continuously regain its homeland. In the past few decades, its territory has gradually expanded from the original corner of Fong Castle to half of the old Bacchus Empire. Today's Ashborn Empire is under the rule of Manius III, already able to compete with the snake worship cult. The Phoenix Knights are the most powerful heavily armored knights in the Ashborn Empire, and their strength lies in the fact that they never flinch in the face of any powerful enemy. Therefore, when they followed Titus to the continent of Pindor, they met the battleships of the Dread Legion Infantry. They did not flinch and won the battle at sea. Then they ran into Baumon, the lord of the Dexia Principality, and Brennus of the Lion Kingdom one after another near the Sava River Fort. Both of them were plundering civilians in the Sava River Fort area. So they brought these two, he was beaten as a reward for Titus for helping them destroy the Snake Cult's port. But after that, Titus asked the Phoenix Knights to retreat from the Sava River Fort, and also took away all the supplies of the Sava River Fort, leaving the helpless civilians to the armies of the Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Desha. Moreover, that was indeed when there was no need to retreat. At that time, Titus had the idea of starting a fight between the Kingdom of Lion and the Principality of Desha, and wanted to watch the fire from the other side. But this was not in line with the usual style of the Phoenix Knights. They were Manius's personal troops and allies of Emperor Marius, not Titus' private soldiers. They can help their allies fight the toughest battles, but they are never willing to be a knife in the hands of others in power disputes. It was just that Titus was an envoy of Marius and Emperor Marius provided generous assistance when the Ashborn Empire was in crisis. The Phoenix Knights respected Titus' status as an envoy and did not abandon him immediately. So from that time on, Titus could no longer order the Phoenix Knights at will. He could only guard Layla Fortress, trying to use the Phoenix Knights as a bargaining chip to ask Emperor Marius for money, food and troops, and then use the troops, money and food he asked for to make the Phoenix Knights obey his command. It's a pity that Emperor Marius didn't give him this opportunity. However, Emperor Marius, like Leon, believed that everyone has a use. He sent Titus and the Phoenix Knights to Cullendir Keep on purpose. The Phoenix Knights and Titus were actually the bargaining chips he used to bargain with Leon. One day ago, Emperor Marius and Leon were bargaining like two merchants trading cabbage. Your Majesty, if you trade those small villages north of Fort Walwing for Ashkaman, this deal will be a good deal for you. Leong drew the map and pointed at the bay between Siyuan City and Ashkaman. With Ashkaman, the economy of the Bacchus Empire will soon recover. And you can also get war horses. Huh? Let's wait until Ashkaman is captured. North of Walwyn. Imel is also north of Walwyn. That's not a small village. Moreover, the area of that land is comparable to Ashko Mandarin is much bigger. Emperor Marius shook his head and said there was nothing to talk about. Your Majesty. Okay. Even if you don't mention Ashkaman, what about the Sava River Fort? I already asked Agatha to burn Chicha Fortress. Is this sincerity enough? You don't want to do this? Leon glanced sideways at Agasun standing in the distance. Burning Chicha Fortress will indeed make Ulrich's troops dare not leave Lion City. But I know that you are not doing this just to reassure me. Emperor Marius smiled and stared into Liang's eyes. I know that Chicha Fortress has extraordinary significance to the Lion Kingdom. This is the place where your country was founded. It will definitely be rebuilt after it is burned down. And reconstruction means it will consume a lot of money and food. But the laborers in the Lion Kingdom have to be hired with money. And even if they are forced to work, they still need to provide money and food. Now in the entire Lion Kingdom, you are probably the only one, Count Leon, who has so much money and food to repair the Chicha Fortress. You want to be everyone's creditor. Right. Oh, you can see it. Yes, debtors will always be polite to their creditors. But in any case, this is a good thing for the Bacchus Empire, isn't it? Leon sighed and looked at Emperor Marius. It was indeed difficult to negotiate with such an emperor who knew everything. Yes, a good thing. Don't you just want to remind me that I am also in debt to you? You also let Agathon scrape the land. Is he someone who can do that kind of thing? Leon, the Bacchus Empire doesn't I know how to trade my country. You can take advantage of the emptiness of the border to capture Karen Deer Fort. No one can say anything about this. But for this kind of transaction, I can't sell my country, even if I exchange a small village for a big city. Emperor Marius looked at Leon with a smile. His attitude was indeed polite, 
but his tone was not relaxed at all. Then what are your plans? If you don't come out with suitable conditions, I will take possession of the Sava River castle and never return it. Anyway, this kind of victory is enough. Liang took a picture of the map and covered the Sava River fort with his palm. Don't think I don't know. You can't get the Sava castle. There is no way the Lion King will seal the Sava castle to you. It will only become the territory of Ulrich or Brennus. Otherwise, there will be no sense of security in Lion City. Emperor Marius also stretched out his hand. But what he covered was the Chicha Fortress. This is one of the reasons why you asked Agathon to burn the Chicha Fortress. You wanted to force Ulrich to rebuild the Chicha Fortress. Sa Sava River Fort is facing both Desha and the Empire at the same time. Now it has lost the support of Chicha Fortress and cannot be defended at all. I don't need you to return Sava River Fort to me. I want to take it back easily. Your Majesty, if you say that, then there is no need to discuss it. Bacchus is so poor that he is almost bankrupt. Don't you plan to go to Dexia with me to subsidize it? Leon now feels a bit of toothache. And Emperor Marius is like a roundworm in his stomach. Of course I have to go. In fact, I sent people there a long time ago. I am indeed willing to form an alliance with you. Not with the Lion Kingdom. But I plan to trade with you for something else. Emperor Marius pointed at Karen Deer Castle. The Knights of the Phoenix. What do you mean? The Phoenix Knights are not your army. How are you going to trade with them? Leon was a little confused. I will have the Phoenix Knights view you as a snake cult killer and prompt them to build a chapel at Cullen Deer Keep so they can be used by you. Emperor Marius sighed as he spoke. Huh? You want the land north of Fort Walwing. But I can't transfer the land. Therefore, I will use the large areas of land and villages around Imel as the Phoenix Knights by acquiring a fief. You are effectively gaining control of that land. Of course, it is still nominally the territory of the Empire. Are you going to use my money and food to feed the Phoenix Knights? And that area has been hit by the Red Death and the Snake Cult. So I have to spend money for disaster relief. Right. This business is very shrewd. Leon gave a thumbs up and began to wonder if Marius was also a profiteer before he became emperor. Whether it's disaster relief or providing supplies to the Phoenix Knights. Isn't this what you want? Otherwise, forget this deal. You lend me another loan. And I will go to the disaster relief myself using Imel as my weapon. Mortgage. Emperor Marius was indeed a profiteer with extremely good judgment. Leon was indeed willing to both provide disaster relief and support the Phoenix Knights. Ha! Huh. You want the people's support while also spending my money. You haven't repaid the last loan yet. Don't borrow it. Leon finally saw that this emperor was cunning and shameless. Much thicker skin than himself. Look, I know you are unwilling to borrow. You now occupy the Sava River Castle on behalf of the Kingdom of Lions. So I will transfer Titus to the Lord of Imel after a period of time. But Titus is just, it's just in the name of the Empire. I won't provide him with any troops or supplies. So you can directly capture Imel. You are the enemy of the Empire anyway. And Titus is a ready excuse for attack. You should know that he has killed many people. Noble prisoners of war from the Lion Kingdom. Emperor Marius shook his head and smiled. Huh? You really know how to use resources. You can even sell Titus for a good price. Leon felt that if this emperor abandoned politics and engaged in business, he would probably become the emperor of a business empire. Leon, to be honest, I don't care about my reputation that much. You are richer than me now. So go and help the civilians in Imer find a way to survive. I can't give away the land. That is the responsibility of the emperor. But I hope that everyone in the land can have enough food and clothing, even if they will regard you as a better ruler than me. I know you will not treat the common people harshly. I have heard about fighting village. Emperor Marius suppressed his smile and spoke softly in a serious manner. Chapter 267 Friends Wine Leong finally agreed to Marius' conditions. What he originally wanted was the land north of Fort Wolfen and south of Shieldwind Fort. In the eyes of others, that area is just a lot of wasteland and small villages. And the only densely populated territory is Imel Village. But for Leong, that is an important deep zone. And it is the only place he can really get in his current capacity. It is also the last gap outside the Nolder Forest. After obtaining this hundreds of miles of depth. Not only will the Nolder Elves be able to appear in all of Liang's territories. But Liang himself will also have the confidence to face any force. Including the Lion Kingdom. Moreover. Imel Village has the potatoes and corn planted by Dean. And together with the surrounding small villages. It has a total population of over 10,000. In fact, this transaction was quite cost-effective for Emperor Marius. 
he spent almost no capital, except for a knighthood that did not belong to him. The transaction was just an excuse, or in the name of sending troops. This excuse is Titus. Speaking of which, Titus is not a member of the Bacchus Empire. He was originally an officer of the Ashbourne Empire. Titus was sent to Pender by the Ashbourne Emperor Manius many years ago. He was one of the first Ashbourne members to make contact with Emperor Marius. In fact, he had nothing to do with the Phoenix Knights when he was in the Ashbourne Empire. He was originally a fleet officer. When he was sent to Pendor, he was a fleet escort officer escorting the mission. At that time, the Bacchus Empire was flourishing. But the Ashbourne Empire on the Amara continent was fighting extremely hard against the snake cult. So Emperor Mania sent a mission to seek help from Emperor Marius of the Bacchus Empire. They are both Bacchus people. Although they are separated by two continents. But they are of the same origin and species. So they naturally have to support each other when facing the snake cult. At that time, Emperor Marius also noticed the threat of the snake cult. Although the envoy sent by Manius was poor and brought almost nothing except sincerity. However, Emperor Marius still agreed to the alliance and not only provided a lot of material support to the Ashbourne Empire, but also sent several more advanced warships. The continent of Amara has been occupied by the snake cult for many years. The Ashbourne Empire was rebuilt on the ruins. There has been no progress in technological development. Even the missions are still using old ships from a hundred years ago. Although the new warships of the Bacchus Empire are not too powerful. They are indeed much more advanced than those of the snake cult. And the Ashbourne Empire can also gain some advantages because of this. At that time, this matter was criticized by the Senate. Saying that Emperor Marius was wasting national power by spending the treasury to unilaterally fund other countries. However, Marius said on the spot that, Most people who say such things are closely related to the snake cult and maintain the covenant with a firm attitude. At the same time, in order to maintain contact with the Ashbourne Empire, Emperor Marius left Titus in the Bacchus Empire and gave him the high position of general. This appointment was originally a courtesy to the envoys from afar, and it was also to facilitate continued cooperation with the Ashbourne Empire. No one objected to giving Titus a general title. After all, he was just an empty general, with salary but no power. This generous appointment gave Titus the idea of serving in the Bacchus Empire for a long time. Even if he is an empty-headed general, he is still a general after all. Besides, during the time when Titus came to the Pender continent as an escort officer, he saw what the Bacchus Empire was like before it was harmed by the snake cult on a large scale. Prosperous, rich, clean, and full of vitality. Even the women who have stumbled in the alleys of Siyuan City are more beautiful. Life here is much better than the Ashbourne Empire which is full of ruins. But as an outsider and an empty-headed general, the Bacchus people actually didn't like him very much. Although they were all polite to his identity, no one would really regard him as one of their own. So Titus has been figuring it out ever since. Soon after, the Bacchus Empire and the Lion Kingdom went to war. During the war, Titus got his chance. At least in name. He was a general. So of course, he should participate in the war. Titus spent all his savings and even sold the ship that originally belonged to him, raised a ragtag army, and made contributions in the war against the kingdom of the lion. That battle was not a great victory. The motley army he had just recruited almost suffered all casualties, and the losses were much greater than those of the lion kingdom. But the strategic results were very good. He defended the Saba fort for the Bacchus Empire. In this battle, Titus took no prisoners. As an Ashbourne, previous battles were against snake worshippers. In addition, Titus was originally a fleet officer, so he naturally had no habit of keeping prisoners. Titus had just arrived in the continent of Pender and had not yet understood the rules among the Pender nobles. He did not know at the time that the nobles of the Lion Kingdom would spend money to redeem themselves. Therefore, many noble knights in the Kingdom of Lion died in his hands, and those nobles who surrendered were all killed by him. Titus' troops suffered too many casualties, and he was basically bankrupt, and the fire in his heart was not at all can't help it. As a result, Titus was considered cruel by most nobles and became even more unpopular. But in any case, Titus did make military exploits for the empire. This is an irrefutable fact. In addition, it is rare to be an emberborn and fight so hard for the Bacchus Empire. So Titus became a real imperial general and got the Sava River Fort as his territory. The area under the jurisdiction of the Sava River Fort was quite large and most of the Sava River Basin was fertile farmland. This was the most important part of the Bacchus Empire. Good territory. This was originally a place that Governor Levius had always been coveted. 
as a large border county, Saba Fort could get a lot of autonomy and control the border guards. Emperor Marius allowed Titus to be the lord of the Saba River castle, and it was said that he did not treat him as an outsider. So this outsider became a real general in control of the army, and he was barely integrated into the Bacchus Empire. But Titus had killed the surrendered nobles before, which in itself was a never-ending excuse. From then on, the Lion Kingdom no longer had to make excuses to declare war on the Bacchus Empire, or attack Karen in the name of recovering its homeland, Deer Fort, or attacking the Saba Fort in the name of revenge. In fact, when Emperor Marius made Titus the lord of the Saba River Castle, he had this intention and was actively creating a name for the Kingdom of the Lion. The Bacchus Empire must always face a powerful enemy so that the country can be united. At the same time, when the old guys in the Senate were constantly facing threats from the Kingdom of Lions, they would not propose anything such as asking Marius to be dismissed from get out of class. They needed Emperor Marius to block enemies who might attack at any time. Marius could only implement his reforms if these domestic laggards stopped messing around. And Titus himself knew that many nobles in the Lion Kingdom had grudges against him. Once defeated, he might not even have a chance to surrender. Therefore, he must defend the Sava River fort and must not be captured. Besides, he was not willing to lose the territory he had gained at the cost of bankruptcy. Most of the Bacchus people also regarded Titus as an outsider. He did not get much help. He had no other way out except to defend the Sava fort with all his heart and to be loyal to Emperor Marius wholeheartedly. In fact, Titus has been doing this all these years. He is a lonely minister in another form. This is the logic behind the enfeoffment of territories by emperors like Marius. There are many more things to consider than most people imagine. The same logic applies to the business discussions between Emperor Marius and Liang. A country, or a big force, actually needs enemies. And sometimes it even has to personally give the enemy an excuse to declare war. Marius knew this, and so did Liang. Liang took the initiative to give Marius an excuse before. He occupied Karen Deer Castle and she'll win fortress in the name of capture. So his territory was always facing counterattacks from the Bacchus Empire. In this way, the king of the Lion Realm and other lords would not hold him back. At the same time, Emperor Marius also needed to face the attack that Leon might launch at any time so that the country could unite as one. As rivals of enemy countries, there can actually be a tacit understanding between them. The excuse provided by Emperor Marius to Leon was still the cruel General Titus. The two reached an agreement at Layla Fortress, agreeing to attack Ashkaman together, but they would not act together. Leon would lead the army to attack from the land, while Emperor Marius' fleet would attack from both ends from the sea. And Leon had not yet it will be regarded as secretly collaborating with the enemy, which is the best choice. Emperor Marius indeed needed to go to war against Dexia. He needed horses. He also needed to solve the domestic difficulties. And he also needed to find a channel for the domestic maritime merchants who were affected by the rebels and the snake worshippers, and were unable to do business for half a year. Taking Ashkaman would indeed allow the Bacchus Empire to recover economically. Have a drink with me. I hope we can successfully conquer Ashkaman. But after this, we may never be able to work together peacefully again. After the negotiation was completed, Emperor Marius kindly invited Leon to drink. It was a jug and cup brought by Marius himself. The jug was placed on a small stove. It seems that Emperor Marius liked to drink wine that was boiled and left to warm. Your Majesty, why do you say that? Leon took the wine glass handed by Emperor Marius and took a sip. The wine was full of sweetness and tasted really good. I want to regain lost territory. And these lost territories are all in your hands. I must get them back as soon as possible. As an emperor, there are many responsibilities that must be fulfilled. Emperor Marius' attitude was serious. There is no need to rush to regain the lost ground. Wait. Your Majesty. Are you feeling ill? Liang's attitude also became serious. And he noticed that there seemed to be a hint of urgency in Marius' words. Is there something wrong with him? Unless he felt that he was dying soon. He wouldn't say this at this time. Huh? I won't sign any agreement with you. Anyway, the Phoenix Knights are stationed at Karen Deer Castle. So neither you nor I have to worry about being attacked by the other side. This is more effective than any agreement. Emperor Marius did not respond to Liang's question. He just shook his head and took a big sip of wine. Liang picked up the cup and looked at it. The flask and cup were silver. But the material didn't seem to be silver. The agreement is waste paper. And integrity is the foundation. Your Majesty. It is your utensil. Is this a lead wine flask? 
Leon opened the lid of the wine jug, and the warm wine inside exuded a rich, sweet aroma. Lead flasks can make the sour taste of wine sweet. You should try it. Emperor Marius nodded and tried to pour more for Leon. But Leon shook his head and refused. I must advise you to drink less wine. And dot it's best not to use this hip flask again. After hesitating for a while, Leon decided to try to persuade the emperor. This is my only hobby. Is there anything wrong with this hip flask? The emperor Marius seems not to have known the consequences of heating wine in lead vessels. The Bacchus people have a long history of lead mining and smelting technology. So a large number of lead products have entered the daily life of the Bacchus people. The process of lead poisoning is extremely slow, and most people are unaware that this metal, which brings them countless conveniences, also brings them countless pains. There is a reason why the population of the Bacchus Empire has not been able to grow. Putting food and materials like lead can cause chronic poisoning. It's better to use clay pots to drink alcohol. My friend. Leon also knew that the impact of heavy metal compounds on humans was difficult to explain in this era. So he directly gave a specific suggestion. Thank you. Friend. Emperor Marius nodded, seemingly listening. Maybe this is the only time the two of them call themselves friends. And from now on they can only be rivals. The advice from his friends was effective. And Emperor Marius replaced the lead pot with a clay pot when he returned. But just a day later he switched back. The wine of this era was relatively sour. And Marius had long been accustomed to the sweet red wine heated in lead pots. The wine in the clay pots made it difficult for him to swallow. After so many years, the poison that should have been poisoned has long been inflicted. Emperor Marius shook his head and smiled bitterly, and then acted willfully again. However, on that day, he issued a special decree to increase the commercial tax on food utensils such as lead wine bottles, pots and pans, and directly increased the tax tenfold. If nothing else, the price of lead food utensils will increase several times, and people who cannot afford it will naturally look for other cheap substitutes. Three days later, the kingdom's army gathered under the commander's flag, and the Bacchus Empire's fleet also began to set off from Siyuan City. Leon led his troops to the vicinity of Turda Fortress and stationed themselves in the valley 30 miles east of the fortress. Leon had been to this valley before. This was the place where he gambled with Ramon. And this time, Leon also met Ramon here again. He took the initiative to invite Ramon to come and meet. They were still at the place where they first met, still facing each other on horseback. Good brother. Are you okay? Do you remember what I once told you? Seeing Ramon again, Leong seemed extremely enthusiastic. Lord Leong, now he is actually a marshal. His worth has risen so fast. What are you referring to? Ramon obviously suffered from some occupational diseases, and everyone would have to estimate his worth. I told you before that I would join hands with you to auction the city lord's position, and even auction the throne. Leong smiled and threw a dice at Ramon. I'm here to cash in on this deal. Those were the dice Ramon had thrust into his hand. Chapter 268 Trial of Heretics He jumped off the horse, stepped forward to greet Leon, took hold of Liang's horse rein, bowed and held the stirrups, and made a gesture to welcome Leon to dismount. This is a kind of etiquette, which is the etiquette for welcoming distinguished elders or close friends in the Savanir Desert. Lord Leon, I have given dice to five people, but only you can understand what I mean. It seems that I have indeed found a real good brother. Ramon's smile was truly genuine. The underground king of Sinjar had his own pride. Even if Bahadur Khan Kadin visited Sinjar, he would not be treated like Ramon personally holding the horse and pedaling. Only friends he approves of. You gave me three lead-filled dice. Naturally you want me to throw a number that satisfies both of us. Good brother, if you regarded me as a fellow traveler, then of course I will also regard you as a true brother. Leon jumped off the horse and gave Ramon a hug. Life is like this. Many people only need to meet once and say a few words to become true friends. Only Leon understood Ramon's thoughts. The three lead-filled dice represented Ramon's confession to him that he was truly willing to regard Leon as his confidant. In this case, Leon must return it with the same sincerity. A person like Ramon may indeed be cunning, cunning and unscrupulous, but the sincerity he paid at the beginning was all true. And he also longed for the understanding and sincerity of others. But all along, the rewards he received were mostly conspiracy and betrayal. In fact, if he repays Ramon sincerely, he will be a real good brother. Just like he treats his subordinates, he will not only take care of the work and life of his subordinates, but also let their descendants receive education like the children of the nobles. Get the chance to completely change your destiny. 
what he wants is actually a different kind of fairness. And Li Ang's behavior of returning the dice means that he is being treated fairly because Li Ang himself is the same type of person. It is indeed a blessing to have a soulmate in life. And most people will never find one in their lifetime. Ramon was lucky that he met. So Ramon smiled even more happily. Good brother. How are we going to auction the position of city lord? He hammered his chest with his fist. Indicating that people who understand don't need too many words. Therefore, these two people are now considered partners. Although there is no contract or commitment. Ramon? In the casino owned by Mai Xiang International. Every time we meet a new customer. The banker will let the customer win a little first. Leong softly talked about the business methods in his casino. Ramon was stunned for a moment. Then laughed again. I know this. And I have learned now that every time I gamble with someone. I will let them win three times first. Huh? You learn quickly. In fact. Strategy and war are also a kind of gambling. If you want to win in the end. You have to get your opponent deeply involved first. And wait for the opponent to take the initiative to increase the stakes. The same is true for the auction of the city lord and the throne. Leong nodded and got down to business. I see. I know what it means. But I can't describe it as clearly as you. Good brother. You are indeed a real tycoon. So, where is our goal? Wait. Let me guess. Is it Ash Coleman? Ramon responded quickly. He was an extremely smart guy. His way of thinking was indeed very similar to that of Leon himself. Communication with him was extremely smooth. You guessed it right. It's Ashkaman. Caliph Bahaman's troops were crippled in the Sava River fort not long ago. And his territory Ashkaman is about to face my army. There will definitely be many customers are willing to come and gamble. At this moment, Leon felt quite like facing a confidant. He held Ramon's shoulders and pointed at the army behind him. There are over 10,000 troops. Boundless. And all kinds of flags are overwhelming. Although half of them were caravans. At least they looked really powerful. There are still quite a few lords from the Lion Kingdom who come to fight with the marshal. Although the troops of King Ulrich and several of the most powerful lords are not among them. The total troops of other small lords total more than 5,000 people. During this expedition to Dexia, the four most powerful lords did not participate. Except for Duke Brennus, Godric of Talon Castle, Leofric of Brave Shield Castle, and here Ward of May's Castle did not come. Their castles are the borders of the kingdom in all directions. Moreover, their territory was too far away from the principality of Dexia, and Leon did not send them a summons. After all, these were his own people. Leon didn't plan to occupy any territory in this battle, so there was no need to trick his own people into traveling thousands of miles. But just Liang's own troops and those small lords combined cannot be blocked by the current Bahamon. On the contrary, the Turta fortress not far away can probably hold on for a while. Judging from the current situation, your army is powerful enough to run rampant in the Savanir Desert. Bahamon may wet his pants dot, but Gawain Khan of Turta Fortress may become an obstacle to you. Ramon could obviously understand the situation. So he also asked about Turta Fortress. He had no doubt that Leon could capture this fortress. But if Liang's troops suffered too many losses in Turta Fortress, they might not even be able to reach Ashkaman City. How can Gawain Khan become an obstacle to me? Good brother. Gawain Khan should become our client. He is Bahaman's younger brother. Leon tilted his head and smiled sinisterly. Oh, so this is how the city lord is auctioned. Ha! Huh. Ramon understood Liang's intention. So, in addition to Gawain Khan, our clients also include Bahaman Sunakram and his nephew Jimshid. How come there are only so few? Ramon, set your sights higher. We still have many big customers. Emperor Marius, King Ulrich, Bahad Khan Kanan, and Cadden's brother Emil Xerxes Dot and Caliph Tire. Lord of Sinjar. Leon counted the number of big customers on his fingers. Just one hand. After counting, Leon looked at Ramon with a smile. Good brother. Do you now know how I am going to auction the position of city lord? After Ashkaman sells it, we can continue to auction the title of Bahad. I said I would auction the throne. You plan to take Bahadur Khan too. TSK TSK. I understand. These big clients really make me salivate. Good brother. What do you want me to do? Ramon opened his mouth wide and began to rub his hands enthusiastically. As the underground king of Sinjar, Ramon has extremely rich sources of intelligence. He knew a few days ago that Bahadur Khan Kadin was defeated at the Lion City. In this case, of course, he immediately understood Liang's plan. Intention. The throne of Bahad Khan can indeed be auctioned. 
Ramon even asked for the first time in his life. What do you want me to do? In the past, he was the one who said, We can do this. You go prepare a large-scale auction. Find all the big customers. And start selling tickets. There must be a lot of people who want to attend this unprecedented auction. And charge them a huge admission fee. In addition, I need your people to go a message from Turda Fortress. Leon was not polite and began to assign tasks to his partners. Turda Fortress. Gawain Khan was pacing back and forth anxiously, with a sad look on his face. His territory faced an unprecedented crisis. In fact, this crisis began more than a month ago. At first, Governor Kairos of the Bacchus Empire led a request to enter the territory of Dexia to track down the priests of the snake cult. At that time, the Desha and Bacchus empires were peaceful countries. Kairos was famous and did not bring many people. Only a few dozen shadow centurions. So Gawain Khan let him pass. After all, snake worship is also a heresy for the Dexia people. Dexia is rarely troubled by the Red Death not because of their special constitution, but because snake worshippers are not welcomed in most places in Dexia. There is little room for development. Only the chaotic city of Single can accommodate all heretics. Shortly afterwards, several small groups also requested entry, and these people are not like armed forces. Each team only has 20 or 30 people, and they behave very politely. They do not conflict with anyone in Turta Fortress, but they are friendly and express that they are here to judge heretics. In the past, there were often very polite small teams entering the country in the name of trial of heretics or critique of depravity, but those people actually went to single. The so-called trial of heretics actually means buying and selling slaves. After all, if heretics are captured alive, they will basically become slaves without exception. Many nobles like to find excitement in heretics. And, criticizing depravity, actually means looking for women who have fallen into disgrace. The temptresses of single are very famous. So Gawain Khan didn't pay much attention. These seemed to be brokers and compradors. To him, it was actually a very common situation for compradors to help nobles buy and sell slaves and have fun. Although single is nominally the territory of Dexia, it is actually two different cultures from Dexia. Most of the people in Single are not Dexia people. They are all kinds of criminals or descendants of criminals from all over the world. Together they make up the a so-called Sinjar nation. Since the Sinjar people do not believe in the black horse, Wada, the Desha god, to most Desha people, the Sinjar people and the city itself are all heretics. So they think there is no problem with the word judgment of heretics. But they all know that this evil city must exist because the location of Single is stuck between the Lion Kingdom and the Savannah Desert. It can block the attacks from the Lion Kingdom for Dexia, especially the Dexia people, after the Lion Realm raid. Therefore, these people will definitely go to Sinjar, and there is no need for Gawain Khan to stop them. He collected the entry tax, as usual, and let them go. But then, things gradually changed. Armed forces one after another suddenly appeared in Dexia, but these troops did not pass through the border, and did not come from Turda Fortress. But these teams all claimed to trial heretics. And they did so. They did not go to Sinjar. But attacked the Desha herdsmen in the Savannah Desert everywhere. The heretics they want to judge are actually the Desha people who believe in Veda. In the territory of Gawain Khan, such armed forces with dozens of people appear the most. Many civilians were attacked, and a large number of horses were robbed. It was not until Gawain Khan killed a small force, and captured a few people alive, that he realized that these people came by sea. Shibasha village is a coastal fishing village. But the bay there is full of rocks, and was originally not suitable for ships to dock. Only local fishermen fish offshore. So there are not many troops guarding it. But the few small teams that politely requested entry were probably the engineering teams led by the spies. They used the fishermen's fishing boat dock to renovate it. And now it can dock small sea boats. As a result, all kinds of chaotic militants in Bacchus landed in Shibasha in waves. Although the temporary port could only accommodate a few dozen people in a small boat at a time, they were still flooded in within a few days. Countless small troops. If it was just like this, that would be okay. After all, these were small troops. And according to the prisoners, they were all green forest heroes from various mountains. They came from a variety of sources and had no subordinates. Gawain Khan was confident of killing them one by one. Of course, Gawain Khan also knew that this so-called Green Forest Hero must have something to do with Emperor Marius. But no matter what, this bandit, who nominally belongs to Bacchus territory came to Dexia territory to rob. 
This kind of thing can only happen. It can be said that public security in Dexia is not good. But just when Dawin Khan sent his army to pursue the small troops who were snatching horses everywhere, his army suffered a heavy blow. A few days after these small troops were causing chaos, a large and truly elite army also entered the Shavanir Desert and defeated an army of several hundred men from Gawan Khan near Gaysen. Almost the entire army was wiped out. This force did not come from Bacchus. Gawan Khan had already destroyed the temporary port of Shabasha and sent troops to patrol the coast. There should be no more. Green Forest Heroes Coming from the Bacchus Empire That powerful army wore silver armor, white cloaks and white robes. They also claimed to trial heretics. And their behavior was indeed like a trial. They would burn anyone who did not believe in the goddess of justice. Astalia. People. They call themselves the Inquisition. The heretic tribunal actually came from the northwest. Maybe they have something to do with the Knights of the Dawn in Guangxu Bay. Anyway. Their style looks similar to those of the Knights of the Dawn. Gawain Khan could easily imagine why this so-called tribunal came to his territory. This army was probably here to recruit soldiers. Because the tribunal took the initiative to attack Gawain Khan's troops and rescued two teams of bandits and those two small teams also joined the tribunal. Those robbers and bandits, who had previously used the excuse of trialing heretics, were obviously the targets that the heretic tribunal wanted to recruit. The very reason of trial of heretics probably gave the Inquisition a lot of inspiration. While recruiting those small groups of bandits, the well-equipped troops of the heretic tribunal also did the same thing as those bandits. Robbery. Taking away horses and property. Killing any men who dared to resist and harming women whether they resisted or not. It's just that they did something extra to force everyone who survived to change their faith. Otherwise they would use fire to carry out their judgment. But Yuan Khan had previously sent out most of his troops in order to hunt down the small bandits who came from Bacchus. Now he only has a few hundred men in hand. And these few hundred men still have to guard the Turta Fortress. The large army of the Lion Kingdom is marching this way. So Gawain Khan is very worried now and he is even considering whether to hurry up and run away. Chapter 269 Chief Foreign Affairs Officer That's Sarah and Anson. Asli Ang's Foreign Affairs Officer Sarah brought several female explorers with strong martial arts skills to join the group army when Leon decided to send troops. However, Leon sent troops quickly. Sarah hurriedly rushed from White Deer Castle, but she could only can catch up with Liang's team outside Turta Fortress, and Anson was brought to the Lord by Rissa Dillon to treat his injuries. As a result, Leong did not go to the direction of Karen Deer Castle. So Anson only arrived at this time. His medical skills were not put to use. And he only had time to check on Leong's body of. Although Liang's heart rate was worrying, at least Anson was sure that the Lord was as strong as a wild boar. So everyone was relieved. Then Leong determined that the target was Ashkaman, which was Anson's hometown. Anson naturally planned to go there and have a look. And maybe he could bring his parents to live in Liang's territory. Anson's status is quite high now, as the acting consul of Karen Deer Castle appointed by Leon. This is actually the same status as an ordinary baron, but without a formal title. The Radiant Knights have also regarded Anson as a member of the Knights, but they have not issued him a knight badge. Anson is currently unable to pass the knight assessment. The requirements of the Radiant Knights are quite strict, but Anson received a shining cross jointly awarded by General Creon and Knight Commander Sir Loris. In fact, this medal is much more prominent than the knighthood. This is a recognition of those who have made significant contributions. This medal was awarded only three times in the entire history of the Shining Cross. This medal means that Ansem can get help from the Radiant Knights and the Blighters when he is in trouble. But the Knights cannot be involved in power struggles or wars between nations. And Sarah. She was originally entrusted by Amy to monitor the Lord. Amy will stay in White Deer Castle to engage in economic construction. When the Lord is away sending troops, only Amy can keep many industries, including banks, running smoothly. But Amy was obviously not at ease with an underage elf girl staying with Leong. So she entrusted Sarah with a few female soldiers to protect Leong. However, although Sarah is Amy's good friend, she still cares more about the Lord's orders. She must complete her job first. This is Dexia after all. As Leong expected, Sarah was indeed from Dexia. And she was familiar with all the lords of Dexia. Those were the people she used to call uncle and uncle when she was very young. She once told Leon that if she revealed her last name, it would bring shame to her. Therefore, Leon never asked her last name. But to be able to make Sarah say something that would disgrace her surname, 
It obviously means that Sarah's father was once the top lord of Desha and must have been an enemy of Cardin. Otherwise Sarah would not have kept silent and would not have left. Home. This time, Sarah told the lord exactly what happened to her. In fact, after knowing everything, Liang felt that it was not Sarah who shamed that last name. On the contrary, it was the last name that Sarah never mentioned that kept humiliating Sarah. Sarah's father's name is Sharavan Sheikh. The name, Sarah, also comes from the first half of his father's name. She is the eldest daughter in the family. Sarah Fan Sheikh was once a powerful leader of the Desha Desert tribe. He was sharp with swords, good at riding and shooting, brave and tenacious. Before Sarah was born, Sarah Fan Sheikh had followed the current Bahadur Khan Kadin in the north and south, played a major role in Kadin's establishment of power, and became the powerful Desert Army. Death Wind Sovereign Leader Savalan The Wind of Death is a traditional strong army composed of warriors selected from various tribes in the desert. These brave fast horse cavalry come from various nomadic tribes. These warriors who come and go like the wind in the desert were prepared in Dexia well respected. Their scimitars and swift horses have struck fear into the hearts of countless enemies. Since the Desha acquired Sinjar 150 years ago, the Desha people began to gradually shift from nomadic to settled. And the simple tents and stalls in the desert oasis slowly evolved into small cities and villages. Many people no longer live in pursuit of water and grass. They rely on cities to settle down and transition to urban life. After Bahadur Khan Kadin came to power, in the process of implementing the hereditary system, most of the people who received high titles were those lords, who were more pursuing settlement. City residents and businessmen were the main taxpayers, and how much benefit it could bring to him. This is the standard by which Carden assigns various titles. It is difficult to receive money from nomads, who live in pursuit of water and grass. Allowing people to settle down is more conducive to vested interests consolidating their power. Therefore, Bahadur Khan Kadin and various caliphs and Bai are promoting the process of Desha from nomadic to settled. As a result, the influence of citizens and merchants in cities such as Toba, Narda, and Ashkaman in Desha increased day by day, while the prestige and strength of the desert herder tribes declined. Seraphan Sheikh and traditional nomadic leaders, like him, will naturally lose their voice as a result. They also fought after Kadin and helped Kadin ascend to the position of Bahad Khan. But instead of getting anything in return, they suffered losses. As a result, many desert chiefs led the tribesmen to openly oppose the settlement policy. They also opposed Kardin's comprehensive hereditary policy and even opposed Kardin's turning the title representing faith into a hereditary title. They still maintain their nomadic traditions and intend to return Dexia to the past era when they were elected by the tribes. Sarah Fan Sheikh was the leader of these desert tribal chiefs who wanted to maintain their traditions at the time. He believed that settlement and hereditary system would make the Desha people weak, and the desert warriors would lose their blood and courage. And sooner or later they would be reduced to the same level as those decadent nobles in the lion realm are just like the old farmers. As a result, the former comrade in arms became the thorn in the side of Bahad Khan Kadin. Sarah Fan became the biggest obstacle to Kadin's centralization of power. The result was that Bahadur Khan Kadin ordered the exile of Sarah Fan and others and expelled them from the Desha Principality. In fact, this should be regarded as Kadin's nostalgia for his old relationship. After all, he was once a comrade in arms, and he did not kill Sarah Fan. But what Bahad Khan did not expect was that, unlike most of the exiled vassals, Sarah Fan Sheikh did not leave. He chose to stay in Desha, ready to repay Bahad Khan's kindness. The elite soldiers under Seraphan's command remained loyal to him, and his reputation and prestige also attracted many brave desert tribe warriors to join him. They agreed that after defeating Bahad Khan, they would abolish the hereditary and settled policies of the principality, return the titles given by the gods to the gods, and return Desha to the nomadic people they used to be. Therefore, he formed an alliance with some chiefs of the Dexia tribe who were also exiled, jointly formed a large horse team, and launched their holy war, to restore their nomadic traditions and beliefs. Their base is in the southern border where he was exiled. It is the barren desert in the southernmost part of the entire continent. But now, a castle, the Jihad Castle, has appeared there. Seraphan Sheikh, the Avenger, has been insisting on being an enemy of Bahadur Khan Kadin during his 20 years of exile. He has been rejecting the settlers under the banner of restoring the Desha tradition, and even the so-called holy war was also launched. But in fact, in the past 20 years, in order to fight against the troops sent by Cardin, he himself built a jihad fort 
and turned himself into a settler. Moreover, in order to win over people, Seraphan even gave his wife and daughter to a tribal leader. He has a majestic black horse, which he regards as a brother and a god, but treats his wife and daughter as bargaining chips that can be traded at will. Sarah's mother committed suicide on the day that Seraphan gave it to a tribal chief. It was also the day that Sarah escaped from Desha. When Sarah was 17 years old, in order to escape, she killed the tribal leader, a dirty chief in his 50s, who had never taken a bath in his life and smelled like horse manure. Seraphan planned to exchange his beautiful wife and daughter for his fighting power. And this so-called powerful tribal chief was stabbed to death in the bedroom by Sarah, who was 17 years old. Therefore, Sarah was very interested in the war in Dexia. Sarah wanted to know how the man who abandoned his wife and daughter would react if he saw her. If possible, Sarah would also like to ask the man herself whether the jihad he wanted to carry out despite abandoning his wife and daughter was really for tradition and belief. Of course, that man is at the southernmost tip of Dexia, and Liang's army has just arrived at the northeastern border of Dexia. Turda Fortress. This is a strong castle that is easy to defend but difficult to attack. It is surrounded by mountains to the north and desert to the south. It is the border gateway to the northeast of Dexia. Honorable Gawain Khan, I am Sarah, the chief foreign officer of Lord Liang, the marshal of the Lion Kingdom. I bring you Lord Liang's goodwill and help. Sarah stood in front of Gawain Khan with a professional smile on her face. Goodwill and help. I saw the army of the Lion Kingdom, but I didn't expect Count Leon to let a woman negotiate. It seems that Gawain Khan is a relatively traditional Desha man and he has some contempt for women. There's nothing we can do about it. Gaiwen Khan. Mr. Leong is going to declare a challenge to Bahadur Khan Khan, and his other subordinates are going to meet with Bahamon and Tyre. The two caliphs. None of them are free. Only I this woman can come to see you. But dot at least I am Lord Leon's chief foreign affairs officer. Sarah smiled and found a chair to sit down on her own without being polite at all. The implication is that Leong has to face a lot of big shots. And with your level as Gaiwen Khan, you are the only one worthy of meeting him. But to have the officially appointed Chief Foreign Affairs Officer come to see you. Mr. Leong has already given you a lot of face. Humph. Then what is the so-called kindness and help you bring? Gawain Khan looked even more anxious. Lord Leong does not intend to attack your territory. He is even willing to help you kill those criminals who do all kinds of evil in your territory. Of course. In return, you have to open turn a fortress and temporarily take away your troops to avoid everyone's trouble. Unnecessary conflict. Sarah made an outrageous offer. That's impossible. If I give up Turda Fortress, I will not only lose my status, but I will also be hanged on the wall of Tobab by Bahad Khan. Gawain Khan refused. He was still loyal to Kadin. Gawain Khan. You may not know dot that the Inquisition was actually brought in by Bahad Khan Kadin himself. Sarah shook her head. Of course she knew Gawain Khan would refuse. But she had already responded. Lord Leong and I both know your loyalty and bravery. But maybe Katan Khan doesn't think so. What? Gawain Khan was shocked. Are you lying to me? Given the current situation, do I need to lie to you? Sarah shook her head and smiled. Gawain Khan. Think about it. Bahad Khan Katan just fought a defeat in the Lion Realm and lost a large number of elite troops. If he wants to continue to maintain his from a strong position, what's the best way? This, Gawain Khan's expression changed. Your brother Bahamon was almost completely wiped out in the Sava River Fort. In this case, you should easily think of why Carden would deliberately let the people of the Ordo Heretic come to your territory to cause trouble. Wan Khan, you can't help your brother Bahamon. So guess who will fall into the hands of Ashkaman, who currently doesn't have many soldiers? The Bacchus Empire? Lord Leon? Or Bahad, who you have always been loyal to? Khan Kadden? Seeing that Gawain Khan listened, Sarah continued, Miss Sarah Dot, are you saying that Bahadur Khan Kadin will attack Bahamon and take Ashkaman away? Gawain Khan's head was already sweating. He knew that what Sarah said might not be alarmist. Using the heretic tribunal to drag him down, and then attack his brother. With Cardin's temperament, it was very possible that he could do such a thing. Ashkaman is a prosperous big port. With such a prosperous place, Cardin will definitely regain its strength in a short time. Although this is treachery, but Cardin? who is facing challenges from all sides now, certainly doesn't care about reputation. Just like he didn't care about reputation more than 20 years ago. Ha ha ha. Gawain Khan. Not just Bahamon. If you were Katan, you had already killed Bahamon. 
Would you have left his brother to take revenge? Sarah laughed so hard that her branches shook. Dot so. What does Earl Leon want to do? Or dot what does his army want to do when it enters Desha? You said that other Earl Leon subordinates are going to meet Bomb on entire. Gawain Khan was already sweating profusely. And his bald head, which had been deliberately shaved off, was shiny. Cadden led his army to attack the Lion City. He attacked the Royal City. Understand? This is the biggest provocation to the Lion Kingdom. Count Leon has just been appointed marshal. He wants to safeguard the dignity of the Lion Kingdom. Sarah said impassionedly. But what Carden did has nothing to do with you. And you did not participate in the attack on Lion City. So of course Count Leon will give you a chance. This is also to avoid unnecessary losses. As for the others, you and Khan, since Lord Leon wants to show goodwill to you, then naturally he must also show goodwill to your brother Bamon and nominal superior Tyre. Like you, they did not participate in the attack on Lion City. You should understand what I mean. Right? Huh? Let me think about it. Let me think about it. Miss Sarah, can you help me make an appointment with Earl Leon? Gawain Khan covered his forehead and sat down. He really needs to think about it. Lord Leong is very busy. If you want to see him, you must at least show some sincerity first. Lord Leang's army is still wasting food and grass outside Turda Fortress. To be honest, an army of this size cannot face you. The fortress can be taken down in one go. I'm afraid you won't be able to hold on for more than a day. But Lord Leong didn't attack. This has shown considerable sincerity. And you should be rewarded. Sarah persuaded Gawain Khan very gently. A few hours later, the defenders of Turda Fortress retreated. The gate of this fortress, which was easy to defend and difficult to attack, opened. Liang's army entered the territory of Dexia without any losses. Today, Sarah no longer needs to use her beauty and singing voice as bargaining chips. She has learned to use gestures. She has also understood that if you want to win over others, you don't actually need a wife and daughter. Chapter 270 The Lord is in a hurry. Leon only stayed at Turda Fortress for two hours before marching south again. In the past two hours, he met with Gawain Khan and gave Gawain Khan a clear way to unite with Bamon and other lords who did not follow Cadden to attack the Lion City. You can unite to protect yourself. The lord said that he was specifically looking for trouble with Bahadur Khan Cadden. This was the Lion Kingdom's response to Cadden's brazen attack on the royal city. And it was a battle for the dignity of the kingdom. In other words, if Lord Dexia like Gawain Khan, who has nothing to do with the attack on Lion City, had better stay out of the way if he didn't want to be crushed. And, what would Bahadur Khan Kadin do when his strength was compromised and he faced a powerful enemy? Will he use you lords, who are not particularly close to him, as cannon fodder? Judging from the way the heretic tribunal went straight to the vicinity of Turda Fortress, Cardin has already done this. And the first one to be attacked is you. You and Khan. The path given by Liang was actually in line with Gawain Khan's own wishes not to be cannon fodder for Cadden. But he didn't need to rely on others to find Bomb on himself. The two brothers could join forces and hug each other for warmth. Anyway, Liang did not ask him to surrender or do anything else that would lose his reputation. He even said that he would not occupy his territory, Turda Fortress, which was very moral. So Gawain Khan rushed to Ashkaman as quickly as possible, without even bringing any soldiers. He wanted his brother to leave the dangerous spot and brought his soldiers and horses back to Turda Fortress with him. This fortress was actually bigger than Ashkaman. Komen is much safer. To be honest, if Gawain Khan can hold onto the city at Turda Fortress, relying on the fortress's defense facilities and his troops' familiarity with the terrain, even with only 500 men, they can stop Liang's troops in Germany. No one can advance beyond Xia's borders. After all, more than half of this group army which seems to have more than 10,000 people, are merchants. Moreover, these merchants accompanying the army have not carried a large amount of supplies this time. They are carrying high-value goods. Not only will they not be able to provide logistical supplies, they will also be a drag on combat effectiveness of the entire unit. Moreover, the real warriors in the army are actually not suitable for attacking fortresses. They are all mixed troops composed of small lords. It is very troublesome to use this kind of troops to forcibly attack the city. As long as a knight is killed or injured, the followers brought by the knight will most likely run away. Road. If there are just a little more fleeing followers, the battlefield will be chaotic and the whole battlefield will look like it has been scattered. If those businessmen see such a scene, they may retreat. And a chain reaction will occur if they retreat. Therefore, when attacking a fortified city, 
he can only use his own troops. But Liang is not willing to suffer any losses here. So he should do as little as possible to attack a fortified city. Besides, he couldn't waste time now. Time is life. And time is money. Liang didn't want the great lord of Dexia to have time to gather his troops. He wanted to capture Ashkaman as quickly as possible. Which was the subject of auction. When facing such a big business, you must be efficient. Ramon was very efficient in his previous work. The news that Liang previously told Ramon to pass to the Turta Fortress was that Bahad Khan Katten hired the Heretic Tribunal. This news combined with Sarah's rhetoric will naturally cause Gawain Khan to be thrown into chaos. To be honest, the Heretic Tribunal can indeed be regarded as being recruited by Cardin. Cardin's army was defeated outside the Lion City. The Lion Kingdom army marched towards Desha. At this time, for the Heretic Tribunal, it is natural best chance. But in fact, the Holy Inquisitor of the Heretic Tribunal, Rasmus de Fatica, was originally peaking near Single and did not come to Turta Fortress. It is estimated that the Heretic Tribunal originally wanted to take advantage of Single. However, Caliph Tahir, the Lord of Sinjar City, did not follow Cadden to the Lion Realm. Sinjar's strength was not damaged at all. So the Heretic Tribunal did not act rashly. However, Liang asked Ramon to send a message to the Holy Inquisitor Rasmus. The people of the Trial Heretics are looting around Turta Fortress. In fact, this was originally the plan of Emperor Marius. And the location information of the Holy Inquisitor Rasmus was also provided by Marius. The small team that previously claimed to Trial Heretics were illegal armed forces such as bandits and bandits that Emperor Marius rushed to Dexia. People with Shadow Wolves followed them to operate in secret. Emperor Marius originally wanted to get rid of Dexia from, purchase, some horses back from the territory. Well, buy it for zero dollars. Emperor Marius' original plan was just to send these bandit teams to cruel the heretics and plunder. And then the people of the Shadow Wolf Pack would be responsible for taking away the stolen horses and selling them back to Bacchus. Let the robbers return home to collect the money and divide the stolen goods. After all, they were all bandits from Bacchus. They all knew that it would be more expensive to sell the horse back to Bacchus. And they were originally going back to their country to share the spoils. But in fact, Marius only planned to get the horse back to Bacchus. He had no intention of letting those bandits return to the country. If no one returned to the country, the Emperor Marius did not need to pay. Anyway, they were all bandits and robbers. And it would only count if they all died in Dexia. Contribute to Bacchus. Marius had always known about the existence of the Heretic Tribunal. In fact, he used this method to let these gangsters commit crimes under the banner of the Heretic Tribunal so as to attract the Heretic Tribunal to attack them. Therefore, Marius originally planned to send someone to send a message to Rasmus, the leader of the Heretic Tribunal. However, the Heretic Tribunal stopped at single, and it was difficult for the Shadow Wolves to contact the Heretic Tribunal. If those Shadow Wolves dared to appear in front of the Holy Inquisitor Rasmus, they would probably be judged directly. So Leong expanded this plan and immediately found Ramon, the boss of single. Therefore, Holy Inquisitor Rasmus led his troops to bypass Single and go straight to Turta Fortress. No troops would be happy to see someone looting under their banner when they encounter such fake and shoddy people who ruin their reputation. Guys, we must crack down on counterfeiting first. Even though their own reputation may not be that good, they still cannot tolerate imitation. Later, Ramon sent his men to lead the way for the Holy Inquisitor Rasmus and defeated an army of Gaiwan Khan near Gaisen. This was to deliberately lead the Heretic Tribunal to the vicinity of Gawain Khan's troops. Ramon's the people are quite reliable. In fact, Holy Inquisitor Rasmus was also a flexible person. He did not kill those bandits, but recruited many of them. After all, many people were killed and wounded in the battle with Gawain Khan's troops, so they had to replenish their manpower. Anyway, at least everyone had a common language in terms of trialing heretics. And these guys seemed to be very efficient when it came to plundering the property of heretics. But this quick-thinking Holy Inquisitor probably didn't expect that just after he had replenished his manpower, the single man who led him would once again take him in the direction of another large army. And yet again, it was the same target that Sarah was about to visit. In the desert more than a hundred miles north of Ashkaman, a tribal settlement named Mudun was inexplicably attacked by a force. This troop seemed to come from the Barkley continent. Some of them were sturdy mercenaries or gangsters. Some were knights wearing white smocks. And some were monks who seemed to be powerless. The mercenaries were the first to attack. 
followed by monks who seemed to pose no threat, while the well-equipped knights were ready to intercept villagers who might escape from the outside. They held up blunt weapons of various sizes in their hands and waved the weapons in their hands while muttering something in their mouths. But the strange thing is that not many villagers escaped in this village. And it seems that countless mature warriors emerged from those mud huts and tents. After the attack, all the villagers in Mudden rose up to resist. Almost everyone had a saber and a war horse. This so-called village is actually a huge military camp. So a raid turned into a melee with no technical content. The leaders on both sides were all asking the same question. What the H? L? Where did this army come from? After killing and wounding hundreds of people each, the troops on both sides were completely intertwined. And they were fighting inextricably. Holy Inquisitor Rasmus de Fatica swung the war hammer in his hand and smashed the head of a Desha rider. He turned around and shouted angrily, You are lying to me! Did you bring me here on purpose? But no one responded to him. The single man who led the way had disappeared by this time. Rasmus de Fatica gritted his teeth and turned around, rushing into the place where the Desha people gathered. And the warhammer in his hand caused a bloody storm. Rasmus was a baptized knight, but he was not a member of the Order of the Dawn. In fact, one might call him a knight of the church. Before he became a knight, Rasmus was a monk. Since the arrival of the Knights of the Dawn to the Pender continent, religious rulings have been launched one after another, and various sects have branched out in the western part of the Pender continent. Rasmus became a monk at that time. The Dexia people often went to other countries to plunder, and from time to time, they would plunder his territory. Then the Desha people who believe in Veda naturally become heretics in the eyes of Rasmus as a devout believer in the goddess of justice and a monk. Rasmus's original purpose was to save corruption and spread faith. He organized some monks and monks and came to the Savannah Desert, the den of heretics. They saw countless wars and killings here. So these believers, who had it their duty to save the world, went to the Savannah Desert. A campaign of redemption began. However, the Desha people's looting habits are difficult to change. And coupled with their long-standing belief in Veda, the inspiration of the goddess of justice sometimes does not have much effect. Rasmus was unable to convert the herdsmen who were addicted to plundering through oral preaching. So he came up with the idea of conquest by force in the religious field. Rasmus accepted the baptism of knights, was willing to bear the sin of killing, and armed himself to become a judge. At the same time, he began to hire mercenaries who had the same beliefs, and began to carry out his redemption and purification under the banner of judging heretics. He claimed to be the Holy Inquisitor of Pendor, and told everyone he was the savior of Pendor, who wanted to get rid of all heretics and false gods in the world, and judge those to pray beliefs. Rasmus is a natural commander. He has a flexible mind, extraordinary martial arts, and extremely charming personal qualities. A monk who once practiced asceticism does have many excellent personal qualities. He is clean and polite, treats others sincerely, and never lies is extremely self-disciplined, does not drink alcohol, and does not approach women. A person with both powerful force and charm will naturally make many believers and soldiers join his team. Moreover, his subordinates all believe that Rasmu exists in the continent of Pender to eliminate heretics and purify heretics. He is the messenger appointed by the goddess to judge heretics. He has no hobbies or bad habits. It seems that he was born to judge heretics. As a result, this self-proclaimed Holy Inquisitor was recognized by many believers. Even some other tributary sects also recognized Rasmus's title of Holy Inquisitor. Rasmus is best at using Warhammers. He believes that Warhammers are powerful weapons that do not cause bloodshed and can bring believers who have been tempted by false gods back to their senses. Therefore, Rasmus and his fellow believers uniformly use this weapon as the equipment of the Holy Legion in their hearts. And they call themselves the Heresy Tribunal. Since Rasmus, the Holy Inquisitor, is not a bloodthirsty person, the Inquisition only captures prisoners and then tries to influence them so that they stop believing in the false god Veda. Many people will be converted and then voluntarily donate all their property to worship the goddess. The stubborn people are judged by the Holy Fire. Just as the Knights of the Dawn say, the goddess will naturally tell whether there is sin or not. So far, it is known that they have conducted countless trials in the Savannah Desert using warhammers and torches. Rasmus' reputation and team size have also grown rapidly in the past few years. So far, more than 2,000 people are following this holy inquisitor. But if nothing else goes wrong, 
they will soon reduce their number in Mudun village by half or even more. Because Mudun is the family territory of Caliph Bahman, the lord of Ashkaman city, and it is managed by his son Ikram. This place is Bahaman's base and the source of his loyal troops. After Bahman became the Caliph, this tribe became quite powerful. But similarly, if nothing unexpected happens, most of Bahaman's tribe will definitely be wiped out by the tribunal. The young patriarch Ikram has begun to run away. He is a brave Desha warrior, but he knows that he will definitely not be able to defeat him. The military strength of the heretic tribunal is more than twice that of the tribal warriors. He must return to Ashkaman as quickly as possible to find his father for help. Thousands of people were fighting for life and death. While a few women and children were running away, houses were set on fire, and the sounds of broken bones could be heard one after another. No one noticed that a beautiful woman was watching all this with cold eyes. Yes, this is driving the tiger away and swallowing the wolf. The Lord is in a hurry. This allows the merchants to enter Ashkaman before the Dexia Principality gathers its army. Business is important. Moreover, only after the merchants are separated from the troops can Liang's army display its combat effectiveness. A day later, Sarah came to Ashikaman and met Bahman. Honorable Caliph Bahman, if nothing else, you have probably met your brother Gawan Khan? Maybe you have also met your son Akram? Sarah did not use her professional smile this time. Her expression was serious. I am Sarah, Earl Leon's chief foreign affairs officer. Count Leon's army. Is here? Bahman looked calm. But the tired look on his face revealed his true heart. He must not have slept all night. The army is 50 miles north of Munan village. You should know what this means. But Count Leon can show you a clear path if you are willing. Sarah said it very directly, because Bahaman's current situation was extremely bad, and there was no need to beat around the bush. Count Leon, do you have any advice? You can just say. Bahaman still looked calm, but his hands had firmly grasped the armrests of the chair. I Shikaman does not have many troops, and your tribe has been invaded by the Inquisition, so it cannot replenish its military strength. Your brother Gawain Khan has suffered heavy losses and cannot provide you with help. The great lords of Desha now have their own thoughts. And they can't help you. They will not come to support you. But may take advantage of the opportunity. You should know who summoned the tribunal. And you should also know that the fleet of Emperor Marius is marching towards Ashkaman. The only place in the entire Dexia territory that can be used within a short period of time is the only one who can help you is Earl Leon. Chapter 271 Taking the Initiative to Raise Funds The Inquisition which had just fought a battle with the troops from Mudan village and suffered both losses, naturally did not dare to block the direction of the army. Holy Inquisitor Rasmus directly fled westward with his scarred team. There were numerous casualties in Mudan village. Half of the people in the entire village were killed, and the houses and various facilities were damaged to pieces. However, it seemed that they had won the battle. The Inquisition left nearly 700 corpses, but failed. Get any benefits in Mudan village? Most of the corpses of the tribunal's troops had a lot of gold and silver on them. These trophies belonged to the villagers of Mudan. Liang's army did not stop the villagers of Mudan from collecting the trophies. Judging from the logic that only the victors are qualified to clean the battlefield, Mudan villages indeed considered the victorious party. Even though the casualties they paid were more than twice that of the Inquisition, Leon showed a very friendly attitude towards the villagers of Mudan village. He seemed to be treating his allies and ordered the troops to exercise restraint against the villagers of Mudan village. In order to avoid misunderstanding, he did not even allow large troops to enter the village, but only camped outside the village. Then the caravan began to officially open for business, and many merchants settled in the village where the corpses were being collected, and they set up a large-scale product exhibition with familiarity. The spoils of war always have to be sold, and the money gained from cleaning the battlefield always has to be spent. The arrival of the merchants is in line with the wishes of the Mudan villagers. The Lion Realm army stationed outside the village did not harass the villagers, but seemed to provide protection for the village. In fact, it is true, but they are providing protection troops for merchants, and they have to share the profits of the caravan. If you protect the caravan well, you can get a part of the profits of the caravan. This is what Leon gives to the army of the Lion Realm. Promise. Changha Express is only responsible for logistics and transportation. But after arriving at the end of the field, Changha Express's mission has been completed. The businessmen naturally have to bear the safety risks themselves. That is, they must pay a certain amount of profits to seek protection from the military. This may sound like a protection fee, but in fact, it is a business tax. 
The profit from this business is high enough. And Lord Liang's business tax is not heavy. So the businessmen are very cooperative. Besides, Eric had been maintaining order and calming the mood among the merchants. In other words, when merchants do business, they will pay business taxes to Liang. And then Liang will distribute the money to the small lords and knights in the group army. This made all the army groups willing to obey the command. And no one engaged in any factional fighting during the expedition. Even if the lords had any objections to Liang, at least the knights and soldiers below would not be at odds with Dinar. The boss of party A is the one who gives the money. This is a very basic truth that any soldier can understand. Therefore, the group army has actually been following the caravan. As long as the caravan obeys Liang's command, the group army will definitely follow the command. Nowadays, the group army has not committed any crime against Ma Doncio. In fact, it is the power of Dinar. Everyone knows that since the caravan is stationed in Ma Dan, then Ma Dan village will bring a lot of benefits to everyone. Naturally, it cannot cause harm. There must be no mistakes. Lord, the new marshal is much more generous than King Ulrich. The small lords who joined the army somewhat regretted not bringing out all the elite family members. Leon distributed profits to them based on the number of armored soldiers. That is the more elite soldiers you have. The more points you get. Many small lords began to think about whether they should go to Sinjar to buy some equipment and arm some armored soldiers on the spot. Soon after, Bahman, the lord of Ashkaman city, also came to Munan village. Bahman is already 59 years old this year. In half a year, he will enter an age that the Desha people call. Even Lord Veda cannot take care of him. Life in the desert is more likely to make people grow old. Under normal circumstances, Lord Desha has no ambitions at this age. The most important thing is to figure out how to let his descendants inherit the family business. But this was not the case with Bahman. He is still strong and powerful. Still often, hunts with his Ghazi raider everywhere. And still desires more power and dinars. In the eyes of Desha lords like Bahman, plundering other countries is their daily job. In their view, this can be regarded as a contribution to Desha. And they can also obtain slaves and wealth for themselves. It's just that the risks of this kind of daily work are indeed relatively high. In fact, Bahman was defeated more than once while leading troops to plunder. In the past few decades, Bahman suffered at least 10 defeats. But each time he managed to escape and regroup. Bahman usually gives the impression that he is rude and irritable, always acting like a pure reckless man. But only his wife and son knew that he had never been a reckless person. Irritability and irritability are just masks he shows to outsiders. Anyone who can sit in the high position of the caliphate will have his own mask. He is actually a person who is very good at making decisions and weighing things up. Otherwise, he would not be able to live as long as he does now. Now Bahman doesn't look irritable at all. He behaves patiently and politely. He is making a difficult and dangerous decision whether to cooperate with Leon. Your Excellency Bahman, you should understand what is the root cause of all this suffering. I think you should also understand that I am the only one who can help you get rid of your predicament now. If you don't want to sit still and wait for death. Leon was sitting under an awning, holding a coconut in his hand. There are also many coconut trees in Dexia. This is the best season in Dexia. The climate is cool but not cold. And there are no sandstorms in early spring making it perfect for picnics. I can understand your intention. Count Leon, you want me to work with you to deal with Bahad Khan Kadin. But this is treachery to me. And I will become the enemy of the entire Desha. Bahman is actually very sober. He knows that Liang's kindness to him is actually to build a rebel regime in Dexia to jointly deal with Kadin. The source of all suffering actually comes from the title, Bahad Khan, which comes from Kadin, at least in Bahaman's view. Leon asked Ramon to deliberately attract the heretic tribunal to create this situation. He also asked Sarah to persuade and educate both Gaiwen Khan and Bahman. What he wanted was to make Bahman have such an idea. In fact, the whole thing had nothing to do with Carden. Carden was busy reorganizing the army in Toba City and had no idea what was going on. But now Bahman, who is beleaguered on all sides, has no way to verify it. And he doesn't dare to bet on Carden's character. As Leon said, he really can't sit still and wait for death. However, he probably had concerns. Lots of concerns. Being an enemy of Desha? Hum. Bahman. Wasn't everything Kadden did after he became Bahadur an enemy of Desha? But he still sat quietly for more than 20 years. The seat of Bahad Khan. Leon laughed and added Bahaman's bed again. You mean? Bahaman's eyes widened suddenly. I mean, 
as long as you replace Cadden and become Bahad Khan. Then you will be the one who saves Deshang Crisis. Who will be your enemy? And, Cadden has so many enemies. You will gain countless allies and supporters, including me. Leong turned the coconut in his hand, cut a hole with a knife, and handed the coconut juice to Bahamon. You only need to make a hole for Desha, and you will naturally taste the delicious food. But the Desha people will not respect an illegitimate Bahad Khan. Count Leon, just like you brought a formidable army, but did not intend to rule by yourself. The Desha people will not obey a simple the powerful Kadan is the legitimate Bahad Khan after all. And even if I defeat Kadan, I cannot become the real Bahad Khan. Bahamon was actually very clear-headed. He knew why Leon didn't conquer the city and implement his rule. The Bacchus Empire had occupied Ashkaman before, but it was driven away by endless resistance and uprisings in just half a year. The Desha people will not agree with the rule that is not in line with the will of God Veda, just like places with other faiths will not agree with the rule of the Desha people. This is what happens in a country that integrates politics and religion. Everything must comply with God's decree. But you are the legal caliph. Bomb on. As long as you raise the banner of restoring tradition and declare to restore the tribal election system, countless tribes will be willing to elect you as Bahad Khan. This is the most legal Baha virtue, is the true tradition of Dexia. There was obvious confusion in Liang's words. In order to achieve the final victory in the election, you should have sought more supporters. What Cardin did back then, you can completely copy it, or let your son Ikra copy it again. You must have thought about this more than once. But you are just not sure. Right. But now, I have given you confidence. Bahamon was silent for a while, and said nothing. But now Liang who has sharp ears and eyesight, can hear that his breathing has become obviously heavier. Okay, that's really all I can do, Dot, but Dot, what do you want? Is your army coming from thousands of miles away just to defeat Cardan? Bahamon made up his mind, but he still had doubts and asked Leong about his purpose. Huh? I am a businessman. Bahamon, as you have seen, I brought a caravan with me. What I need is wealth. As you said, I cannot rule in Desha. So I, there is no need to occupy any city. But I can let a person who is willing to give me benefits rule Desha. I might as well say directly, Bahamon, whoever gives me more benefits. I will support whoever becomes Bahad Khan willing you are not the only one who has shown kindness to me. Leon has officially started the big business he and Ramon agreed on to auction the city lord's position. As well as the throne. Bahamon was silent again. Of course he knew that Leon had many choices. In fact, the lord of Sinjar city, Caliph Tahir, and Kadan's brother Amir Xerxes, and even the rebel Seraphan Sheikh in southern Xinjiang, were all better than him. Choose. Tahir's military power was quite strong and his reputation was higher than Bahamans. Moreover, he did not want to be the lord of Sinjar city. The Sinjar people with various sources were not easy to manage. In fact, no Desha lord could implement real rule in Sinjar. Tahir had been considering other ways out. Not a secret at all. Emil Xerxes is Cadden's younger brother. So he has a natural advantage in status. And many younger generations of Desha people are already following him. Say it again. Emil Xerxes has been playing the banner of Divide Dexia equally for several years, which is probably more in line with Liang's wishes. As for Seraphan, the rebel in southern Xinjiang, he won over many Desha tribes who were bent on restoring their nomadic traditions in the Jihad fort and fought against Cadden for 20 years. If he gets the news, I'm afraid, he will be willing to do anything to seek help from Liang's army. So Bahamon understood that if he wanted to ensure his own safety, he probably had to pay something. Otherwise, Liang could indeed turn around and support several other people, and then use himself as cannon fodder. Count Leon, I have a daughter, Luha, who is 18 years old this year. Bahamon suddenly mentioned his daughter. Sorry, there are already too many girls around me and I don't dare to have anything to do with any of the daughters of Lord Dexia at this time. I am the Marshal of the Lion Kingdom after all. It is true that Leon can drive away tigers and devour wolves. He can control the Dexia puppet army to serve him, and he can also make deals and negotiate terms with Lord Dexia. But he must not have any marriage relationship with Lord Dexia. Otherwise, there would be no need for any reaction from the Lion Kingdom, and the small lords in the army group he led would probably suspect him of treason. Martial status can bring a lot of convenience. But it can also bring many sensitive issues. And red lines cannot be touched casually. Oh! In that case, Count Leon, 
Maybe you can help me find a better home for her. Count Leon. I will use the entire Ashkaman as Lua's dowry. Seeing that Leon refused so directly, Baumon changed his tune. Perhaps Baumon and Seraphan Sheik have something in common. They will definitely have troops and horses in their hands. But their daughters can be used as gifts to give away. This is Baumon looking for a way out for himself. Baumon wants to tie Leon to the chariot and marry Luha. Whoever he marries will be able to obtain the right to rule Ashkaman in name and legally. Baumon felt that Leon would definitely not give up this opportunity. Even if he did not marry himself. He could marry Luha to a subordinate to gain the right to rule Ashkaman. And Baumon himself can still maintain actual control over Ashkaman in this way. This is undoubtedly a good bargaining chip. In that case, I will take over this job. I will hold a grand wedding reception for Luha and single. I guarantee that it will be a unique event in the entire continent and will never humiliate your daughter. Leong did agree with a smile. However, this matter is probably different from what Baumon expected. Leong really had no need for Ashkaman's right to rule. He had promised Emperor Marius a long time ago that Ashkaman would belong to him. But Baumon himself took the initiative to increase the bet. And of course Leon, as the banker, had to accept it. Chapter 272 Everyone Has His Own Plans Three days later, the throne room of Lion City. Ulrich was listening in surprise to the military report sent back from the front line by a knight. Your Majesty, Count Leon led his army three days ago and occupied Ashkaman, the largest port in Desha. Neither Guen Khan of Turda Fortress nor Baumon, the Lord of Ashkaman, dared to stop the Lion Army. Baumon has decided to cooperate with the kingdom to deal with Kadden. He and Gawain Khan returned to Turda Fortress to ensure the retreat of the kingdom's army. Count Leon originally decided to rush to Kadden and had not yet organized the Desha army. Before, we attacked Toba City as quickly as possible. But, the knight was eloquent and reported the matter clearly. But he obviously did not finish what he said. But when he said this, Ulrich stood up on the throne. So the knight looked at the king and slowed down his words. Ulrich stood up because he was a little excited and nervous. He really didn't expect that Leon was so efficient. Only half a month had passed since he publicly declared war on Desha. And Leon actually captured Ashkaman. This progress is incredibly fast. Ulrich also understood Liang's tactics. Bajur Khan Kadin suffered heavy losses outside the Lion City. So Leon rushed with the fastest force before Kadin could replenish his troops and summon the lords of Desha to form an army. The speed drives straight ahead. In fact, when Liang marched to Turda Fortress, Cardin had probably just returned to his territory Toba across the desert, and he must not have had time to react. This means that the kingdom's army can form a situation where more people fight against fewer people along the way. Most Dexia lords may not dare to stand in front of the army, so they can coerce some Dexia lords to give in or even cooperate with the kingdom. But Ulrich knew that although he could understand the reason why Leong quickly captured Ashkaman, he would never dare to do it like Leong. Or it can be said that the vast majority of people do not dare to do this. This kind of running for thousands of miles is a gamble. If you are dragged by a brave enemy and give the enemy's main force enough reaction time and space, you may be trapped to death in enemy territory. It is normal for the entire army to be wiped out. Therefore, Ulrich was a little nervous, especially after hearing that Leon planned to continue to quickly attack Toba City. He couldn't help but stood up. Has Leon already marched towards Toba? Montivo, when you come back now, it's a big army. Was there any accident? Not yet. Your Majesty, after the army entered Ashkaman, it was discovered that the fleet of the Bacchus Empire was marching towards Ashkaman. Therefore, Count Leon must deal with the Bacchus fleet first to prevent the army from being attacked from both sides. I am after discovering this situation. Count Leon decided to come back and report to you. His plan to quickly attack Toba can no longer be implemented. I am worried that the army will be trapped in Ashkaman. This knight named Matever was obviously not one of Leon's men. Everything he reported came from what he had witnessed. In fact, Matever is the son of Keldrin, the former lord of Eagle Claw Castle. Kedrin single-handedly rushed into the Crow Kingdom's army. King Gregory IV thought he was a rare warrior. So he took Kedrin back to the Crow Kingdom. Duke Bredis came back and reported to King Ulrich that Kedrin died heroically in battle. This was the opportunity he gave to Kedrin. Kedrin had committed treason and could only save his family by dying in battle. So Kedrin's family only lost their original baronetcy and territory. But they did save the family's lives and other property. Kedrin's son Montever also still retained his knighthood but he could no longer be called Lord. In fact, Ulrich even reused Kedrin's son Montever for this reason. After all, 
Kedrin, died heroically, when the country was in danger. Now Montever was sent by Ulrich to Leon's army to monitor the movements of the army. And he could be regarded as a close confidant of the king. Bacchus. It's normal for Emperor Marius to have an idea for Ashkaman. Ulrich muttered to himself after hearing from Montever that he had discovered the Bacchus fleet. He now actually understands that Emperor Marius also suffered a domestic rebellion and suffered heavy casualties from foreign enemies when dealing with the rebels. And Emperor Marius's losses must have been much greater than his. After all, only half of the Lion Kingdom was in chaos. And the tax revenue in most areas was not affected. However, the entire Bacchus Empire was in war. And there was definitely no harvest in the last quarter. Today's Ulrich is very poor. And Emperor Marius is naturally even poorer. And may have gone bankrupt. Therefore, Ulrich immediately understood the intention of Emperor Marius to send a fleet. Ashkaman could solve Emperor Marius' economic crisis. In the same way, Ashkaman can also solve the problems Ulrich himself faces. So, it is indeed possible that the kingdom's army will be trapped in Ashkaman. Bacchus's fleet Leon will definitely be able to handle it. But Bahadur Khan Kadden may take the opportunity to organize the Desha army to counterattack. Montevergo, go and pass the king's order to Leon, asking him to hold on to Ashkaman. And I will personally lead the army to support him. Ulrich stretched out his hand to signal the clerk to write the king's order, while giving instructions to Montever at the foot of the steps. Your majesty is wise. Count Leon will definitely be able to stop back his fleet, but it will inevitably delay his march to Toba, which will give Cardin time to summon the Dexia army. Montever bowed his head in sincerity. Today's King Ulrich seems to have returned to his original ambitious and wise appearance. On the side of the throne room, the clerk who was writing the king's order frowned. The clerk was a young and handsome aristocratic young man. This is Brennus' son, Lord Malbot. He was now Ulrich's designated future son-in-law. It's just that the prince consort hasn't gotten engaged to the little princess yet. Ulrich's youngest daughter is only 10 years old this year and was born when the Knights of the Lion were re-established. And until either Brennus or Ulrich died, Ulrich probably would not officially announce the engagement. Ulrich is in good spirits now. And maybe he can have another son. After all, he is only in his early fifties. And the new princess is young and beautiful. And there may be a chance to get the legitimate heir. Marbert hesitated for a moment with a pen beside him. But still said nothing. He wrote the edict according to what King Ulrich said and stamped it with the king's gold seal. His current status, abilities and responsibilities are that he can only listen to politics but cannot speak. Today's King Ulrich never convenes a royal meeting. And everything is decided with one word. He cannot pour wine and water in the royal meeting as a cupbearer and can only appear in the throne room in the name of secretary. Cupbearer and secretary. These are two positions often held by juniors who are regarded as the heirs of the ruler. According to the law, these two positions can only listen to politics but not speak. But they can learn how to govern the country in the process of listening to politics. However, when Marbert handed the king's order to Monever, he said, Night Monever, please hand it over to Count Leon personally and bring back Count Leon's signature and reply to your majesty. When receiving an edict from the king, it is usually necessary to sign a reply, which means to confirm receipt. Of course, the marshal leading the troops may sometimes refuse to accept the king's order because of sudden changes in the battle situation. But in this case, you must also send a reply to the king and tell him the reason for not accepting the order. Malbert, do you have any concerns? Just tell me directly. You and I don't need to abide by such strict laws. Ulrika noticed Malbert's abnormality and began to encourage his future son-in-law to commit crimes. But Marbert seemed unwilling to break the law. After hesitating, he put down the hand holding the pen, took off the clerk's hat on his head, and then spoke. Your Majesty, I'm afraid Count Leon will not obey your order. Malbert was hesitant when he spoke, but he seemed confident in what he said. Why? He is a smart man. He should know the price of disobeying me, King Ulrich asked, because he is probably no longer an Ashkaman. Lord Leon is very efficient in using troops. That's why I have to remind Lord Monteverdi to ask Count Leon to personally sign the king's order. Malbo gestured to Montever. Ulrich waved his hand for Montever to exit the throne room. Now that there is no one else, what do you want to say? Ulrich saw that Malbert had something else to say. Malbot said softly, Your Majesty, Earl Leon's Changha town is much more valuable than Ashkaman in Dexia. You can definitely go slower to support. After all, it's a long way. Ulrich was stunned for a moment, and then looked at Malbot hesitantly. But at the same time, 
He was a little relieved that Malbot could say such a thing, which meant that he was indeed thinking about the king wholeheartedly. But when Malbot lowered his head and saluted the king, when Auric couldn't see his face, he quietly showed a complicated expression. At that moment, he had a humble smile on his face, but his eyes were filled with the light of ambition. The capital of Dexia, Toba. Toba is geographically located in the south-central part of Desha, dividing the Savannah Desert into northern and southern halves. This is a quite large city, with a population even larger than that of Boji City. This city is built in the place with the most abundant water resources in Dexia, under the Wusa Mountains. The Wusa Mountains are a huge snow-capped mountain that straddles the area between Dexia and Field Way. It is a very high-altitude mountain range. Although it is located in the south, it is still covered with snow all year round. The entire southwest of Dexia is covered by this mountain range. Surrounded, it is the existence of the Wusu Mountains that creates a natural dividing line between Desha and Fields Way. This mountain range is the source of almost all freshwater resources in the entire Desha. But at the same time, it is also the source of the formation and expansion of the Savanir Desert. A large part of the Shavanir Desert is the Gobi Plateau, which is the part in the western part of Dexia near the Wusu Mountains. The Gobi near the Wusu Mountains has a very high altitude and is a plateau desert with a very wide range of temperatures. The maximum temperature difference in a year can even reach more than 70 degrees. In extreme cases, it is either unbearably hot or extremely cold. At the same time, the temperature difference between day and night is also very large. 40 degrees during the day and several degrees below zero at night are normal conditions. This environment makes it difficult for plants to survive in this place. Without plants, it is difficult to retain moisture in the soil, gradually forming a large desert plateau. The Wusu Mountains are not a complete mountain structure. There is a gap in the middle of the two huge mountains. There is a valley mouth where the I Pass Fortress has been built by the Fields Way people. A huge vent formed at the mouth of the valley, and the humid sea breeze from the west coast had greater pressure. So it blasted from west to east through the huge vent to Dexia territory all year round. This continuous one-way warm wind brings year-round snow to the Wusa Mountains and turns the Gobi Plateau on the east side of the mountains into a source of windy and sandy desert. The decertified Wusu Plateau is swept eastward by wind and sand year after year, accompanied by huge sandstorms every year, constantly expanding the boundaries of the desert. Therefore, the entire eastern side of the Wusu Mountains is covered with desolate Gobi and desert, while the territory of fields way to the west of the mountains is mostly covered with tree-lined hills which is like two distinct worlds. Almost the entire Savannah Desert will be affected by this wind and sand, except for the city of Toba. A ridge extends horizontally from the Wusu Mountains. This ridge is also the source of the largest river in Dexia, the Gatsi River, and Toba City is on the upper reaches of this river. The abundant water source has caused the river to be covered with tall and strong trees with deep roots, coupled with the horizontal mountains that block the wind and sand from the High Pass Fortress. The area around Toba City has become the most livable area in the entire Dexia, with abundant water sources, trees that can block the wind and sand, large tracts of pasture, and the output of materials can be directly connected to the sea outlet along the Gatsi River. Narda City is also a big city, but it is not as big as Ashkaman. What an excellent natural port. This is the reason why Toba can become the capital of Desha. The noble Bahad Khan naturally wants to occupy the best territory in the entire country. But the situation in Toba City today is a bit tense. After Bahadur Khan Khatan returned to Toba, he immediately planned to reorganize his army and tried to secretly kill Amir Xerxes to ensure his position. But before he could recruit new troops, he heard that Liang had entered the country with the army of the Lion Kingdom, and his brother Emil Xerxes suddenly disappeared after that. This made Cardin quite panic for a while. The thing he was most worried about was that hostile countries would support Emil Xerxes as a puppet, and Emil is missing. You can imagine this situation with your knees. His younger brother, who has always claimed that he wants to divide Dexia equally, may have gone to find the Lion Kingdom to divide Dexia equally. Within a few days, Carden received the news that Ashkaman was occupied by Leon, and it was said that no war occurred. This made Carden's heart sink to the bottom. What he was most worried about seemed to have happened. Bahman was probably forced into helplessness, and Carden could understand. But Emil Xerxes, who suddenly disappeared, must have taken the initiative to surrender to the enemy. In this case, a Shikaman must be recaptured as soon as possible to show that today's Bahadur Khan Kadin is still the strongest man in the entire Desha. Otherwise many people will definitely turn to Amir Xerxes. 
but it is said that Liang's army has more than 10,000 people and is powerful. So Carden must organize a strong enough force. Moreover, if Baomon will surrender, then other lords may also be unstable. Therefore, Cadden sent envoys to various places, began to gather the armies of various Desha families, and personally went to Sinjar to ensure that Caliph Tyre, who was powerful and had not suffered any losses, was still loyal to him. Yes, not being loyal to Desha, but being loyal to Cadden, which is different. Although Caliph Tahir, the lord of Sinjar's city, had always supported Cadden before, Cadden himself also understood that Tahir must have been wavering. If he didn't show up, I'm afraid single, an already unstable place, would be directly out of control. With the troops that had not yet been fully organized, Carden rushed to single at an extremely fast speed, just in time to catch up with Ramon's news of the option of the city owner of Ashkaman in single. Chapter 273 A Hasty Attack As Malbert guessed, Leon is indeed no longer in Ashkaman at this moment. Leon didn't care about the fleet of the Bacchus Empire at all. He left most of the merchants in Mudun and Ashkaman, and led a large force to the southwest. The businessmen are not panicking. In their view, since Lord Leon will continue to go out to fight, he is naturally confident enough. Ashkaman must be safe. It must be said that the simple judgment of the businessmen is the most correct. Of of course, Leon didn't need to worry about the Bacchus fleet. Emperor Marius was his ally. And that fleet was under the banner of General Agathon. Even if the two sides were not allies, Agathon couldn't do anything like plundering merchants. He couldn't even shave his head off the floor. Right now, Leon is in a place called Fondel, southwest of Ashkaman. This place is not in the desert, but a town built in a grassland, surrounded by the best grassland in the entire Dexia. The grassland where Fondar town is located is the horse breeding land of the Dexia principality. And it is also the place where the Gotsi raiders and Gotsi archers were born. There is a huge mountain south of Ashkaman. This mountain is also regarded as the Gotsi mountain. There are temples everywhere on the mountain. The Dexia people regard this mountain as the birthplace of the god Veda. That is, they regard it as a sacred mountain. The huge peninsula surrounding this mountain is also the earliest birthplace of the Dexia people. The word Ghazi is an ancient Desha language, which is almost equivalent to the meaning of holy or temple. So being called a Ghazi warrior is the lifelong pursuit of most Desha warriors. But this ancient Dexia language is actually no different from the language of the Jata people. The Dexia people are not considered the aborigines of the Pender continent. They originally came from the same lineage as the Jata people and came from the Amara continent. It's just that they came earlier. They came to the vicinity of Gatsi Mountain as early as the time of King Kabbalah of Pande. Moreover, the reasons why the Dexia people and the Jata people came to the Pandar continent are similar. The Jata people came as mercenaries of General OSA in 150 years, while the Desha people came to the Pandar continent hundreds of years ago, mercenaries of the late King Kabbalah. But the Dexia people themselves do not admit this. They probably consider themselves to be members of a civilized society and look down on warlord tribes like the Jata people. Moreover, if they have different beliefs, everything is different. If the Jata people do not believe in Veda, then they are definitely not the same kind. However, their daily living habits and raiding methods are really no different from those of the Jata people. Civilized society cannot be developed by just building a few cities. The Dexia people around the Gatsi Mountains are different from the settlers who call themselves civilized people. The people here are still pure nomads. They still live around the holy mountain of Ghazi chasing water and grass, and have preserved their ancient nomadic traditions. But since most Desha people have now become settlers, the nomads at the foot of the Ghazi mountains have become aliens. Moreover, many Dexia, urbanites, living in Toba or Ashkaman now even regard the traditional herdsmen under the sacred mountain as brainless barbarians. This is a mockery with a little regional discrimination, and it is the people at the foot of the holy mountain who are being discriminated against. This is because it is not easy to become a Ghazi warrior. It requires not only extraordinary martial arts, but also devout faith. You have to kneel on your knees to climb the holy mountain and go to the temple to offer everything you have in order to obtain the title of Templar Warrior. Title. However, most of the Desha people who settled in the city were not able to dedicate their property and wives to God Veda. That is not pious enough. This is the case in a place where politics and religion are integrated. Everything must be accompanied by the Will of the gods. I don't know why their Veda god, who is a horse, requires believers to donate dinars and women. 
but the people near Gatsi Mountain are really devout. They will even send their wives alone to the temple on their wedding night to seek the blessings of the gods. Because Veda God not only represents prosperity and wealth, but also represents reproduction. In fact, Seraphan Sheik was a warrior who came out of the Ghazi Mountains. So Seraphan was exiled by Kadin to the southernmost Jihad Fort. Kadin's Toba city blocked the southern part of Desha. And Seraphan could not break through the blockade and return to the area around Ghazi Mountain. Otherwise, he would most likely gain the full recognition of the Ghazi people. Since the nomadic culture has always been preserved in the area around the Ghazi Mountains. Countless skilled riders and archers have been produced. The people are brave and good at fighting. Therefore, most Dexia lords will go to the Ghazi area to recruit warriors. Today's area around Ghazi Mountain is probably Dexia's true base. But in the past 20 years, no Ghazi warrior has become the lord of Dexia. This is not because of regional discrimination, but because the people of the Holy Mountain, who have always preserved the ancient traditions, will not learn the culture of Pender. They can't even speak Pender language, let alone read and so on. This is naturally impossible. As a lord, even the warlords of Jata know how to learn the official language. Besides, if you give everything to God, how can you be a lord? Therefore, the lords of Dexia are particularly willing to go down to Ghazi Mountain to recruit warriors. These pious people here will not threaten their status. It is enough to give them the honor of Ghazi warriors. Yes, for Desha lords like Bahamon, most of the Ghazi raiders, or Ghazi archers, in the team are not real Templars. They are just Bahamon in the name of the Caliph. It's just a title given to the elite troops. In the eyes of senior leaders like Bahamon, the holy mountain of Ghazi Mountain is really just a recruitment base. Only the Koha at the bottom are so pious. The upper level ruling class has always been very flexible in their attitude towards gods. Fongdal Town is the recruitment center of this troop base, and also the place where nomads near the holy mountain sell their war horses. Leon would come here. Of course, originally to march towards Toba. Junal is between Ashkaman and Toba. And the three places are basically in a straight line. The entire auction plan that he and Ramon jointly planned was actually not complicated. From the beginning, Leon was confident that he could quickly conquer a Shikaman no matter what method he used. After all, Emperor Marius' fleet would also provide support. However, Leon used the least labor-intensive method to achieve his goal as quickly as possible. That's all. Then Ramon will publicly announce the auction of the Lord of Ashkaman in Sinjar. Ramon's propaganda ability is very outstanding in this era. The Dexia lords, including Carden, will definitely hear about this as soon as possible. And they will definitely rush to single. The great lords of Dexia, including Cadden, must all understand the reason why Liang entrusted Ramon to auction Ashkaman. Liang's territory is far away from Ashkaman. And an outsider cannot effectively rule the son of God Veda. People, only by selling the city can Liang's interests be maximized. In order to recover Ashkaman intact, Carden will definitely participate in the auction. If Ashkaman fails to auction, then the city will definitely be completely destroyed by Liang's army. This is easy to imagine. Spending money to buy it back is more cost effective than letting the city be completely destroyed. And you can also organize an army in single. Maybe you can do a zero dollar purchase when the city is handed over. Anyway, the auction house only needs to pay a deposit first. As for whether you need to pay the final payment when delivering the goods, it depends on the actual situation. At the same time, since it was the single people who organized the auction, everyone, including Carden, would suspect that Tahir, the lord of single, might conspire with Liang, and they had to go to single. In fact, Carden's reaction was faster than Leon and Ramon imagined. After Ashkaman was occupied by Leon, Carden had already considered that Tahir might be unstable. So the news of the auction had not yet spread. When he reached Toba, he went to single. Of course, this does not affect Liang and Ramon's plans. Carden left Toba City. And most of the Dexia lords would also go to Sinjar. Which would make Toba City and the surrounding areas relatively empty during this period. Probably few people would have thought that Liang would immediately send troops again after occupying Ashkaman. This would be during his city lord auction. Who would have thought that the auctioneer would leave the auction item at this time? And they left just as the fleet of the Bacchus Empire was attacking Ashkaman. No one in Dexia will know about the verbal covenant between Liang and Marius. At least no one knows about it yet. Except Ramon. Ramon will indeed complete his auction. And he will definitely sell Ashkaman to Emperor Marius. This is the result of Leon's agreement with him. Yes, no matter what era or place. 
auctions are always operated behind closed doors. Selling a large city to Emperor Marius would allow Ramon to gain the highest reputation and gain the friendship of the Bacchus Empire. For Ramon, the underground king, a country that does not border Sinjar is the best ally. At the same time, this was also Leon's promise to Marius and Agathon that he would leave Ashkaman to the Bacchus Empire. Of course, this is a sale, and he must get enough profit. Marius said before, Wait until you capture Ashkaman, then let Emperor Marius go to the auction house to bid. Most importantly, Ashkaman had to be sold to Emperor Marius in order for both Cardin and the Desha lords, who supported Cadden to go to Ashkaman, who would inevitably assemble to try to retake the city. In fact, Cardin must do this now. If he cannot win back Ashkaman, it will be tantamount to announcing to everyone that the current Bahadur Khan is no longer good. Everyone, come and snatch the Khan's position. Ashkaman is bound to face a tough battle. After all, Leon told Agathon early that he only needed the Bacchus Empire to defend Ashkaman. And this will give Leong enough time and space to conquer Toba City. Ramon will flee single after completing the auction for Ashikaman. Lest the angry Cadden and Tahir join him in trying to kill him. He will rush to Toba City and preside over the auction of the title of Bahad Khan with Leong. During the auction of the master of Ashikaman City, the empty Toba City will definitely not be able to stop Liang's army. Both Ramon and Leong are confident about this. The auction of the throne mentioned by Leong and Ramon can actually be understood as the auction of military power and the ownership of Toba City. To put it simply, whoever gives Leong and Ramon more benefits will hand over Toba City to the other party. And Liang's army will support the other party to become the real Bahad Khan. Of course, before that, Leong must at least let the Desha lords did not have the ability to quickly replenish their troops to avoid being trapped in a tight siege. If necessary, after conquering Toba, you have to return to Ashkaman and cooperate with Agathon, who defends the city to defeat Cadden's army. And since he was also traveling thousands of miles away, Leon naturally wanted to avoid encountering the same dilemma as Cardin. After all, the lesson learned happened more than half a month ago. In order to avoid the situation where Cardin ran into the main army when he first arrived in Lion City, Leon had to first destroy Fondel, Desha's recruitment center, or move it to another place. For example, Mudun and Ashkaman. It was Akram, the son of Bahamon, who brought Leon to Fondar. Bahamon and his son often went to Fondar to recruit Ghazi raiders. And Akram was very familiar with the place. In fact, Akram is actually in a mood now. His father gave Ashkaman to Leon as his sister Lua's dowry. Which means that he will lose the inheritance rights to Ashkaman. His father Bahamon the decision is very opinionated. Although his father received the support of Leon, and seemed to have a chance to become Bahadur Khan. Who knows whether it will come true, compared with Ashkaman, who was bound to inherit. The opportunity to become the heir of Bahad Khan was not so fragrant to Akram. In Akram's view, even if Leong fulfills his promise, even if his father Bahamon really takes the position of Bahad Khan with Liang's help, he is just Liang's puppet and has no influence on the Desha rulers. Dignity. Such thoughts made him uncomfortable. Young people always value dignity and honor more. His father, Bahamon, didn't think so at all. If he didn't take the initiative to hug Liang's lap, he was afraid that even living would be a luxury and there would be no dignity. Besides, Leon always has to leave. He can't stay in Dexia forever. Being attached to Leon for a short time does not mean that he will be a puppet for the rest of his life. He will have the opportunity to restore his strength and accumulate more power. Only when he becomes stronger can he have a real future word. But Akram didn't think so far. He just felt very shameful. Now he seemed to be a translator leading the way for Leong. He felt like he was leading the invaders to kill his own compatriots. This feeling of guilt makes Akram quite emotionally unstable. So, after bringing Leong to Fondel, Akram decided to take a risk. Leong originally planned to ask Akram to tell the nomads that from now on, matters such as recruiting soldiers and selling horses can be carried out in Ashkaman, where the bids will be higher. At the same time, if you are willing to serve as a mercenary for the Lord of the Lion Realm, or sell horses to the Bacchus, you can even earn three times more money than before. This was originally just to prevent Fondal from becoming a recruitment base for the Dexia people and prevent the Dexia lords from quickly regaining their strength, since the people near Gatsi Mountain only spoke their traditional dialect, which was very different from the mainstream official language of Pendor. Leon couldn't understand the people here, so he asked Akram as a translator. Oh, Leon can understand two sentences. One is, Bispa, 
and the other is Uzza. He learned it from the Jata people. When Liang went to Fondal to have relatively friendly communication with the mountain people here, he would naturally leave the protection of the army temporarily. After all, if he brought too many people with him, the herdsmen would stay away. Therefore, the army did not enter Fondal, and Liang only brought the guards with him. But after Akram brought Liang to the place where the herdsmen gathered in the Ghazi Mountains, he asked the herdsmen to capture Liang in the name of Bamon. He promised those people that the person who captured Liang would become the Khan at the foot of the Ghazi Mountains and declared Caliph Bahman will establish the area around Ghazi Mountain as a permanent reservation. And the Ghazi Mountain people can implement self-governance based on ancient traditions. Speaking of which, Ikram is smart enough to persuade the herdsmen to listen to him with such a promise. Many mountain people are not willing to deal with city people. The implementation of autonomy has always been what the mountain people have been asking for. Moreover, this second-generation official with some brains probably carefully considered the consequences that he could not kill Liang. If Liang died here, he would most likely die too. The army of the Lion Kingdom will definitely kill him, and even destroy everything including Ashkaman. Liang's men will definitely kill his father Bamon, and maybe his uncle Gawain Khan and sister Luha will also survive. If we don't go down, the whole family will be uprooted. Of course, if Liang had not died, the ending would probably be similar. In order to save the family, Bamon might personally kill his son, who doesn't know how to be noble. So Akram planned to capture Liang alive. He wanted to catch Liang, and then force Liang to act according to his own ideas. Liang's army is just one mile away. It is of course very dangerous to attack Liang here. But Akram is just a young man in his twenties. And his mind is full of so-called honor and bravery. Maybe he thinks this is a chance a heroic feat. He wanted to become Dexia's hero, and wanted to gain status with dignity by standing. So Liang encountered an attack. This attack was actually very hasty. Nearly a hundred herdsmen from the Ghazi Mountains swarmed forward and rushed towards Liang from all directions. They looked very brave. In fact, Liang did not expect that Akram would dare to do such a stupid thing. But fortunately, this attack was not too dangerous for the Lord. This time, Liang led his personal guards into the place where the herdsmen gathered. Not alone although he only brought about 20 people. It was actually quite normal for these 20 people to deal with a 100 nomads without armor. And it was not something worth bragging about. The 20 people accompanying Leon were the old guys from Kloza's team in Mendenheim, as well as Sarah and the female explorer she brought with her. In addition, there were Lisa, Dylan, and Wendy. Chapter 274 Temple Defense Battle Since Leon had been stabbed and injured before, these most loyal partners were closely guarding the Lord all the way, and they were always armed to the gums. The armors of the great swordsmen of Mendenheim were already extremely thick. Now that they have become members of the Silver Hand, Liang specially provided them with a set of shining silver arm armor. It was an enchanted piece of equipment produced by Nolder. It was a plate armor with middens forged from fine steel and embedded with mithril runes. The forearm of the arm armor was widened and thickened, and was integrated with the gauntlet. The elbows and the gauntlets also have some spikes. In fact, this kind of arm armor is also a weapon in itself. The thickened forearm can be used as a wrist shield or an arm hammer. And both punches and elbows can kill people. It is also quite reliable when used as a wrist shield. Although the protective area is relatively small, the curved forearm plate armor is quite solid. Unless it is hardwired with an axe. Ordinary swords will basically be unable to break through the defense. This kind of silver gauntlet that integrates offense and defense is the signature equipment of the core members of the silver hand. At least it looks like a genuine silver hand which is much more reliable than the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet, who do not equip the Ebony Gauntlet at all. It's just that this kind of gauntlet cannot be mass-produced, and Liang doesn't dare to equip it in large quantities. Only true confidants can get it. The cost of this thing is very high, and the cost is more expensive than the same volume of silver. It is a genuine silver hand. The one-foot-wide gauntlets made up for the shortcomings of Medenheim's great swordsmen, who did not carry shields and also made the big macho men look like lumps of iron men with spikes. Full of intimidation. The female explorers brought by Sarah are the best of Amy's men. Eight female warriors who have obtained the status of reserve knights. Amy asked Sarah to take them with the army. Not only to protect Leon from being violated by an underage elf girl, but also to allow them to contribute to the country and establish military exploits. This actually also declares that Griffin Claw is a regular red new loyal to Amy a bodyguard of the princess of the kingdom, not a mercenary. In this way, Amy can justifiably canonize these women as regular knights 
as the Lord of White Deer Castle, and they will not be regarded as a legal conferments, no matter where they are. If they want to become a recognized legal knight, fighting for the country is a necessary process. These female soldiers are Amy's top fighters, and their equipment is naturally the best. Amy is now a rich woman and has gotten a lot of good things for her men. Ten strongmen dressed like steel plates, eight heavily armored female knights, and two outstanding Nolder elves. Such twenty bodyguards are not something ordinary people can handle. In addition, Liang himself is not a weakling. In fact, even without the guards around, these Gazi people probably can't catch the Lord. Those hundreds of nomads had not made any preparations before. Their equipment was very simple, and their skills were not very good. Even if they were to attack with more than few, they would not be able to defeat them. Moreover, they had to be captured alive, and they could not fight with their hands tied. Therefore, Ikram's plan naturally failed. Not only did it fail, but it also caused a large number of Ghazi people to be killed and injured in a very short period of time. Faced with the attack, Liang and his guards would not hold back. This short battle was actually lackluster. The Medenheimers blocked the outside to attract firepower. Two Nolder elves shot arrows in the middle, and several female explorers wandered around to fill in. They all have rich combat experience. This kind of small scale, they know how to cooperate in battle. Leon stood in the inner circle and didn't need to take action at all. And he didn't need to give verbal instructions. He only needed to guard against hidden arrows and... That's it! Just a few minutes later, dozens of the nomads died, and the rest dispersed on horseback. On Liang's side, only Summer and two female warriors were slightly injured. Chi people threw a few waves of crudely made spears as they ran away. This kind of crooked and tattered low-quality weapon is indeed quite threatening when thrown. The flight trajectory of the crooked spear is really difficult to predict. However, these people were originally guarding in front of Leon. They did not dare to avoid it, lest they be attacked behind them. The Lord, who blocked his view, was unfortunately hit. So they used their swords to intercept the spears, but they were slightly bruised. There were even thorns on the spear shafts that had not been scraped clean. This attack failed to do anything to Liang, and Close and others did not care much about this kind of attack in enemy territory. After all, it was normal for troops to encounter such things during war. But Liang was very unhappy, partly because his plans were affected, and partly because Ikram was missing. In the few minutes when those herdsmen attacked Liang, or in the minute or two, when Liang was blocked from sight by the tall Mettenheimer, Ikram disappeared without a trace. There are grasslands with no shelter around here, and the only places to hide people are a few shabby large tents and some fences to contain horses. But Akram was still missing. It was obvious that Akram had run away with the nomads. These nomads ran very quickly with light armor and fast horses. Leon was not familiar with the terrain, so he would definitely not be able to catch up. Gotsi Mountain is surrounded by grasslands. It's quite a big place, and I don't know where they will go. Sir, what do you think he said to those herdsmen that caused them to attack you? Could it be that Bahamon meant what he did? At the moment, only Sarah can discuss countermeasures with Leong. But neither of them has figured out that Akrim's intention is to kill Leong Akrim himself, and his whole family will be destroyed. This is easy to understand. Leo, it's not like the army in the border area can't kill people without a marshal. In fact, without Liang's restraint, the army of the Lion Realm would have reduced Ashkaman to ruins long ago. I don't think Bahamon is so stupid. Actually, I don't care what Akram said. Anyway, it has happened. The problem now is, if Akram does this, what will happen to the Desha herdsmen in this area? They have completely become my enemies, and it is difficult for us to communicate with them. Leon looked at the corpses on the ground inside. I originally just wanted to do business and didn't want to kill people. But now, I probably have to kill a lot of people before I can do it. After all, dozens of people have been killed. It is difficult to calm down this kind of conflict over human life. In addition, due to the language barrier and the inability to communicate, it is impossible to solve the problem peacefully in a short time. So we can only continue to kill. Sarah also sighed. It's a pity that I can't speak the ancient Desha language either. It is true that she did not speak Dishagu. And she was not yet born when his father, Seraphan Sheikh, left the holy mountain. After Sarah was born, Seraphan never took care of her. It was her mother who brought her up. Sarah's mother was a noblewoman from the Cheres tribe in northern Dexia and had no contact with ancient languages. It is no longer possible for me to show kindness to them. And they will definitely not believe me. You? Since they have chosen to be my enemy, then I must destroy them. 
Leon looked eastward. But he couldn't actually see the Gazi Mountain in Fondel. Only a piece of grassland. They should be destroyed too. In fact, this is also a good thing for the Dexia people. That holy mountain is simply the source of all evil. But, sir, Sarah agreed with Liang's decision. But at the same time, she also had some concerns. But that is the sacred mountain of the Dexia people after all. If you kill people in the holy mountain, the Dexia people may regard you as a devil. You will those who have been hunted by assassins all their lives. There are many assassin groups in Desha. I know that Ashkaman has a Scorpio assassin brotherhood. Just because I don't want to provoke them. I want to accept Ashkaman peacefully. Leong sighed and shook his head. But it's different here. I don't actually need to destroy this place. Sarah, you and Sigismund should go back to Ashkaman and tell our General Gason. The war horses that Emperor Marius wanted. There are many of them under Mount Gotzi. In fact, Leon did not expect that in the end. Agathon would have to scrape the land in Dexia. Dot, sir. You want General Agathon to come over and do this dirty work. I understand that, Dot, but those herdsmen will not keep their horses at the foot of Gotzi Mountain. General Agathon will not see the horses when he comes. Come on. Where can I find those enemies? Sarah frowned and expressed incomprehension. Gotzi Mountain is surrounded by grasslands. Who knows where those herdsmen are gathering now? You don't need to see it. Sarah, go and tell Agathon that as long as he burns down the Wada Temple, countless ownerless wild horses will appear under the mountain. Leon curled his lips. By the way, tell Agathon that in order to ensure that he can take the horse away, he'd better bring more manpower and weapons and equipment. I'll let Sigismund take the gladiators over to help Agathon. A handful. Lest the guy dies fighting on the mountain. And he still owes me a huge debt that he has yet to repay. Leon does not intend to change his plan. If there may be problems with the plan, then he will get rid of those who may cause problems. No matter how many people they are. But the Lord still has to do business. And doing business requires harmony and wealth. So you must not do things like murder and arson by yourself. If you are too hateful, it will affect the business. But Agasun is different. This imperial general definitely doesn't care whether the Dexia people hate him or not. The more the Dexia people hate him, the more satisfied he may be. For a general, coming from an enemy country, his hatred is actually equivalent to his own reputation. Sarah already understood. She bowed to the Lord with sincerity, then mounted her horse to find Sigismund. Three days later, the Veda temple on Ghazi Mountain unfortunately caught fire. This fire attracted all the traditional herdsmen who devoutly believed in Veda and they all came galloping to put out the fire. However, the Gotzi Mountain is so steep and dangerous that horses cannot go up it. So countless, ownerless horses did appear at the foot of the mountain. The Dexia herdsmen rushed up the mountain like crazy, while Agathon stood guard on the mountain from a high position, turning an invasion war into a defensive war. In fact, Sigismund burned the temple, and he always lit fires on the top of the mountain to ensure that all the temples on the mountain were burning. This was to illuminate the entire mountain and prevent Agathon from being attacked at night. Sigismund couldn't stand this kind of thing like making money and having women in the name of gods. In his opinion, destroying this evil sacrifice was tantamount to saving the common people. And Agathon also knew that Leon did not deceive him. As long as he could hold on and kill all the Dexia people who attacked the mountain, the horses at the foot of the mountain would naturally become real ownerless war horses. But it was unclear how long this battle would last and how long he would have to stay on the mountain. Fortunately, the snow on the top of the mountain has ensured the water source for many years. The food brought out by Sigismund in the temple has also piled up like a mountain. And even the dinars used to reward soldiers have piled up like a mountain. These temples are really rich. I'm afraid Leon I feel greedy just looking at it. The only problem is manpower. Agathon only brought a thousand troops, which was half the strength of the fleet he brought to Desha. And the other half was at Ashkaman. There are countless Desha people at the foot of the mountain. Anyway, there are heads everywhere. A thrown spear can cause casualties to two enemies. Moreover, these Dexia people were extremely crazy after the temple was burned. Even crazier than digging their ancestral graves. It looks like it might turn into a protracted battle. While Agathon was fighting a difficult battle to defend the temple, Leon had successfully arrived at Toba City. The city gates of Toba City were closed at this time and there seemed to be a few cantilevers protruding from the city wall. It was probably because large catapults and other equipment were deployed in the city. From a distance, Dexia's soldiers standing at the top of the city could be seen moving on the city wall. Liang's troops were stationed about five miles north of Toba City. 
This is the transition area between the green space and the desert outside Toba City. And it is also the location where the land is the hardest. In the distance, there is light yellow sand blown up by the wind, bringing up a piece of silk-like fine dust, which shines golden light under the reflection of the setting sun. The defenders in Toba City had obviously discovered Liang's army a long time ago. But they closed the city gates at such a distance and began to play with catapults. The defenders in the city were probably very cautious people. Of course, this is also a sign of lack of confidence. Sir, do you want to send a scout over to investigate? A knight from the Lion Realm approached Liang. This was Father's subordinate. Father, like Amy, did not come himself, but sent several representatives. Liang did not let Fawcett join the army. He had already taken Eric away. So Fawcett must stay within the limits of Chang'e town. Because Fawcett had a huge influence on the rogue nobles, or bandits, hiding in the mountains. Deterrence. Today, Father is busy in the eastern region of the Lion Kingdom, and is regarded as a butcher. Everyone knows that he is cruel and ruthless. And some discerning people know that he is the knife that kills people in Liang's hands. But no matter what, when this knife exists, what kind of monster is it? They didn't dare to show their heads. Fawcett's knight only brought 30 soldiers with him. But all of them were very skilled like cavalry. And they were Fawcett's elite family. This is the attitude shown by Father towards Leon. His troops are willing to take on the hardest jobs. Such as serving as the most risky scouts. There should be a lot of Desha wind riders in the city. Their archery skills are very good. You'd better not go there. It won't be long before someone comes to tell us about the situation in Toba City. Maybe they can even bring the city defense layout. Leon did not let the knight go out. But he patted the knight on the shoulder and gave him another task. Take someone to patrol about 30 miles to the north. I am more concerned about whether there will be anything in the desert behind. There will be enemies. And the Dexia cavalry trapped in the city in front are nothing to worry about. Then the army began to camp on the spot and make fires to cook. Leon was going to rest here for a night and wait for Ramon's people to come to him. Chapter 275 Bridge and Edies After nightfall, a single rider riding a yellow horse came to the military camp. He rode a horse and came to the vicinity of the military camp. Soldiers warned him and shot arrows at him. Then he took the initiative to dismount and surrender with his hands raised. He was then taken to Liang's camp by the patrolling soldiers. Lord Liang, your soldiers almost shot me to death. Can you let me go? The Sinjar rider complained, then turned to glare at the two soldiers guarding him behind him. You recklessly rode a horse and rushed near the military camp. To be honest, you are still alive only because tonight's patrol sentry deserves to die. Close. Go change the perimeter defenses and drag tonight's perimeter sentry back and beat him to 10 army stick. It actually allows people to ride horses and get within 100 meters of the army camp. Leon finished the order with a gloomy face and then turned to look at the rider. Who are you? What do you want to do when you come to me? The Lord asked this question because he knew that this Sinjar rider was not Ramon's subordinate. Ramon's men will not complain to Leon. And they will first make a sound to inform Leon Ramon's men have been conducting various secret activities for a long time. And everyone is cautious and will not be as reckless as this single rider. My name is Edis. Lord Leon, you don't need to punish the sentry outside. I knocked one out. Well, he has actually been patrolling conscientiously a mile away. The Sinjar rider seemed a little embarrassed. It was Mr. Ramon who asked me to contact you in Toba. But I think the contact information he gave me is too cowardly. I don't like doing such dishonorable things. He asked me to imitate the wild cat's name, Spring. This is indeed an agreement between Ramon and Leon. Ramon's men will call Chun in a fixed rhythm. And Lisa, Dylan, and Wendy. Two Nolda with strong ears can hear it two or three miles apart. What? You call being cautious cowardly? Why do I think that your survival today is all due to luck? Leon looked at Adiz and said, You'd better talk about business first. I'm not interested in your personal preferences. Sir Ramon asked me to tell you that there is an abandoned secret door on the west side of Toba City. Your army can enter the city from there. Now Bahad Khan Kadden is not here. And there are only a few Desha Windriders, and with some new soldiers guarding it, you can quickly capture Toba City. And the Principality of Desha will soon become a vassal of the Lion Kingdom again. Adais began to explain the situation quickly. As if he had recited it. And he spoke smoothly. As he spoke, he approached the Lord. Let Dexia become a vassal of the Lion Kingdom? Dot ha. Did Ramon really say that? Leon looked at Adais with a smile. Then picked up the silver hand. In front of him and asked while putting it on. 
in the shadow behind the Lord. Lisa Dillon had begun to move quietly and silently circle behind Edie's. There is obviously something wrong with Ad Ice words. The agreement between Leong and Ramon was to auction Bahadur Khan's throne. How could Ramon say such a thing? Moreover, Ramon does not need to help Leong invade Toba City. Leong does not have this requirement. He only needs information from Ramon's spies. In fact, Leong does not necessarily have to capture the city immediately. He can stay outside the city for a few days, keep the scouts away, and defeat the Dexia lords who come to rescue Toba City one by one. After all, the ultimate goal is not to capture the city territory, but to eliminate the active forces loyal to Kadden so that the seat of Bahad Khan can be truly auctioned. Ramon must have placed his spies in Toba City, but Ramon will never let his men take Leong through any secret passages and secret doors. Unless Leong has this request, people like Ramon will not help Leong do it. Decided, Ramon is good at gambling, but he is not a gambler himself. He will not actively add any uncertain factors to his plan, let alone make his own decisions without saying age, low. So, there's definitely something wrong with Edie's. Something happened to Ramon? Or maybe something happened to the men Ramon sent to Toba City? Lord Leong, I am just the person responsible for delivering the message. Now that the message has been delivered, it is time for me to leave. Adai seemed to sense that Liang's eyes were a little unkind and began to look back at the tent door as if preparing to run away. You haven't taken me to see the secret door yet. You want to leave now? Adai's, you are not good at acting at all. And you are not Ramon's subordinate. Who asked you to come? Leong stood up, moved his shoulders, and stood in front of Edie's. Lord Leong, I don't understand what you are talking about. Ad eyes looked at Leong's spiked arm armor and seemed a little hesitant, his eyes darting around. Did I have to give you a hard time? Lisa Dillon suddenly appeared from the shadows, grabbed Ad eyes arm, and twisted his hands behind his back. Leong directly touched Eddie's with his gloved hand. Eh. He really doesn't have a weapon. Lisa Dillon, search him for any poison. Leong took two steps back and took off the arm armor. This was closed as equipment. Liang's arms were not that thick. So wearing this arm armor would not be stable at all. It is only worn temporarily to prevent assassination. There is no poison on him. But there is a little bit of ecstasy. But this thing is probably not meant to harm you. Sir. Rasadalin was very familiar with the poisons used by assassins and he would carry several of them with him. But Edie's obviously doesn't know how to use poison. The small ball of ecstasy he carried was actually an ointment made of opium mixed with spices. It needs to be heated with a bomb to smoke. So it definitely cannot be used. Harmful. Nolder? Don't throw away my things. Let me go! You pointy-eared bastard. I won't be that kind of cowardly killer. I'm really just here to deliver a message. Seeing Lisa Dillon throw away the ball of opium like trash. Ad eyes struggled and started shouting. Edies, who are you working for? Since you have no intention of murdering me, I can give you a way out. But at least you have to tell me who is planning to trick me into attacking the city through that so-called secret door. Leon looked at the ball of ointment on the ground. And then at Ad eyes. It was obvious that the reason why Ad eyes appeared here was obvious. This guy probably exchanged this mission for the black ball on the ground. Stuff. Dot I can't betray my employer dot although he is a bastard. I am not. A trace of struggle flashed on Adai's face. But he still didn't say anything. That's fine. Just don't say anything. Leon looked very reasonable and asked in a gentle manner. It seems that you are a person who pursues respectability. But why would you work for someone like Bridget? I owe him a lot of money. Wait. How do you know I'm working for Bridget? Edis had been staring at the ball of opium. He was originally answering casually. But then he reacted and turned to look at Leon. He never mentioned Bridget. Just a guess. You are from single, and you are not Ramon's subordinate. You still have this thing on your body. Of course, I can guess that you are Bridget's subordinate, since you know that Ramon is my friend. Leon shook his head and smiled. Brigi, a magician who uses poison to control his subordinates. Ramon will naturally tell me. Sir, I will bury him. Lisa Dillon had already tied Adai's hands. Seeing the embarrassed look on this guy's face, but gritting his teeth and pretending to be a tough guy, he sneered dragged Ad eyes and planned to walk out. Wait. Pointy ears. Wait. Master Leon. I am no longer working for Bridget. I am really just here to deliver a message. Really? Seeing that Lisa Dillon was really planning to bury herself, Ad eyes became anxious. 
You have to say something useful. Otherwise, a useless drug addict will just waste food. Leon still has a gentle attitude, and he cooperates well with Lisa Dillon, who has a red face and a white face. Brigi and his troops are in Toba City. He accepted the employment of Bahad Khan Kadden and wanted to lead you to the secret door for an ambush. That's all I know. Lord Ramon's men are the one caught by Brigi. Has died in Toba City. Ad eyes explained quickly. Sir, I have decided to leave Bridget. Really? I can't stand his disgraceful behavior. Brigi claimed to be the desert prophet and claimed that he was inspired by the gods to destroy all unclean evil spirits in the Desha territory. He claimed to his followers that evil spirits had no normal state and could only be identified by his divine eyes and revealed through oracles to make evil spirits appear. And once he identifies it as a so-called evil spirit, both humans and animals will be wiped out and the property will be dedicated to the gods. By him, this guy probably merged the styles of the Knights of the Dawn and the Ghazi Temple, and then developed his own set of purification logic. However, what he believes in is definitely neither the goddess of justice nor the horse god Veda, the mysterious religion that Bridget believes in advocate sacrifice and dedication. It is said that after death, you can go to the paradise of heaven. In this religion, any ritual that requires enlightenment from a prophet is actually using highly addictive hallucinogens to create hallucinations, such as opium or other similar drugs that can lead to rapid addiction. After this, Bridger will be able to control or enslave his men for a long time. Before every war, he would deliberately stop taking the medicine, causing his men to become addicted to the medicine. These drug-addicted people will become quite crazy when fighting, and Brigi has won many victories with this method, and also forced some small tribes near Sinjar to surrender to him. Speaking of which, Bridget actually had a grudge against Ramon. If Ramon wanted to cooperate with Leon, he would naturally tell Leon about his enemies and possible enemies. He probably has something to do with Fruzi, the mercenary leader who was once killed by Ramon. Anyway, all the single temptresses under Fruzi who lied to people are now under Bridge. Moreover, many of those temptresses were selected by Bridget to accept some kind of mysterious challenge. This challenge is said to have been inspired by Bridget himself when he was hallucinating due to taking drugs. But no one knows the specific content of the challenge. Not even Ramon. But Ramon said that all single temptresses who successfully challenge will be called Omen Seekers by Brigi and become his trusted escort. This was obviously a heretical way of doing things. So Ramon mentioned it to Leon. However, Cardin would actually hire such a guy and let him enter the capital Toba City? Isn't he afraid that all the people in Toba City will become drug addicts? Or, is this what Cardin hopes? Bridge and I should be considered to have no grievances. Why would he harm me? I don't believe that he was simply trying to help Cardin defend Toba City. Leon felt that Bridget's despicable behavior was definitely not that noble. And Cardin should only hire him to defend the city. Not let him become the Caliph of Desha. Logically speaking, Bridget did not need to take the initiative to cause trouble for the Lion Realm army. Lord Leon, Bridget is not trying to kill you. He is trying to capture you alive. And then use poison to control you. And then control your army. Edis turned his head again and stared at the ball of opium paste on the ground. In fact, all his troops came here. I see. Edis, you probably don't believe in Bridget's mysterious religion. How did you get addicted to drugs? Leon looked at Deezy up and down and confirmed that he was a real Singalian. Most of the Singalese people did not believe in God. Dinar was the highest justice. This was what Ramon said. Ahem. I was deceived by some temptresses. It's not very honorable. So don't mention it. But I have really decided to leave. I want to get away from this life. There was an obvious look of embarrassment on Edis's face. It seemed that he had been deceived by those temptresses before. I really want to believe that you really left Bridget. But the thing on the ground makes me have to doubt that you may not have left so thoroughly. Leon shook his head at Adai's. But if you can help me kill Bridget, then maybe I can get you out of this thing completely and return to a normal life. Okay. Master Leon, I know I will definitely be buried here if I don't agree. I really don't want to live dependent on drugs for the rest of my life. But it's really hard for me to control myself when the addiction attacks. Adai's gave up the struggle and turned to Leong inside. But, Lord Leong, Bridget has nearly 2,000 people in the city. And he is recruiting more people. And many lawless people have joined his army. Now it's not that easy to deal with him. It seems that Adai's himself does want to return to a normal life. But he just doesn't have much confidence in killing Bridget. He recruited the Desha people in Toba City? 
He could actually convert the Desha people who believe in Mata to heresy. Liang somewhat admired Bridget's ability, which was something neither the Knights of the Dawn nor the Holy Inquisitor of the Tribunal could do. Most of the Desha people in Toba City do not truly believe in the God Veda. In fact, I think they, like the Sinjar people, only believe in Dinars. Adai shook his head. Lord Leon, how do you plan to deal with Bridget? Don't you owe him money? How much do you owe him? Leon asked about Adai's debt. Chapter 276 if you don't come in. Just wait and see. Adai's did owe Bridget a large sum of 3,000 dinars. In order to pay off the debt, he became Bridget's mercenary. But for an ordinary single mercenary, 3,000 dinars is a huge amount of money that is difficult to repay in a lifetime. And even if he sells Adai's, he can't afford it. Judging from the prices, that Ramon, a professional trafficker, usually places on various fighters. A single rider like Edie's is only worth about 700 dinars. If the buyer is good at bargaining, Ramon might even give him a lame old horse as a bonus. Therefore, Edie's was originally quite pessimistic about his future destiny. He could not afford this huge sum of money, and it was difficult to get rid of Bridget's drug control. The key is that the debt would even increase. Edie's was not a bummer. Li Ji is a follower of the mysterious religion, and the opium given to him by Bridge is not free. There is almost no hope in such a life. Of course, Adai's is still trying to think of a way. For example, this time, he took the initiative to get the opportunity to fool Liang. The chance to risk his life would allow him to reduce his debt a little and get his hands on a small dollop of opium paste. When Bridget stopped taking medicine for the troops, this small ball of opium seemed quite rare. It is indeed very sad when a person is in poverty. Everyone struggling at the bottom has their own difficulties and helplessness. If this person who is struggling at the bottom still wants to lose face, it will be even more difficult. Edie's is obviously a shameless person. He doesn't even want to imitate a wildcat and calls himself Spring. He has a very strong self-esteem. But perhaps Adai's is lucky. The mission he fought for for opium gave him a chance to truly change his destiny. Tomorrow you can pay your debt and I will give you 3,000 dinars. Leon stared into Adai's eyes. Go back to Bridget and tell him that I believe you are Ramon's subordinate. Wait! Lord Leon, I will not be an assassin for money. I can leave my employer because his behavior has caused me to lose my honor. But I can no longer assassinate him. This is the bottom line of being a human being. Although I also hope that he will be killed. I cannot be the one who killed him. Adai's interrupted Liang's words and did not avoid Liang's eyes. He spoke very seriously. Most of Sinjar's mercenaries do have this sense of honor. They do believe in Dinars. But they do have a bottom line when they are mercenaries. This is a code of conduct that has been gradually formed in Sinjar. A chaotic place. For hundreds of years. They can cheat and kidnap. They can disrespect the gods. And they can leave. Employers. But never attack the employer who provided the money. In fact. Single riders and spearmen are quite popular in the mercenary industry. Even if they face a lot of temptations. They will not attack their employers. At most. They will steal things and run away. Perhaps. No matter which continent it is on. It is the people at the bottom who can maintain these senses of honor and moral values. But the problem is, Eddie's is now an addict. It's actually quite rare for an addict to still retain such a sense of honor. So Leon smiled. He felt that people like Edie's were just right for his plan. Edie's, I have no intention of letting you assassinate Bridget. Besides, I don't think you are a killer. Leon grinned and shook his head. I just need you to pay back the money you owe Bridget and say that I gave you a sum of money. Because I believe that you were Ramon's subordinate. This is what I gave to Ramon. Mongolian Settlement of Cooperation Funds. And tomorrow night, I will personally lead the team to attack Toba City through that secret door, so that Bridget will be ready to catch me. Do you understand? Repeat what I said. Adai's memorized it honestly, and there was nothing wrong. Okay. Rasatalin. Go get him 3,000 dinars. Send him to Toba City. And go with him to explore the so-called secret door. Leon nodded and signaled to Adai's that he could leave. Of course, there is nothing wrong with this job. This is just using Bridget's plan to deceive Leon. It is not difficult at all. It is just a word. Although Edie's knew that Leon was going to counter ambush Bridget, as long as he was not allowed to stab his employer to death with his own hands, it would be fine. As long as he paid off the debt he owed to Bridget, Bridget would no longer be his employer. After that, no matter how Leon dealt with Bridge, it had nothing to do with him. 
So the Sinjar Rider rode back to Toba City again with a huge money bag. With Lisa Dillon watching secretly, Edies did not dare to take the money and run away. Not long after, Lisa Dillon returned with clothes. Sir, that attic did enter Toba City through a secret door from the west. It seems that Bridget was well prepared to deceive you. That door should be used to transport feces out of the city. It is indeed possible to ride a horse. Even carriages can come and go. Rasadalan first described the secret door, and then asked the Lord. But, sir, do you really think that Edis can do as you say? He doesn't seem to be suitable for lying. And he seems to like to do it himself. Claim. I don't care at all whether he will do what I say. As long as he returns the 3,000 dinars to Bridget. That's it. Do you think Bridget will think that I handed it over to Adis? The money must be much more than the 3,000 dinars? It's even so much that Adis doesn't care about the 3,000 dinars anymore. Leon shook his head and said, I just need Bridget to believe that I will really attack from the secret door. I don't need anything else. I hope he can survive. In fact, he should be a kind person. Edis probably didn't realize that Leon asked him to bring the 3,000 dinars just to prove that Leon had believed the attack through the secret door. Scam passed by Edis. After all, Edis pretended to be Ramon's subordinate to pass on information. And Leon paid him a large sum of money, which looked like he was settling the balance for Ramon. This meant that Leon believed Edis' words. This is of course to convince Bridget that Leon will indeed attack from the secret door tomorrow night. He will definitely place the main force near the secret door. And he will definitely guard the secret door all night. Then, Leon can launch a direct frontal attack the day after tomorrow. And then send elites to carry out a flanking attack from the secret door when Bridget transfers the exhausted troops to the front wall. Useful tactics are often not too complicated. When it is determined that the enemy's main force is exhausted, attacking the city from the front is also a good choice. The time limit for Li Ang's attack on the secret door may only differ by half a day. But this half day is likely to be fatal to Bridget. The accurate time limit is actually the time of day. However, this will actually put Edis in danger. Bridger may torture Edis and ask where the other money is. After all, in Bridger's opinion, if a big boss like Ramon can proactively provide intelligence services, then Leon will definitely settle a large sum of money for Ramon. Moreover, Brigi also knew that Ramon was auctioning the city lord. This kind of matter involving the city lord's position must involve far more than 3,000 dinars. In fact, this is also the reason why Leon must kill Bridget. It's not because Bridget tried to control Leon with poison, nor because of this guy's immoral way of acting, but because Bridget caught Ramon's men and must have asked a lot of things from Ramon's men. Since Adis can know the contact information agreed between Ramon and Leon, it means that Ramon's men should have confessed everything they knew after being caught. However, Ramon probably didn't tell his subordinates about the auction of Bahad Khan's throne. So Edis or Bridge thought that Leon came to Desha to launch the Battle of Dignity. In fact, most people may think so. After all, the Principality of Dexia was once a vassal principality of the Kingdom of Pendor. And the Kingdom of Lion has always claimed to be inherited from the Kingdom of Pender. Although Desha became independent in the second year after the establishment of the Lysher Kingdom, the Lysher Kingdom will certainly not recognize its independence. Each generation of Lysher King will not regard the rulers of Dexia as equal monarchs. After all, the kingdom you still have to save your face. The capital was attacked by a former vassal state, and it was necessary for the Lion Kingdom to launch a counterattack. Otherwise, it will appear that the Lion Kingdom is weak and other countries may find excuses to declare war, if they are equal countries, such as the Kingdom of Lion and the Empire of Bacchus. They can show weakness to lure the enemy, they can endure hardships, or they can admit defeat. It's no problem. But facing the former vassal country, one cannot show weakness. Not at all. This is the face of the kingdom. The capital of the Lion Kingdom was attacked by Bahad Khan Kadin. So the Lion Kingdom should attack Toba City, the capital of Dexia, and either kill Kadin or capture Toba. Anyway, at least Cardin's territory must be turned upside down. This is not only a retaliatory counterattack, but also the reaction that the Lion Kingdom should have when facing provocation. Cardin probably thought so too. Which is why he hired Bridget to strengthen Toba City's military strength. But the problem is that the Marshal of the Lion Kingdom is Leon. Leon actually doesn't care much about the reputation of the Lion Kingdom. He cares more about more practical things. Such as your own safety, and whether your plan will succeed. Bridget knew too much. In order to avoid any accidents in the plan, Bridget must die in Toba City. Late at night, 
in Toba City. Edis has already met Bridget, as Leong expected. Eight eyes had been tied up, and the 3,000 dinars had fallen into Brigi's hands. But Brigi did not think that this was a debt repaid by eight eyes. Edis, you should understand that this is a mission, and I should distribute the spoils obtained during the mission. This is my rule here. Tell me, where did you hide the other dinars? Brigi held a whip in his hand and looked a little ferocious. Nothing else. That's a dot, and this isn't a trophy. This is my unexpected income. Bridget, let me go. I've paid off my debt, and you are no longer my employer. Edie's gritted his teeth and widened his eyes. It was obvious that Bridget's behavior exceeded his expectations. Okay, even if I'm not your employer, dot, but I can make you owe me money again at any time. Give him medicine. Bridge stood behind Adai's, swung the whip and struck Adai's on the back several times, and then directed a woman to give Adai's medicine. The woman was wearing a half-covered helmet, and the part above her mouth was hidden in the helmet, so her face could not be seen. This should be Bridget's omen seeker. What is this? I don't eat this. Adai's gritted his teeth and turned to dodge, but the woman grabbed her chin and raised her head. This action caused Adai's to look up from the bottom and see the face of the omen searcher through the half-covered helmet. It's you? Adai's stopped struggling and stared closely at the omen searcher. Are you Bridget's subordinate? Did you lie to me according to Bridget's order from the beginning? Bridget! You bastard! Uh-huh! The omen searcher didn't say anything, but seemed to smile contemptuously, poured a cup of dark liquid into Edie's mouth, and blocked his chattering mouth. I said, I can make you owe me money at any time. Edie's, tell me where is the dinar that Leon gave you? There is no way he only gave Ramon 3,000 dinars. Bridge seemed to believe that Edie's had hidden more money, and he cracked the whip again. But Adai stopped talking. Just looked at the omen searcher in front of him with red eyes. Gritted his teeth and endured the whipping without saying a word. This kind of torture will be fruitless after all. After all, Adai's really didn't hide any money. In the end, Bridger could only put Edis in prison in Toba City. Of course he would not kill Adai's. After all, he felt that Adai's must have hidden a lot of dinars. He would wait until Adai's drug addiction hit. And then, there would be consequences for asking anything. But the next afternoon, Edis was gone. To be precise, Edis escaped from the prison in Toba City. He was able to quietly knock out the sentries outside the Leon military camp. His skills were actually very good. Bridget was unaware of Edis' escape because he was busy setting up an ambush near the secret door. At the same time, Liang's troops began to slowly march towards Toba City. The attack was launched in the afternoon. This kind of movement was obviously unreasonable. Normally, the attackers would advance early in the morning. We set out in the afternoon, and when we got to the city, we had to arrange siege equipment. I'm afraid it would already be dark by the time we were ready to attack the city. This situation also means that Liang's army should not launch a frontal attack. Brigi strengthened his confidence. He felt that Liang was just using the army as a cover, and he must enter the city through the secret door. So he deployed most of his elite troops to ambush near the river in the west of the city and in the slums in the city. That is, on both sides of the secret door. Liang's army did not attack the city. They were just concentrating on building siege facilities. Bridget waited all night near the secret door. And a troop did indeed arrive. Those were actually about 200 people led by Lisa Dillon. They were not elite soldiers. But some new recruits, who were responsible for night guard and odd jobs. Rasadalan led them around the secret door. Neither getting closer nor moving away. There was only starlight at night. And the lights were dark. Bridget thought that these were probably the elite troops brought by Liang. So he kept working hard to prepare for the battle. But this team kept going back and forth. But never came in. Which made Bridge feel empty. As a result, Bridget and his elite men had been lying in wait near the secret door all night. But Lisa Dillon only took the new recruits for the whole night. Chapter 277 Meeting Dusk Again So he immediately closed the secret door and rushed to the front wall with his men who were ambushing here to redefense. But his men had been squatting in the wild and in various corners all night, and had been maintaining a high degree of tension. Now they were exhausted. Only at this time did they urgently move the defense area. This group of people basically seemed to have lost their souls. No matter how elite the troops are, they won't have much fighting power left in this situation. After all, people need to rest. So Rasadalan wandered around with the new recruits, who did odd jobs at night, because they didn't have to participate in the battle during the day. But Bridget was obviously not prepared for this. In addition, all of Bridget's people, including Bridget himself, are drug addicts. 
although after weaning them off the drugs, these drug-addicted guys would indeed go crazy when fighting. The problem was that they didn't fight at all that night. They just fed mosquitoes. The biggest problem for addicts is that they get sleepy and tired easily. Perhaps they still possess skilled combat skills. But the poison has long corroded their endurance and weakened their acumen and will as warriors. Even under normal schedules, these guys are yawning all day long, let alone staying up all night. Therefore, this group of weak drug addicts now have to fight but have no fighting spirit and have no physical strength. They have stopped taking the drug for a day and a half longer than expected. And most of them are now in a state of having green eyes and garlic on their feet. In fact, Bridget made a wrong decision that seemed right at this time. This was probably a small mistake that most people didn't realize. He shouldn't have let these drug addicts, who had been lying in wait all night and were in a state of exhaustion go up to the city wall to set up defenses. Because there were originally some defenders on the city wall. And they were Cardin's elite troops the Dexia Wind Riders. Although Cardin took away most of his troops, he still left dozens of Wind Riders in Toba City, as well as more than 300 Dexia Juechen, led by the Wind Riders. Wind Rider is a title that can only be obtained by sharpshooters who are good at riding and shooting. This is Cardin's personal guard unit. The name of this pro-army unit is also called Wind Rider Chapter. This is the result of Cardin's implementation of his hereditary feudal lord system in Dexia. The status of Windriders in Desha is generally equivalent to that of knights in other countries in Pinder. Like ordinary knights, these Windriders also have their own retinues, or sergeants, who cooperate in combat. The sergeant unit they led is called Juechen ones. But Juechen is not a mounted archer. Accurate mounted shooting in a desert environment is much more difficult than in the plains. And not everyone can learn it. The Juechen are fast cavalry. They usually fight with swords, shields or lances which can perfectly cooperate with the Wind Riders, who are good at riding and shooting. In their familiar desert environment, the Wind Riders chapter's fighting prowess is considerable, although they are defending the city at this time rather than the desert, which is more suitable for them to exert their combat power. The skilled Wind Warriors are still very reliable. Even though there are only a few hundred people, the city defense is well laid out and looks very good. It may cause considerable trouble for Liang's army, but at this time, Bridget sent his exhausted troops to the city walls. This did replenish the manpower of the city defense. But after those weak drug addicts occupied the positions originally guarded by the wind warriors, they caused various problems in the city defense. These guys who stopped taking their medicine for two or three days were exhausted physically and mentally and were confused and confused, disrupted the original reasonable arrangements of the wind riders. These yawning guys don't even know when to place thornwood or when to plug the gaps. They all scurry around the city wall like headless flies. Not only that, these guys from Sinjar also had conflicts with the Dexia Wind Riders. The Dexia Wind Riders actually realized that the city defense had been disrupted. So they kept cursing people and eagerly planned to kill the Sinjar people who were in an unreasonable position. Or the temptresses rushed to the right place. Of course, the Wind Riders will be impatient. Liang's army has already begun to attack the city. But these drug addicts are in the way here. So of course, their actions are more rough. They even wish that these drug addicts would die quickly to avoid getting in the way. The Wind Riders and the Sinjar people have different beliefs and nationalities. Even in normal times, conflicts would easily arise. And Brigi's men are now tired and crazy. As a result, they actually started fighting among themselves. You need to be rational to defend the city. It is not feasible to rely on a group of guys who are crazy due to drug withdrawal. Moreover, more troops are not always better. If Cardin himself was in the city, he would definitely be aware of the problem. And Cardin can also make everyone obey orders completely. But the thing is that Cardin wasn't there. He did go to single. Bridget was unable to command Cardin's personal guards. And the Desha Windriders simply looked down upon this magic stick who controlled the troops through poison and deception. At this time, there was neither a reasonable city defense deployment nor a unified commander on the city of Toba. There was even a fight between a group of single spearmen and the Desha Wind Riders on top of the city. At this time, Leon was leading the army in trying the first wave of tentative attacks. He did not send the main force in this wave of attacks, because it was originally just to test the strength of Toba City's city defense, and also to keep the attack going so that Brigi's troops in the city would be more exhausted and unable to repair. But what Leon didn't expect was that this tentative attack with a second-line force composed of other lords and knights actually succeeded in scaling the city wall and gained a foothold on the city wall. The enemy was not even able to drive down the troops who had attacked the city. 
This second line army actually occupied half of the city wall, which also included two arrow towers and a military station. This means that the army can continuously mount the wall if the military station on this wall is captured. In fact, the defenders in the city will not be able to mount the wall. There is a military station on each city wall, which is not only a place for troops to be stationed, but also a military station in the city. The passage for people to climb the city wall. The city's defense strength was much lower than expected, and the enemy troops in the city were still fighting with each other at this time. And it was definitely not a show, because Liang saw with his own eyes that several single spearmen were chopped off from the city wall by the Dexia Wind Rider and fell on the ground outside the city. Two of them survived, rolling and groaning in pain below the city. The Lord feels that it is quite unreal at this time. Is it such a childish thing? After all, Toba City is also the capital of Dexia. In the face of a large army attacking the city, you actually still have thoughts of internal strife? Do you look down on me? Sir, this is a good opportunity. Let's attack directly. Even Close realized something was wrong in the city and began to take the initiative to ask for help. So Leon simply stopped trying. In this situation, he could fully demonstrate his bravery as a marshal. Of course, the most important thing is not to let those small lords lead the second line troops to capture the city. The one who breaks the city must be Liang himself. Otherwise it will be easy to argue over the loot. So Liang drew his sword and decided to lead the army to attack the city himself. Silver hand, follow me forward. Kill! Close shouted and led his brothers to follow Liang and start climbing the siege ladder. The army began to make a noise. And Liang's entire elite troops were dispatched. The siege was much more powerful than before and the entire city wall was completely conquered within 10 minutes. The Wind Riders no longer fought with Breeji's men. They abandoned the city wall and all retreated into the streets and alleys of the city. But Bridget's men were not so rational. This group of drug addicts did not retreat. But they actually showed a certain degree of fighting power at this time. When IQ was no longer needed and only chaos was needed. These drug addicts went crazy because of drug withdrawal. The people do have pretty good lethality. But it was already too late. After occupying the city wall, Liang's troops instead caused damage from a high position. Although Bridget's drug addicts were crazy, their fatigue and terrain disadvantages were irreparable to madness. The Silver Hand kept advancing, and after creating hundreds of corpses, they quickly cleared the area near the city wall. Liang's griffin flag has been planted on the city wall. The city gate has been opened, and large troops from outside the city have begun to enter the city. It looks like Toba City is about to be captured. At this time, the sun was only halfway up in the sky, and less than two hours had passed since Leon launched his attack. Sir, you'd better not rush into the city. I'll just go and plant your flag on the inner castle. Behind Leon, the person holding the big flag was still Jocelyn. This former Twilight Knight has now become the official flag bearer. It seems that he values this honorary position very much and behaves very conscientiously. That's right. Sir, you can just watch the battle from the city wall and leave the rest to us. These people are not worthy of your personal action. Close also expressed the same opinion. Of course, Leon did not refuse the goodwill shown to him by his men. But he just said, Close, you are responsible for capturing the material warehouses in the city, especially Carden's treasury. Jocelyn, you are responsible for capturing Toba's city, the inner castle, but I need to take over the royal court of Bahad Khan in its entirety. So don't destroy that place. The two men led their troops to rush into the city. Close took the silver hand to find the silver bank, while Jocelyn took Liang's non-commissioned officers to the direction of the inner castle, and Liang stayed in the military station on the city wall. Lisa Dillon also returned with the new recruits who had harassed Brigi all night. At this time, they became the left-behind personnel in the camp outside the city, and they needed to catch up on their sleep. Everything seemed to be going very smoothly, but at this moment, Leon heard an unusual voice. Rebellion. Die. It was a sound coming from the streets in the city. It was normal to have such a roar on the battlefield. But the problem was that the sound was not too loud. But it was very clear and could overwhelm the entire building in the chaotic and noisy battlefield. The city's cry of killing was obviously very unusual. This was exactly the same cry that Sir Roland had made. Moreover, after the sound was made, Leon saw his handsome flag fall. The distance was far and the streets and alleys in the city blocked the view from the street. Leon could only see the conspicuous handsome flag on the city wall, which was also Jocelyn's position. The handsome flag fell. This is a big deal. Under normal circumstances, 
the flag officer or the flag bearer next to the flag officer will quickly raise the flag again in this case, so as not to cause the troops in other positions to think that the front army has been defeated. If the control is not good and the commander's flag is never raised again, it is very likely that the rear army will evolve into an inexplicable route. But Leon waited for a full minute, and the flag was still not raised again. Something happened to Jocelyn. Leon immediately got off the city wall and rushed to Jocelyn's location with Wendy. Jocelyn was really in trouble at the moment. He still wore two layers of heavy armor, but he didn't ride a horse to fight in the city. His Nagata war beast had no effect other than blocking the road. In any case, he was holding the flag and had no intention of fighting, and the heavy armor on his body was enough to block the sabers of the Dexia people. His two layers of composite armor were really thick, although it was quite difficult to walk after wearing them. The Dexia people without riding horses really couldn't cut him, so Jocelyn never paid attention to the Dexia people's saber. If it didn't have the speed of the horse, it would be like scraping him. However, when a group of knights wearing devil horn helmets and black armor suddenly appeared from the alley, Jocelyn didn't dare to be so boastful anymore. That was his former comrade, Twilight Rider. Jocelyn dot the rebel must die. The leading Twilight Knight was extremely skilled. He stabbed the two non-commissioned officers next to Jocelyn with his knight's sword and quickly cut off the team in the street fight. Other Dusk Knights also swarmed up to block the soldiers behind. These Dusk Knights are well equipped and very skilled. Jocelyn was already in the streets. And the troops behind him. They were unable to break through for a while. Leaving Jocelyn under siege. The handsome flag must be unable to be raised. The double-layered heavy armor on his body restricted Jocelyn's skills at this time. The Twilight Knight's sword is different from the saber. Jocelyn blocked left and right. But the weight was too heavy, and he was not flexible enough which made him quite passive. Alistair, you actually helped the Desha people fight? Jocelyn shouted angrily. I'm just chasing the rebels. The Dusk Knight known as Alistair shook his head, raised his sword again, and stabbed Jocelyn. Fart! Rushing into the battlefield of the army to hunt down the rebels? Alistair, do you think I'm a fool? Jocelyn struggled to block Alistair's sword, and the two Dusk Knight swords met at the hilts and began to wrestle. You are a fool to begin with. What did the rebellion of becoming a knight bring you? It seems that you don't know what you gave up. Alistair forcefully glanced the two swords to his side, drew out the sword in a flash, broke away from the wrestling situation, and launched the attack again. Jocelyn stopped talking. His martial arts skills were probably equal to those of Alistair, but he carried too much weight and consumed more energy than Alistair. He did not dare to be distracted anymore. Moreover, there were several Twilight Knights behind him, but these knights did not attack Jocelyn. Instead, they stared at the back of the street, seeming to maintain this one-on-one -on -one battle. Jocelyn, if you surrender and follow me back to Sinjar, I may be able to give you a chance to survive. Alistair was still chattering and attacking, but it seemed that he didn't want other Twilight Knights to interfere in the battle between him and Jocelyn. Otherwise, he would have had several other Twilight Knights swarm up and resolve the battle. Alistair, daughter, are you trying to tease me? I know what I will face when I return to Sinjar, Jocelyn said breathlessly. He managed to hold on in this situation for several minutes. The thick armor consumed too much of his strength, and his steps were no longer flexible. At this time, Jocelyn could no longer block Alistair's sword. Alistair's sword did stab Jocelyn's neck. But at this moment, a Nolder arrow fell from the sky and penetrated Alistair's sword-holding arm. Chapter 278 For the Right to First Night Leon came from the roof. The roofs of the Dexia people are different from those in the Lysha realm. The houses here have all flat roofs. The rainfall in this place is small, so there is no need for sloping tiles. The roof is generally used to drive things and has a relatively strong load-bearing capacity. A few Dexia wind riders were shooting arrows on the roof at this time, and Liang's men were constantly attacking them. Since there was still street fighting at this time and the street was not smooth, Wendy took the lead on the roof, which was the shortest and fastest straight line between the two points. Then Leon began to walk in a straight line from the roof, and then discovered a situation that he had never noticed. His reflexes seemed to be greatly strengthened. The houses in Toba City are relatively dense, and Leon and Wendy are flying from above like two parkour partners, jumping from one roof to another from time to time. If it were normal, Leon would probably not dare to jump like this. He has never learned parkour. Although he is quite flexible, the most important thing to master this skill is not physical skills but the need to overcome psychological barriers. People are all afraid of heights, being unable to pass, pain, and injury. 
because they are afraid that they cannot do it. Their movements will become deformed, and they really cannot do it. Moreover, most people don't know themselves well. They don't know exactly how far they can jump, nor how long they can take to make correct reactions and actions, nor do they have the ability to develop various actions into instincts. So I will keep thinking and hesitating, and I will not be able to connect the actions together. Those parkour masters have actually overcome the fear in their hearts and have a very good understanding of their own bodies. Coupled with long-term training, they have the ability to make almost instinctive reactions in fast movements. But now, Leong found that he seemed to have no mental barriers and had that instinctive reaction. He could even follow Wendy running at full speed on the rooftop. As if he and Wendy had the same reflexes. Perhaps this was an unexpected gain brought to him by Wendy's blood and dragon tears? Has your agility improved? Leon guessed. However, Wendy's movements were as light as a cat. But when Leon jumped from the roof to Alistair, it was like a wild boar landing on the ground. The ground even shook twice, kicking up a large amount of dust. It seems that the reaction and agility have indeed improved. But the skills are still far from the same. But this cumbersome landing method has a very good combat effect. Several dusk knights took a step back. No one wanted this strong man who jumped from the roof to fall on their heads. The Twilight Knights thought how brave they are. They actually dare to come and cause trouble when the army is attacking the city. Leong stood in front of Jocelyn, pointing the sword in his hand in a circle, and finally pointed at Alistair. In fact, when he jumped from the roof, he didn't see so many people jumping off. Only then did he realize that there were several Twilight Knights leaning against the wall. He couldn't see them on the roof. However, of course, you can't show your timidity at this time. And there is no need to show your timidity. After all, Liang's other teams will be here soon. After shooting an arrow to save Jocelyn, Wendy blew the assembly horn on the roof and shot a loud arrow into the air to summon Liang's main force here. The rally call sounded, and the sounding arrow also appeared in the air. It seems that you are Earl Leon. Lord Earl is indeed very courageous. Come on! Alistair covered his injured arm and issued an order. And a dozen Twilight Knights finally swarmed up but not at Jocelyn, who is raising the flag again, but at Leong. Are you here specifically to deal with me? Leong heard the meaning of Alistair's words. They attacked Jocelyn on the battlefield, not to hunt down the traitors of the Twilight Knights, but to bring down their own flag and lure them over. In order to get here quickly, there was only Wendy beside Leong. He originally only needed to determine what kind of enemy he encountered at Jocelyn's location. After all, his troops were everywhere in the city. If you can deal with it, Blow the rally trumpet and shoot loud arrows to attract the troops. If you can't deal with it, let Wendy blow the horn for the entire army to retreat. And then run away. You really don't need to bring anyone with you. As too many people will get in the way. And Leon jumped to the street. Which meant that Leon thought he could deal with it. After all, he only saw a few twilight nights. Count Leon, you have become an obstacle to the goddess. We are here at the will of the goddess. Alistair spoke quite righteously and he raised the sword in his hand again. But as soon as he raised the sword, he felt pain and put it down. The wound on his arm that was penetrated by the arrow was still bleeding. So Alistair took a few steps back and did not join the battle again. Goddess? You mean Arena? Huh? Leon waved his sword to repel the combined attacks of the two Twilight Knights and stood back to back with Jocelyn. Surrounding them were a dozen Twilight Knights. But these dozen masters were unable to do anything to Leon for a moment. Liang's sword was extremely sharp, and every blow was so powerful and heavy that it could even cut off the Dusk Knight's sword directly. In fact, as soon as he handed it over, Liang's heart was already half at peace, because he is determined that the people of the Twilight Knights dare not kill him. The attacks launched by the Twilight Knights are not aimed at his vital points. In fact, if you think about it for a while, you can understand that if you die, none of Alistair and these Twilight Knights will be able to leave Toba City alive. They can only capture themselves alive. Therefore, Leong seemed very active. Even if he was fighting more than a dozen at a time, he still played vigorously. Coupled with Wendy, who was jumping around on the roof and shooting arrows, and Jocelyn, who had recovered his strength, the dozen or so members of the Twilight Knights were gradually at a disadvantage. After Leong cut off several swords in succession, the Twilight Knights hesitated a little. Bridge! How long do you want to wait? At this time, Alistair once again let out that cry with mysterious power. As soon as the voice fell, the Twilight Knights who were intercepting the sergeants behind them all retreated. And a large group of people completely trapped Leon. 
behind the twilight nights. Bridget appeared from several houses with a team of omen hunters, blocking Leon's troops on the other side of the street. At the same time, a group of troops in black rushed over from behind Alistair. They were the servants of the Twilight Knights. The Twilight Slaves. These Twilight Slaves only came out at this time. It was obvious that Alistair had planned this in order to prevent Leong from showing up due to too many people here. In this alley that was only a few meters wide, people from the Twilight Knights were blocked at both ends. Leon and Jocelyn were surrounded in the middle. Some omen searchers also appeared on the roof, forcing Wendy down onto the street. The enemy created a local numerical advantage. And this advantage seemed quite large. There were almost four to five hundred people surrounding three people. Leon, Jocelyn, and Wendy. This scene is really troublesome. You can barely fight against a dozen of them. But it's really impossible to fight hundreds of them. Although Liang's army must have begun to gather here. No amount of troops will be effective in this case. Just like Leon himself kidnapped Justice and Levius. I am Alistair. Count Leon. How about you put down your sword and follow me? You are already trapped here by us. Even if your army gathers here, it will only cause more damage to your reputation. Seeing that his men were surrounding Leon, Alistair had a smile on his face and took two steps back again. This guy was very cautious. When the situation was so good, he moved further away from the Lord. Oh, it seems that I really have nowhere to escape. In that case, why don't you let me die and understand? Leon looked at Alistair and lowered the sword in his hand. The current situation was indeed not good. He tried to delay for a while to allow his troops to break through the blockade of the Omen Seekers. And to get some useful information by the way. You have become a threat to the goddess. Okay. Let me be more direct. Alistair probably felt that the situation was settled. And he had a look of pride on his face. Count Leon. Your strength has grown too fast. And many people want your life. The most important thing is that you have been fighting with the goddess. His servants are enemies. Servant of the goddess dot you mean the three prophets? Leong has not forgotten that when he first met Twilight Knight Jocelyn, the fake Igor with a different face was obviously the work of the three prophets. And Jocelyn's mission at that time was actually to protect the fake Igor. In this case, the three prophets obviously have some trouble or cooperation with the Twilight Knights. It's just that Jocelyn didn't know the specific situation. So he didn't understand it at the time. And Leong did have a grudge against the three prophets. He defeated the three prophets when he first arrived in Chunga town. If Lehman hadn't come to intercept Huan King Ulrich's order, the three prophets would have died in Liang's hands. After obtaining Chunga town, Leon also asked Father and Granlon to find the lair of the three prophets. Although this was just to put the blame for stealing the king's seal on the three prophets, it must have caused a lot of trouble for the three prophets. Trouble. To be honest, the three prophets did not take the initiative to provoke Leon. It was indeed Leon who took the initiative to become an enemy of the three prophets. Now that Alistair was talking about the servants of the goddess Arita, Leon naturally thought of the three prophets. Huh? Maybe it's the king? Count Leon, your territory is no less than that of the king. Alistair did not answer directly, but took a step closer with a smile. Count Leon, put down your sword and follow me. I don't want to kill you. That will cause me to be chased by your men. But I think you probably don't want your troops to be counterattacked by Bridget. Right. As he said this, he pointed to the other side of the street that was intercepting those who were searching for omens. It is true that Leong is trapped here, and the large army will definitely not dare to attack the Twilight Knights. But Bridget's team can counterattack without any scruples. At this time, the army has become a constraint for Leong. King, come out to disrupt the situation when I am about to capture Toba City? Huh? If you are talking about the prince or princess, then I can understand it. Leong did not put down the sword in his hand. He kept looking into Alistair's eyes. When he mentioned princess, he noticed some subtle changes in Alistair's eyes. The change was very small, but Leon still noticed it. The look in Alistair's eyes, like one of surprise, flashed away. Is it the princess? Leon figured out everything at once. The queen of the Lion Kingdom passed away a few years ago, and Ulrich adopted a new princess a few days ago. It is said that she is young, beautiful, smart and virtuous. But the king did not hold any grand banquet this time. And even powerful lords like Leon or Godric did not receive invitations. Now it seems that this young and beautiful princess may have a deep relationship with the three prophets. And may even be one of the three prophets. It seems that their skills are getting better and better. And even Ulrich can be fooled. If this is the case, 
then we must fight to the death. If it falls into the hands of the three prophets, it is better to die early. Leon can even think of what the three prophets will do to him. I am afraid that his skin will appear on another person. Right? Alistair, have you ever thought about Dot what would happen to the Twilight Knights if I escaped? Leon glanced around and began to figure out how to escape. I'm curious about why you would deal with the Marshal of a Kingdom. You should be able to imagine the risk. Why do I feel that your Twilight Knights are being used as swords? Already? If I can get Chang'e Town as my territory, do you think it's worth taking such a risk? Alistair smiled and looked at Jocelyn. Jocelyn, do you now know what you gave up by rebelling against the Knights? Huh? You could have enjoyed wealth and wealth in Chang'e Town. And even had the right to have the first knight. I'm not interested in your customs and hobbies in Buckley. Alistair, you're a scumbag. Jocelyn was unmoved. Then you will become a prisoner that I whip for fun at the banquet. Jocelyn, I originally thought you would look back. I actually care about our comradeship back then. After being called a scumbag by Jocelyn, the smile on Alistair's face disappeared and his tone changed to a threat. Then you have to catch me alive first. Jocelyn turned his head away and ignored Alistair. Alistair, you just said dot the right of first night? Why don't I remember that the Lord of the Lion Kingdom has this privilege? Leon was still looking around, thinking about how to escape while talking. But Alistair was now several meters away from him. Wendy behind him snorted, obviously very unhappy about the right of first night. It can be understood from this name that this is a privilege enjoyed by noble lords in certain places. That is, they can enjoy the bride's first night when people in the territory get married. Generally, a big country like Buckley granted some newly conquered territories far away from the sea to attract nobles, to lead troops and serve as lords to maintain their rule. However, several countries in the Pander continent do not have this statement. As early as the time of the late King Kavala, this kind of privilege that easily inspired civil rebellion was completely abolished. It is true that there was no kingdom of lions before. But what if the kingdom of lions is no longer the kingdom of lions? Huh? How many plump young girls are there in your Chang'e town? Earl Leon. I mean the fleshy ones. That firewood girl behind you doesn't count. There was some longing in Alistair's eyes. And he seemed to be quite yearning for the right to have the first knight and the fat girl he was about to get. Wendy glanced sideways at Alistair and tightened the sword in her hand. She obviously had some objections to the phrase, Firewood Girl. Chapter 279 Confiscation of Crime Tools So, this matter has something to do with the Buckley Empire? As far as I know, only Buckley will grant the right of first knight to the Lord who is willing to transfer the title to the Cross Sea Enclave. Liang's eyes no longer looked around, and he saw what seemed to be a faint shadow in a room behind Alistair. It was a dilapidated house with no windows, and the light inside the door was extremely poor. The figure was somewhat hidden inside the door, but you could vaguely see what gestures he was making, and that figure seemed familiar. The Lord did not stare at the house all the time. He turned around and looked at the other Dusk Knights. Fortunately, they all wore full coverage devil horn helmets. Such helmets only left a slit forward for the eyes, which was definitely not good for vision. No one should have noticed there. Count Leon. You will know the specific reason when you come back to Lion City with me. In fact, we really don't want to hurt you. To be precise, we hope you can join the organization. We are even willing to let you become Dusk. Knight Commander of the Knight's Order. Alistair seemed unwilling to say anything more, but pointed to the sword in Liang's hand and motioned for Leon to put it down. Leon nodded. In that case, you should at least tell me who is the Grand Leader of the Twilight Knights? Who will be my immediate boss in the future? Actually, you know him. But for his safety, I can't tell you now. Count Leon, we will not abuse you. And we have even prepared treatment for you that is consistent with your status. Seeing that Leon didn't seem to be going to resist, Alistair smiled and waved his hand. Of course, this is just to prevent you from hurting us or yourself. We all know your strong fighting power. As Alistair waved, another Dusk Knight came forward with a shackle, holding it up to signal to Leon. The shackles were exquisitely made, and the inner layer was covered with leather. It seemed that they were indeed the most humane treatment for prisoners, at least considering that they would not scratch Liang's wrists. So Leon sighed and nodded. Okay, I can go with you. But where are you going to take me now? This city is full of my troops. The Lord even bowed and put the sword on the ground, turned his back to Alistair, and put his hands behind his back, as if he was about to take the initiative. Wendy and Jocelyn did not expect that Leon would make such a surrender-like gesture, and turned around to look at Leon in horror. 
but they saw a look in Liang's eyes. The Lord's eyes glanced at the windowless house. The location of that house was right behind Alistair. Just when the Dusk Knight stepped forward and was about to clasp the shackles on Liang's wrists, Wendy suddenly put a hand on Liang's shoulders, used her hands and feet to fly up at the same time, and Leon also stood up suddenly, put his hands on Wendy's feet, and threw Wendy over his head, towards Alistair's position. Ah! At the same time, Jocelyn suddenly roared like a mad cow and launched a charge, rushing straight towards Alistair, even completely ignoring the two Twilight Knights who were about to intercept with their swords hastily. The Twilight Knight behind Leon still held shackles in his hand, and when he saw something was wrong, he was about to draw his sword. But Leon directly kicked him to the ground, then rolled over and grabbed his sword from the ground. Then, without stopping, he swooped down and slashed towards Alistair's position with his sword. This was when Leon was already captured, and when Alistair and the Twilight Knights had just relaxed. The other Twilight Knights around were just on guard against Liang's sudden escape. Liang's back was turned to Alistair. Who would have thought that his target was still Alistair? So, Wendy in the sky, Leon on the ground, and Jocelyn Alistair swooping in from the middle face to combined attack from three people. And it happened when he didn't expect it at all. This was high-level treatment. And it was for a man who had been shot in the arm. Alistair reacted very quickly. He was stunned for only half a second and then immediately started to retreat in a hurry. His arm was injured, so he definitely couldn't fight. He couldn't beat any of these three people now, but it was too late. The other Twilight Knights reacted a little slower for a second. When they came to their senses, Wendy had already flied above Alistair's head. She still used a straightforward somersault before landing, and while she was in an inverted state in the air, she volleyed again with a stunning sword, targeting Alistair's neck just like when she killed Castro. As done. However, this sword failed to kill Alistair. In fact, Alistair did not block Wendy's sword. But the Dust Knight was so lucky that he tripped when he hurriedly retreated and was lucky enough to avoid Wendy's stunt. When Alistair fell on his back, he watched Wendy fly over his head and Wendy's sword almost passed by the tip of his nose. This obviously scared him a lot. So he subconsciously twisted his waist to dodge while falling. In fact, it was only then that he realized that he had to dodge this sword. Sometimes it may not be considered lucky if you are not killed by a sword. Because Leong, who was rushing towards the ground, also slashed out a sword at this time. And the Lord could not hold back his hand. Originally, the Lord's sword was aimed at cutting off the legs. After all, it was a ground sword. But Alistair was in the process of falling to the ground. And he half-twisted his body. As a result, the sword hit Alistair firmly in the crotch. Ah! Boom! Alistair's sharp scream and the dull sound of landing sounded one after another. Then, a large amount of blood spurted out from between his legs. The Twilight Knight armor has turned into crotchless pants, which looks very neat. The opening is indeed in the middle, which is quite symmetrical. At this time, Jocelyn had also rushed over. When he saw this, he breaks suddenly and took a breath of cold air. This scene was too tragic. Alistair would obviously not die but he would definitely not be able to enjoy anything in the future. It's the first night, and the fat girl can't be touched anymore. The Lord Sword probably split his crime tool into two. In fact, the other Twilight Knights were all stunned, and some even glanced at a certain part of themselves. The scene was quiet for a moment, but the battle didn't end there. The other Twilight Knights finally reacted and started chasing him. It's just that they all seem to have their shields covering their lower bodies. It seems that although Alistair is the leader of these Twilight Knights, the other Twilight Knights will not stop because of him. It seems that the mission of the Twilight Knights this time is much more important than the leader's life. The crisis facing Leon has not been resolved. However, fortunately, the Lord did not just want to capture Alistair. After all, it is amazing that three people move together in the sky and on the ground. The dark figure in the house behind Alistair must also notice the actions of Leon and others. He did start to cooperate in that house. A figure of a single man appeared and began to shoot arrows. That's Edie's. In the two or three seconds from when Wendy took off to when Alistair fell, Adai's had already shot at least five feather arrows in a row. Each arrow accurately drove back a man who was chasing Leon, the Twilight Knight of others. Although the armor of the Twilight Knights is quite thick and may not cause much damage when shot, Edie's arrows were all aimed at the face. The shields in the hands of the Twilight Knights were held relatively low and their heads were completely exposed. Outside, this ultra-fast rapid fire is not very powerful, 
and cannot actually cause effective damage. But the oncoming arrows will always make people subconsciously avoid them. Had eyes bought more time for the Lord. Perhaps this time was only two seconds, but it was enough for the quick moving Wendy. As soon as she landed, she made another swooping move like a sitic cat, pounced directly into the dark house, and started shooting arrows out. Nolder arrows don't just scratch an itch, they actually kill. Edie's fired quickly, and Wendy clicked to kill, which gave Leon more time and space. The Lord also rolled from the ground into the house, and even had time to drag Alistair, who collapsed on the ground. Go in. After Jocelyn rushed over, he used himself as a shield to stop several Twilight Knights who were chasing after him. The two layers of heavy armor on his body finally had a positive effect at this time. But Jocelyn still suffered a sword wound from this. Hurt on the butt. At this time, Adai's once again showed extremely fast reactions. He did not perform rapid fire again, but flew out of the angle and shot over the last Dusk Knight who was chasing Jocelyn with an arrow from the side. Adai's archery skills were definitely not as good as Wendy's. But this arrow was very timely, because the Twilight Knight whom he shot over was the one who stabbed Jocelyn in the butt. If Eddie's hadn't taken action in time, Jocelyn would probably have been hit by another sword. The Twilight Knight had already raised his sword to the back of Jocelyn's back. Later, Leon dragged Jocelyn into the house, and Eddie's pushed down many debris to temporarily seal the house. Only then did the few people breathe a sigh of relief. This house was quite dark very different from ordinary houses, and was full of stench, because there are two large cesspits here, which are the warehouses where excrement is stored in the city. They are often called treasuries. Yes, no doubt, that's the name. The place where dinars and gold are stored is generally called a bank. The place where shit is stored is called a treasury. Big cities in this era had such cesspool warehouses. On the one hand, this was because the sewer systems in most cities were imperfect these days. All kinds of excrement produced in the city were usually collected in such warehouses, and then loaded onto trucks and shipped out. Go to the city. On the other hand, excrement is a weapon for defending the city. And some will be kept in the city for military needs. Lord Leon, Adai said H, low to the Lord, but was stopped by Leon before he could speak. Edies, if you have anything to say, please leave here before you leave. The debris at the door can only block them for a minute or two at most. The Lord would not waste time chatting at this time. He used to talk to Alistair just to gain time and opportunities. But now, he could not waste the opportunity to escape. Villains die from talking too much. And decency dies from gossiping. Leong doesn't know whether he is a righteous person or a villain. But he doesn't want to die anyway. From here you can directly access the secret door in the west of the city. I originally wanted to escape from here. This is the passage used to transport feces out of the city. Adai's didn't hesitate and pointed to a dark alley inside the house. This is probably a road specially opened for dung trucks. It should be connected and supplemented by the original outer walls between the houses, and a one-way road is specially separated. It seems that it will lead to the city along part of the city wall. Outside, when transporting manure out of the city, people generally do not use the streets. Otherwise the streets will stink, which will cause the dignitaries to be in a bad mood, and will also cause a large number of flies and maggots to be infested. There were a lot of maggots in that dark alley, and there was a lot of feces scattered in it. In addition, there was no way to get in. Naturally, no one would stay in this kind of environment. Moreover, Adai's also got a dung truck in the vault. If it weren't for Bridget guarding the secret door all night, Adai's would have used the dung truck to escape from Toba City after completing his escape in the early morning. It seems that my 3,000 dinars were well spent. Leon patted Adai's on the shoulder stepped directly into the alley that didn't smell very good, got on the dung truck, and loaded Alistair, who was still moaning in pain, into the dung truck. As long as you can escape, there should be no enemies outside the secret door. There should be at most three or five gatekeepers. Liang's troops actually had the upper hand in the city, and Bridget and the Twilight Knights could only defend the street for a while. Moreover, the city gate is also under the control of Liang's troops. As long as they can leave this street, it won't take too much time to circle back from outside the city. Therefore, Leong did not hesitate to signal everyone to get on the carriage. And the carriage began to move in the dung. The car rushes through the passage. The end of the alley is indeed a secret door. And there are indeed several dust slaves guarding the door. If Edie's was alone, it might be more difficult to get out. But now that Leong and Wendy are here, those twilight slaves have basically failed to form any hindrance. At this time, 
the Twilight Knights had broken through the door of the treasury. They also discovered the Dung Truck Passage. But they were all on foot. So they would definitely not be able to catch up. However, they did not hesitate to start running in the passage. This was no longer to chase Liang. They themselves had to escape for their lives. Liang's army is all in the city. And Bridget is resisting it on the streets. But it certainly won't be able to hold them back for long. Perhaps the Twilight Knights knew that there was this passage here. After all, they would operate here. If they wanted to capture Liang alive, they would naturally have to consider ways to escape. Bridget's previous attempt to lure Leon into the city through the secret door was obviously also because of this mission of the Twilight Knights. But the people of the Twilight Knights did not say H, low to Bridger at all, when they fled from the passage. Bridger also led the Omen searchers to resist Leon's army in the streets. Of course, this is also because Bridgie's troops are all drug addicts. They have stopped taking drugs for several days and have not rested since last night. They no longer have much ability to execute tactics. They probably don't even know what retreat is. Know how to fight like crazy. Half an hour later, when Liang re-entered Toba City with his carriage, the battle in the city was over. Bridget's troops were overwhelmed by the army, and Close took control of the situation in the city with the silver hand. But Bridgie disappeared, and Close failed to notice that he probably also escaped through the secret door. So Liang's first order after returning to the city was to send troops to search outside the city and pursue Bridget and the Twilight Knights. However, this kind of search is not easy to produce results. After all, the direction of their escape is not known. But it doesn't matter. Leon has Alistair in his hands. And this guy must know a lot of information. Chapter 280 Usurper Alistair probably does know a lot of information. But he is not in a good condition right now and cannot interrogate him yet. In fact, his life was not in danger. And he did not fall into a coma. Even the wound on his crotch was treated by Jocelyn and it stopped bleeding. Jocelyn showed a certain amount of kindness towards Alistair. After all, this was his former comrade in arms. And the two did have a friendship. However, since Alistair was hit by Liang's sword, his eyes have been dull and soulless. And he has ignored everything. He didn't even react when Jocelyn took off his pants to treat the injury. The whole person's condition is basically the same as that of a male cat that has just undergone sterilization surgery. Which perfectly explains what? Life is beyond love. This is understandable. Any man who gets cut off will definitely be depressed. It wasn't until Jocelyn handed him a small clay pot sealed with wax that he had a little reaction. He held the small clay pot tightly in his arms and began to cry silently without saying a word. That jar contained half of the piece that Jocelyn took out from Alistair's crotch. Remnant limb. For the time being, Leon was unable to question this hopeless guy. Alistair was in such a state that he couldn't ask questions. His current hostility towards Leon was definitely at its peak. After all, it was the Lord who did it himself. It seems that Bridget will indeed escape. Edies, do you know anything else about Bridget? Where do you think he will go? Leon planned to get some information from Edies first. Lord Leon, I only know that Bridget once said that he would build a kingdom of God. But I don't know much about him. At first, I thought he was a kind man who generously lent me money. Had Eyes replied, he probably didn't know much. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been fooled. But even this sentence is enough. The Lord had an idea at that time. Edies, what kind of equipment did Bridget wear last night? Go and get a set that is exactly the same. After sending Edies away, Leong first began to deal with the war in Toba City. Toba City is currently basically occupied by Leong. But it can only be called basic occupation and cannot be called complete control. Because the Dexia people in the city are just afraid of Liang's army and no longer openly resist for the time being. There must be many rebels secretly hiding in the city. Leon must always be prepared for assassinations or sneak attacks. However, the inner fortress and the bank have indeed been completely received. The bank has not yet been inventoried. But the materials stored in it are not very large. It is initially estimated that the inventory inside is worth about half a million dinars. This is quite expensive for a national treasury. There are really too few words. Fortunately, they are all high-value hard currencies such as gold silver and velvet, so they are very easy to carry. The inner castle was basically undamaged, but the warehouses inside the castle were basically empty. Apparently Cardin had taken away most of the valuable things. Cardin wanted to recruit troops from all over the place, so it was expected that he would take away most of his property. As for Toba City, every house is closed and it appears to be quite quiet, but this is actually not what a newly conquered city should be like. In fact, 
there will always be some sporadic resistance in ordinary cities. If there was no resistance at all and nothing happened, it could only mean that there must be many Desha warriors loyal to Cadden hiding in the houses. On the contrary, this means risk. Sir, manpower has been deployed everywhere in the city. Do we need to clear all the residents of the city into the streets? I mean, do we need to publicly execute those prisoners? In the castle of Toba City, Eric began to ask for instructions on how to deal with the situation. Eric's martial arts skills are not good, so he basically does not need to go to the battlefield during combat. His main job in the army is as a palm print officer, and he also serves as a logistics officer. In fact, these are the two highest civilian positions in the army. Of course, these two positions were originally mainly for Eric to control those businessmen. But now that the merchants are not in the team, Eric's main responsibility has become to convey instructions to other lords. That is, to dispatch the small lords who have joined the group army but are not directly under Leong. Usually, after capturing an enemy city, the conqueror would gather the residents together to announce some orders or policies. Policies were sometimes very moderate. This was when the conqueror intended to rule the country for a long time. More often than not, the orders will be cruel, even cruel. For example, when it is necessary to attract the resistors hidden among the residents. Some prisoners may be publicly executed in a cruel and killing way. Eric's intention is obviously the latter. He knows that his boss has no intention of occupying Toba City for a long time. He just needs to completely clear out Toba City and ensure its safety. No! Eric! Just declare martial law and order that no one is allowed to take to the streets. There is no need to clear the city. We don't need to attract hatred. Anyway, I don't plan to be stationed in the city. Leon shook his head, turned around and walked outside the inner fort, giving instructions as he walked. Steal the door of the inner fort and ask Close to empty the city's silver vault and don't leave anything valuable behind. Walking outside the inner fort, Leon turned around and asked Wendy behind him, Where are those female knights? Call them here. By the way, get some sets of Omen Seeker equipment. Those female knights were the eight female explorers sent by Amy. Sarah and Sigismund went to the holy mountain of Ghazi together. These eight female training knights temporarily served as Leon's guards together with Wendy. Sir, do you want them to change into Omen Seeker equipment? Wendy was very smart and guessed Liang's plan. Yes, since Bridget ran away, in order to prevent him from ruining my affairs. I naturally have to prevent him from seeing Carden. Leong nodded. In fact, the Lord is not sure whether Bridget was hired by Carden. But in any case, Bridget cannot be allowed to see Cardin. Otherwise Ramon may face big trouble. Leong didn't want Ramon to be killed by Cardin. Sir, Bridget has escaped. How can we prevent a person who has escaped from seeing Cardin? Wendy didn't understand. It's very simple. Just make him afraid to see Cardin. That's it. There are Cardin's trusted troops. Windriders. In Toba City. They will definitely tell Cardin everything that happens in the city. Therefore, there is no need to eliminate them leaving them to report to Carden. Leon smiled. I plan to make Bridget a usurper. Four days later, single, Bahad Khan Kadden met a Desha Wind Rider from Toba City in the castle of Tahir, Lord of Sinjar City. Supreme Bahadur Khan, Toba City is occupied by the enemy. But it is not Leon from the Lion Kingdom who occupies Toba City, but that bastard Bridget. The Desha Wind Rider was covered in dust and exhausted but he still brought the news to Cardin without resting for a moment. Being able to cross the 600 miles of desert from Toba City to Sinjar in four days. This wind rider really risked his life. And he was obviously a loyal minister and good general. Bridge? What's going on? The invitation in Cardin's hand fell to the ground. It was an invitation from Ramon's auction. Made of gold foil. Bridgie deceived us. He colluded with the army of the Lion Kingdom and led Leon to lead an army to capture Toba City. Then Leong took away the silver in the city, and the army of the Lion Kingdom also withdrew from Toba City. And subsequently, Briji announced that he would establish a new kingdom of God in the city of Toba. He would become the new Bahad Khan as the Desert Prophet. He even named several omen seekers as caliphs and worshippers. Usurp the throne. The Windrider said this with some anger, because he had witnessed all this with his own eyes. Leong took away the gold and silver belongings in the treasury of Toba City but did not occupy Toba City. Instead, he left the city to Bridge. In the view of the Wind Rider, it was obvious that Bridget had colluded with Leong. Leong wanted wealth. Bridget wanted Toba City, and each got what they needed. 
It is understandable that Liang does not occupy the city. Most people with a little bit of brains can realize that Toba City cannot become Liang's territory. So it is normal for Liang to only take away wealth and not occupy the city. In the eyes of most people, as long as Toba is captured, Liang will have completed his mission of leading the army, which will prove the dignity of the Lion Kingdom and make up for all losses from the treasury of Toba City. As for who will get Toba, it really doesn't matter to Liang. Anyway, it is difficult for the Lion Kingdom to implement effective rule here. And Bridge, when Liang was attacking the city, he deliberately arranged for drug addicts to climb the city wall and disrupt the city's defense deployment. This was ironclad evidence of colluding with the enemy. Later, when he was persisting in street fighting resistance in the city, he suddenly disappeared again, which is also irrefutable evidence. But when Leon left Toba City, Bridget appeared in the inner fort again, sat on the throne of Bahad Khan, and declared that Toba would become the capital of the kingdom of God. This is definitely a usurpation of the throne. Of course, the Lord asked Adais to pretend to be the bridge who claimed to establish the kingdom of God in Toba. Those omen seekers are also pretenders. But the wind rider couldn't tell the difference. Adais is also from single. After putting on Bridget's clothes, he can basically look fake. The angry Carden turned to look at Tahir beside him and slapped him. Didn't you say that Bridget guy is reliable? Tahir covered his slapped face. And there was anger in his eyes. Bahad Khan. I admit that this is because I don't know people well. But Bridget cannot control Toba City in a short time. As long as right his bounty to various taverns. And the usurper's head will appear in front of you soon. Sometimes you don't need to kill someone to eliminate a threat. You just need to act. At this time, Bridget was trudging across the desert. He did not ride a horse when he escaped from Toba City. In order to avoid being tracked, he did not dare to go to surrounding villages and towns to find transportation tools. Bridget, who was walking across the desert, moved much slower than the Wind Rider, who was deliberately released from Toba City by Leon and Bridgie didn't realize at all that his own employer had already decided that he was a usurper. Just like he was Eddie's employer a few days ago. But he also decided that Eddie's was secretly hiding money. You always have to pay back when you go out to hang out. In the past few days, Leon got some information one after another from Jocelyn, which came from Alistair. The eunuch was gradually able to talk to Jocelyn for a few words. Although most of the time, he was complaining about himself, and there was no real communication. Alistair's resentment could actually reveal a lot of intelligence. Coupled with some of his own analysis, the Lord basically has a map in his mind. The Twilight Knight's mission to capture Liang is obviously related to the Three Prophets. The Three Prophets were originally priests of Astalia, the goddess of justice. Obviously, they originally came from the continent of Barclay. Now, they are disciples of the dark goddess Arida. The Twilight Knights also believed in the goddess of justice when they first separated from the Dawn Knights and they were also from Barclay Continent, and now they have also converted to the Dark Goddess, although they have always claimed to. Correct the Dawn Knights. The Dusk Knights have not done any good deeds. Instead, they secretly make trouble everywhere. The only advantage is probably that they they will not burn, kill, and loot in the name of the gods like the Knights of the Dawn. As for Bridger, he is not from Buckley. He is from Single, but the headquarters of the Twilight Knights is in Single. Moreover, Bridget's way of acting is very strange. Like a fusion of the Knights of Dawn, the Knights of Dusk, and the Three Prophets. He calls himself the Desert Prophet, uses poison to control his subordinates, and uses deception to strengthen his team. This is the way of the Three Prophets. In addition, like the Knights of the Dawn, he claims to kill evil spirits. The method of killing evil spirits is also the Knights of the Dawn's method of using fire to judge. The Twilight Knights, whose purpose was to correct the Dawn Knights, appeared here to cooperate with him. Obviously, Bridget's mysterious sect is actually a branch of the sect of the Dark Goddess Arida, and Bridget's troops are probably one of the ways the Twilight Knights, correct, the Dawn Knights. By cultivating a desert prophet and letting them, he does bad things in the name of gods. In fact, Leon thinks that the Dark Goddess should probably be called the God of Evil, because the forces that believe in the Arida are basically not decent. Perhaps it was just because no one wanted to believe him when he claimed to be the god of evil. So he was given the name, Darkness. Leon guessed that the goddess of darkness Arita and the goddess of justice Astalia were probably twins of one body. The emergence of two wills in one godhead. And the competing for control was actually a split personality. Or called splitting the godhead. 
The three prophets are probably the spokespersons of the dark goddess. They are the true prophets of the sect. After all, they can indeed use the divine power of the Erida. In other words, the three prophets are church forces. The Twilight Knights are representatives of the ruling class who believe in the dark goddess Arida. That is, the secular aristocratic force. As for Bridget and his army of addicts, they are most likely cannon fodder raised by the three prophets and the Twilight Knights to do dirty work. When they unite, they can be regarded as the prototype of a theocratic kingdom. This structure is actually the structure of the Buckley Empire many years ago. Starting hundreds of years ago, the emperors of the Buckley Empire needed to be crowned by the Pope. Otherwise, they would wouldn't be considered orthodox. It was not until the Barclay Empire, which had fully advanced in science and technology, expelled the Knights of the Dawn more than ten years ago that the religious power was greatly weakened. And it was difficult for the church to interfere in royal politics. It seems that the three prophets and the Twilight Knights want to recreate a theocratic country in the continent of Pender. This is probably indeed the wish of the dark goddess Arita. The three prophets and the Twilight Knights obviously want to overthrow the kingdom of Lion and the principality of Desha. They may even have agreed on common interests. They may plan to establish a religious country based on the dark goddess Arita. In this way, the three prophets can become the Pope or a priest with a higher status than the Pope while the Twilight Knights can become the National Knights. And each Twilight Knight can also become the Lord of each place. As for Bridget, if he wants to achieve great things, he must make some sacrifices. Bridget's troops are probably made for sacrifice.